The blade removed itself from her groin and found her face. A streak of pain flashed in her cheek and she jumped back, moaning. You cut me, you little shit! What the hell are you playing at? Playing? He waved the knife at her. You think I'm playing? Calm down, said Nancy. Let's just take a minute and behave ourselves. The boys at the back of the kitchen suddenly seemed younger, and Nancy's firm tone cowed them. Perhaps it had been a while since an adult had told them what to do. Jake, however, was not cowed. You two can stay here, you know. If you play nice, it's a safe place. There's no fungus, and there's an apple tree out back. We even catch rabbits sometimes. It's not so bad. He smiled at Sophie and looked her up and down. Of course, there are conditions that need to be met. Ain't that right, eh? The girl nodded, expressionless. Sophie understood the setup here. Being a few years older, Jake was the only thing in these children's lives close to resembling an adult. They clung to the only assurances left, which Jake probably gave them in spades. They obviously didn't realise that he was nothing but an insecure bully, trying to convince himself that he was a leader. Sophie wanted to hate him, but to do that, she needed to know the kind of kid Jake had been three months ago. Look, Jake, there are no rules anymore, which means we can all do what we want. But one day, there's going to be a reckoning. And if by any chance the world goes back to normal, you're going to have to live with yourself. Is this really the man you want to be? If these kids are depending on you, then be a good guy for them. Take care of them in the right way. The fuck you think I'm trying to do? They're only alive because of me. We owe Jake everything, Nay protested. The two boys standing behind her nodded. You don't owe him everything, said Sophie, looking at Nay. There are certain things you never have to give away if you don't want to. Jake waved the knife again. Shut up. It's not as if you're offering something better. The whole world's fucked. Sophie nodded. It is. And I guess that should mean no one needs to care anymore, except that I do. I still care about how we treat one another, and you should too. So hand me the knife, Jake. Let's change how this goes. Jake squinted one eye at a time. He was a twitchy character, and it was possible he might have gone a little mad which would hardly be surprising. The knife in his hand trembled. Do what I tell you, he ordered, or I'll kill you. Sophie shook her head and took a step back, not wanting to prod the kid into lashing out. I won't do what you say. Try something else. He gritted his teeth, knife trembling even more. I'll fucking gut you. No, you won't. You're a good kid, I can tell. Before all this, I bet you were just a normal young lad kicking a football around and vibing with the girls at school, right? The knife trembled even more. You don't know anything? Nancy put her hand out. Come on, don't do anything silly. Just listen to Sophie, she wants to help. Shut up, you old slag! He kept the knife pointed at Sophie and took a step forward. You are pissing me off, he warned. Get down on the ground, nay, come tie her up. Sophie took another step back. Don't do what he says, Nay. This isn't happening, okay? The girl appeared unsure about what to do. She just kept attempting to take a step and changing her mind until Jake raised his voice and she finally got moving. Sophie took one more step backwards and her hands found the golf club. Nay tried to grab her, but she shoved the little girl away and swung at Jake's head. Even in these dark times, she had never killed anyone and it reassured her that she found it so horrifying. The club struck Jake in the temple and sent his left eyeball popping out of its socket. His body struck the tiles and flopped about. It looked like he was trying to walk, but his legs were in the air. It took almost a full minute for him to go still. Nay stared at Sophie in horror. Sophie reached out a hand to her. Is it okay? He can't hurt you now. We're going to take... The girl screamed, then knelt beside Jake's body and cradled it. What did you do? What did you do? Sophie shook her head and closed her eyes, trying to ignore the headache she had coming. 
She wondered if caving in a few more skulls would relieve the tension. But that was a dangerous notion. I can't let violence overtake me. These children are just scared. Sophie opened her eyes again and studied the three young boys at the back of the kitchen. They looked ready to piss themselves. Nay continued to scream and admonish Sophie, but Sophie didn't care. She stepped away from the corpse and stood with Nancy, who was shaking her head and staring at Jake's bloody skull. What did you do? she said. I thought you were going to talk things out. The kid was a rapist. That girl is no older than twelve, and it looked like he was ready to have his way with me too. Fuck him! Sophie, he was just a boy. A boy who wanted to be a man. That means consequences. Come on! She picked up her backpack, shoving the blanket back inside. Where are we going? To search this place for anything we can find, and then we're going to take as many apples from the tree outside as we can carry. Nancy gasped. But it belongs to these children. It belongs to whoever's willing to take it. Sophie, move, Nancy. I'm not going to ask you again. Sophie left the kitchen and headed upstairs, bloody golf club by her side. Chapter 7 Aaron had left Coldrake's ruins five days ago. Alongside him were Boone, Cameron, Fiona, Helen, and three soldiers who wanted to tag along. Helper skipped along behind everyone. They were all heading for the Scottish Highlands, specifically to the village of Quarry Kell, where Aaron knew the location of several corkscrews. The fungus appeared more and more frequently as they headed deeper into Scotland. Fortunately, Helper had a method of keeping it at bay. Whenever they set down their bedrolls in whatever natural shelter or abandoned building they found, the alien would vibrate his fans. Somehow it kept the fungus from creeping near. They hadn't originally set off with the alien in tow. Aaron had assumed the remains of the army would take the alien south with them. But upon the first night after leaving Coldrake, Helper had awoken them with his usual litany of Ally! Helper! Friend! The temperature was milder than Aaron would have expected it to be, but a constant drizzle kept everyone damp. It was only Boone's training and lessons John had imparted to Aaron that made life bearable. Every night they set a fire to sleep beside, and whenever the weather grew particularly blustery, they bivouacked in whatever crevices they could find in the rocky landscape. They were poorly armed and poorly equipped after leaving Caldrake in such a rush, but they were doing okay, averaging 15 miles a day by Boone's prediction. It had put them nearly halfway to their destination. Boone pulled up the sleeve of her camo shirt and glanced at her watch. It's time to make camp. Anyone disagree? Nobody did. So they shrugged off their packs and set them on the ground. Caldrake had been an infectious mess after the attack, so they'd only grabbed a few supplies before leaving, which Aaron supplemented by hitting uninfected rabbits with his .22. Cameron had also shot a starving fox with his SA-80, but the 5.56mm round had obliterated the animal too much to eat. Aaron propped his rifle against a large boulder at the side of the road, they had kept mostly to the main roads because it was easier going and allowed them to follow the traffic signs. The last one had indicated they were approaching the village of Comrie, which they would seek to avoid. They always endeavoured to skirt around the various pockets of civilization because it was much safer out in the open where they could see any threats coming. I'll go fetch some sticks to Budden, said Cameron, walking off on his own. The last few days had been unkind to the big Scot, and his face was grey and baggy. Losing Col Drake had struck him hard. I'll come with you, said Aaron, and he caught up with Cameron as he headed off road. Deep in the wilderness, it was easy to find bushes and trees to use as firewood. Everyone had knives. Aaron, the machete that had belonged to John, so cutting the wood wasn't difficult. Finding patches of ground free of fungus was the only challenge, but fortunately, 
Boone had stopped them in a clean area. Helper was nearby if they needed to push the spread back a few meters. Cameron moved up to a spindly tree with a whitish bark. Aaron knew little about trees, but he thought this one was pretty. It was almost a shame when they started hacking at its limbs. You doing okay? asked Aaron, noticing Cameron wouldn't look him in the eye. Grand. You? I've been better. I'm sorry. Cameron eyed him as he prepared to slash at a new branch. For what? For thinking this was all about me. What we're doing now is for all the places like Coldrake that are still holding on. Cameron lowered his blade and grunted. We were supposed to defend Coldrake, and we failed. We failed all those people. They didn't all die, Cameron. We fought back. A lot of us made it. Aye, but Coldrake near did. It were the first place I ever felt I belonged. Now it's gone. Aaron hacked at the branches for a while, wishing he knew what to say. He had never seen Cameron depressed. His sense of humour had gone, and he no longer displayed the brash self-confidence that had caused him to butt heads with Ryan so often in the beginning. Aaron decided to give him some space, so he took an armful of branches and went and deposited them in the middle of the road. Boone's soldiers were in the process of fastening a large ground sheet to four large sticks they carried with them everywhere. The canopy would capture the heat from the fire and keep everyone dry. Boone was gathering rocks to radiate warmth. The entire drill was second nature by now after their five-day camping trip. It surprised Aaron to find he actually enjoyed pitching camp. He enjoyed the company of his friends. Enjoy was possibly the wrong word, though. He wasn't happy, but he was content. No longer was he drifting from empty minute to empty minute. His life had found new purpose. There was a reason to wake up every morning. Fiona unwrapped some of the rabbit meat they had left and poked it with her finger. Somehow she had become the group's unofficial cook, and she too seemed to enjoy having a purpose. Aaron sat beside her. Cameron is really suffering. She raised an eyebrow and huffed. We're trekking 15 miles a day during an apocalypse. Who isn't suffering? Good point. I just thought he would agree with how important this is. We need to hit back at the enemy. We need to fight. Usually that's what Cam's all about. He understands, Aaron. Give him some time. If he didn't want to be here, he wouldn't be. All of us understands what needs to be done. Hey, said Helen, coming to join them. I'm looking forward to going home and seeing what the fungus and flames have done with the place. She looked down and sighed. I can find my boy and put him to rest properly. We'll all look for him, said Fiona, placing a hand on Helen's arm. Once we do what we have to do, we'll find him. Helen smiled grimly. Thank you. Aaron had expected Helen's mood to worsen the closer they got to the village where she'd lost her son. But the opposite happened. No longer drunk, she seemed confident and strong. Maybe, like Aaron, she just needed a mission to set her mind to. We can look for your brother too, said Fiona. We can find Ryan. Aaron looked down at the road and picked up a chunk of grit, rolling it between his finger and thumb. How would I even recognise him in the rubble? The whole village burned. Helen shrugged. Perhaps just being back at the place I'll have one's day will be good enough to see Edgar Bays. We never had a chance before. But if our plan works, we might get a little time to make our peace. Aaron chucked the piece of grit and blew air out of his nostrils. You're right. It might help. Certainly can't make it any worse, said Helen. Fiona chuckled to herself and when they both turned to her, she started to explain what had tickled her. When I was a kid, she said, back before I screwed my life up royally, I used to visit this little stream near my house. It was more of a ditch, really, and it filled up every time there was heavy rain. At certain times of the year, you could catch newts and frogs and stuff, so a lot of kids would go there to hang out. I was no different. But because my mum worked as a barmaid in the evenings, I never had to go home when my friends did. 
she would get back well after midnight, so I could pretty much stay out as late as I wanted. Anyway, sometimes I would stay at the stream until dark, and this one year a fox appeared. Obviously I shit my pants. The thing was big, like the size of a cocker spaniel or something, and I worried it was going to bite me. It didn't, though. It kept its distance and trotted right into the stream. Then it started splashing about like it was playing and having fun. It was trying to catch the newts and frogs, but back then I didn't know any better. It was just beautiful. A moment where the world was just right. Aaron chuckled. Don't foxes carry babies? I don't know, she admitted. This one didn't. Anyway, the next night I hung around the stream again and the fox came back at the exact same time. It was cautious of me, but not afraid, and once again it splashed in the water, having even more fun than last time. Let me guess, said Helen. Came back the next night too? For over a week. I started tossing it bits of sandwich meat, and it stayed longer and longer every night. Aaron smiled. Cute. But then it stopped coming said Fiona abruptly. I came back three nights in a row, but the fox was never there. I spotted it on the main road a few days later, when I was walking along the verge to buy sweets at the petrol station. That sucks, said Helen. Fiona nodded. He was plastered all over the road. I could only tell it was him because of the lumps of orange fur. I knew it was my friend lying there. He'd probably got run over on his way to the stream on his way to see me. I cried my eyes out for a week. Is there a point to this story? asked Helen, a little mean-spiritedly. Then she grimaced. Sorry, just wondering. Yes, there's a point. After the fox died, I avoided the stream because it was too painful. Until one night, weeks later, I went back. I sat down at the side of the water and pictured the fox, splashing about in the water and having fun. I remember how much joy it filled me with, watching it. Then I realised I was feeling joy all over again, just by being there and remembering. I said goodbye to the fox, hoping its spirit would hear me, and suddenly this weight lifted. After that, whenever I felt sad, I would go and spend time by the stream, and things would get better. Adam raised an eyebrow. So, your point is that I can say goodbye to Ryan, just by making it back to Quiety Kel. Or maybe my point is that we all end up as roadkill eventually, so let's enjoy what we have while we have it. Aaron looked down at the scraps of rabbit flesh in her hands and wrinkled his nose. For we are truly blessed. Oi, said Boone, standing in the road. You three get your asses into gear. If this rain picks up, we're going to end up sodding. I was thinking we might be able to build a decent lean-to and have a late start in the morning. We could all use a rest. You're telling me, said Fiona, leaning over and pressing at the toe of her dirty white trainer. I had blisters on my feet the size of walnuts. Aaron wasn't sure he liked the idea of resting when their mission was so important, but he had to admit his entire body could do with a break. Yeah, some extra sleep would be good. It's decided then, said Boone. But no one rests until we make camp, so on your feet and get to work. Aaron hopped up to get more firewood, while Fiona and Helen organised supplies. Cameron was far off, hacking at a large lopsided bush. Boone gathered her three men to build a lean-to. Helper was staring off into the distance. At first the alien appeared to be resting, which he did whenever they stopped but then Aaron saw a dark shape in the distance, moving down the centre of the road. What is that? asked Aaron, forgetting that the alien wasn't much of a conversationalist. It startled him when Helper gave a reply. Dog! Aaron frowned, but then realised it was indeed a dog racing towards them. It was large and dark coloured. Dusk was on its way, which made it hard to see clearly but there was no doubt that a large hound was heading their way fast. Shite! Aaron turned and searched for his rifle. He grabbed it from the large boulder he'd propped it against and hurried back to help her side, aiming down the iron sights, 
he brought the rifle to bear on his target. It was rare for an infected animal to be so quick, as their bodies were usually in too poor a state to sprint or pounce. This dog was moving at breakneck speed. Canine, dog, pet. Aaron tried to keep his crosshairs on the bounding animal, and the closer it got, the larger a target it became. But he needed to hold off long enough to hit the target with certainty. Miss, and he might not get a second chance. Behind him, Boone barked orders. Everyone grabbed their weapons. Aaron prepared to pull the trigger. Mixed in with the dog's brown fur was a flash of colour. Not green. Red. Blood. Aaron held his breath, readying to take the shot. He was just about to squeeze the trigger when he focused once again on the flash of red coming from the dog's mouth. Is that... a ball? The dog had a red rubber ball in its mouth and was whipping its tail like a propeller as it bounced towards them. Aaron pulled his eye back from the rifle and scanned ahead. A second shape was coming down the road, and while he couldn't be sure, he thought he heard a distant voice. Boone stepped up beside Aaron and levelled her rifle. Stand back! No, said Aaron. It's not infected, it's just a dog. Boone glanced at him. Starving and dangerous, no doubt. Aaron grabbed her arm, seeing that she still intended on shooting. She glared at him, about to spit venom, but he interrupted her. It has a ball in its mouth, look! Boone frowned, then squinted through her scope. Well, I'll be damned. Okay, nobody shoot, but be ready. They stood and waited while the dog continued bounding towards them. Its tongue lolled out the side of its mouth, the ball taking up most of the space between its jaws. Its tail was a blur behind it. Looks like a German shepherd, said Fiona. My granddad used to have one. Said his squad adopted a stray during the war and he fell in love with the breed. It's big, said Aaron, trying not to focus on the fact that most things that ran at you nowadays wanted to kill you. Gentle giants, said Helen, and she strode into the road ahead of them. Get back, Boone warned. You're blocking my short. Fiona knelt and put an arm out in front of her, her fingers outstretched. She held the position for three seconds until the excited dog reached her. Rather than sniff her fingers, it leapt up and knocked her backwards. Aaron raised his rifle, but when he realised Fiona was laughing, he held off from firing. The dog's red ball had rolled to the side of the road, and it was now licking at Fiona's face, yipping with delight. It's friendly, said Boone, relieved as if she had suspected it wouldn't be. Aaron turned back to face the road, and he saw a man sprinting and waving his arms. Here comes the owner. What do we do? Ask me in about 90 seconds, said Boone. Everyone keep their guards up. We haven't seen another person since leaving camp. He's friendly, the stranger shouted frantically. He's okay. Aaron looked at the dog and chuckled. There was no doubt about the animal being friendly. It had soaked Fiona's entire beaming face in saliva. He lowered his weapon and waved. This apparently reassured the stranger because their sprint became a jog. The stranger stopped ten feet away, panting and clutching at his ribs. S Sorry, he gets... Oh, Jesus, excited. Fiona sat up with the dog wiggling beneath her arm. You can say that again. What's the dog's name? Ranger. Boone frowned. Ranger. The stranger nodded. He was a teenager with a lean body. I came to Scotland two years ago to play for Celtic's youth team, he explained. When shit went down, though, I was playing at Dundee on loan to get some experience. Guess I'll never make the senior squad now. Anyway, Ranger isn't my dog, but when I found him a couple of months back, I named him after me club. Mainly so I could tell people this story about how I almost became a super rich footballer. Boone was smiling, which wasn't unusual, but for once she seemed genuinely thrilled. Both of her canines were on display, which Aaron was still drawn to look at. It's wonderful to find someone alive living up here, she said. Have you been surviving on your own? The young lad shrugged. By not staying in one place, mainly. It's pretty empty out here, which I think is a good thing. 
The cities are probably in bad shape, huh? Edinburgh's safe, said Boone. He jolted. For real? And here I've been, walking around, like the last man and dog on earth. Aaron chuckled. Like Will Smith. Huh? The film, you know. The teenager shrugged. Never mind. So your dog's name is Ranger, said Boone. What's yours? The teenager offered a handshake. Name's Teddy Blanchett. I'm 19 years old and I hail from the great town of Wigan. I like the Chinese food, nightclubs and, of course, football. My dislikes are green fungus and choking on your own spit. I mean, what is that about? Seems like a design flaw. Boone chuckled and Aaron realised he was doing the same. How on earth had this young man survived all alone while keeping such a positive attitude? Teddy was clearly pleased to find somebody else, but instead of acting shocked, he chatted like they were old friends down the pub. It was nice. Aaron liked him immediately. I'm Aaron. This is Sergeant Boone. And I'm Fiona. She fought to keep Ranger from licking her again. I love your dog. Teddy smirked. Seems to like you too. You don't happen to have any food, do you? It's um, been a few days. Boone sighed. We have very little, but we'll share what we have. Maybe later we can try and hunt another rabbit. Plenty of them around, said Teddy. Some of them are even the right colour. In fact, I think... Uh... He trailed off. For the first time, he noticed Helper standing eight feet behind them. Their bodies had obscured the alien, but he was visible now. It's okay, said Aaron. He's, um... Our friend, said Fiona, or pet. Not entirely sure which. Aaron nodded. He's an alien, but not the same as those that sent the fungus. His planet was invaded too, so he came here to help us. Friend, ally, said Helper. You see, Aaron chuckled, he's good people. Teddy didn't speak for a moment. Then he put his hands on top of his head and said, Are you guys kidding me? This shit is crazy AF. I thought it was lucky finding a dog, but you legends found an alien respect. Well, said Boone, chuckling, he's not really a pet, but yes, he's with us. We're on a mission, but we're going to rest up for a while. You're welcome to camp with us. Teddy eyed the alien. That thing won't eat Ranger. I can't guarantee it, said Boone, but it's unlikely. Then, Al, yes, I'll spend the night with you guys. I want to hear all about this mission of yours. Your army, right? Not all of us, said Boone, but some. Well, thanks for being so cool. You're welcome. Although you're going to have to work for your keep. We need firewood, rocks, leaves. We're already losing daylight. Teddy clicked his fingers. Hey, don't fret it. You know who you're looking at? Teddy Blanchett, fastest left back in Glasgow. I'll get what you need. Come on, Ranger. Teddy and his dog took off at an impressive speed. Aaron and Boone shared glances, both of them smiling. Cameron watched from a distance. Chapter 8 So you've really been out here all by yourself? Boone asked, as she sat beside the campfire in the middle of the road. With the grass so long everywhere, it was safer to stack the firewood on the tarmac, not to mention that the hard surface captured the heat. Fiona and Helen had gone to fetch more firewood to keep it going. Boone's soldiers had erected a lean-to with a tarp and some branches. It was something of a luxury these days. Pretty much by myself, yeah, said Teddy, stroking Ranger. The two of them nestled on a leafy bed. I come across people now and then, but most of them are lost souls, if you know what I mean. They aren't bad, just unpredictable. Most are too afraid to do anything besides run and hide. But not you, said Aaron. How have you managed to keep going? Teddy glanced at Ranger, who had his muzzle propped on his two front paws. This beauty helped me a lot. The world has ended, but Ranger hasn't changed one bit. Long as my friend gets a meal every day and lots of belly rubs, life is good. I try being like Ranger. Only thing I worry about myself is getting enough food and water to stay alive. Anything beyond that gets too heavy to deal with. You have to simplify things or you'll go crazy. I guess that makes sense, said Boone. She glanced over at Cameron, 
who was lying separate from everyone else by a few metres. Sometimes our humanity is too much of a burden to carry. Good men suffer worst. Teddy frowned. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. Anyway, why are you all heading into the middle of nowhere? What's in islands other than a whole heap of fungus? The fungus is the point, said Aaron. We're going to destroy the corkscrews that landed in a village near Quarry Kell. Teddy frowned. Corkscrews? The objects that fell to earth at the beginning of all this, said Boone. They brought the fungus. Destroying them is how we're fighting back. Teddy nodded over towards Helper, who was standing silently at the side of the road. You a pet alien tell you that? Yes, actually, said Aaron. He studied the alien for a moment and chuckled. He doesn't use a lot of words, but he gets the point across. Mostly he communicates through images. Teddy raised an eyebrow. That's cool. I guess it makes sense that an alien creature might communicate differently to us. You guys sure you can trust that thing though, right? I mean, he's not going to get inside our heads and control us or anything. Aaron felt oddly offended by the accusation. As different as he might be, Helper was part of their group. He showed no signs of being telepathic. Everything he's done has been to help us. I got infected and he cured me. I'd be a green right now if not for him. Infected for real? Teddy fidgeted uncomfortably. That sucks. I'm fine now. It was days ago. I would have turned already. Boone nodded. We're cautious, obviously, but at this point, what is there to lose by trusting a shiny blue alien? I'd trust Barney the Purple Dinosaur right now if you offered to help. Teddy pursed his lips and nodded. All right then. Well, I'm just glad there are still people out here fighting. Maybe I should have been doing more of that myself. All I've done is think about my own survival. Wish I had a big gun like yours. He eyed at Boone's SA-80. Sure it's easier to be brave with one of those. We were part of a larger group, said Boone. It changes things. Fighting back is less frightening when there are people beside you. Aaron glanced at Cameron, wishing he could help ease his friend's grief. And there are worse things than death. Once you realise that, things get easier. Wow, said Teddy. You folks is deep. Boone and Aaron chuckled. Fiona and Helen returned to the camp with more wood. They tossed the branches into a pile beside the fire, which hissed in anger at the drizzling rain. Helen's knees clicked, and Fiona shuddered as the two of them sat down cross-legged and warmed their hands over the flames. It's getting colder, she said. We might have to think about looking for some decent camping equipment in the nearest village. Wood blankets at the very least. Helen nodded. Or we're going to need to start building bigger fires. Makes you wonder, said Cameron, finally. He was lying on his back, just outside the lean-to, with his hands behind his head. How a young fella like Teddy can survive out here, with only the clothes on his back? Boone frowned. What are you talking about? Cameron didn't move. He remained on his back, staring up at the stars. Just seeing. It's strange our guest near has so much as a spare pair of socks. Aaron huffed, assuming Cameron's foul mood was airing. He had always had a problem with newcomers, so it was hardly surprising he wanted to pick a fight now. But this time he had a point. He's right. Where's your stuff, Teddy? You and Ranger are both clean and fed, but you turned up with no camping gear, food or anything. Teddy shifted awkwardly, straightening both his legs and rubbing at his thighs. He might have been preparing to leap up and run, but he remained sitting. I didn't want to say anything until I knew you guys were okay. But there's an old country park down the road. It used to have animals and a couple of playgrounds. I let the animals go, but I've been living off their food. Bags and bags of grain, dried vegetables, stuff like that. The gift shop is carpeted, so I've been sleeping there. Can always smell a liar, said Cameron. Worse than a fart. Boone waved a hand. All right, settle down, Cam. Yeah, okay, I sort of lied, Teddy admitted. But only because it would have been stupid to just come out and tell you. I got robbed half a dozen times in the early days. 
It wasn't until I found the country park I managed to keep safe. If people know about it, they'll take it from me. So what were you doing out on the road? asked Aaron. Ranger and I like to take walks, to check for approaching threats if nothing else. If Ranger hadn't bounded off like a maniac, I would have hidden from you guys. Hiding is my thing. Well, we're not interested in taking anything from you, said Boone. We'll see you back home safely before carrying north. Boone turned to Cameron, who was still lying on his back. Satisfied? No problem with me, Sarge. Although if the lad's so well fed, why did he ask for our food? Just when Aaron thought the matter was resolved, he was once again filled with nagging suspicions. He looked at Teddy once more, trying to see if there was anything about him that didn't add up. You said it had been a couple of days since you'd eaten. Another lie? Teddy rubbed his face and sighed. He wore several glittery rings on his fingers, which made sense for an aspiring footballer. I've been eating well, true that. But it's been a while since I've been eating anything besides animal feed. I was hoping you guys would have some meat. Thought I could smell it. Aaron still tasted the cooked rabbit they had eaten, and he thought about how he would feel if he'd been existing on grain for months. He decided Teddy's answer was reasonable. He had been dishonest, yes, but there had been no reason for him to trust them with the truth. Look, said Teddy, I get that the big man don't trust me. Some things never change, I guess. But I'm just a kid out here on my own. If you want me to leave, I will. It was nice meeting you all the same. He went to stand up. Sit down, said Boone, waving a hand. Cameron likes to growl before he looks. He's a surprisingly likeable guy once you get to know him. You're welcome to share a fire, Teddy. You can even come with us to Quarry Cal, said Aaron, if you want. Although, I probably wouldn't recommend it, said Fiona, unless you like kamikaze missions. Teddy crossed his legs and put his hands in his lap, a little more relaxed. I'll think about it. I know Ranger would like some new people to play with. Upon hearing his name, the dog wagged its tail. The red rubber ball was next to its paw, and it nudged it with a glistening brown nose. OK, said Boone, clapping her hands. We decided we'd rest up and recharge our batteries, so let's not waste our chance. Everyone get your head down. We'll make a plan in the morning. Any volunteers for first watch? One of Boone's soldiers offered. A quiet man with a thick blonde beard. He shouldered his weapon and stood up while everyone else bedded down on their makeshift mattresses. Helen handed out blankets from her pack. They would have to remain near the fire beneath the lean-to to keep the drizzle from soaking through their clothing. Fiona had been right. They couldn't go much longer without finding proper camping gear. Cameron spread his mattress further away from the fire than the others, but he was close enough to hear when Aaron whispered to him, Hey, Cam, don't give up on me, okay? That night on the platform when Ed died, you were there for me. Now I'm here for you. Whatever you need, just tell me. Cameron rolled onto his side and grunted, Get some sleep, little English. Good night. Aaron sighed. See you in the morning. Aaron must have fallen right to sleep, as he did most nights lately. There was something about an open sky and crackling fire. Perhaps mankind had overcomplicated things. Mere months ago, video games had been the most important thing in his life. Now he was content, just lying beneath the stairs with nothing but his own thoughts. As usual, Ryan and his mam tried to visit him in the silence. At first he fought them away, but then he remembered John's advice and let them in. What he feared would become a nightmare became something pleasant. His family were together again. He woke up when someone nudged him. Instinctively, he went to complain, but a hand clamped over his mouth. Struggling did him no good, his attacker was too strong. Cameron put a finger to his lips and shushed him. Surely me, keep quiet. Aaron nodded. Cameron removed his hand, allowing him to speak. What are you doing, Cam? It's the middle of the night. Is the fungus here? Our wee guest is up to something, Luke. Aaron turned his head and saw a figure standing at the edge of camp. It could have been whoever was on guard. 
but the silhouette did indeed resemble Teddy's wiry frame. But it didn't mean he was up to anything. Cameron hadn't trusted John at first either, or Ryan. Cameron never trusts anyone. I knew that lad was bad news the moment he trotted up with a smile on his face. His story ne adds up little English. Why not? Think about how you'd be surviving on your own for months. You'd be off your head, eh? Aaron kept his voice to a whisper. Some people are stronger than others. For all we know, he might have had a dozen mental breakdowns. Maybe. But why is he up and about now? He waited for everyone to fall asleep. As much as Aaron disliked Cameron's cynicism, he respected him too much not to at least give the benefit of the doubt. He lay silently and watched as Teddy moved around the camp. There was no sign of whoever was on guard duty, which was concerning by itself. When Teddy bent down and took Boone's rifle, it was pretty clear that something was horribly wrong. That's my cue, said Cameron, and he leapt to his feet, snatching up his rifle. Aaron likewise grabbed his point too, too. Put the weapon down, you sneaky pile of shit. I'm on to you. I were on to you the moment you turned up. His bellows woke everybody and all hands reached for their weapons. Teddy spun around with the rifle in his hands, but he kept it pointed at the ground. When Boone realised he had taken it, she leapt up and tried to grab it. But he struck her in the face with the stock, then aimed at her chest. I'll shoot her, he warned, anxiety rife in his voice. Nobody make me do anything stupid, okay, just chill. Helper was standing off in the grass, blue skin shimmering under the moonlight. He was silent, seemingly unaware of any threat. Ranger, however, barked non-stop. What are you doing? demanded Aaron, annoyed that he had trusted this stranger. I would just get out of here, said Teddy. You people don't know what it's like here. You can't trust anybody, and everybody's out there to take what's yours. Weapons make life a whole lot easier. I'm taking this and leaving, okay. My need is greater than yours. He looked left and right seeming to peer into the darkness. In a quieter voice, he said, Look, you don't want to push me on this. Let me leave, and you might get to keep the rest. Aaron frowned. What are you talking about? Teddy peered into the darkness again, as if he saw something out there. I like you guys, so I'm going to give you some advice. If I were you, I would head back the way I came, okay? Cameron strode forward, rifle pointed. You got three seconds to live or day. Put down the rifle, eh? And I'll let you choose which. Teddy shook his head. Soon as I do that, you'll shoot me. He chuckled to himself. The mum's always said Scotland was a dangerous place for a black man. Stop with that bullshit, said Cameron. I didn't care about the colour of your skin. I care about the fact you're trying to steal from us. Two seconds left, lad. Time to make a choice. You shoot me, I'll shoot her. Boone stared at Cameron. And for once, her face had no hint of a smile. She wanted Cameron to shoot, but she was terrified of how things might go down. Cameron swallowed and licked his lips. You've been watching too many films, lad. Ever seen a kick from one of these bad boys? By the time you can even think about pulling your trigger, your dead body will be ten feet down the road. From the way Teddy held Boone's rifle, it seemed unlikely he even knew how to use it. Despite that, he acted strangely confident as he straightened up and faced Cameron head on. I was hoping to do this quietly, he said. All we want are your weapons. Aaron frowned. You said we again? Teddy smirked. Me and Ranger, of course. Boone leapt up off the ground and snatched at a rifle. There was a deafening crack as a weapon discharged. Boone crumpled sideways, landing right on top of the fire. She made no sound and didn't move even as her body burned. Teddy ducked and fired his rifle, clearly more familiar than he had made out. From the way Boone's body had fallen, Aaron was certain it hadn't been him who had shot Boone. Then one of Boone's soldiers crumpled to the road dead, and it became clear they were under fire. Everybody get down, Aaron cried out. Cameron took a shot at Teddy, but the darkness beyond the campfire was total, and he melted into it like a ghost. Fiona and Helen tried to grab Boone's body from the fire, but a shot struck the road at their feet and sent them scrambling. 
Meanwhile, Aaron stood stock still, his point two two aimed at nothing. It felt like he was standing on a landmine. If he moved, he was dead. More shots hit the road. Another of Boone's soldiers fell. Aaron tried to see the enemy, but darkness surrounded the road. Cameron swore, firing off several bursts from his rifle. Helen took pot shots with a pistol. We're going to die, thought Aaron, right here on this road in the middle of nowhere. I'm even further from home than before. Teddy leapt out of the darkness, re-emerging into the light of the campfire. He shoved the muzzle of Boone's rifle into Aaron's side and shouted, Drop your weapons! Aaron allowed his point two two to fall to the floor as he raised his hands above his head. Boone's remaining soldier fell victim to a headshot, his skull exploding. Helen and Fiona put their hands in the air, their pistols tucked harmlessly into their waistbands. Only Cameron remained armed. He ducked and dodged, making himself a hard target. What the feck is going on? He roared. I'll feckin' kill you! Teddy positioned himself behind Aaron and prodded the barrel against his spine. You got about three seconds to live or die, mate. Your choice, now drop it. Just do it, said Aaron. I don't want anyone else to die. Boone's body had stifled the fire. But wisps of black smoke escaped from beneath her as her flesh smouldered. Cameron's face was bright red with rage. But fortunately, he was still rational enough to understand that they were screwed. He tossed his rifle into the grass and laced his fingers behind his head. I'll make you pay for this, he warned, spitting through his thick red beard. Mark me words, steady boy. Torches flicked on at both sides of the road bobbing amongst the shrubs and long grass, a dozen at least. Who are you people? asked Aaron. Why are you doing this? Because we're at war, said Teddy. He sighed, sounding exhausted. The only way to survive up here is to take whatever's left, and weapons make that a whole lot easier. But don't worry, all right. The dock will probably let you go if you do what you're told. Aaron frowned. The dock? Yeah. He's the boss around these parts. In fact, here comes the man himself. Teddy stood up straight and faced the road. Hey, boss. I tried to do things quietly, but the big one only pretended to be asleep. An older man, wearing military fatigues, stepped into the light of the smouldering campfire. His scraggly beard was as much black as it was grey, and ashen flesh bulged beneath his eyes. There was something familiar about him. Fiona gasped. Dr. Gerard? He frowned, the bags beneath his eyes crinkling. Have we met? Cameron took a step forward, shaking his head in disbelief. Hey, you took care of us once not so long ago. The doctor nodded as if remembering. Then allow me to take care of you again. Do as you're told and no harm shall come to you. A collection of grizzled men and women stepped out of the darkness, half of them toting firearms. A few wore combat fatigues. Helper skipped alongside the road, finally seeming to sense something was wrong. Friend, ally, helper. Dr. Gerard's face contorted in horror. And everything happened in slow motion. Aaron cried out, Don't shoot! But everybody did. Helper wheeled around on three legs as the bullets hit him like a swarm of angry bees. Dozens of rounds ricocheted off his hard flesh, but several seemed to take root, opening up gushing fountains of thick sapphire blood. The alien screeched and whipped its fans ready to fight. No, said Aaron, not wanting anyone else to die. Not even the arseholes who'd just killed Boone and her men. He threw out an arm. Helper! Run! Run! Helper staggered back, clearly injured. His large black eyes directed themselves at Aaron, and for a moment he was certain the alien was looking only at him. Helper, get out of here! Leave! Run! Retreat! In a flash, Helper pivoted on his middle leg and sprang into the darkness at the edge of the road, gone. What on earth was that thing? Dr. Gerard demanded. He had a handgun and was scanning the shadows with it. There was a slight trembling to his wrist. Teddy kept his rifle buried in Aaron's spine. Fucked if I know. They said it's an alien that came to help us all. 
Seems pretty harmless until now. Did you see those blades on his arms? It were ready to slice itself on some human ham. He's friendly, said Aaron. He's on our side and you shot him. There are no sides anymore, said Dr. Gerard, straightening his dirty cuffs of his combat fatigues. Only the strong and the weak. We'll find out soon which you are. He turned to his people. Gather their weapons and put everyone in the wagon. Yes, sir. Cameron struggled as someone produced a set of cable ties and wrestled his wrists behind his back. But it was a half-hearted attempt. His fighting spirit having deserted him since the loss of Cull Drake. Aaron had to admit it was deserting him too. Teddy cable-tied Aaron's wrists behind his back and led him along the road. Ranger trotted along beside him, wagging his tail. I'm really sorry about this, kid. The plan was to rob your weapons and leave you be. Didn't plan on anyone dying. You thieves and murderers. We came here to fight the fungus and to help everyone. People like you are the reason we're so close to losing in the first place. Open your eyes, kid. We lost this battle on day one. No! Aaron shook his head repeatedly. There's still a future. We just have to fight for it. Teddy barged him with a shoulder, forcing him to walk faster. There ain't no future left. I was going to be a professional footballer. Do you know what that means? That means I was going to have a life swimming in muddy and pussy. Instead, I'm sleeping on an airbed every night, wanking myself off to memories of the girls I used to fuck. There ain't nothing left for us now except animal instinct and survival of the strongest. The fittest. What? Aaron rolled his eyes. It's survival of the fittest, not the strongest. Whatever. You take what you need and you fuck every other tribe that ain't yours. If that's what life is, then what's the point? Maybe there ain't one. All the same, my tribe is powerful and yours is weak. That means you lose. We all lose. With nothing else to say, Aaron allowed himself to be escorted down the road. His friends were behind him, suffering the same fate. After what might have been a ten-minute walk, a strange sight presented itself. Three wooden carriages sat in a line along the road, each pulled by two horses. They appeared laden with supplies. Where did you get these? From that place I was telling you about, said Teddy, the country park. They must have done carriage rides for the kiddies or something. Seeing as how we haven't been able to get any cars running, horses are the new Lamborghinis. I didn't mean the horses, I meant all the supplies. Oh, well, like I said, we take what we find. A lot of old farmhouses around here, and there's a village nearby. We go out most days looking for stuff. Looking for people to rob, you mean? Sometimes I wasn't lying when I said I got robbed in the beginning. That's when I decided it's better to be the one doing the robbing. Aaron sighed. He wasn't interested in hearing excuses, so he changed the subject. Do you know how to ride the horses? Teddy shrugged, using just one shoulder. Somehow, despite the situation, he still had a likeable way about him. There's a woman in our group who rides well. She's been teaching the rest of us. This group of yours, are they good people? They're just people. No different from before the world ended. If you're lucky, you might get to meet everyone. Aaron climbed into the back of one of the wagons. And if I'm unlucky? Teddy pulled a face. Shit, man. You really need me to answer that question for you? No, I guess not. Look, just sit tight and behave, okay? You folks were kind to me, so I'll put in a good word with the doc. Might not seem like it now, but you and me can be mates. Aaron rolled his eyes, but he was undecided whether he wanted to kill this cocky young man or not. Cameron, however, had already decided. He dumped down onto the bench beside Aaron, spitting and growling as he wrestled with the cable ties behind his back. They feckin' dead, the lot of them. They ain't getting away with what they'd done to Boone. Fuck, she didn't deserve to go out like that. Aaron sighed. Boone's loss hadn't even settled on him yet. But the thought of repaying her death with more death didn't put him at ease. More and more, it felt like every life was precious. Finally, they had a way to strike back at the enemy. But if there was no one left to save, it would all be for nothing. He stared off into the darkness wondering what was out there in the unseen landscape ahead. How many people? How many monsters? And Helper? He's out there. Is he okay? 
Chapter 9 They'd spent the last few hours inside some kind of animal enclosure. There was no way of telling what species might once have lived inside the habitat, but a cement wall and an eight-foot chain-link fence encircled the whole area, suggesting it could have been something dangerous. The wooden climbing platform in the centre of the grassy mound made Aaron think of a wildcat or weasel. Out of all of them, the only one who managed to get a little extra sleep was Cameron. But as soon as the sun came up, he rose to his feet. He now stood staring through the fence. Aaron climbed up onto the platform and sat cross-legged on top of it. The country park was small, with only a single building that was surrounded by four or five paddocks. An overgrown dirt track formed a perimeter that must have once been used for the horse and carriage rides. In an adjacent field was a pedal go-kart track. That was all. What time is it? asked Helen, rubbing her eyes. Fiona checked her watch. Just past seven. She arched her back and stretched with a groan. Then she slumped up against the fence beside Cameron. What do you think happened to the animals? The paddocks are all empty. What do you reckon happened to them? There's a reason that lad looks so well fed. She grimaced. They ate the animals? That's sad. Cameron shook his head at her, bemused. You gobbled the rabbit last night, cute and fluffy it were. I know, but eating the animals at a petting zoo, that's just wrong. Or maybe it's not. I don't know. She put a hand over her face and groaned. My head is throbbing. The animals are the least of our concerns right now, said Aaron. He tried to make out people inside the building, but the windows were tinted. A hundred people could be hiding for all he knew. Cameron nodded. We need to turn the tables on these gob shites and make them pay for what they did. Helen leant back against one of the wooden platform supports. I agree. Boone and her men were family. They deserve retribution. Revenge, said Cameron, his eyes narrowing. Revenge doesn't bring anyone back, said Aaron. We should try to escape, said Fiona. We have more important things to think about. Cameron snorted. And do what? Skip our way into Quarry Kell with no weapons. Fiona rolled her eyes and swore under her breath. She rubbed at her tattooed arms, sleeves rolled up despite the morning chill. It's not like guns are all that helpful against the Greens. Our best shot was having Helper with us, but now he's either dead or unlikely to ever trust us again. He's alive, said Aaron. I hurt him. I know he's alive. We need to find him. We can't even make it out of this cage, said Helen. We can climb it, said Cameron gripping the fence and shaking it. There's barbed wire at the top, said Fiona, pointing, and my days of self-harm are long behind me. Aaron looked over toward the main building again. He had a feeling people were watching them. We'll never escape without being caught. There were a dozen people on the road last night. I assume there's even more inside that building. Our best way of getting out of here is by talking our way out. We've met Dr. Gerard before. He wasn't so bad. He's right said Fiona. He wasn't insane or anything. The sword abandoned his patience, said Cameron, in case you've forgotten. And a few months is a long time nowadays. We lost four good soldiers last night for no reason. Boon the best of them. So as soon as I get a chance, I'm breaking necks. Aaron chuckled. What's so funny, lad? You're back? I am back. Can't a fella have an off day? Drake was my home, and so was Quarry Kell. I'm sick of losing people in places I care about. So I'm not going to let a bunch of fuckwits steal from us and get away with it. Helen sniffed and wiped her nose. We've been fighting for our lives ever since we met. The time for talking things through is still a long way off. Fiona cleared her throat and seemed to accept what she was hearing. I suppose you're right. The only people I trust are in this cage. If one of us fights, we all fight. For Boone, if for nothing else. Cameron raised a bushy eyebrow at Aaron on the platform. Are we all in agreement then? We make these bastards pay. Aaron sighed. If a fight goes down, of course I got your back. But that doesn't mean we can't play things smart and wait for the right moment. I want revenge for Boone too, but not if it means losing anyone else. I brought us all here. Boone and the others are dead because of me. Bullshit, said Cameron. The people to blame were those holding the guns. 
maybe we can just play things out. We're too badly outnumbered to go straight for the kill. Cameron rattled the fence in frustration and turned around. Every fibre in my body disagrees, little English. Okay. We'll wait for the moment to strike. But when it finally comes, I want my payback. We all do, said Helen. Movement caught Aaron's attention. Heads up, someone's coming. He hopped down off the wooden platform and joined everyone by the fence. There was a gate at one end of the habitat, a small chain-link enclosure with two padlocked doors. Dr. Gerard and six men exited the main building. Teddy was one of them, walking with his head lowered. It was difficult to know whether the teenager had truly intended on what had happened last night, but he was responsible either way. He had lied and tricked them, and had intended to rob them. Cameron's fists clenched. Aaron stood next to him. We're going to play it smart, yeah? Hey, little English, for now. Gerard approached the enclosure. He appeared tired, like he'd had even less sleep than them, but he was healthy and fit otherwise. I've given it some consideration, he said, walking slightly ahead of his men and reaching the enclosure first. And I do remember you all. Survivors of Quarry Cal, right? You've done well to make it so long on your own, Cameron huffed. No thanks to you, you donkey. You and Ewell on your own patience. The blow landed because the doctor flinched. Most were beyond saving, and my mind was on my family. I had hoped to reach them, but things didn't turn out as planned. The past is the past, however, and I do not wish to dwell there. We need our weapons back, said Aaron. We're heading back to Quiety Kell. Why on earth would you do that? The whole place is infected. Part of the reason I abandoned the place was because I read the writing on the wall. We torched the village to the ground, said Fiona, and now we're going back to destroy the corkscrews that landed there. Why? What good will that do? We're not sure, said Aaron, but we think it'll kill the fungus in Quiety Kell. Gerard folded his arms and raised a pointed chin. There was a glint of madness about him, but also a remnant of an educated and civilised man. Who told you that? Military intelligence? An alien, said Aaron, without embarrassment. The one you shot at last night, along with four innocent soldiers. Sergeant Boone served under you directly in Quiety Kell, and you killed her without a second thought. That was unfortunate, but death, I'm afraid, is no longer tragic. It is inevitable. This alien, tell me about it. Why should we? Aaron folded his arms, matching the older man's posture. Because I'll have you all shot, said Dr. Gerard plainly. He motioned to his men, who all raised their weapons slightly. It's no skin off my nose. Helen chuckled, like she found the whole situation absurd. You're supposed to help people as a doctor and protect people as a soldier, but you're shite at both. Did you forget what you signed up for or what? Gerard returned her smile with no sign of offence. I've forgotten many things, miss, and for good reason. This is the end of the world. We've been invaded, overrun, and routed. Hell is rolling out the red carpet for us all, but I'll do whatever I can to keep my feet from the flames for as long as possible. If you can make yourselves useful, you're welcome to join us here, but I'm afraid the alternative is both cruel and unusual. You'll kill us, said Fiona flatly. In some fashion or other, yes. Try not to let it bother you too much. Like I said, it's inevitable. Aaron shook his head, confused. If we're all dead anyway, what are you even doing here? Why not give up? Because survival is a loud mistress. If eking out a modest existence here for a while is possible, then my nature demands that I do so. There's food, shelter, and so far no signs of the fungus. Let us go, said Aaron, and you can have more than that. We're going to whip back at the enemy. We can turn the tide. Don't you want to do more than survive? The men standing with Dr. Gerard exchanged glances. Aaron was no mind reader, but he detected a twinge of excitement or hope. They want what I'm saying to be true. Gerard has convinced them there's nothing better than what they have right now. Don't be naive, Gerard admonished. Even if you're correct and destroying the corkscrew somehow damages our enemy, how do you hope to succeed? The corkscrews are surrounded by fungus as thick as your arms and guarded by foul monsters. 
even if you destroy one, how would you destroy them all? There are over three thousand of them. Fiona gasped. Three thousand? Gerard shrugged. That was the number we estimated globally. An insurmountable figure, wouldn't you say? One less is better than none less, said Cameron. All victories have to start somewhere. So let us out of this cage before things go sideways for the lawyer. If that's a threat, I should remind you that you have no weapons or bargaining chips of any kind. He motioned towards his men, who all held various firearms, some military, others not. When I left Quiet Cal, several came with me, taking as many supplies as they could, carrying and slaughtering the animals here to supplement what we had. Ever tasted alpaca meat? Makes a wonderful stew. Cameron rattled the fence and growled, What's your point, fella? My point is that I'm well fed and I intend to keep it that way. And anyone who gets in my way will end up the way of Rudy the alpaca, who used to live in that empty paddock right over there. You've lost it, said Helen, a smile still on her face. Didn't get me wrong. Most of us have lost a wee nut, but you've really lost the cheese off your cracker, have you not? I'm not the one in the cage with a head full of nonsense about saving the world. Teddy cleared his throat. Um, boss, last night they said there were still people in Edinburgh. Is that true? You told us the city was overrun. Gerard glared at Teddy, but when it failed to shrink the lad, he gave an apathetic shrug. I assumed it to be the case, based on what I know. If the city hasn't fallen yet, it will soon enough. You forget that I've seen firsthand the army's dismal attempt at controlling the fungus. Mankind has failed, and while it pains me to say so, we have lost the war. The world is no longer ours. No one is a failure until they quit, said Cameron. Dust yourself off and stand up like a man. There's no excuses for giving up, especially when people are relying on you. There's a difference between cessation and surrender, sir. I have merely chosen not to fight an unwinnable fight. Let us out to here, give us back our guns, and we might let you live. You can't hide here growing carrots and sucking your thumbs while the real warriors take care of business. You wet feckin... Dr. Gerard snatched a pistol from his belt and pulled the trigger. The shot struck the chain-link fence and ricocheted. Everyone ducked inside and outside the habitat, except for Gerard, who didn't even flinch. My patience has run out, he raged. He took a deep breath and held it, as if the outburst had been involuntary and he now wished to contain it. Exhaling slowly, he said, I tell you people what I'll do. I can't feed you all indefinitely, so I'll accept two of you. Choose between the four who will die and who will join my camp. I'll give you until noon to decide. Oh, and there's no escape, so don't waste your time. He glanced at Fiona and Helen. Better hope chivalry still exists, yes? Feck off, said Helen. Gerard turned and walked away with his people. Halfway to the main building, Teddy broke away from the group and came back to the habitat. He was armed with a dull black shotgun that had a hardwood stock. Got this from a dodgy geezer at a pub in Glasgow, he said, holding the weapon up to show them. Told me it was used to kill British squaddies in Northern Ireland. I thought it was cool at the time. You don't think so now? asked Fiona, wrapping her fingers in the chain-link fence and staring at him. He lowered the shotgun and shrugged. Suppose I understand the life of a soldier a little better these days. It's not a gig anyone would choose if they knew the truth. You did this to us, Teddy? Aaron moved beside Fiona. He made sure not to look Teddy right in the eye. You screwed us over and killed our friends. Eh? I'm sorry it went down like this, but the doc likes to shoot first and ask questions later. It might not be right, but it kept us all alive out here. Fiona looked past him towards the main building. How many of you are there? Teddy appeared unsure as to whether or not to answer, but he must have realised they were powerless to pose a threat, because he eventually shrugged. Seventeen. Ayest was twenty-six, but this weird Hungarian guy named Otto did a runner a couple of weeks ago. Few others left with him. Why? asked Helen. If this place is so grand, why did they run? I don't fucking know, do I? I think you do, said Aaron. There was an unease about Teddy, a sense of shame. They wanted out, that's all. 
It gets a little bad here sometimes, you know, like we're all just waiting around with nothing to do. There's no place to run, but for some reason that seems to make people want to run even more. Stir crazy, said Fiona. I used to feel it when I was in prison. I'd sit in my cell and have this massive urge to climb the walls. Hard thing to overcome. Aaron nodded. I get it too. Running is better than waiting and fighting is better still. That's why we're here. If we can make it to Quiney Kell, we can give everyone a chance to fight back. Everyone is still alive in Edinburgh, said Fiona. You didn't know, but now you do, and that means everything has changed. It's not over, not yet. Hey, said Cameron. The boss man lied to you. Probably didn't want anyone thinking there was a better place to be. Teddy shook his head. You got the dock all wrong, man. When Gerard found me, I was skin and bones, sleeping in a block of toilets at the park. He found all of us like that, desperate. He taught us how to fight, how to survive. Only a few of us here were ever soldiers. Without Gerard, we'd all be dead. And now you're just waiting to die instead, said Aaron. Don't you want to try for something better? What if we can win this fight? What if we can get our planet back? Get real, man. You reckon letting you out of this cage will make a difference? You can't save the world. You're right, said Aaron. But he'll allow us to make a start. We're not the only people left, Teddy. There are hundreds of people south of here making their way across the English border as we speak. You don't have to wait here and die. You can fight for the future. Teddy licked his lips. He glanced back at the main building where Gerard had disappeared with the other men. He stood there for a while, then wandered off without a word. He stopped about twenty metres away to sit down on a metal bench. He placed his shotgun against his lap. Guess he's done talking, said Helen. He's a handsome lad. She is one of the bad guys, because I wouldn't mind her aid. He's not a bad guy, said Fiona. He's just trying to survive, and he's done that by listening to Gerard. Why would he trust us when he doesn't know us? He hasn't seen what we've seen. He saw an helper, said Aaron. That should have been enough to show him that there's more happening than he realises. Cameron marched alongside the fence, rattling it, testing for weaknesses. Who gives a feck? He'll be the first one I kill when I get out of here. He could have warned us last night, told us to lie low, but instead he ate our rabbit and waited for us to fall asleep. Lad's a traitor and I want revenge. Revenge! Calm down. Aaron folded his arm and reflected for a moment. He stared over at Teddy, who had obviously been given guard duty. I think he was listening to us. He's over there digesting what we said. Helen shook her head. No, he's guarding us until Gerard comes back and shoots two of us. We're supposed to be making a choice, remember? We ain't doing that, said Cameron. No way we're picking who dies. I'll volunteer, said Helen. Hell, it's about time. Aaron hissed. We won't let them kill us, Helen. You promised to get me home to me, ma'am, remember? I still plan to collect on that. I'm only saying, if push comes to shove, my hand will be in the air. Cameron nodded. Mine too. He looked at Fiona. Look after the little English for me if the worst happens. Fiona didn't seem to know what to say, so she just nodded. None of us are dying here, said Aaron. We've been through too much to be executed in a cage like animals. Still think we can talk things through? asked Cameron. He shook his head to show his opinion of the notion. No. We'll try it your way. Good lad. Cameron rubbed his hands together. Let's put our heads together. We've been in worse scrapes. Everyone took a seat inside the enclosure. Cameron grabbed a thick branch that twisted out of the ground and pulled it loose. He began to sharpen it against a small outcropping of stone. They sat down on the grass and discussed strategy for the next few hours. Perhaps a dozen different plans in total, but nothing seemed wise or practical. They were trapped, unarmed and outnumbered. It was a riddle without an answer, and every minute that passed made it more and more likely that two of them were going to die. Another hour passed. Hey, said Aaron, unable to think any more and now distracted by something outside of the cage. There's Ranger. The German shepherd was sniffing around a weedy flower bed planted in front of a painted sign with meerkats on. He cocked his leg and took a piss. 
Aaron clapped his hands and knelt by the fence. Hey, Ranger, here, boy. The dog perked up its ears and wagged its tail. After spotting where Aaron was calling from, it sprinted over to the enclosure and leapt up against the fence. Aaron forced his fingers through the links and allowed the dog to lick him. There's a good boy. Hey! Teddy hopped up off the bench and hurried towards the enclosure. Step back! Aaron ignored Teddy's command. He was only saying hello to the dog. He didn't intend to hurt it. Chill out. I'm only giving him a fuss. Leave Ranger alone. Cameron raced up to the fence and thrust half of his hand through the links. He managed to hook Ranger's collar with a finger and the dog yelped, trying to pull away. Keeping hold on the collar, he thrust a sharpened stick through the fence with his other hand. I'm gonna kill your feckin' dog, Teddy boy. Least I can do. No, please. Teddy skidded to a stop a few feet from the fence. He put his hands up, the shotgun in his left, pointing harmlessly to the sky. Don't hurt her. Cameron frowned. Head? He tilted his head and looked at the dog's underbelly. Hey, well, she's tomorrow's dinner now, pal. No, stop. I'll help you. Cameron pulled on the dog's collar, his fingers turning white. He turned his head. How? Teddy lowered his hands. Look, I've been sitting over there wondering what to do. I meant it when I said I didn't intend for anyone to die last night. And it wasn't my call to start shooting. I was only going to rob you. The same shit I pull all the time. Me and Ranger gain a group's trust. And then in the night, I swipe their gear and meet back up with the others. It doesn't usually come to killing, but lately... Gerard's getting worse, said Fiona. Teddy swallowed and gave a tiny nod. The more people we rob and the longer we survive here, the more the doc believes it's us against the world. He stopped caring about other people. But it's me that... He blinked slowly and cleared his throat. I'm the one who has to go up to these strangers and make friends with them. Most of them are good people, just trying to stay alive. They feed Ranger, tell me stories, and then I stab him in the back. I wasn't always like this. There's a better way, said Aaron. Perhaps Gerard is right, and we're all going to die no matter what, but that doesn't mean our actions are worthless. Right and wrong still exist. Teddy nodded. My friends are here. If I left, I'd be alone again. I can't survive like that. Please, let Ranger go and I'll try to help you. Help us first, said Helen. Prove you're not a piece of shite. Hey, said Cameron, yanking on Ranger's collar and making her yelp. How do I do that? Teddy begged. I've been over there racking me brains. I don't even have the keys to the gate and even if you escape, Gerard will just track you down with the horses and kill you. Then say goodbye to your pet. Teddy lowered his shotgun and aimed it through the fence. Don't do it. I'll shoot you in the face. I swear she's a good dog, man. Just let her go. Aaron slumped against the fence. Let Ranger go, Cam. Out of all the people here, she's probably the only one who's truly innocent. Feck it. Cameron let Ranger go, revealing that he never would have hurt her. The dog hurried over to Teddy with a tail between her legs. Teddy knelt and stroked the animal behind the ears. It's okay, girl, it's okay. Did you mean it? asked Aaron, moving to the section of fence beside Teddy. Were you really thinking how to help us? Yeah, said Teddy. I don't see why anyone needs to get hurt. Okay, so how long do we have until Gerard comes back? An hour, maybe, I'm not sure. Will he go through with his threat? Teddy averted his gaze and nodded. He pulled this shit before. It's what caused Otto and the others to leave. Aaron sighed. And we have an hour to figure out a plan. And we need your help. Teddy scratched Ranger's belly while she rolled on the floor. With a worried expression, he nodded. I'll do what I can. Aaron was sitting on top of the wooden climbing platform when Dr. Gerard emerged from the main building. Teddy had returned to the metal bench 20 metres away ostensibly on guard duty. His shotgun lay across his lap, and Ranger slept beneath his feet. Both man and dog stood to attention when they realised they had company. Once again, Gerard had a small group of men with him, the same ones as before. Aaron wondered what the others inside the building were like. Did they stay inside constantly? Were they also armed? If the latter were true, 
escape would be even more difficult. Where were the women? Gerard approached the enclosure, holding his pistol by his side. So what will it be? He sounded impatient. Who has the honour of joining our little family? Shove your silly games up your arse, said Cameron, rattling the fence. We ain't choosing. If you'll let us go and we succeed, said Aaron, then the fungus will disappear from Scotland. We'll be able to regroup with the army in Edinburgh and finally fight back to reclaim the country. He looked not at Gerard, but at the men standing beside him. They were young, possibly career soldiers, but certainly not veterans. Their doubt was obvious. Doubt about what Gerard was planning to do. I wish I had your faith, said Gerard, but I am burdened with the truth. And the truth is that you are nothing but competition. Competition for resources, competition for survival. Even if I let you go, you would try to visit revenge upon me for last night's losses. We won't, said Fiona. We just want to leave here. With our weapons, said Aaron, so we can make it to Quiry Kell and do what needs to be done. Out of the question. You either decide among yourselves who lives, or I shall have you all shot. Cameron sneered. These boys only follow your orders because you've got them scared. Only a weak man leads through fear. Nonetheless, I am in charge here, so make a choice, or I'll do it for you. Kill me, said Helen, and she pressed herself against the fence. But you'd best get close enough to do it properly. We'd hate for a ricochet to blow your head off, or only take half a mine. Very well, ma'am. He cocked his pistol and sniffed. Okay, we're halfway there. Good. Any other takers? Aaron nodded. I'll go second. Like hell you will, said Cameron, over my dead body. That is what's on the table, said Gerard, and I agree it would be cruel to kill the youngest of you, so perhaps you should volunteer yourself. Cameron puffed up his chest. Aye, but you best take care of Aaron and Fiona like you said. No funny business. You have my word. They shall be invited into the group and looked after. It's the best anyone can hope for. Helen was still pressed up against the fence. Get over with then, you wankstein. My pleasure. Gerard stepped up to the fence and poked his pistol through one of the links, pressing the muzzle right up against Helen's heart. Give me a second, said Helen, suddenly nervous. Last words, eh? Gerard grunted irritably. Fine, you have three seconds to say something you believe to be poignant. Helen closed her eyes. And this, my final hour, I humbly asked. That Cameron cuts out your intestines and feeds them to you. Gerard recoiled. What? No! Cameron roared, and Helen threw herself aside as he grabbed the sharpened branch hidden in the grass at his feet. Striking like a viper, he thrust it through the fence with both hands. Gerard's pistol discharged. Helen hit the ground. Cameron roared. Gerard gasped as the air escaped him. His head lowered eyes falling upon the branch now sticking out of his guts. He tried to say something, but only blood escaped his lips. That went in easy, said Cameron, sounding impressed. Ranger leapt back and forth, barking and whining, disturbed by the gunshot. Gerard stumbled backwards. His men raised their weapons and pointed at the enclosure. Teddy leapt into the firing line. He held his shotgun non-threateningly over his head and dodged back and forth. Don't shoot, he begged. We don't have to do this. They stabbed the dock, one man growled, and he grabbed Gerard to keep him from falling. They attacked first. Because we were going to shoot them, yo. When we started this, we were just muscling people out for supplies. Now we're locking people up and executing them. I didn't sign up for this, man, did you? Seriously? Get out of the way, Teddy. Kill all them. Gerard staggered back towards the enclosure, still alive despite the stick pressed into his insides. He lifted his pistol shakily towards the fence, but Teddy lunged and grabbed him, shoving his shotgun into his back and using him as a shield. No more killing, Teddy protested. This ain't the way. We're telling the truth, said Aaron, trying to look the armed men in the eye. We're heading north to try to kill the fungus. Killing us will only hurt yourselves. Gerard spat blood. Shoot them! Someone fired a shot at the fence. The bullet hit the steel and bounced skyward. Everyone inside the habitat hit the ground. Ranger howled. 
Stop! Teddy yelled, and he fired his shotgun over Gerard's shoulder into the sky. Gerard yelped, blood ejecting from his mouth. Startled by the shot, someone shot back at Teddy, but the reckless bullet struck Gerard in the chest and ended his life. The dead weight of the old man's body forced Teddy to the ground. Violence exploded. The six armed men started throwing punches or lashing out with the butts of their weapons. They were clearly split over what to do. Someone fired another shot. Someone else hit the ground dead. Feck it, said Cameron, lying on the grass inside the enclosure. If they kill each other, we're going to end up stuck in here. It was a bad plan, said Aaron. Teddy told you he wouldn't be able to talk everyone down. It was the only plan going. Keep your head down. Rangers started barking ferociously and risked being shot. Teddy crept along the outside of the fence and made it over to the gate. He had a key in his hands that he must have taken from Gerard's body. I told you this was a shite plan, he said, fumbling with the padlock. Fuck, man! Just let us shoot you here, said Cameron. Teddy got the first gate open, then the second. Cameron leapt up off the ground and barged past him. Aaron and the women went right after him. This way, said Teddy, and he pointed towards the track that ran around the edge of the park. We need our weapons, said Cameron. Take this, said Teddy, handing over the shotgun. I can get us more. Cameron took the weapon and thanked him. Then he turned it around and pulled the trigger, blasting Teddy right in the chest. The force took the teenager off his feet and dropped him on his back. He wheezed and moaned on the ground, wide eyes staring vacantly at the sky. What the fuck did you do? Aaron demanded breathlessly. Why? Revenge, said Cameron. Fiona rushed over to Teddy and lifted his shirt. You utter twat, Cameron, he helped us. He got Boone killed, Aaron sighed. Every person we kill is one less to fight our enemy. We don't have the luxury of grudges anymore. Wait, said Fiona. I think, I think he might be okay. Doesn't look that bad. Teddy was gasping for breath. Blood soaked his chest, but the wounds appeared shallow. A cluster of black divots dotted his ribcage, but his insides weren't on display. It was like someone had hacked away at him with a blunt knife. Cameron frowned. Reaching down, he picked up the spent shotgun shell. It was crumpled and scorched, and when he tilted it, small black beads spilled out. Sudden thing misfired. He tossed the old shotgun onto the concrete and the wooden stock split right along the centre. Help me get him up, said Helen. We need to help him. Take me with you, Teddy murmured. I want to help. Aaron looked at Cameron, a mixture of pleading and scorn. Cameron fought with himself, but eventually turned the air blue and made the decision. Fix sake, you can't even kill a man these days without getting in the neck. He grabbed Teddy and scooped him up, tossing him over one of his broad shoulders. We still need weapons. In the wagons, said Teddy, groaning. There are guns in the wagons. Helen got moving. Let's go. They raced away from the brawling and towards the rear of the enclosure that had been their former cell. As soon as they rounded the corner, they spotted the wagons. Four in total, but without horses. The animals grazed in a nearby paddock. Teddy was still gasping for breath, but he asked Cameron to put him down so he could walk. Aaron helped the lad stand, and Cam went up to the first wagon. He opened a crate set behind the seats and whooped with joy and pulled out his SA-80. Next, he reached in and grabbed a pair of handguns that Aaron recognised as belonging to Fiona and Helen. Everyone armed up. Aaron got his point two two back. It felt like regaining a lost limb. Someone came around the corner and shouted, Hey, put those down! The ours, said Cameron, and mine beats yours. The man aimed a hunting rifle. If he missed his shot, Cameron would cut through him with a burst of 5.56 millimeter fury. Fortunately, the man was smart enough to realize, and he lowered his weapon. Is it really true? You know a way to fight the fungus? It, it took my entire family. We think so, said Cameron. We want to save lives, not end them like Gerard. Will you let us walk away from this peacefully, pal? The man nodded. The doc is dead. 
Don't even know what any of us will do now. Head to Edinburgh, said Aaron. There are people there. We only need one of these carts. You can use the others to reach the city in a few days. The man nodded. He walked away with his rifle over his shoulder, giving no indication of whether or not he intended to follow Aaron's advice. Hopefully he would, because every life counted. They're going to panic, said Teddy. The doc kept everyone calm, kept them in line. Without him, they're going to go to pieces. If we do what we intend to, said Aaron, then they'll be okay. I hope so. We need to get the hook. Teddy staggered, nearly slipping out of Aaron's grip. Whoa, said Helen, moving in to help. Let's get you onto the cart. Somebody get Ranger. We don't have time, said Cameron. Please. All right, said Fiona. I'll call him. They bundled Teddy onto the carriage's rear bench. Ranger soon appeared and leapt up beside his adopted owner. Cameron sat up front and took the reins. Anyone know a bloody thing about horses? I do, said Fiona. And when everyone frowned at her, she shrugged. I used to have a friend who owned a pony. She let me ride it. How long ago was that? asked Helen. About 15 years ago. Grand, said Cameron. This is going to be a fun road trip. Fiona rolled her eyes and hurried into the paddock. She didn't seem to know exactly what she was doing, but Teddy was able to guide her through the harness and equipment. Twelve minutes later, they were all aboard the cart and ready to leave. Cameron took the reins on the left, Fiona those on the right. Walk, said Fiona, and surprisingly the horses began to move. The cart trundled over rocks and divots, rocking to and fro as it picked up speed. Someone took a shot in the distance, causing everyone to duck for cover, but then they were racing along a dirt road towards the country park's exit. They had escaped. Somehow they had made it out of an impossible situation. Aaron decided anything was possible so long as they stuck together. Maybe if everyone had done that at the start, we'd have had a better chance. When they reached the tarmac road, everyone relaxed. Teddy wheezed less and closed his eyes to rest. Aaron put his face up against the breeze and found himself grateful to be alive. The air had a metallic taste, but the sensation of it filling his lungs was energising. He had barely slept, but he felt able to run a marathon. Ally, friend. Aaron threw his head forward. Wait, did anyone hear that? Hear what? asked Helen. I'm not sure. Just hold it. Cameron, stop. Bad idea, said Teddy. Gerard soldiers will probably be coming after us. Those who give a shit he's dead, at least. Just stop, Cam. Are they? Are they? Stop this thing, Fee. Whoa, whoa, said Fiona, and the horses gradually came to a halt. Aaron tilted his head and tried to listen. Ally, help her. Helen frowned. Is that? I can't believe it, said Aaron with a grin. He stood up on the boards and looked around. At first he saw only overgrown fields and the winding road. Then he noticed a splash of darkness in the sunlight's soft glow. What is that? asked Fiona, seeing it too. She put a hand on her brow and squinted. He's helper, said Aaron. He's calling after us. Friend, ally, Aaron. Well, I'll be damned, said Cameron. Plucky little fella. Helper bounded after them on three stumpy legs. Aaron grinned from ear to ear. Chapter 10 Thanks to the horses, reaching Quarry Kell took only two and a half days. Upon escaping the country park, they had ridden for approximately three hours before coming upon an old stone quarry. The pit had been deserted, and the officers made a good place to take shelter. The two days that followed were far tougher. The weather had taken a worse turn, and the constant drizzle of the last few weeks had turned into a heavy downpour. With only the wagon's inventory to make use of, they were left exposed, with no blankets or tarps with which to make a canopy. At night, they slept like sardines beneath the wagon, warmed by whatever heat they could create. To make matters worse, there were no villages nearby so scavenging for supplies wasn't an option. Collecting rainwater to drink in Scotland was easy, 
but no one had eaten since leaving Gerard's camp. Every mile they spoke less and less. They were like zombies. Even Ranger seemed to have lost the spring in her step. Blanket, said Helper, as the horses began ascending a steep slope. While the animals had been able to feed on grass every evening, they were weary and tired, making slow progress. The road ahead was overgrown with weeds and covered in potholes, but there was no sign of fungus at least. Aaron rubbed at his eyes, realising he had been half asleep. It was only the middle of the day, but the wagon's trundling had a hypnotic effect. What is it, Helper? Blanket! Enemy! The knee sounds good, said Cameron, and he pulled on the reins to bring the horses to a halt. Teddy was sitting up front with him, now recovered from his trauma. The pockmarks in his chest scabbed over and spoke reassurances to the exhausting animals. The horses came to a stop halfway up the hill. Teddy yanked a lever on his side and engaged the brake. Ranger hopped off and started wagging her tail. Cameron turned and looked at Helper. There was no room on the wagon for the alien, and while Helper was agile and quick, his body was ill-shaped to sit on a bench made for humans. He spent the journey jogging beside the horses, stamina apparently endless. Helper lifted his arms, and then the fan-like appendages pulsated. He had done this many times, almost always in the presence of an infected animal. Ranger seemed to send something too, a low growl rumbling in her throat as she lay on Helen's lap. I'll check it out, said Aaron, and he hopped off the wagon. I'll come too, said Fiona, slipping out behind him. Cameron placed an elbow on the back of the bench and nodded down at Aaron. Be careful. Of course, I'll be right back. Aaron plodded up the hill with Fiona beside him. She placed a hand on his back and said, I'm proud of you. Huh? For what? She tutted, as if the reason was obvious. A week ago, you were still a kid, throwing tantrums and blaming the world for everything you didn't like. Now it's like you've suddenly grown up. Everyone is here because of you. Adults following your lead. Aaron glanced back at the wagon, watching Cameron, Helen and Teddy chatting amongst themselves. I guess I never thought about it like that. I'm just trying to do something useful. What other option is there? We could run and hide like Gerard's people. We could be selfish. They were afraid and without hope that anything could change. It's hard to blame them. She chuckled, then smiled off into the distance. Aaron frowned. What is it? What's funny? You remind me of him. Who? Your brother. He seemed to have a way of always seeing the best in people and the worst in himself. Aaron couldn't help but smile at that, which was comforting, seeing as he usually wanted to cry whenever someone brought up Ryan. He was always like that. He was immature, always screwing around and that, but people always giving him chance after chance, because he just had this way about him that no one could resist. He made people feel better about themselves. When I first met him, I was frightened of my own shadow, worried that any moment might lead me back to old habits and put me in the gutter. The only thing I could focus on was not giving in to temptation. Never did I think I could be anything more than a recovering addict, fresh out of prison. But your brother made me feel like a person again. He fought for me and asked me to fight for him too. Ryan saw me as more than just a junkie. Eventually, he helped me see myself as more than that as well. Ryan knew he could trust you, Fee. I just wish he was still with us. Me too. I'm glad you're here, though. You're probably the coolest person I've ever met. She smirked. It's the tattoos, isn't it? Mostly. They took a few more steps until they reached the crest of the hill. There, they skidded to a halt, gasping. This is bad, said Aaron. On the other side of the hill lay a field of emerald green. The towering fronds of alien fungus pulsated and swayed. Rain droplets glistened like an infinite scattering of crystals. It was absolutely beautiful. And it was horrifying. I've never seen so much, said Fiona. It's like... like... A blanket, said Aaron. And it was true. 
It was as if a thick green fleece had been draped over the earth. Not a single gap, nor any sign of other life. Beyond the vast green field lay the village of Quiry Cal, a collection of fuzzy shapes upon a distant hill. Helper startled Aaron and Fiona, skipping up beside them. Blanket! Enemy! Yeah, Helper, said Aaron. This is our enemy, all right. What do we do? Aaron, fight! How? Helper hopped forward on his middle leg and started making his way down the far side of the hill. The fungus started twenty metres away, but as the alien got closer, it appeared to recede. He lifted his vibrating fans higher, and they became a whir. Aaron detected a faint sound, like a small bird beating its wings. What's he doing? asked Fiona. Why, well, he always does, said Aaron, helping. The shimmering blue alien strode forward purposefully, fans continuing to vibrate in the air. As he reached the vast field of fungus, a breach appeared, the green growth shying away and turning black. Helper moved right into the newly formed path treading on the dead fungus. More and more of it shied away or turned black, the green field parting left and right. Aaron grinned. Remind you of anything? Yeah, said Fiona. Moses and the Red Sea. Huh? No. I was thinking of a lawnmower. Maybe Elpa can go back and forth and make stripes. Fiona put her hand on his back again. Come on, we should tell the others. We made it. Agreeing, Aaron headed back down the hill and told the others they had finally reached Quiry Kel, but that the fungus had taken hold worse than they'd feared. Then Fiona told them about Helper. He's out there right now, said Aaron, making a path for us. Let's get the wagon up and over. Cameron was pale, his freckles muddy against his cheeks. Clearly something was bothering him, so Aaron asked what it was. It's whom? said Cameron, grimacing. It might not always have been good to me, but it were where I spent my life. I knew the people, the places, the good moments and the bad. If it's as grim as you say it is, Alan stroked his arm. We always knew it was going. We're here so that other places that people call home get to survive. Aye, I suppose. I've just been putting it all to one side of my brain, trying not to think about it. Now that we're here, it reminds me of everything we've lost. Can you not picture Father Miles giving us sermons on a Sunday morning? Or Dale opening up the pub every day come noon? The last thing I want to do is picture Dale, said Helen. But I get what you mean. I can see my daffodil balancing on the wall outside the church, pretending he was a tightrope walker. I always thought Quiry Kell would be a bonny place for him to grow up, you know. Boring, but nice. He were a good lad, said Cameron, and you were a fine mother. Tears filled Helen's eyes, but she blinked them back. Let's put the village to rest, along with all our friends and neighbours. Aye, let's. We're ready, asked Teddy, picking up the reins. Just say the word. Cameron gave him the nod. With the brake released, the horses got moving again. Aaron and Fiona remained on the road, walking beside the wagon as it crept up the hill. The horses had encountered the fungus several times in the last couple of days, but not in such a vast quantity. Whenever they had come across an infected creature or a patch of fuzz, Helper gave them prior warning. Then they had taken the creature out with a well-aimed headshot or slice of Helper's blades. It turned out the horses had their limits. At the top of the hill, they whinnied and raised their front hooves off the road. It's okay, girls, Teddy soothed. Calm down. They sense it, said Aaron. They know what's over the hill. Teddy continued trying to calm the animals, but it was no use. They threw themselves left and right, causing the wagon to skid and the frame to creak. Something snapped. One of the wheels wobbled, then turned inwards. The wagon slumped diagonally and the horses dragged it off the road. Ranger leapt off the wagon, barking and dancing about, bewildered by the startled animals. Teddy, Cameron and Helen threw themselves off after the dog landing on the stony grass. 
Helen swore in pain, as did Teddy, who clutched his wounded chest and turned the air blue. Cameron ducked into a roll and made it back onto his feet. Both wheels came free as the axle snapped. The wagon crashed into the grass, tearing up the mud beneath. The horses broke free, bolting off into the distance with bits of wood and harness flapping behind them. Well, said Fiona, there goes our ride. Eh, said Cameron, shrugging his shoulders. I fancy me a walk anyway. So are we really doing this? asked Aaron. If we head into the village, we might not make it back out again. At least we'll be home, said Helen. I'll be with my boy. There's no turning back now, said Cameron. Coldrick proved there was no way to survive this by running in Hayden. It's time to be, what do you call it, proactive. Aaron nodded. Well, let's get going. Everyone grabbed their weapons and crested the hill in a line. Cameron and Helen gasped in unison when they saw the emerald field, while Teddy fell utterly silent. After a moment, the lad shook his head. I've never seen it like this before. I didn't realise it was so bad. This is what we're up against, said Aaron, peering down at the unbroken field of green. This is all that'll be left of the planet if we don't stop it. Teddy nodded. I'm sorry. I almost got in your way. It's all right, said Cameron. I shot you, so we're even. Teddy fingered his chest beneath his bloody long sleeve t shirt. Good to know. Eh, you'll get over it. I got shot in the ass once. Also, good to know, I hope it hurt, Teddy smirked. Wasn't my favourite day, let's put it that way. Helper was now a hundred metres ahead. A swathe of fungus lay blackened and dead in a wide strip behind him, but it was still incredibly thick and vibrant beyond that. Was there a limit to how much of the fungus the blue alien could deal with? What if his abilities ran out or needed recharging? Without him, their mission would be impossible. Thank God he made his way back to us. Cameron scuffed his boots against the last of the tarmac road. Beyond, it was completely covered. Well, it goes nothing. He stepped forward and started down the hill. Everyone followed him. Ranger stayed close to Teddy, tail tucked between her legs. When they reached the edge of the fungus field, Aaron felt a shiver along his spine as he expected it to leap up from the sides and smother him. The healthy fungus was four feet high. The blackened pathway Helper had made was six feet wide, which gave them plenty of space to walk safely, but it didn't make things any less scary. Helper moved steadily, but they caught up with the alien by jogging. Cameron then did something unexpected and patted the alien on its back, cheering him for his good work. He didn't seem to think about what he was doing. Helper stopped and turned around. Maybe you shouldn't have done that, said Teddy, freezing. Aaron froze too, wondering if Helper would interpret the exuberant pat on the back as some kind of attack. The alien seemed to glare at Cameron, but then spoke. Friend! Ally! Cameron! A smile cracked Cameron's face. Hey, pal, we're friends. Let's get a paint together after all this is through. Blanket! Kill! Aye, that first. Everyone got moving again with help of clearing a path. The way ahead entered a dip, and a short distance beyond, that dip rose into a hill. Upon that hill sat the village of Kwaidikel, where the dead lay waiting. Chapter 11 Sophie felt nauseous, which made no sense, because she hadn't eaten in days. The apples had rotted surprisingly quickly in their backpacks, which they had shed to be free of the weight. Travelling north was getting harder and harder as the fungus crept in on them from every direction. They could no longer keep to the roads, and instead had to walk through farmland or wherever else they could find that was uninfected. Gradually, mile by mile, they were being closed in. Soon, there would be no way ahead at all. Nancy was in bad shape. Without food, she had weakened substantially and barely spoke a word now. They were two silent machines, tasked with walking until they dropped. Life held no pleasure. 
The future was a tiny dot of light on an unrelentingly dark backdrop. I'm sorry, said Sophie, when they reached somewhere between nowhere and any place. I'm sorry I didn't plan this better. Nancy shrugged, tiredly putting one foot sluggishly in front of the other. There were no plans to be made. What could we have done differently? I don't know. We could have found a working car for starters. We would have had to kill to get one. They're not just sitting around. Sophie thought about Jake and how she had caved his skull in back at the cottage before stealing the supplies from the children they had abandoned. We've had to kill anyway, Nancy, and where did it get us? We would have been better off with Jake. She laughed dryly and reconsidered. Maybe not. What we did to those children was terrible, Nancy said, putting a hand against her grubby forehead. It's been weighing on my mind for days. We only did to them what they were going to do to us. I don't like it, Nancy, but I'm certainly not going to lose any sleep over it. You've never had children, Sophie. That's why you don't feel as badly as you should. They're probably starved to death by now. Children. It was three days ago. They're probably fine. If not, then they're no different from the millions of other kids who never made it. Guilt is pointless when most of the world is dead. Who does it help? I'm still a human being, Sophie. I can't help but feel guilty. Sophie stopped walking, her jeans soaked up to the knees, and faced her mother-in-law with her hands on her hips. Are you saying I'm not human, huh? Nancy avoided eye contact for a moment, but then she appeared to steel herself. You become callous, Sophie. It wasn't so long ago you were about to bludgeon a poor man to death for trying to feed his daughter. Then back at the cottage, you... you... I what? I killed a rapist? Fed us? How much longer do I have to take care of you before you actually thank me? Thank you? We're in this together. I'm not your goddamn sidekick. No, you're not. You're a dead weight, Nancy. You're getting slower and slower, and you've been eating two-thirds of our food. What food? Exactly. You ate it all, and now you're complaining about where it came from. I'm starving, and I'm exhausted, and... and... She clutched her matted blonde hair and pulled. I don't think I can do this anymore, Nancy. I'm done. It's fucking over and I'm done. Nancy flinched, clearly shocked by her sudden breakdown. Sophie hadn't even been aware that she was so close to the edge. Now tears were flooding down her face. Oh, honey, come here, come on. Nancy tried to grab her, but she swatted her away. Don't, don't touch me. Okay, okay, I won't touch you. I'm worried about you, Sophie. Before all this started, you were a kind, generous young woman. I want you to still be that when we find Ryan. We're not going to find Ryan. Come on, Nancy. You realised it before I did. We're screwed. Our food is gone, our water is gone, and soon there won't even be anywhere left to go. We head north, Sophie, same as always. Shit, we don't even know which way north is anymore. We could be walking in circles. Perhaps. But even if there's no hope, like you say, I still wouldn't change a thing. Setting out with you to find my boys was the right thing to do, and I'm grateful we did it. How could we have lived with ourselves if we'd have just stayed at home, hiding out while the world ends? Just look at what we survived these last few months. A slow starvation surrounded by death and monsters. Nancy shook her head and chuckled. I didn't say it's been pleasant, but you're a warrior, Sophie. You want my thanks, then okay, you have it. I see the sacrifices you've made. I see how strong you've had to be. And maybe I am weak. I don't want you too far over the line. It's better to fail at being who we are than becoming something awful to survive. You're worried about my soul? I think it's a bit late for that. It's never too late. I might never see my sons again, but at least I gained a daughter. She stepped towards Sophie with her arms out. Please, I don't want to fight with you. I'm sorry if I upset you. We started this together, and we've got so far. Let's not fall out now. Stay with me until the end. Sophie lowered her head and stepped forward, allowing Nancy to hug her. There they stood for several moments. Sophie didn't want to admit it, but it felt good. During the last few months, she had desensitized herself to everything around her. Her focus had been only the journey north. Hunger, boredom, 
fear and pain, she pushed them to the back of her mind to keep going, along with love, hope and compassion. Nancy's right. I'm losing myself. I'm never going to see Ryan again, am I? Nancy squeezed her. Probably not, sweetheart. But I love you for trying so hard to find him. He really was lucky to have found you. There's no one else I would have rather seen him settle down with. It sounds like you're saying goodbye. Sounds like you want me to. It's okay if you need to give up. I won't blame you. We've both done all we can. If you want to go take a seat up against that oak tree over there, we can rest up and wait for the end together. It was tempting. The thought of dying was not entirely unwelcome, which terrified her to the core. To be so calm on the brink of death, did that mean she had nothing left? Had life truly become so unbearable? She looked at Nancy, a woman who had always irritated her a little, and sometimes a lot. Since leaving Manchester, this woman had changed from being Ryan's mother to becoming hers. She was a physical burden, but emotionally, Sophie couldn't have made it this far without her. They were in this together, and that meant life wasn't completely empty. They had each other. I'm done, Nancy. I just want to rest now. Is that okay? Of course it is. Come on, sweetheart. They headed towards the large oak tree that Nancy had indicated. It stood in the middle of a grassy field, although the field didn't appear to be part of a farm estate. It was just a large field surrounded by woods, a piece of natural, unspoiled earth. They wouldn't have long to enjoy it. They stopped before they reached the tree because there was something lying at the foot of it. From ten feet away, the two of them gasped at what they saw. Completely out of the blue, they had discovered another person. The sleeping middle-aged man looked like a hobo, but these days everybody likely did, anyone who was left anyway. He had a thick unwashed beard and straggly blonde hair down past his ears, filthy clothes and odd shoes. Yet despite his dishevelled appearance, he was surrounded by food. He has meat, said Nancy. Look! Here were several sandwich bags on the ground next to the oak tree, each filled with scraps of cooked pale meat from something the man must have hunted and killed. Just past the oak tree was a small tent with a cooking stove, kettle and other supplies. Several bottles of water sat in a pile alongside a plastic tub full of what appeared to be biscuits. Where did he get all this? Sophie shrugged, keeping her voice to a whisper. I don't know. He obviously had a better plan than we did. Be quiet and let's grab what we can. What? No, we can't steal from him. He has more than enough, and he's probably capable of getting more. That doesn't matter, it's his food. I know that, but... Nancy stared hard at her. Please, Sophie, if the end is coming, be that kind, generous girl that Ryan fell in love with. Don't give yourself away for just one last meal. Sophie shook her head, unable to believe what she was hearing. They were both starving to death. You won't miss a little bit of food. You might be right. But he will still feel robbed and vulnerable. It's wrong, Sophie. Let's just wake him up instead. He might share. He might kill us. Not everyone is bad, remember? We can't control what others do, but we can choose who we want to be. Sophie thought things through. It would be so easy to just grab a couple of bags of meat and leave. It was enough food to get them through another couple of days. But the way Nancy was looking at her, she's right. Not everyone is bad. She had once been suspicious of Mike, but he had proven her wrong. He had been an honest man trying to take care of his stepdaughter. He had looked like a dishevelled hobo too. Sophie sighed. Okay, let's wake him up. Nancy smiled and nodded. It's all going to work out, you'll see. This is a sign that we should keep going. She cleared her throat and spoke louder. Sir? Excuse me, sir? Wake up! Hello there! Yoo-hoo! Sophie side-eyed her mother-in-law. Yoo-hoo? Seriously? Nancy shrugged, embarrassed. The man stirred, 
his eyes flickering behind the lids. His lips moved as though speaking. He lifted one knee so that he was no longer lying completely flat. Then his eyes opened and he bolted upright. Both women gasped in fright. It's okay, said Nancy, putting out her hands. We're friendly. The man leapt to his feet. A knife appeared in his hand. He started speaking, but the words weren't English. His accent sounded Polish, which reminded Sophie of a taxi driver she'd once used regularly not so long ago. A nice young man, working all hours of the night and day to send money home to his family. He was probably dead now. Easy, said Sophie, aware that she was unarmed because she no longer carried her golf club. After using it on Jake, it had been a gore-soaked reminder of what people had become. She tossed it in a stream full of infected green water two days ago. We're not looking for a fight. The man continued to rage at them, waving his knife around. There was a wound on his neck, scabbed over, but recent enough that it was still red around the edges. His left hand was also injured, coiled up like a tangled spring. He'd clearly been through some stuff. Your things, he said, you'll give them to me. What things? asked Sophie. The only thing we have is our clothes. He pointed the knife at Sophie's middle. Belt, give belt. No. He thrust the knife at her. You give. You, fuck off. He slashed at her face but missed. Sophie dodged back, hands out to protect herself. Hey, calm the hell down, there's no need for this. He swiped again. Nancy pleaded with him to stop, but he tried to slash at her too. Both women backed off, moving towards the man's tent. Oh my God, said Nancy, half turned away from her attacker. Sophie didn't know what was wrong. She stole a glance over her shoulder to see what Nancy had seen while attempting to keep one eye on the knife, trying to slice her. She saw the worst thing imaginable. A young boy, maybe not even yet a teenager, lay naked on a dark blue tarp, an arm cut off at the elbow a square patch of flesh missing from his plump stomach. Suddenly it was clear where this man had got his meat. Sophie shook her head at her man with the knife. You've been eating him? I not kill, he said. My cousin, he gets sick, he die. And you were too starved to let him go to waste? Sophie nodded, less disgusted than she ought to be. I get it. Look, Nancy and I are going to leave, okay? We only wanted to say hi. You clearly have your own things going on here. You stay. He looked her up and down. I don't mind you stay. You eat, we laugh, it's good. Ah, I'm going to head out. This isn't my scene, mate. I'm hungry, but not that hungry. We're sorry to have bothered you, said Nancy. The man strode forward, knife pointed at Sophie. You stay, or I beat you and tie you up. Sophie grabbed Nancy and stood in front of her. Get lost, all right? Touch us and I'll claw your goddamn eyes out. The man just laughed at her. I like you. Realizing that he wasn't going to give up, Sophie kicked at his balls. She hit her target, but the crotch of his jeans took the brunt of it. While she was off balance, he grabbed her and turned her around, wrapping an arm around her waist. He licked at her cheek. You're mine now. Nancy launched herself into the air, clawing at the man's face while he was busy with Sophie. Leave her the fuck alone! The man released Sophie and stumbled back, palm against his ragged forehead. He bellowed in a foreign language, fury mixed with madness. Then he flung himself at Nancy. Sophie got in the way. She punched their attacker in the side of the jaw. It rocked him hard enough to send him off course. Immediately she went to attack him again, but he spun around and backhanded the knife across the side of her arm. She squealed in pain as a tender flesh of her triceps parted and the man pounced on her. He rammed his bleeding forehead into the bridge of her nose and roared. Sophie had never had a broken nose before, but she knew she had one now. She crumpled to the floor, blinded in agony. The man proceeded to beat her, punching her over and over again. Every blow caused her vision to spiral. Darkness crept into the edges of her mind. Get off her! Nancy leapt onto the man's back, halting the attack. He spun around in a circle, trying to dislodge her. Sophie gritted her teeth and found the strength to get to her feet, 
her entire face throbbing. She had fallen beside the man's tent, and she looked around for something to use. On the top of the stove was a tin kettle with a handle on the top. She grabbed it, disappointed that it wasn't as heavy as she hoped for. It would have to do. She turned around, ready to rush to Nancy's aid. Something cold slid inside her. The crazed man stood in front of Sophie, his hand outstretched towards her. Looks like you will be food, he said. It's pity. Sophie looked down and saw the knife half buried in her belly button. She clutched herself. Hands quickly covered her own warm blood. Somewhere close by, Nancy screamed in anguish. Falling to her knees, Sophie dropped the kettle and it rolled away from her. The man stood over her, grinning like a maniac. Nancy had been wrong about not all people being bad. They were all that was left now. I'm sorry, lady, but we are all animals now. It was true. And Sophie realized that she had become one too. She had wanted to take from this man as he now wished to take from her. Guilt and innocence no longer existed. The rules had been wiped clean, and you were either starving or fed, alive or dead. You're the only animal here, Nancy screamed, and she knelt to grab the fallen kettle. Before the man could react, she swung it so hard that it whooshed through the air. It struck the side of his head with a meaty thud. His eyes crossed. He stumbled. Sophie felt like she was kneeling in crashing waves. She yanked the blade out of her stomach and examined it, finding oddly pretty the glistening sheen of metal mixed with the darkness of her blood. Even the coppery smell was pleasant. Nancy rushed over to her and snatched the life from her hand. It's okay, sweetheart. It's going to be okay. Sophie turned her head, distracted by movement. Weakly, she managed. Look out! Nancy turned to see the dazed man racing in to attack her. She reacted on instinct, throwing out her arms and planting the bloody knife in the right side of his neck. He dropped to one knee, gurgling and clutching at his jugular. He pulled the knife out and tossed it down. A jet of blood gushed out onto the grass. He died less than a minute later. Sophie was probably going to be joining him soon. She slumped onto her back, her body cold. Nancy knelt over her, cupping her face in both hands. Don't leave me, she begged. I can't be here without you. Come on, Sophie, come on. A gush of air escaped Sophie, and she found herself at peace. I love you, Nancy. Tell Ryan I love him too. You can tell him yourself, goddammit. Sophie thought about where she was heading next and smiled. She smiled because she thought Ryan might be there too. Maybe she really could tell him herself. Stay with me, Sophie. Please, stay. Ah, I, I can't. Sophie, stay with me. But she couldn't. Chapter 12 in the safety of the channel forged by Helper, it was possible to study the fungus up close. Aaron slowed his walk and peered at the fuzzy green stalks curiously as he passed them. They were made up of criss-crossed fibres, almost like a cotton tapestry dyed green. Crawling back and forth along those fibres were fat, four-legged slugs, smaller than those that came bursting out of infected animals, but clearly the same animal. Based on the size of the fungus field, there must have been millions of the disgusting critters. Maybe billions. And every one of them spreads the fungus. We're so close to the end. If this doesn't work out, the world doesn't have long left. Up ahead, the fungus stalks grew even taller. Five feet and above. Taller because they were older and had had more time to grow. The closer they got to Quiry Kell, the worse things would likely get. It was almost impossible to see the village now, especially since they had entered into the dip at the bottom of the hill. The fungus stalks in front seemed to sway. Helper stopped. His fans shimmered in the air. Ranger went and sat behind the alien, bum waggling, ears alert. What is it? asked Aaron. Why did you stop, Helper? Danger. There was no reason to ask Helper to elaborate, because the stalks began to part 
as creatures burst through the fungus field on all sides. There were flashes of white as talons whipped high above the stalks. Instinctively, everyone bunched up, facing outwards. Cameron clenched his fists and growled, The buggers led us into a trap! Aaron could read the concern coming off Helper, despite the alien having no human expression. He didn't! This is just the fight we signed up for! Cameron raised his rifle and fired a burst just as a green launched out of the stalks. Its chest opened up like a waxy husk and flakes of dead, infected flesh filled the air. Then half a dozen more greens attacked from the field. Aaron used his point two two as a club. Fiona, Teddy and Helen aimed handguns. Helper sliced the air with his blades. The greens fell easily, but they kept on coming. They were slightly different to those encountered before. Dried out and fragile. While it might have been his imagination, Aaron thought the air felt dry too. The atmosphere here is different. This place is no longer ours. At least until we take it back. Aaron swung his rifle and clubbed a green in the jaw. Its entire face ruptured and fell off its skull. He kicked it over with his foot, surprised by how light it was. When it hit the blackened ground, its whole body came apart. They're barely held together, said Fiona, firing a shot into what might have once been a young woman. It's like they're made out of leaves. It makes them easier to kill, said Cameron. I'll take it. Helen aimed and took the head off a swollen bellied green. She laughed afterwards, saying, Reckon that was Postman Pete. Never like that guy, pervert. Come on, said Aaron, realizing Helper was moving forward without them and reducing more of the fungus stalks to blackened mulch. Ranger was right beside the alien, leaping up and down and barking while keeping her distance from the attacking monsters. Perhaps the dog realized she was safest with Helper. Indeed, it seemed like he was trying his best to keep her in his protective orbit. There's more coming, Fiona warned. She was fumbling to put a new clip into her handgun. Three months ago, she'd never even held a gun. Helper lashed out at several greens ahead. Their bodies crumbled. Cameron bellowed in anger, holding the trigger on his SA-80 until it emptied, then swinging the rifle over his head like a warhammer. Helen was laughing, maniacally, kicking and striking with the grip of a handgun. They ran out of ammo fast, so it became a hopeless melee. More and more enemies launched themselves from the dense fungus field, hidden until the last moment by the giant stalks. Aaron lost his footing and stumbled backwards into the growth. The feel of the crispy fronds against his arms made him recoil. It was like being brushed by the fingers of a corpse. A green threw itself at Aaron. He held his point two two horizontal across his chest like a hockey stick and thrust out. The blow knocked the green's head back, its neck snapping like a rotten branch. It fell to its knees, with its skull dangling between its shoulder blades. Aaron then spun around and clocked a second green in the side of the head, right as it was about to lash out at him with a talon. The impact crushed its skull, but sent Aaron stumbling into the stalks. He tripped and fell, but quickly got back up. All he saw was green. He moved back towards the blackened pathway, but it wasn't there. He picked another direction, but couldn't find his friends. He heard their shouts, but they were muffled and indistinct. It was like being underwater. He was lost in an alien world. No, no, no! Something whipped out from beneath the stalks and sliced Aaron's arm. He began to bleed, but the pounding of his heart was the only thing he could think about. He was whipped a second time across the back of his skull. He spun around and swung his rifle into the stalks. The stalk connected with something soft and the attack stopped. Panicked, claustrophobic and injured, Aaron threw himself forward, swimming on his feet. He didn't know which direction to go, but he simply had to get away. Away from the alien landscape and away from this nightmare he found himself in. The sky was grey overhead. The ground was a carpet of mossy green. Everywhere he moved, giant stalks fought against him. 
He felt bugs on his skin. Help me! Help me! He thought he heard Cameron's voice, but it was far away, almost imagined. I, I can't get out! Ah! He bent over and started to hyperventilate. He threw out an arm, bending the stalks in front of him, but seeing nothing beyond them but more green. He was going to die in here, consumed by the very organism he had come to kill. I failed. Ryan gave his life to save me, and I ended up dead in the exact same place I left him. How many people died to keep me alive? Brett? Miles? Ryan? Boone? John? John? Aaron gasped as a thought occurred to him. He reached into his jacket and grabbed for the only other object he had. For a moment, he feared he would find the item to be lost, but when his fingers wrapped around the wooden compass, he sighed with relief. John had told him the compass was broken, that it always led him into trouble. That didn't sound good, but at least it might allow him to walk in a straight line. Right now, he couldn't tell left from right, and his friends only sounded further and further away. He flipped the lid on the compass and looked for the hand. It was pointing slightly left of north, but it remained dead set as he rotated the unit in his hand. The arm stayed in place, not moving so much as a millimetre. Perhaps following it would be a bad idea, but he could think of nothing else. He started moving, putting one foot in front of the other as he kept his eyes on the compass arm. His head throbbed where it had been slashed. Once again he was infected, but there was no time to worry about it now. If he somehow managed to reunite with the others, then he would have to pray that Helper could cure him a second time. If not, then there was nothing he could do about it anyway. He had no idea if he was heading north or what the compass was pointing at, but he began to gain confidence that he was at least moving in a straight line. The stalks rose overhead, getting taller and taller. That might mean he was getting closer to Quarry Kell and the older growth of the original spread. He just hoped his friends managed to find their way too. There was a high likelihood that he would never see them again, and it filled him with rage, rage bred from frustration and exhaustion. It pushed any sadness aside. There was another green up ahead, but it didn't seem to see Aaron. There was a bug on his arm, and he squashed it with his thumb. He lifted his rifle and eyed his unsuspecting enemy. Live or die, I'm here to do some damage. As if to spur Aaron on, the sun made an appearance overhead. There was a strange reddish tint to the predominantly grey sky, but the sun fought back with a weak white glow. It felt like it was fighting just as hard as Aaron to push back the enemy. Their enemy did not belong here. How far away are the aliens who sent the fungus? How far did Elpa travel to get here? We're not alone in the universe, and it is full of monsters. A green he had just killed lay two feet behind him. His rifle lay next to it. The stock splintered and broken after being used one too many times as a club. He was now unarmed and bleeding from two infected wounds. The back of his skull throbbed, the infection probably already on its way to his brain. It was impossible to see ahead, so he just followed the compass, hoping it would lead him somewhere. He just hoped he would get there before his body gave out. His breathing was ragged, and every now and then stars appeared in his vision. No question, he was in a bad way. And there were more threats coming his way. The stalks ahead began to sway, another green incoming. Aaron clenched his fists, painfully aware that he'd never been in a fistfight before. Without his rifle, he had nothing but his bare hands. The green broke free of the stalks, a grotesque male completely in the nude. His penis was a strand of green wire dangling between his swollen thighs. His right hand had been replaced by a tentacle and whip. Aaron threw a punch, but it was awkward and hit the side of the green's neck. Chunks of flesh came away, plastering his fist. But before he could throw a second punch, a talon whipped out and struck him in the stomach. The world became a vacuum. All the air escaped Aaron, and it was impossible to suck any more in. 
He clutched his stomach, hot blood seeping between his fingers. The impact had winded him, and all thoughts of fighting back abandoned him. As a mortal panic came over him, he gasped and tried to breathe, growing dizzy and falling to the spongy ground. This can't be it. No one will ever even find my body. The green was emotionless as it peered down at Aaron with one human eye and one fuzz-encrusted one. Its talon rose up in the air, preparing to whip at him again. If it struck Aaron's neck or an artery, it was game over. The problem was, his lungs had turned to stone and his body was barely obeying him. The stalks parted and another creature burst through. Instead of green, this one was brown and smaller. It rose up into the air, stretching out into the shape of a missile. Ranger collided with the green and knocked it to the ground. The dog then proceeded to tear and rip at the infected man's throat until his fragile spine snapped and his head rolled away like a football. Aaron caught a breath, sucking in air hungrily. His chest was flattened, but slowly the stabbing pain in his ribs went away and his lungs filled. He put a hand out anxiously towards Ranger, wondering if the dog had panicked and turned feral. But as soon as she saw him, she licked his fingers and wagged her tail. Aaron scratched her behind the ear, incredibly pleased to see her. Good girl, good girl. Ranger turned back to the stalks and seemed ready to dart away, but she stopped and looked back at him. She gave a short yip. Aaron clambered to his feet, wheezing and moaning. You want me to follow you, huh? Ranger yipped again, and when he took a step, she began moving through the stalks. He followed the dog as best he could, trying not to lose sight of her. Her bushy tail beat back and forth, hitting the fungus and creating a noise for him to follow. Aaron realized he was still holding the small compass, and as he looked at it, he saw that he was moving away from where it was pointing. As John had warned him, it only led to trouble. Ranger disappeared up ahead. Aaron was about to call out to bring her back when he broke free of the stalks and entered a blackened circle of dead fungus. There, the others lay on the ground, panting and injured. Helper was hurt too, his body crisscrossed with slices and blue blood oozing from his stony flesh. The alien was sitting, which was odd to look at, three stubbly legs spread out in front of it. We thought we lost you, little English, said Cameron, sitting on the ground and clutching a badly torn thigh. Helen and Fiona sat nearby nursing their own wounds. Teddy had a slash across his chest, adding to the wounds already there. We got it hard, said Teddy. Glad you're still on your feet, man. I guess this is the end, though, huh? Aaron groaned, dismayed to see his friends so hurt and hopeless. There was a dull despair in their eyes. Alper will heal us of our infections. It'll be okay. Cameron shrugged. Poor fellas as fecked as we are. He won't do his thing on any of us. Have you asked him? How? Aaron stepped towards the alien. Helper, heal, friends, allies. Helper shifted slightly. The large black eyes pointed at him. Death, broken, end. I think that means he's done, said Helen, chuckling to herself. She lay back on the blackened ground, seemingly at peace. Leave him be. Aaron took an unbalanced step and almost sprained an ankle. The jolt of pain revived him a little and he was then able to stand taller. We can't just lie here and give up. We didn't come only to get this far. Quarry Kel is right there. Look! Up the hill, the tops of the buildings were visible. The tallest was the twisted blackened spire of the burnt-down church. We have to keep moving! Cameron tried to get up, but his thigh gushed blood and he barked in pain. It was clear he was in unbearable agony. I'm sorry, little English. I can't move. I need to wrap this leg before I can even think about standing. I'll come, said Teddy. Although his voice was hardly audible, his breathing rattled. When he moved, it was like an old man in need of a cane. Aaron shook his head, 
realizing the lad wouldn't make it more than a few steps. Fiona might have been able to make it, but how long before the Greens attacked again and finished her off? We're all dead. So what do I have to lose? Aaron held up the compass and looked at it. It pointed right towards the hill, right towards Quirikel. If he followed it, it would take him right through the village and to McGregor's cottage beyond. There was still time to do this, but not if anyone was slowing him down. I've known you all for three months, he said. That's nothing really, but I love you all. I need you to know that. Cameron waved a hand. Silly bollocks. Fiona smiled. We know. I love you too, kid, said Helen. Aaron made eye contact with Teddy, who was frowning awkwardly. Not you, Teddy. I just met you. I meant I love the others. Give it time, he said. I'll grow on you. The only thing growing around here is the fungus, said Helen. And they think there'll be time for anyone to get to know you better, Teddy. Teddy shrugged. Still, at least we tried, huh? I'm kind of glad it went down like this, seeing this place. Gerard and the rest of us were living on borrowed time. At least my eyes are open. Aaron smiled, glad to see everyone handling their impending dooms as well as could be expected. He wished he could stick around and see out the end with them, but he had work to do. He went over to Fiona and took something out of his pocket. If Alper manages to heal you, deliver this to Sophie. She shook her head and narrowed her eyes. What? I don't understand. He made her take the letter from him, shoving it into her hand. Just do your best, okay? If you ever find my mam and Sophie, give them Ryan's letter, please. Of course, but I've got to go, said Aaron, before anyone could see what he was planning. He hurried to the edge of the blackened circle of ground, the green stalks towering over him. Cameron tried to get up again. The hell you doing, lad? Using the last of the time I have left. I can't sit around waiting to die, I'm sorry. What? Don't be a fool. Sit down, said Fiona. Don't leave us. Helen sat up. Oi, Aaron, come back here, you idiot. But Aaron gave them no chance to stop him. He leapt amongst the stalks and lifted his compass, following the arm as it pointed towards the village. He planned to make it all the way to McGregor's cabin with a single stop along the way. Aaron thought someone was chasing him through the stalks, but when he turned back, he saw that it was only Ranger. He laughed and patted the dog on the head. Teddy's going to get mad if you keep running off with me. You're his dog. The dog sat and wagged her tail, causing Aaron to reconsider. No, you're your own dog, aren't you? You're free. Thanks for coming along. The way ahead was tough. The stalks thick and high. Pushing them aside took effort. Each one heavy and stiff. Aaron sweated from the exertion, but also because the air was dry and hard to breathe. The ground was lumpy, things buried, overgrown with fungus. It might have been the mess left behind by the army, and when he reached a small mound shaped like a single-story building, he wondered if it was the petrol station on the edge of the village. That meant the pub would be close. Ryan is close. The fungus parted in places where the ground was too scorched to allow growth. It was in these places that Aaron tried to get his bearings, looking at the compass while tiptoeing to try and see as much as he could. Mostly he saw the tops of buildings, most covered in fungus, but some were scorched and blackened. He headed to the largest one he could see, recognising it. He kept waiting to be attacked, but he had encountered nothing since leaving his friends behind. Perhaps the Greens that had attacked previously were the only ones left. They had been so brittle and delicate, as if they had been slowly disintegrating. Aaron reached the remains of Dale's pub and stopped where he thought the main entrance used to be. The pub's interior was visible through small gaps in the fungus that grew over every window. It was blackened and burned out, the ceilings caved in and lying on the floor. There was no way inside, even if it wasn't encased in a thick growth of fungus. That didn't matter, though, because he had Fiona's words in his head. 
the story about the fox. It didn't matter if he could find Ryan's body or not. He was here, right next to where he had died. If there was anything close to a spirit, his brother would hear him. Ryan would be here. I feel him. Hey man, it's me. He took a step closer to the front doors, knowing his brother's remains were only metres away, buried inside. I miss you. Two months is a long time when it hurts, you know. I keep waiting for it to get better, but it doesn't. At least, not that part of things. Other things are better. I'm not alone for one thing. You left me with good people, family. Not blood or anything, but the closest thing. Cameron kept his word. He's been looking after me like you asked. He's a good man. Maybe he learned a thing or two from you. He shook his head and a tear spilled down his cheek. Everyone misses you, Ryan. We all remember what you did to get us out of this place. The last you knew of me, I was a self-centred kid. I'm trying really hard to be a man you'd be proud of. I'm probably going to fail, but I'm going back to McGregor's cottage to try and do something to help everyone. It matters that I'm trying, right? It's better to do something rather than nothing. It's what you'd have done. Aaron took a deep breath, feeling the life leaking out of him. His head throbbed and his arm raged with a fiery heat. He remembered back at the beginning when Sean had got infected up on the hill. It had taken his mind first. How long before things stopped making sense? Maybe they already had. Aaron might be walking around with talons hanging from his arms, only believing in his own mind that he was standing outside the pub saying goodbye to his brother. I love you, man. We'll be together again soon. Also, thanks a lot for inviting me to your stag do. It really sucked. He turned and began walking, but stopped to say one last thing. Oh, Man United forever! Ranger wagged her tail beside him, so he knelt to pat her. He gathered the dog up and held her for several moments, enjoying the earthy animal scent of her. She was the best reminder of all what life had once been. Man, animal, nature, it was all beautiful. Maybe the fungus was beautiful too. How was it any different to an English rose or an extravagant peacock? It was life doing what it needed to thrive. The fungus wasn't even here by choice, but now that it was, it merely wanted to live. The fungus was no more guilty than a bullet. The true villain was whoever had sent it here. That doesn't mean I don't want to watch the fungus burn. Aaron resumed his journey, studying the compass he still hoped would keep him going in a straight line. The village was a surreal landscape of scorched, lifeless earth and green, vibrant growth. The buildings were either blackened husks or mounds of green fungus. Beside the pub, the only structure he recognised was the church. Miraculously, its spire was neither burnt nor covered in fungus. High in the sky, it was the only thing in Quarry Kell that was as it used to be. A cross had never been a symbol of hope for him, but right now the cross gave him a surge of pride. It was a symbol of humanity rising above its enemy. It was time for Aaron to rise. The hill was two miles ahead, rising up towards the sky. Nestled midway up was the cottage where Aaron had begrudgingly come to celebrate his brother's impending marriage, a marriage that would now never happen. It was where all this had started, and it was where it would all end one way or another. Before he started the final leg of his journey, Aaron needed to rest. He knelt down and put out a hand to summon Ranger, but the dog kept her distance. She yipped at him, tail lowered. At first it was confusing, but then Aaron saw the thick black lines running down his arm. His veins had thickened beneath his skin, and the ragged wound on his forearm had turned a deep, dark green. The back of his head no longer throbbed, and when he fingered the area it felt fat and spongy. Ranger's wariness suddenly made sense. I don't have long left, do I, girl? It's okay. If you want to go, then go. Don't attack me, please. 
but Ranger stayed put. While she would no longer come to him, she stayed close. When he started walking again, she followed. It seemed she was content to keep an eye on him. The way ahead grew harder to navigate. Aaron had to rely completely on the compass. The stalks were taller than they'd ever been, ten feet tall. Ranger slunk left and right, zigzagging back and forth while Aaron had to shoulder his way forward. Two miles of this was going to be hell, and if he tried to take it slow, his time might run out. He was turning into a green, a dead man walking. I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing it for everyone else that's left. As he kept his eye on the compass, the arm suddenly began to change direction. He stopped dead. Then moving forward, the arm continued to turn, pointing slightly to his left. The further forward he walked, the more the compass pointed to the right. What are you attracted to? It's not north, is it? With his time running out, Aaron had little option but to see what had caused the compass to change direction. He turned to Ranger, who was three feet behind. Looks like we're going this way. Taking a shallow breath, Aaron swatted aside the stalks and followed the compass's new bearings. The fungus began to thin out, not as tall and not as thick. Eventually, it gave way completely to an area of blackened ground that went on for a hundred metres. In the centre of the clearing was a small, dark object. Perhaps the compass was pointing at that. When he got closer, he was sure of it. Aaron checked that Ranger was still with him. The dog was right on his heels, seeming a little less wary. For whatever reason, the fungus did not exist in the clearing. The fire had done its work, but it was more than that. There were patches of healthy, normal soil and the remnants of a road. The object ahead was wider at the top than the bottom. It was scorched and twisted. Aaron quickly realised what it was. It was a corkscrew, one of those that had fallen directly in the village. It had melted, puddled around the base like a spent candle. There was no fungus anywhere near it. It's dead, said Aaron. The fire in the village destroyed it. He turned to Ranger, excited. And the fungus around it is gone. Most of Quiry Cal was still, of course, covered in fungus. But as Aaron thought about it, he formed a theory. Perhaps all the remaining fungus here was from the corkscrew on the hill. While this corkscrew was dead, the one on the hill had worked overtime to claim the village by itself. One thing was clear. Any fungus that had emanated from this particular corkscrew was dead. There were clumps of it scattered all over the ground. It wasn't burnt or even rotten. It had liquefied into gelatinous globs. Aaron circled the dead corkscrew, keeping an eye on the compass. It followed the corkscrew, always pointing directly at it, until he reached a certain point where the needle began to flicker, hopping back and forth like it couldn't decide which way to go. At first it made no sense, but then Aaron realised what was happening. The compass pointed towards the corkscrews. They must give off a magnetic signal. John had said the compass had always led him into hot water, and that was because the compass always pointed towards the epicentre of the fungus outbreaks. The corkscrews. The compass was stuck between two destinations. The corkscrew he was standing beside, and another. The other must have been the corkscrew on the hill, responsible for the fungus inquiry Kell. It was time to finish this. Come on, Ranger. Let's go. Ranger growled and followed along. Chapter 13 Aaron didn't think he could make it. The ground underfoot shifted and moulded around his feet. It was like walking along a beach, and his shins ached more and more with every step. The stalks of fungus were like trees, blotting out all but the strongest rays of sunlight. It was cold and hard to breathe, an alien planet. Yet, Aaron continued, ranger alongside him, until he reached the part of the hillside where it flattened out. Twenty feet ahead, a blocky structure rose towards the sky. The cottage. 
The old place has gone to shit, said Aaron, shoving aside the stalks to get a better look. There was no way inside the building, and if not for him having been there before, it would have been impossible to tell what it had ever been. It was only its square shape that gave it away as something man-made. Nature didn't like corners. Maybe to quell his fears, Aaron spoke to Ranger. As much as he worried for himself, he worried for the animal. What had made her want to follow him? They were surrounded by fungus, and the fat little slugs were everywhere, dropping from stalks and writhing in the soil. Aaron swatted them off his arms and neck as if they were pesky gnats. There was little chance she didn't sense that he was infected. He could feel the fungus creeping beneath his skin, but she seemed to sense he was still himself too, for now. During the last twenty minutes, Aaron had begun to feel strange, outside of himself, feverish. There seemed to be a delay between his brain and his body. He had to plan every movement. His left arm was rotten, comprising black veins and green fuzz. He could barely move his fingers, which were swollen and discoloured. One of his fingernails was slipping away from its bed. Yet he experienced no pain, which didn't feel like a good thing. It made him feel even more inhuman. There was just one final act to accomplish, one last mountain to climb. The hill's peak rose directly behind the cottage. Upon that hill was the corkscrew that had crashed down onto the earth and spilled its deadly contents onto the rocky landscape. The same thing had happened in thousands of other places, but this particular one belonged to Aaron. It was his personal foe, the benefactor of all his misery. He was here to destroy it. Even if it destroys me? Aaron rounded the fungus-covered cottage and started up the hill. Ironically, it was easier to climb thanks to the green stalks now growing all over it. Aaron was able to grab hold and pull himself upwards. If the fungus was radiation, he would have been lethally exposed, but the fungus could only infect him once, and that horse had bolted. Perhaps Ranger realised it too, because she showed no concern about climbing the densely covered hill, even as the infectious bugs dropped all over her. Despite being easier to climb, the hill behind the cottage was still tall, and he had to stop several times to catch his breath. He looked at the compass while he breathed, and saw that it was pointing dead set up the hill. He was now certain that the corkscrews gave off some kind of magnetic field. Perhaps that was what had ruined all of the electronics. Would they work again once the corkscrews were broken? No, the electronics are already fried, and the dead one back in the village was still attracting the compass. Just focus on what you need to do. Aaron caught his breath and started to climb again. His vision was blurry, and there was immense pressure behind his left eye. It felt like he still had sand in his veins and caterpillars in his stomach. A voice in his head whispered at him to lie down, to just cease struggling and rest. It was a convincing voice, but it was joined by another. Ryan told him to keep going. You got this, our kid. Aaron kept on going. Behind him, Ranger growled. At first he thought she was growling a warning, but then Aaron realised the dog was growling at him. Her hackles were up. Easy, girl. Easy. I'm almost one of them. She's going to tear me throat out. Realising that Ranger was going to turn on him any minute, Aaron used everything he had to pull himself to the top of the hill. When the slope began to level out, he threw himself forward and flopped onto his hands and knees. He gasped and spluttered green sputum flinging from between his lips. His left hand split open between the middle and ring fingers, revealing a bony protuberance within. He was changing fast, much faster than Sean or Luby or Brett had. The infection in the back of his head hadn't far to travel. I still have time. I can do this. There were more whispers in his head. Friendly voices telling him that everything was okay and that it was fine to rest. They cared about him, the voices said. They wanted the pain to stop. Don't fucking listen to them, little bro. They're trying to mug you off. 
Sodding city supporters, mate, the lot of them. Aaron sneered. Down with the blues, mate. He clambered forward five metres on his hands before finally pushing himself back to his feet. Behind him, Ranger growled more and more fiercely, her head lowered and her flanks raised. She was preparing to attack. You're a good dog, Ranger. If you can give me just one more minute, okay? Good girl. Good girl, Ranger. The sound of the praise along with her name seemed to confuse the dog. Her growling cut off and she shuffled backwards a few steps. For a moment her tail wagged and Aaron felt safe enough to turn his back on the dog for a minute. A head was what he had come for. The corkscrew shone in the sunlight, its metallic surface shimmering. Green tendrils wove back and forth across it and a thick blanket of fungus covered the ground around it. The fungus stalks didn't grow in the immediate vicinity, leaving a circle eight feet wide around it, covered in a tapestry of thick green vines. No, not vines. Veins. The corkscrew was plumbed into the earth, pumping God knows what into the soil. The thing was a canister of hazardous material cracked open. Time to yank out the weeds, said Aaron, as he stumbled forward. His fierce desire to see the corkscrew destroyed was the only thing keeping him going, the only thing keeping total numbness at bay. But he quickly realised that he hadn't thought his plan through beyond simply getting here. Now that he had arrived upon the hill, how the hell did he destroy the corkscrew? His point two two was broken and discarded. His bare hands would do no good, and he only had one still under his control. He searched for a solution. But of course there was nothing around him but fungus. No, no, I can't get all this way and fail. I'm going to fucking destroy you, do you hear me? For Luby and Sean and Ryan and all of the people who died because of you, I'm going to kill you. Behind him came a growl. He turned, just as Ranger leapt, lunging towards his throat. He reacted just in time to deflect her snapping teeth and take the bite on his collarbone. The pain broke through the numbness and made him scream. He lashed out instinctively and Ranger yelped, letting go and rolling on the ground. She floundered for a moment, then got up and limped away, bleeding from her side. Aaron frowned. He raised his left arm and was horrified to see a talon hanging from the centre of his ruined hand. I'm one of them. No, I'm still me. Barely. Aaron stood before the corkscrew, glaring at it. He wished he could summon up the strength to rip the thing right out of the ground and hurl it back where it came from. There had to be a way. But all he had was the stupid compass pressed in his right palm. Movement in the corner of his eye caught his attention. He turned and saw something rising up to his left. The mossy fungus-covered ground was collecting together, forming a mound that grew and grew. Something began to take shape. The whispers got louder, demanding that Aaron give in, to join. Join. Rest. Be one. Join. The green mass resembled some kind of perverted snowman, round and indistinct. Then slowly the details emerged. First a twisted torso, then arms. Next came a face. Not just one face. There were many each appearing for only a split second like a stack of photographs falling away. Luby, Sean, Brett, Miles and dozens more, all victims of the fungus, all people who had joined, the same faces over and over again. Aaron stood straight as he could manage. Show me someone else, sir. Show me someone who wasn't infected up here on the hill. How about all the people in India or China? Show me someone different. Go on. The same faces kept appearing, maybe a hundred in total, but all the same. You can't, can you? He sneered, hoping the beast could feel shame and embarrassment. You can only show me the faces of people you infected in Quarry Kell because you're cut off. You're an individual payload, a special forces soldier behind enemy lines. I destroy you and this whole place will be free of you. Then on to the next, and the next, and the next. You're not going to win because you isolated every one of you. Join. You're afraid. You're powerless. 
Your people are gone. Not all of us. Civilization started with a single flame. We're going to beat you. The mass rose up higher, still sporting the faces of the friends and strangers. Aaron was rooted to the spot, and when he looked down, he saw his ankles were buried deep in the mossy floor. His body was convulsing. He tensed, then relaxed, tensed, then relaxed. Something was fighting for control of it. He tried to fight it. A tentacle formed out of the mass and whipped through the air. It wrapped around Aaron's throat and tore him from the ground, lifting him four feet in the air. His airways were cut off, but he didn't struggle. Breathing seemed unnecessary now. Luby's face glared at him, formed of green fibres and glistening tendrils. It seemed to mock him with an inhumane smirk, but Aaron just grunted and smiled. He fought with the tentacles around his neck, opening up his airway enough to speak. You can't use him against me. You can't make his face, can you? Because he died being a hero. He beat you. All shall lose. All shall join. The cataclysm comes. Fuck you! Aaron lifted his right hand, which was barely under his control. He still held the compass, the lid open. With his numb thumb, he fumbled in the space beneath the catch. A lens caught the sunlight the tiny magnifying glass sliding free. My friend taught me this trick. Aaron held the magnifying glass up to the sun, which seemed to shine even brighter. It was on his side, a part of the natural order that did not want this invader here any more than he did. Just like when John had shown him, nothing happened, and he began to fear it wouldn't work. But then a tiny slither of smoke appeared. Aaron couldn't breathe or even move his face, but a thrill shot through his veins as the smoke grew thicker. It emanated from the tentacle around his throat. The flame grew slowly, like a distant vehicle coming into view on the highway. Gradually it got bigger and bigger until it was too large to ignore. It began to spread along the tentacles towards the large mass of fungus. Its face contorted in terror. Yes, Aaron thought. Let this whole place burn. The tentacle removed itself from Aaron's throat and recoiled as the flame took hold. The crisp, dry fibres went up like tinder and soon an inferno found life. Aaron stumbled away, gravity and momentum taking him rather than his legs. He fell to the ground a few feet from the corkscrew. Ranger raced across the hill and leapt on him, proceeding to tear into his left arm, already rotten and ruined from the infection. That was okay. She could take the wretched thing. It was no longer a part of him. You will suffer, came the whispers. You shall join. Up yours, said Aaron, as the dog continued to savage him. And then he was gone. Lost in the whispering darkness, as a great fire rose up around him. Cameron could barely walk but Helper did something with his fans that numbed his wounds. The alien was wounded too, but it seemed to have caught a second wind. All of them bled from their infected wounds, but the alien's vibrating blue fans seemed to keep the infection from spreading. Fiona, Helen and Teddy all held on to one another, helping each other to walk. They were a spent force, no doubt, but they weren't going to let Aaron die alone. As soon as they had found the strength, they set off into the village. Helper worked much slower than before, making strange mewing sounds every now and then that showed the creature felt pain just like they did. The infection didn't seem to take root in the alien's wounds, but they did bleed a lot. Blue blood, thought Cameron. I always hated blue bloods until now. The cottage is just up there, he told Teddy who grabbed him under the arm when he saw he was flagging. That's where the little English is heading. He couldn't have made it much faster than us, said Teddy. Not without helper. It was true that the way ahead was much easier going with the alien killing off the fungus and forming a pathway. Aaron would have had to fight for every inch. Ranger, Teddy yelled, like he had been doing for the last half hour. The dog had run off into the stalks, possibly following Aaron. Cameron didn't see much help for the dog. 
he didn't see much help for any of them. I'm infected to buggery. How much time do you have left until I'm one of them green bastards? I spent the rest of my life as a Celtic. There are worse ways to die. I'm not sure I can make it, said Helen. Her boozing and lazing about from the last few months had caught up with her, and she looked a hundred years old. Fiona propped her up and told her to keep going. Not much further to go. You've got this, Helen. Think about your boy. We have a chance to kill this thing. If Aaron's theory is right, said Teddy. That kid is always right, said Cameron. Ever since the beginning, Aaron has had this thing's number. I don't listen to him in Cold Drake, but I should have. Blanket, said Helper. Blanket, enemy, death. Aye, said Cameron. It's right up there, eh? Blanket, death, fire. Cameron frowned. What's that now? He said fire. Fiona sniffed the air. Hey, do you smell that? Everyone took a moment to sniff. Then everyone nodded. Something's burning, said Helen. Do you think, do you think Aaron did it? Teddy gasped and then leapt up and down. Ranger, come here, girl. The dog came bounding down the hill, tail wagging back and forth. Her fur was matted, and when she got close enough, it became clear that she was hurt, cut on the side. Teddy made a fuss of her and groaned when his hand came back bloody. Shit, girl, what happened? Now she had reached them, the dog flopped to the ground, hurt and exhausted. Her tongue lolled out and she began to pant. Cameron couldn't be certain, but she looked at death's door. Teddy seemed to realise it too, because he fell silent kneeling next to the dog and stroking her softly. That's it, girl. You rest now. Everything's going to be okay. Good girl. Helper turned and barged past Cameron. Dog! Ally! Friend! Easy! Easy! Everyone stayed still while Helper got to work. They had learned to let the alien just do what it wanted to. He always had his reasons. Teddy slid back slightly as the alien approached, and he didn't even protest when Helper flopped down on top of Ranger. The dog yelped and struggled, understandably panicked, but there was nothing she could do. Two minutes later, Helper rose back to his feet and staggered aside. Once again, the alien seemed hurt and exhausted. But Ranger sprang to her feet, wagging her tail and hopping back and forth, Tears gushed down Teddy's cheeks and his mouth stretched into the widest smile. Something's burning up there, said Fiona, pointing up the hill. Black smoke rose into the air, the source not yet in sight. Ranger yipped and bolted away. Teddy ran after her, his tiredness suddenly forgotten. Come on, said Cameron. Adam might need our help. The three of them set off as quickly as their wounds would allow, dog and alien in tow. Fifteen minutes later, they were barely able to stay on their feet, but they reached McGregor's cottage. The old place was covered in two things, fungus and fire. The entire hillside was aflame. The fungus was burning to a crisp. There was no sign of Aaron. Ranger bolted around behind the burning cottage, scurrying up the remaining hill. There were few places to go that weren't on fire, but the animal found a way. Teddy called after her, but she wouldn't return. Aaron, said Cameron, and then he yelled it. When there was no reply, he began to fear the worst. He must be up there. He said the corkscrew was up on the hill. He turned his back to his companions. Two women he had known for what seemed like a lifetime, and a young lad who he had recently tried to kill. They were good people but they were tired, hurt, and defeated. This is the only time I've ever been of use. I was never good at anything, but I'm good at this. I'm good at taking care of the people I care about. And I care about that fucking kid too much to leave him up there alone. Wait here, said Cameron, and he rushed around the cottage on his stiff wounded leg. Payne demanded him to stop, but he'd never taken orders from anybody. So he wasn't about to start now. I'm coming for you, little English. Aaron opened his eyes and saw darkness. He realised that it was the sky, stained with smoke. 
He tasted fire at the back of his throat and spat and coughed. Heat licked his skin with a needled tongue, but he was too numb to feel anything else. The whispers had gone. He turned his head, looking for the corkscrew, and saw it aflame. It gave off a high-pitched squeal like an old-fashioned kettle boiling. The fungus around its base was shriveling in the heat consumed by the fire. The flames consumed everything, spread out several meters from the melting mass that had risen to taunt Aaron with the faces of his dead friends. Soon the fire would reach Aaron's legs and reduce him to ash. But he had done what he came here to do. I did it. I destroyed it. Too right you did, our kid, said Ryan. Nice one. Aaron relaxed and almost accepted his fate. But some tiny spark inside him got him moving. Weak and wounded, he dragged himself, one-handed, across the warm ground. He couldn't help but look back at the corkscrew, enjoying the sight of it burning. The inferno grew all around him. He had to move faster. His legs slowly returned their control to him, and he kicked at the mossy ground. He used his hand to claw at the stalks and pull himself forward. Sweat poured down his back. His burning flesh cried out. He was already dead, yet he desperately clawed and kicked to stay alive. Despite his victory, he didn't want to die here alone. Maybe if he could just make it back down the hill. But he couldn't. The small reserve of energy he had summoned ran out and he slumped face down in the fungus. He had only enough strength to lift his head. The fungus beneath him was dying. Even though the fire hadn't reached it, Aaron could clearly see that the fungus was sickened. Several fat bugs lay dead amongst the fibres. The mossy undergrowth began to wilt. The tall stalks either side of Aaron began to topple over, unable to hold their own weight as their roots shriveled. The fire ate up the landscape, a force even more destructive than the fungus. But its spreading ruination was welcome. Aaron was done. His death was a favour to all those who still lived. And although he didn't welcome his end, he could at least accept it. He began to sing a song chosen by his brain at random. Three Lions a song of hope and victory, of lost battles and friends remembered. And it was an absolute banger. Bloody racket! Aaron jolted, unsure if he'd heard a voice up there on the hill with him. Cameron appeared on the mossy ground beside him. Aaron couldn't lift his head enough to look up, but he knew the big Scot's heavy black boots. He also knew his voice. You bloody English never win a sodding thing, so stop with your singing! Aaron groaned in pain. Come? Hey, lad, come on. Let's get you to a designated assembly point. Aaron almost passed out again as Cameron grabbed him by the arm. It was only the sound of his friend's startled gasps that shocked him back awake. What is it, Cam? It's now, lad. Let's go, I've got you. This time, Aaron did pass out. Ready to die or be rescued. He would let fate decide which. Aaron fell in and out of consciousness as Cameron and the others dragged him through the twisted remains of Quidrakel. Everywhere he looked, the fungus stalks were toppling over and turning black. The fire was yet to make it down the hill, but it had done the damage when it had destroyed the corkscrew. Helper had been right. The fungus was dying. Aaron had fantasies of a clean and safe Scotland, but it was probably unlikely to be that simple. What would the landscape look like once the fungus receded? Would the earth be blackened and dead, or would it bounce back to life, nature reclaiming it? Aaron wasn't sure he would get to find out. He felt no pain and was too weak to look at himself, but he was aware of the way his friends kept looking at him. Concern and horror that was what their expressions conveyed. Whatever state Aaron was in, it was bad. I'm dying. They came to a stop on blackened ground, and Aaron was vaguely aware that it was the clearing around the other corkscrew, 
the one that had been destroyed by the previous fire. I need to catch my breath, said Cameron. I think we have some time. Aaron turned his head and saw smoke rising in the distance. They had outrun the inferno. Scale late, said Teddy, shuffling from foot to foot. We need to get out of here soon. And how are we going to deal with... I just need a minute, said Cameron. He sounded stressed. Me too, said Helen. And she sounded hollow. Something was definitely wrong. Aaron tried to sit up, but found himself stuck in limbo between upright and lying down. His abdomen trembled with the effort until Fiona came and propped him up from behind. Is everything okay? he asked. Is anyone hurt? Of course they are. They're all infected. Is that why they look so worried? We're fine, said Cameron, and it was true. While Aaron had left his friends weak and wounded, they only seemed tired now. Their wounds were caked in dried blood and dirt, but there was no fungus winding its way around their limbs. Had Helper healed them? The alien stood on the edge of the clearing, completely still, completely at peace. I think we're okay, said Fiona, kneeling and allowing Aaron to use her leg as a backrest. Helper kept the infection at bay at first, but when the fire started... We're not infected anymore, said Cameron. He looked down at his thigh, which was torn above the knee, but clean and healthy insofar that a wound could be. I can feel that nasty shite running through my veins. But since the fire, the feeling stopped. When you destroyed the corkscrew, it killed the fungus growing inside us. Helen nodded. It's all connected. Look around, it's all dying off. It's a beautiful sight, said Teddy. He knelt beside Ranger, scratching the base of her tail. Aaron grinned. His friends were going to be okay. They had been victorious in their quest. He felt pretty awesome right now. But that didn't stop him from lurching forward and moaning as a sudden bout of agony seized him in the middle. Black bile and rancid filth burst forth from his throat. It kept on coming, chunks and chunks of it spattering the blackened earth. The sound he made was demonic and he thought he was going to turn inside out. At the same time, it was purifying, the foulest being purged from his body. Minutes later, he was finally done. He slumped backwards into Fiona's arms and gasped, I'm okay. The fungus is gone. We did it. And I'm not going to die. It seemed impossible to imagine. He had been certain the end was near up on that hill. He remembered fading away as Ranger ravaged his flesh and the fire raged. Now he felt closer to life than death. It was a miracle. And Ryan was still with him. I never left our kid. Cartwright brothers don't stay down. Aaron smiled. We're going to win this war. The fungus was afraid of me up there. I felt its fear. We have to destroy all the corkscrews. Aye, said Cameron. We will. Why did he sound so sad saying it? Helper moved beside Aaron and flapped his fans for a minute. Then he let them drop almost defeatedly. Aaron, blanket. Aaron, blanket. Ranger trotted up beside the alien. She was wagging her tail, but she also eyed Aaron warily. In fact, everyone was eyeing him warily. What were they so concerned about? What? Aaron asked them all. What is it? Why are you all looking at me like that? It's your arm, said Helen, nodding to his left. I think you should take a breath and look at yourself. My arm is gone. Ranger tore it off. So why doesn't it hurt? And why can I still feel it? With a knot in his stomach, Aaron slowly turned his head. As he feared, his left arm was gone. Strips of muscle and pink flesh remained in places, but no bones, only flaps of skin. And something else. Shock made him try to lift his arm, even though it was gone. Something moved, flapping on the ground like a fish on land. Then something heavy and sharp leapt a foot in the air. Feck me, said Cameron, and everyone dodged away from him. The only one who stayed put was Fiona, who continued to hold him up in a sitting position. Aaron yelled in fright as he saw the tentacle flapping at his side. 
It was connected to him. He could feel it. Every time he tensed, it thrashed on the ground. Ranger growled. Helper raised his fans again and made them flicker. Aaron clambered to his feet, screaming. The talon at the end of the tentacle, his tentacle, slashed at the air, slicing only a foot from Cameron's face. It's one of them, said Teddy. I warned you. Shut up, said Cameron. No, Aaron cried. I'm not one of them. I'm not. I'm still me. He backed away, tentacle whipping back and forth in front of him. Please, somebody help me. This can't be true. This can't be true. What's happened to me? Help me. But all his friends did was back away. Chapter 14 the subtle scent of wet grass, cold rain on her face. For a moment, Sophie thought she had died and gone to some peaceful place, made only to pleasure her senses. But then she opened her eyes and saw a darkening sky. She heard Nancy's screams. She wasn't dead. Not yet. She felt sick, nauseous and fevered. Her body felt light and disconnected, like it was trying to get away from her. The ground was hard, causing the back of her head to ache. It's going to be okay, Sophie. I'm going to get help. She started screaming at the top of her lungs, but it brought Sophie no comfort. There was no help to find. The world was dead, and the few people still alive were like the man who had stabbed her the man who had been eating his dead nephew. Humanity was corrupt, people now lesser than animals. Soon they wouldn't even be that. They would be ashes feeding the earth. It was over. Please don't let it be over. Nancy continued screaming, begging for God to help. Her vacant exhaustion had gone away and she was frantic, yelling until her voice grew hoarse. Nancy, stop. It's okay. It took several moments to convince her mother-in-law, but eventually she seemed to accept the reality of the situation and knelt down beside Sophie. She sobbed, cupping Sophie's cheek in her hand. I'm so sorry. I was weak. You would have been better off without me. No, you were strong. Sophie smiled, but she was unable to turn her head and look at Nancy. She could only see the sky. You kept us both human. You kept us from turning into monsters. It's okay for me to die. It's fucking well not. I'll never forgive you if you leave me like this. Nancy. No, Sophie. I refuse to let you die. I'm going to find help. Sophie moaned. Stay with me. Just stay. I have to do something. Nancy choked back a sob. I can't let you die. Just hold me, please. Nancy grunted, but it was only a few seconds before she gathered Sophie up onto her lap. Finally, Sophie could see her mother-in-law's face. She appeared ancient, with dirty skin like tissue paper. Tears streamed down her cheeks, cutting lines through the mud. Oh, Sophie, we were so close, we came so far. A lengthy breath escaped Sophie's lips, and her mouth grew dry. Thirsty? Of course, let me get you some water. Nancy placed her down gently on the grass and stepped away. Sophie looked up at the sky again, surprised to see a pair of birds skimming across her vision. Birds had been so rare over the last week. It was nice to see some alive. It made her feel less alone. She licked at her dry lips, anticipating the cold kiss of the water Nancy was fetching for her. It wasn't much of a last meal, but she would enjoy it all the same. But Nancy didn't come back. Nancy? Nancy, where are you? She got no reply. She might have panicked, but she had nothing left to fear. It was more confusion, she felt, than fear. Where had her mother-in-law suddenly gone? And what is all that noise? Sophie realised she could hear voices and the clinking of metal in time with hurried footsteps, lots of hurried footsteps. As the voices got closer, she started to make out words. Army, heading south, 
Call Drake. Sophie used all the energy she had left to turn her head. When she managed, she was shocked. Several dozen men and women were racing across the field towards her. Nancy was with them, waving her arms and pointing ahead. She found help. She actually found help. Nancy made it back to Sophie and dropped onto the grass beside her. It's the army, she said excitedly. They've come from north of the border. They heard me shouting, we're saved. Ryan, Aaron, are they? I don't know, sweetheart. There was no time to ask. All I care about right now is you not dying, so don't, okay? Let these people help you. They have a medic. Okay, said Sophie, dreamily, growing tired in an instant. I won't die. She didn't die, but she did pass out. The End This has been The Spread, Book 4, The Road. Written by Ian Rob Wright. Narrated by Aubrey Parsons. Copyright 2021 by Ian Rob Wright. Production copyright by Ian Rob Wright. The Spread, Book 5, Turning Point. Written by Ian Rob Wright. Narrated by Aubrey Parsons. Chapter 1 A curdling at the back of the throat. Thick odours mingling in the sinuses, sweat and chemicals. Sophie opened her eyes. Where am I? A knife? I was stabbed. I died, didn't I? She tried to move, but found her body stiff, like it was encased in setting cement. It took effort to lift her head from what felt like a cheap pillow and blink the blariness from her eyes. Opposite, she saw an old woman sleeping fitfully in a narrow bed, a drip stand raising beside her and a tiny blinking monitor to her left. I'm in a hospital, thought Sophie. I'm alive. But the world has ended. What did I imagine it all? Please say I did. She slid an elbow beneath herself and shuffled painfully up the bed. Fish hooks tore at her abdomen, yet pain seemed somehow distant. Her body felt dull. Had she been given pain relief? The room she was in was cavernous, with a shiny wooden floor. A basketball hoop fastened to one wall made her realise she was lying on a trolley bed inside a gym, along with two dozen strangers. A pair of women in white tabards potted about at the back of the room, which was an area cluttered with cheap desks and wheeled filing cabinets. Only a few of the room's patients were on their feet, walking gingerly back and forth. All around, monitors beeped in and out of time, each keeping to their own rhythm. Sophie? Sophie jerked her head to the left, and she paid the price as a jolt of electricity shot through her neck. The pain was worth it, though, when she saw who was coming running towards her. Nan Nancy, what's happening? Where are we? Nancy smiled, but the expression didn't reach her eyes. She hurried through the space between the rows of trolley beds, clutching a mug of steaming hot liquid in a trembling hand. Everything's fine, honey, she said. You were hurt. But they've been taking care of you here. Where is here? Edinburgh. We made it. We made it across the border. And then some, after that psychopath stabbed you. Nancy shook her head and scowled, as if the very memory angered her. You were in a bad way. Luckily the army found us and brought us here. You almost died, Sophie, but... She shook her head again, and this time it looked like she was fighting back tears. You've been unconscious for three days. I've been so worried. Three days? I've been out for three days. Ah, I'm sorry, Nancy. Don't be silly. All that matters is that you're okay. Sophie felt tired in every cell of her body. She could barely believe she'd been asleep for so long. Are things still bad? Nancy sat down on the bed and offered Sophie her weak-looking tea. Sophie declined. Her throat felt swollen. Her stomach was unsettled. 
All she wanted to know was what was going on. Yes, things are still bad, said Nancy, but I don't know how bad. From the number of patients coming through here each day, things don't seem to be getting better, that's for sure. Although, Sophie shuffled up in the bed a little more, now almost sitting. What? What is it? There's an area everyone goes to at night to relax. I think it was an indoor market before, but now it's a gathering square where people can get a little alcohol and junk food. Anyway, last night a group of off-duty soldiers seemed excited about something. It sounded like good news. Sophie rubbed at her eyes, which were still blurry. We can only hope. Thanks, Nancy, for staying with me. You look tired. Ha! <laughs> I'm beyond tired, honey. Tired was two months ago. I thought we were going to die out there out on the road. Now that we're safe and sound, I think it's all finally caught up with me. I feel like I could sleep for a thousand years. She covered her mouth with a fist and coughed. <laughs> Make that two thousand. Sophie reached out and cupped Nancy's wrinkled hand on the bed. How many people are in the city? Do you think Ryan and Aaron could be here? Have you found anything out? Nancy shook her head. I've asked a dozen people about my boys, but nobody knows a thing. They say the North was completely covered by the fungus. No survivors. I hate to say it, Sophie. In fact, I can barely even think it, but... Don't give up, Nancy. We've made it this far. Ryan and Aaron could have too. Ryan's strong, she smiled, like his mam. Nancy smiled back at her but it still failed to reach her eyes, which were underscored with dark bags. She sipped her tea and let out a weary sigh. For a moment they both just sat there in silence, listening to the beep, beep, beep of the monitors. Some of the patients appeared to be in a bad way, hooked up to ventilators and covered with wires. Others were awake reading magazines and paperbacks. None of them were cheerful. Even if they recovered from their injuries, it wouldn't make the situation outside any better. Why are all these people being treated inside a gym? asked Sophie. Surely the city has hospitals? Nancy nodded. Yes, but they're all full. It seems half of Scotland made its way here after the invasion. You can barely move outside in the streets. Invasion? Is that what they're calling it? Aliens, that's what everyone says. Not so unbelievable at this point, is it? Still, crazy to have it confirmed. There was a sudden kerfuffle at the far end of the gym, causing both Sophie and Nancy to turn their heads. Nancy's expression turned grim, and she put a hand on Sophie's shoulder. You're not going to want to watch this, honey. Sophie was about to ask what she meant, but then fell to silence as a pair of uniformed officers marched into the gym, heavy boots clomping against the wood. Their sandy-covered trousers made it look as though they'd just come from fighting in the desert, and each shouldered a combat rifle, but ignored them in favour of handguns. A nurse led the soldiers over to a bed where an elderly woman was coughing and spluttering. When the patient saw the armed men approaching her, she wailed and begged, one of her flapping arms was discoloured and strangely elongated. Without a word, one of the soldiers shot the woman in the face with his handgun. Her body slumped back against the pillow, and the nurse quickly pulled a blanket over her. Blood seeped through the white linen. Sophie covered her mouth to keep from yelping. Nancy grabbed her and pulled her into a hug which caused a stab of pain to shoot through her abdomen, but she didn't resist it. What? What just happened, Nancy? She whispered. That woman must have been infected, Nancy whispered back. I've seen it happen a dozen times. There's no way to help the infected, and they're a danger to everyone, so nobody takes any chances. Ah, I understand. This is war, I guess. It's something all right. The soldiers marched out of the room, and the nurses started spraying the bed down with chemicals. Most of the conscious patients in the room barely reacted, 
It was clearly a normal occurrence. Nancy eased Sophie back down on the pillow. You need to get your rest, honey. There's nothing for you to worry about. Sophie tried to get comfortable, but failed. Her body was still stiff, and a cramp kept threatening to seize her calf. How long had Nancy said she'd been lying here? Three days? That was crazy. The last thing she'd remembered was walking through a field, then encountering a crazy cannibal who had stabbed her. Her memory was blank after that. Am I allowed to get out of bed? she asked. I, I want to stretch my legs and get some air. Nancy raised her eyebrow, the first expression to make it past her mouth. Are you sure that's a good idea? I don't know. But I don't feel good just lying here. I want to move about. Okay, let me fetch a nurse. Sophie licked her lips. Water, too. Thanks, Nancy. No problem, just relax. Sophie settled on her pillow and stared at the high ceiling. The events of the last few months filtered through her mind. The chaos early on at the supermarket. Mike and Maisie hiding out in the woods. Her bludgeoning Jake, a boy, to death with a golf club. The nightmare had grown only worse, never better. But now, was she truly safe? Should she stay here and give up the search for Ryan? Perhaps he would find his way here. Or is Nancy right? Are you gone, Ryan? Are you gone? I can't believe that. I feel you out there. I know you're still alive. We're going to find our way back to each other. Nancy returned a few minutes later with a plump Indian woman wearing a name tag reading Sheev. She didn't look happy about the notion of Sophie getting out of bed, but Sophie persisted until the woman agreed. First, however, she was required to have an assessment, which turned out to be a harsh groping as Sheev checked every inch of Sophie's naked body for infection. By the time the woman was done, Sophie's flesh was red raw. The area around her stitched-up abdominal wound was an angry purple. You don't have any signs of infection, said Sheev, sounding disturbingly close to disappointed. I'll get you some painkillers, but I want you back in bed in two hours. And if your stitches bust, you can bleed out because we have none to spare. You need to work on your bedside manner, said Sophie, but the nurse didn't dignify it with a response. She handed Sophie some painkillers in a small paper cup, while Nancy handed her some water to wash them down with. Once Sophie had swallowed the medicine, she got dressed with Nancy's help and prepared to leave. What am I doing? All that time on the road and I finally have a chance to rest. Why am I so restless? Sophie's tummy turned a somersault. Inside the gym she was a patient to be looked after, but she had no idea what to expect outside. To add to that, she was in pain and her body was stiff. Walking around would be an ordeal, so why was she so adamant to do so? Nancy and I stayed alive on the road because we kept moving. If we'd have stayed in one place, we'd never have made it. It took Sophie almost an entire minute to take her first step, and the razor blades in her abdomen took her breath away. Easy does it, said Nancy, and she took Sophie under the arm, helping her to amble over to the exit which was a set of double doors at the far end of the gym. The exit led out into a carpeted reception area with a high desk and a set of chairs arranged around a circular table. Old fitness posters hung from the walls and a bank of empty vending machines sat against one wall. Shiny brochures littered the floor, advertising a gym that was now a makeshift hospital. New people flood into the city every day, explained Nancy. Not sure if that's a good or bad thing. I suppose, said Sophie between laboured breaths. It's both. At least there are still people surviving. I was beginning to worry we were all that was left. Us and the lunatics. She rubbed at her bandaged stomach where she'd been stabbed. Surprisingly, it just felt like a severe bruise. Nancy rubbed Sophie's arm. You're safe. He got what he deserved. 
but he gave me something to remember him, huh? Or a reminder of how strong you are. They exited the gym building and stepped out onto a cobbled road that made up a wide thoroughfare. Food banks operated on both sides of the street, overseen by soldiers. Long lines of people trailed off in both directions. The air stank of smoke, tasted like weak vinegar. Sophie sniffed. I smell burning. Nancy wrinkled her nose. Bodies, rubbish, fuel. Fires burn constantly all over the city. Keeps everyone warm, but the smell never goes away. All these people lining up for food? Is there enough to feed everyone? Seems to be for now. Everyone gets a ration ticket every day that they can use whenever they want. I ate this morning. Dried noodles and this horrible strip of chewy meat. I'm hoping it was beef jerky, but I have me doubts. It wasn't a Mackey's breakfast, that's for sure. Be starving, though. The nurses will feed you, so you don't need to worry about queuing up yet. In fact, you got the best of it. I spent last night to sleep on the floor of a public library. The back's killing me. Sophie stopped, out of breath, but also wanting to study Nancy. Are you holding up okay? You look exhausted. I'm doing better than most. Better than you, in fact. But why don't we just... A ringing bell cut her off, a noble sound reminding Sophie of church weddings and the news at ten. It was also jarring. What? What's that? The main gates are opening, said Nancy. Someone's coming in or going out. Sophie pictured Ryan staggering into the city and calling out her name. It was ridiculously hopeful, but she couldn't help herself. Do you know the way? she asked. I want to see. Nancy took her arm and led them cautiously along the thoroughfare. Sophie had never visited Edinburgh before. Its majesty surprised her. Every building seemed old and distinguished, witness to kings and queens and the passing of years in the hundreds. Part of the city slept upon a hill, a grey sky hanging over the angled roofs and jagged spires. Fortunately, the city gates, which were really just a gap in a vast makeshift wall comprised of razor wire and mesh, were less than a mile from the gym. So Sophie was just about able to make it there with Nancy's help, although the pain in her abdomen was starting to nauseate her. En route, she had seen the appalling state of the ancient city. Dishevelled, underfed zombies slept in doorways and bus shelters, while filthy children played in streets without the eyes of parents upon them. A bleak tapestry of misery, with barely a bright spark to be seen. Humanity hanging on by a thread. Sophie bent over and took in a deep, painful breath. I know the feeling. Are you okay, honey? Yeah, I just... Maybe this was a bad idea. You want to go back? That's after coming all this way. I'll be okay, let's just keep moving. Okay, well, here's the gate, said Nancy. And she pointed to a roll of mesh that a group of soldiers had pulled back out of the way to create a ten-foot gap across a grassy common. Outside the perimeter, multiple fires burned, sending up black clouds into the sky that had an unusual purple tint. A small group of people approached the city gate from a straight road that cut through the park. Identify yourselves, a guard demanded from a perch, atop a green double-decker bus. He had a large rifle with a scope, but didn't aim it. We're survivors from Coljik, one of the newcomers shouted, a middle-aged man with shaggy brown hair. The location has been abandoned. There was an attack. Yes, said the guard. We got word of it several days ago. Other survivors have already made it here. What took you so long to reach us? The shaggy-haired man limped forward, a thick branch beneath his armpit being used as a crutch. Close to twenty people stood behind him on the road, most of them bandaged, shell-shocked expression on their faces. We're medics, said the man. We stayed behind to help as many of the wounded as we could. Not that many could be helped. Are any of you infected with the fungus? the guard inquired. No, 
and that's a miracle. When Cold Drake fell, some of us camped upon the hilltop behind it so it could tend our wounds. After several days we rested, intending to move once the fungus got too close. But then, two nights ago, he shook his head, a smile on his face. The guard adjusted his grip on his rifle like it was growing heavy. What is it, man? What are you trying to say? The fungus died. It turned black and shriveled away like someone had put an invisible torch to it. Goldrake is gone, but the entire area around it is ours again. They did it. The guard turned around like he was checking in with the superior down below. Then he turned back and readdressed the newcomers. Who did what? A group of survivors from the battle at Kildrake headed north. The man glanced back at his people who all nodded in agreement. They said they knew the location of a corkscrew in some village up in the highlands. Quarry Kell, I think they called it. Sophie jolted. Quarry Kell? That's where Ryan went for his stag to. Could it be? Yes, said the guard. We're aware of several corkscrews in that location. We tried to secure the village early on, but failed. Yes, well, this group set off for Quarry Kell right after Kuldrake fell. They wanted to destroy the corkscrews in the village because we had received intel suggesting it might strike a blow to the enemy. I think that intel was correct. The man threw down his branch and stood on one leg. Two days before we broke camp, I got infected with the fungus. It entered through an open wound on my shin. I was dying. But now, days later, I'm fine. When the fungus died around Cold Drake, it died in me as well. It fell right off my skin, and I coughed up the rest. The group that headed north must have succeeded in their mission. The fungus in the north is gone. We can win this war. Finally, there's a way. The people behind him agreed excitedly, battered and shell-shocked, but not defeated. In fact, they seemed hopeful. The guard on top of the bus shook his head in awe. That's unbelievable, soldier. We've been receiving reports of the fungus receding in the north. But it's good to have confirmation. You're the first person I've heard of to be cured of the infection. It is indeed a miracle, if it's as you say. It is, as I say. All these people are witness to it. We're healthy, but also tired and in need of rest. Please allow us inside and we'll happily quarantine. I'll give a full briefing concerning the events of Kuldrake. The guard remained silent for a moment. Then, I'm afraid I can't accept that risk, soldier. But I shall send out a team to investigate. Thank you for making it here to inform us. The man in the road appeared confused. He glanced back at the group behind him and then took a step forward. May we come inside? The guard on the bus shouted a command and thunder boomed as a dozen rifles fired through the gaps in the mesh fence. The people in the road danced, their bodies rattling. A few managed to run, but well-placed shots took them in the back and sent them sprawling into the grass on either side of the road. No one escaped. No one survived. Two seconds was all it took to kill everyone. Refugees not just turned away, but exterminated. Several soldiers rolled the mesh back into place, closing up the gate. None of them seemed disturbed by what had just happened. Nancy grabbed Sophie by the arm and pulled her away. Come on, honey. It's time to get you back to bed. The more I see of this place, the less I like it. Nancy appeared sick to her stomach. But Sophie was strangely unaffected. She understood what had just happened and didn't see a kinder alternative. Letting those people into the city would have been too great a risk. The man had admitted to being infected. Killing the strangers had been a sacrifice for the greater good, and it gave Sophie hope that the city might actually remain standing. She didn't care about the dead refugees. She cared about something else. Ryan, are you still alive? 
Are you one of the heroes who destroyed the corkscrews in Quarry Cal? Somehow, she felt it in her bones that Ryan was alive, and closer than ever. Chapter 2 Aaron felt like he started every morning waking to the sound of Cameron's snoring. It was like sharing a room with a hedge trimmer. The sun had risen, but thick curtains kept most of it out, allowing only a peep of light in around the edges. Another day had begun, but Aaron didn't welcome it. Slumber beckoned him back to its warm embrace, and he wanted to duck beneath the covers and stay right where he was. He couldn't stay in bed, though. There was too much to do. The quaint grey stone bed and breakfast was an environment Aaron was unfamiliar with, especially since the world had ended. And it felt like an extravagance, waking up in an actual bed with clean blankets and plump pillows. Despite the comfort, though, he ached terribly and felt a burning in his shoulder where his arm was missing. In its place hung a sinewy green tentacle punctured by a talon. He was a monster, one of the infected, yet somehow still himself. He existed in a fever dream, not always sure of reality versus dream, and constantly felt that he might suddenly wake up back home with his man making breakfast downstairs and Ryan lazing on the sofa watching the morning news before whatever dead-end job he was attending that day. It's as if that reality never even existed. Aaron struggled out from beneath his duvet, finding it difficult to manoeuvre with only one arm. His tentacle was sinewy and boneless. He could do nothing with it. The talon at the end was incapable of grasping. Maybe I can learn how to swing with it like a monkey. Rather than wake Cameron up, Aaron crept quietly to the door. They'd been trekking south for over a week now, having crossed the English border three days ago en route to a corkscrew reportedly near Stoke. The journey hadn't been easy, especially for Aaron, who had been weak and disorientated since leaving Quarry Cal. The infection, although halted, had ravaged his body. His left eye was tinged a putrid green, and a thick black vein bulged in his lower lip. His left arm, of course, was missing. Mentally, he was in no better state. During the last few days, he had experienced several bouts of delirium, not knowing who or where he was. It had demanded a slow and cautious journey, culminating in their current stay at the four-star Dew Drop Inn, where everyone agreed a bit of downtime was in order. Aaron crept down the creaky carpeted staircase into the Dew Drop's tiny lobby. It had no reception desk, only a small wooden side table with a signing-in book and a plastic box full of various pamphlets. Aaron imagined a sweet old retired couple living out their dreams of running a and b here, but truthfully, he had no idea who the hotel had belonged to. Where the owners were now was anybody's guess. 99% chance they're dead or infected. 1% chance we find them sipping tea in the loft, waiting for this old thing to blow over. Aaron found the others, sitting on bar stools in the lounge. Helen, Fiona and Teddy were usually up at the crack of dawn and this morning had clearly been no different. They were propped against the bar, eating a strange breakfast of crisps and pork scratchings. The dew drop in was well stocked with food and water, and both its lounge and dining room featured open fireplaces that were easy to get going. Everyone agreed it would be a great place to stay, if not for their mission, but safety wasn't a luxury in their immediate future. After destroying the corkscrews in Quarry Kell and reclaiming the land, they had a duty to continue the fight. Momentum was difficult to regain once lost. We have to keep going. We have to destroy more corkscrews. It was staggering how much the landscape had changed during their trek south. Black ash from dead fungus covered everything, 
and infected corpses littered the ground. In fact, anything that had originally emanated from the corkscrews in the highlands was now dead. Eventually, Aaron and his companions expected to encounter new fungus emanating from corkscrews further south, but for now, they were safe. When Aaron crossed the lounge, Helper, who was standing at the back of the room, flinched and raised his fans. Ever since leaving Quiry Kell, the big blue alien had been wary of Aaron, behaving as though he expected him to attack at any moment. Ranger too, the group's friendly German shepherd, was distrustful, obvious from the way she lowered her tail whenever he got too near. Aaron's human companions likewise no longer fully trusted him. He saw the way they shuffled back whenever he approached, and the way they stared at him when they thought he wasn't looking. It struck at his heart, knowing they would never again see him as they once did. He would forever be an abomination to them. But what he had done, he had done for them, and paid a colossal price. Perhaps that was the burden of a hero, to be alone, even when among company. Fiona peered across the dusty wooden bar at Aaron and smiled, then gave him a small wave before sliding a pack of crisps in his direction. Instinctively, he went to grab the packet with his left hand before quickly realising he no longer had one. Correcting his mistake, he turned sideways and grabbed the crisps with his right hand, then opened them with his teeth. Sitting down on a stool a few feet away from the others, he ate them one at a time. Sleep well, Helen asked him. I was out like a light. I have to say I love this place. This morning, I saw a fox just standing there, right out in the open, without a care in the world. Hey, Fee, maybe it was related to your childhood friend. Fiona chuckled. That's a nice thought. I'm just glad there are animals left that are uninfected. Gives me hope. It shall give you hope, said Teddy, bumping his fist against the bar triumphantly. We did something nobody else could back in Quarry Kell. Soon there'll be wildlife everywhere, and we'll get to start over. Who knows? Maybe this time we can do better. Aaron rolled his eyes. The thought of humanity doing better seemed naive to him. Even with all its technology and a population of billions, mankind had been found utterly defenceless against the invasion. Even if the Earth was reclaimed, humanity would be more vulnerable than ever before. What if there was another attack? Or some other alien species out in the universe eyeing the planet up like a tasty gumball? We're just ants in a vast garden beyond our understanding. Despite his dark thoughts, Aaron didn't wish to lower his companions' moods. Since crossing the border, their spirits had been high, and even Helen managed to smile from time to time. She even spoke about her dead son Andy without falling to pieces. Eh? said Aaron. When all this is over, we should go bowling or swimming. There are so many things I miss. Actually, on second thought, swimming might be a bit of a struggle. Everybody remained silent for a moment while they thought about it. Eventually, Teddy spoke. I miss scoring goals, he said with a wistful smile, obviously recalling his time as a semi-professional footballer. I was a defender, so scoring wasn't exactly my forte. But now and then, something had just come over me. The ball would stick to me feet and it was like me legs would move all by themselves and I'd bury the ball in the back of the net. The crowd would go wild. My teammates would pack me on the back. There's no feeling like it. Pure joy, man, I swear. That's what I miss. I miss that. Fiona slumped forward across the bar. Aaron realised she was drinking a beer. I miss getting high, she said with a haunted chuckle. Now don't judge me. Drugs were my downfall, I know that. The reason I couldn't keep a job, the reason I stole, took stupid risks. Whenever I was high, I didn't fit into society or understand its rules, but I can't lie, it felt pretty great sometimes. 
sitting on a couch, smoking a bowl in front of the television and just melting into my own thoughts, processing things without fear or guilt. That's what I miss most. Besides, there's no society left to fit into anymore and no laws left to obey. What exactly would be the harm in becoming a junkie? Good point, said Helen. Maybe when this is all over, when we destroy the next corkscrew, we can call it a day and go find a nice beach somewhere with enough mind-altering substances to last us a decade. Sounds a pretty good life to me. Aaron cleared his throat and tried not to show his concern. He understood a thing or two about pain, and he knew booze had certain medicinal properties when it came to soothing the mind but he'd seen the state Helen had fallen into back at Coldrake because of booze. Likewise, he liked Fiona for who she was now, and it filled him with dread to imagine what she might become under the influence of drugs and beer. From the stories she had told, it didn't sound like a pretty picture. Their mission was too important to take their eye off the ball. Everybody needed to keep their heads. We can't fight and go through all this just to abandon who we are, said Aaron. The reason we're doing this is so that there's something to live for afterwards. Ah, I need you all with me. I need you to be strong. Helen shook her head and seemed annoyed. Fiona blushed and looked away. Easy, man, said Teddy. We're just fantasising, blowing off a little steam. Sometimes it's the only way to stay sane. None of us are getting high, but we can at least dream about it, yeah? Maybe it's as close as we'll ever get. But it's tough keeping our shit together 24-7. Either way, we're with you, man. We understand the assignment. We've all sacrificed, Aaron, said Helen, staring down at the bar and running an index finger along its grooves. No one needs reminding of what's at stake. No one needs a lecture. Aaron nodded. He wasn't always the best at reading people's feelings, but obviously he'd said the wrong thing. I'm sorry, he said. Bit early in the morning, I guess. I'm just glad we're all here together working as a team. That's all I'm saying. Teddy turned to Helen, sitting on the stool next to his. So, Al, what about you? What about me what? What do you miss? She shook her head at him and glowered. What do you think? I miss my son. Teddy recoiled. Shit, sorry, I... She waved a hand at him. No, I'm sorry, it's okay. She laced her hands together and took a few deep breaths. I miss the bench outside her house. Sometimes on a Sunday morning, I'd make bacon sandwiches for us. And we'd take them outside to sit on the bench beside the road. We'd just watch the world go by while we ate. And it was perfect. And he loved people. He would have been something really special, my daffodil. Fiona rubbed Helen on the back and whispered something. Teddy remained embarrassed. He hadn't been there when Helen had lost her little boy Andy, but he knew about it. They'd got to know each other well over the last week, good stories and the bad. Aaron took a crisp from his packet and tossed it on the floor for Ranger. The dog crept forward, tail down, and then gobbled it up. The tail wagged for a moment, and then she returned to help us side. The alien and dog seemed to have formed some kind of budding friendship. Helper had even learned how to pet her, stroking her head gently with his fans. So are we still planning to spend another day here? asked Teddy. My legs still ache, even after spending a night in a proper bed. I think we still need the rest, said Aaron. Maybe if I get another decent night's sleep, I'll stop slowing us down. I'm sorry I've been a burden. Don't be sorry, said Helen, grabbing Fiona's beer and taking a swig from it. You haven't done any harm. Fiona's eyes went wide and Teddy gasped. Aaron stared at Helen for a moment, processing what she'd said. His condition was a great big diseased elephant in the room, and while everyone cared for him and made allowances for his condition, no one dared mention it out loud. Helen had just broken the taboo. 
Aaron burst into laughter. Piss off, Ellen. Don't make me come over there and whip your ass. He flicked his tentacle and let the talon clunk against the bar. Everybody's eyes fixated upon it. Then everyone erupted into laughter. Helen's sour expression lifted. Fiona opened another beer. Teddy lightened up too. Cameron entered the room, rubbing sleep from his eyes and yawning. What the hell are you gobshites cackling about? Did someone rip a wee fart? Nope, said Aaron. I just offered to build us all a nice warm fire tonight. I'm going to do it single-handedly. Cameron frowned while everyone else continued to laugh. The day passed by pleasurably enough. They'd stuffed their faces with snack food and tinned peas from the kitchen before stuffing as much as they could carry into their backpacks. As promised, Aaron got a decent fire going in the lounge for everyone, but doing it one-handed had been a tedious affair. He was slowly becoming better abled as he adapted to his condition, but it was oftentimes frustrating. His chin had become an indispensable appendage used alongside his right hand to grip things. After eating, everyone had then spent most of the afternoon outside on a small weed-covered patio, watching the birds and the trees and the squirrels bolt out of hiding. It was a mystery where the animals had taken refuge during the invasion. But they were back in force now. The countryside was renewing itself. When night arrived, they retired back inside the dewdrop, and they were now sitting in a semicircle around a blazing fire. Everyone had been drinking all day, so Teddy quickly fell into a stupor, half asleep in his padded chair. Fiona swayed to and fro, seemingly unable to stay still. Helen stared intently at the flames, seeming to mumble to herself while Cameron sang barely recognisable songs. They had shut themselves down for the night, which they thoroughly deserved to do, but it left Aaron feeling lonely. Maybe I should just grab a bottle and get drunk with the rest of them. Sure seems to take the edge off. But my head is so fuzzy. I'm struggling to put one thought in front of the other. I worry what booze might do to me in my current state. I want to stay present. I need to get a grip. Aaron patted Ranger to his right. The German shepherd seemed to have decided to trust him for the time being, so long as he made no sudden movements. Helper, however, was a different matter. The blue alien stood in Aaron's blind spot at the corner of the lounge, and every time Aaron turned to look back at him, the alien's big black eyes were fixed on him. Aaron had spoken with the alien several times during the day, and Helper still named him friend but something had changed between them. My alien buddy no longer trusts me. Or perhaps he's just worried about me. I'm worried about me. You're right, little English. Cameron leaned in towards him, bushy red brows raised high above his bleary eyes. All good, said Aaron. It's nice to have some time to think. Or not to think, I'm not totally sure. Hey, I get you. My mind's a hellscape at the best of times, too. How's the, um, arm? Aaron glanced down at the tentacle dangling by his side, although it was more like a vine, really. It's weird. If I'm not looking at it, I forget it's there, and it feels like I have my old normal arm again. Hey, phantom limb syndrome. Was a fella that lived in the village who lost his leg, told me about it one time. Must be horrible, but I'm glad you're still alive. Could have been worse, eh? Aaron looked him in the eye, although Cameron was incapable of focusing. Are you glad? Glad you're alive, eh? Cause I am your barn poet. There's enough bedrooms in this place for us all to sleep alone, but you shared a room with me last night. Because you don't trust me, right? Cameron grunted, and he didn't reply for a moment. But then he nodded. Aye, I need trust you, lad. He seemed angry at himself for even saying it, and he shook his head again. Actually, that's not true. I do trust you, little English. 
It's that slithery bit of alien hanging off your shoulder, and they like. You'd be losing your head out on the road. Couple of times it looked like you was going to lash out and hurt someone. I'm getting a handle on it. The infection is... think it's going away. I haven't had any fits today or yesterday. I'm just worried, lad, eh? We all are. We're a family and one of us is sick. I'm not sick, Cam. I was sick. And this is what's left of me. Maybe I should go on alone. You're all safe here. It would be stupid to leave. It's nae a question of your going on alone. We've all got a nag in this race. I'm just saying I have nothing to lose. Neither does anybody else. He looked at Helen, who was still staring into the crackling fire and mumbling to herself. She turned and caught Cameron looking at her, then made a slight gesture with her head, pointing her chin towards the lobby. Cameron glanced back at Aaron and patted him on the knee. When he almost touched his tentacle, he recoiled and pulled away. Um, hey, well, I'm turning in, little English. Tell you what, I'll let you have the room to yourself tonight, eh? Sure, I trust you. He stood up and put a hand on Aaron's shoulder. Whatever you think, lad, you're near alone. Aaron nodded. Thanks. Cameron got up and exited the lounge. A minute later, Helen tucked her brown hair behind her ears, got up and exited after him. That left Aaron with Fiona and Teddy, and for a few minutes none of them spoke. Then Teddy raised an eyebrow and nodded towards the lobby. Them two. Them two shagging-like. Fiona shrugged. Good for them if they are. I wish I had someone to keep me warm at night. Christ, I don't even know how long it's been since I had an orgasm. Teddy winked at her. Not you. Oh, but you wouldn't kick Cameron out of bed. She chuckled. I didn't say that, did I? Cam's a good guy, so I can't blame Helen for wanting his strong arms around her. I guess, said Teddy. He's a bit of an oaf, though. Yeah, but he's a good oaf. The best, said Aaron. Anyway, count yourselves lucky. What chance do I have of ever sharing a bed with someone with this? He nodded at the tentacle, which flopped by his side. Yeah, said Teddy. That might be a bit of a mood killer. Sorry, bud. Not your fault. At least it's my left arm, right? Fiona smirked. Every cloud. Speaking of which, I'm going to get some air, said Aaron. And he stood up, causing Helper and Ranger to twitch. Both eyed him warily so he waved his good hand at them and tried to put them at ease. Relax, I'm just going outside. It's getting a little stuffy in here. The truth is, he was feeling a little woozy. The air smells wrong, said Teddy. Smells like vinegar. Aaron nodded. He hadn't wanted to mention the acidity of the air, or that bizarrely breathing it in revitalised him. I'll be back in a minute, he said. Try not to miss me. I'm sure we'll cope, said Fiona, giving him a wave. Her tattoos shimmered in the firelight, as did the thick scar his brother had given to her. To save her life, Ryan was a hero right until the end. Feeling glum and a little light-headed, Aaron stumbled out of the lounge and into Dewdrop's tiny lobby. As he passed by the guest book, he gave it a quick glance. The last message was from several months ago. It read, We had a wonderful stay here, and I can't wait to come back. Thanks for being so welcoming, Jeff and John. It was pretty unlikely Jeff and John would ever get to return, so their message would remain an eternal, unfilled promise. Most likely, the two of them were dead. Were they together or alone when they died? Does it even matter? Not wanting to dwell on the hypothetically tragic end of strangers, Aaron exited through the front door, disturbing the bell hanging above it as he passed. His feet crunched down on the gravel driveway outside. He took a breath of vinegary air, tipping back his head and closing his eyes. Am I still human, or am I a monster? Does it even matter? Aaron opened his eyes again and peered up at the sky. For a moment he thought his vision was tricking him, but then he grew sure that what he was seeing was real. 
Bright colours swirled overhead, like paints mixed together. Purples, oranges and greens. The starless night sky was a day-glow satin sheet. He'd never seen anything like it. He closed his eyes again and took a deep breath, holding it in while thinking quietly to himself, Why do I have a feeling things are about to get worse? Chapter 3 A new morning began, and, like a band of adventurers, they were sitting around a bar discussing the world's peril. So, said Cameron, the sky were a colour of a gay man's vest, you see. Teddy shifted uncomfortably. I'm not sure what that means, man, but I'm pretty sure it was homophobic. Cameron frowned. What was? I've no problem with that kind of stuff. It's just an expression. Pretty sure it ain't, bro, but whatever. Anyway, yeah, the sky was all out of whack, like someone had tossed a shitload of paint up at the sky. Fiona, Aaron, me, we all saw it. Aaron cleared his throat. You and Ellen were, um, busy. We didn't want to disturb you. Cameron blushed, but Helen gave no reaction. She just sipped quietly from a can of cider. Fiona had her hand around a beer, Cameron a can of coke. Hey, said the big Scot. It was a long day. I needed an early night. Teddy nodded. Yeah, right. Anyway, what do we think it means? What's wrong with the sky? Same thing as what's wrong with everything else, said Cameron. Aliens. But this is new, said Aaron. I can't be sure, but I think the colours in the sky were moving. Fiona took a swig from her beer and belched. It was unladylike, yet somehow she pulled it off. There was something alluring about the way she was always so authentically herself. Well, without a telescope or a bunch of scientists, she said, I think we'll just have to focus on what we know, which is that destroying the corkscrews gets rid of the fungus. That's our mission, so let's stick to it. If we stress out about anything else, we'll only get distracted or overwhelmed or killed. Aaron drummed the fingers of his right hand against the table, thinking things through. The sky changing could be something terrible, or it could be nothing at all. Either way, Fee's right. We can't do anything about it, so let's just stay focused. Whatever comes at us, said Cameron, will kick its arse. After what we've been through, what is there to worry about? Nobody had an answer to that. So a silence descended upon the bar, which was eventually broken by Helper, who flapped his fans and produced a grunting sound. Eventually, the big blue alien found a word in his vocabulary and produced it with a vibration of his left fan. People! Aaron turned around and looked over his shoulder. People? People, allies, humans. Cameron slid off his stool and marched across the bar. He parted the curtains, covering one of the lounge's window, and peeked outside. For a moment he said nothing, arching his neck back and forth to alter his view. Then he seemed to spot something, grumbling to himself and swearing. It's the army. Teddy stood up. The army? Aye. He let the curtain fall back into place and faced the room. Five gays armed with rifles. Should we go out and meet them then? asked Teddy. He started to fidget. Why not? asked Fiona, shrugging and sipping from her beer. It was only a week ago when we were part of the army ourselves. Speak for yourself, said Helen. I was only at Caldrake for the free food and booze. Teddy chewed at his lip for a second, then shook his head. Not all army guys are good, yo. Have you forgotten about Gerard? Nobody's forgotten about the mad quack, said Cameron. Locked us up like animals. Exactly. Do we even know the soldiers outside are with? Do you recognise them? Cameron shrugged. Probably friendly. Great, said Teddy. Probably. Uh, guys? Aaron slid off his stool and cleared his throat to get their attention. I'm not sure they're going to want to see me. He lifted his tentacle in the air, waving it gently. 
What if they shoot first and ask questions later? Cameron's lip curled. Apparently, the thought of somebody hurting Aaron angered him, which was a relief because Aaron had been unsure whether he still had the big Scot's affection. We'll pop out and see what the situation is, eh? Aaron, you best stay out of sight. Last thing we need is a misunderstanding. Aaron agreed, but he felt a looming dread. A certainty that the peace of the last 24 hours was due to end. The army was outside, and there was no way of knowing what their mission was or what they might do. Cameron put a finger to his lips and shushed everybody as they assembled in the lobby. Aaron stayed back, moving over to the window in the lounge. He parted the curtains and peered through the gap. Half a dozen soldiers marched down the dewdrops shingled driveway, probably on the lookout for supplies. They were well equipped and professional, marching in a line with rifles held at identical angles. Insignias covered their uniform, but that meant little to Aaron. Cameron appeared outside on the driveway, both hands above his head. He perhaps wasn't their best diplomat, but he had got on well with the soldiers back at Cold Drake and had an intimidating aura. Hopefully things wouldn't become unpleasant. Fiona, Teddy and Helen backed Cameron up. Ranger remained in the lounge with Helper and Aaron. Before the soldiers got too close, Aaron twisted the handle on the single pane window and cracked it open a few inches so that he could hear whatever conversation might ensue. Cameron stood in place with his hands raised towards the sky. He made no sudden movements and waited patiently for the soldiers to arrive. Once they had, they kept their rifles pointed at the ground and behaved pleasantly enough, but it clearly surprised them to find somebody out here in the middle of nowhere. Can I help you, fellas? asked Cameron, lowering his hand slightly. He sounded jovial, like everything was normal, but things were far from normal, of course. One soldier broke free of the others and gave Cameron a nod. I'm Sergeant Ridgeway. Nice to see you folks. He eyed the dewdrop. How long have you been here? Cameron shrugged nonchalantly. Not long. We were at Cold Drake when it fell. Them left alive scattered in every direction and we ended up here. The sergeant nodded, still eyeing the dewdrop. Cold Drake, you say? Heard things turned pretty bad there. At least there were survivors. Aye, but not enough. We won the battle, but it near felt like it. The sergeant lowered his gaze and looked at Cameron directly. Well, the fight goes on, brother. So are you folks all stocked up? Supplies? Food? We have some to spare, if that's what you're meaning. But don't take liberties. We might be unarmed, but that name means we're defenceless. The sergeant laughed and put a hand up plaintively. We're not here to rob you, sir. The new Scottish leadership party has sent patrols out from the capital to offer aid. The fungus has receded north of the border, so anybody alive and well is to head there at once. What about anybody who's not well? asked Fiona. Sergeant Ridgeway frowned at her. Strange question to ask, ma'am. Is somebody here sick? No, but before we crossed the border, there were infected people trying to survive here and there. What help is the capital providing them? A merciful end. What else is there? There's no cure for the infection and no way to help those who catch it. Part of our mission is to euthanize anyone showing signs of infection, for their own good. You all seem well enough, though, so I'll simply urge you to head to the capital. Grab whatever supplies you have and leave this place today. It's only a matter of time before the fungus returns. That's not true, said Cameron. Us here are the reason the fungus has gone north of the border. We destroyed the corkscrews in Quarry Kell. You're welcome. The sergeant raised an eyebrow. The men behind him chuckled. That's a grand claim, sir. Truth is, nobody knows for sure what made the fungus recede in the north. But whatever the reason, everybody is to head to the capital at once. Government orders. Cameron sniffed. Sorry, pal. We have other things to do. The sergeant raised his rifle ever so slightly. I'm afraid it's not a choice, sir. There's quarantine in place, and everyone in this area 
along with all of Scotland, is to return to the capital without delay. We need to gather everyone who's still healthy and ready ourselves for the battle ahead. I believe I've made myself clear. So if you won't go willingly, then... Cameron took a step forward, closing the gap between them. Then what, Sudge? You'll shoot me dead, eh? What kind of man would that make you? I have orders. You can wipe your ass with your orders. Wake up, pal. No one's in charge anymore. It's us and the enemy and that's it. He nodded to Fiona, Helen and Teddy behind him. We cleared the fungus in the north. Now we're heading south to do the same. You really want to pull us away from that mission, pal? Maybe I want to see you try, eh? The sergeant glared. I promise you do not want to see me try. His rifle rose a little higher. So did those in the hands of the men behind him. You'll do as commanded. I'll do as I feckin' well please, you milk carton. Aaron held his breath, peeking out from behind the curtain. He saw the soldiers lift their rifles. I need to do something. Just hold up, said Teddy. He stepped up beside Cameron and put both of his hands out. We don't need to do this. We shouldn't do this. Look, I'm all for blindly following orders, man. Life's easier that way, but sometimes there's a line, you know. Cam here is on the level, all right. We destroyed the corkscrews in some village up in the islands and made the fungus go away. We're hitting back at the enemy, yo. You might have your orders, but man to man, human being to human being, do you really want to stop us from doing what needs to be done? We're all in this together, right? So don't, don't be a fascist, eh? Sergeant Ridgway eyeballed Teddy. Kid, do you even know what that word means? It's not something you should bandy around. Teddy shifted awkwardly. Maybe I don't know what it means exactly, but I do know that you have no right to tell us what to do. We're trying to save people out here. Once upon a time, I'm guessing you signed up to do the same. I'm Sarge, said a soldier, standing behind Ridgeway. You know, we did hear a rumour back in the city that destroying the corkscrew was important. Top brass all but confirmed it in our last briefing. If these guys are planning to do what they say they are, then the capital will probably want us to leave them to get on with it. Sergeant Ridgeway glanced back at his man and seemed to think about it. He lowered his rifle and sniffed. I suppose orders change in the field. Thank you for your input, Corporal. He turned back to Cameron and raised an eyebrow. You really destroyed a corkscrew? Or are you just full of shit? Most people who survive this long have a few screws loose. Not us, said Helen. We're all painfully seen. Beer helps with that, said Fiona, who revealed she was holding a fresh one in her hand. The sergeant chuckled and adjusted his helmet in a relaxed gesture. All right. Then I suppose good luck to you. Aaron sighed. Maybe there was hope yet. As long as people could continue to work together, he moved back from the window, letting out the breath he'd been holding. As he did so, he felt a sudden jolt up his spine, and before he knew what was happening, his tentacle had lashed out and struck the curtain hard enough that the rock-hard talon on the end shattered the fragile glass window pane. Ranger let out a startled yip. Aaron froze. What the fuck? What the fuck did I just do? Outside, the sergeant yelled, What the hell was that? Who's in there? Just our dog, said Cameron. But he put little effort into the lie. Off your port, pal. Note to see here, all right? Is somebody sick inside? Are you hiding them? No, said Fiona. Just go away. Okay, that's enough. Inside, all of you. Any sudden moves and you'll be shot. Teddy was right, said Helen. You are a fascist. Damn it. Aaron turned and found Helper standing directly behind him. Aaron, danger. Aaron nodded. I know, I know, danger's coming. Oh, eh? Do you mean me? Aaron, danger. The dewdrop's front door opened, jingling the bell. It caused Aaron's heart to sprint, and he rushed over to the bar, ducking beneath the hatch and stooping down so that he wouldn't be seen. 
Cameron and the others entered the house with five soldiers behind them holding rifles at the ready. Aaron watched through a tiny gap between two sections of the wooden bar. Army! Fighters! War! Jesus Christ! Sergeant Ridgway yelled. What the fuck is that? Dinner shoot! said Cameron testily. He's harmless, eh? He's... he's the one, isn't he? One of what? He's the visitor from Cal Drake. The capital received reports from the outpost before it fell concerning a captured alien friendly. We've been searching all over for it. Shit, I'm going to get a promotion for this. You ain't getting out, said Cameron. He's with us. He helped us destroy the corkscrew, said Fiona. He's not a prisoner or a slave. He came to Earth voluntarily to help us all. Exactly, said the sergeant. Awed, but no longer hysterical. Don't you think he would be better use in the capital than out here in the middle of nowhere with you? Helper, ally, friend. Yes, said the sergeant. Friends, I need you to come with me. He ain't going nowhere, said Cameron. I said he's with us. Just leave, said Fiona, or things will get nasty. Come on, guys, Teddy protested. Chill. Ranger barked. Helper, friend, ally. The sergeant growled. Everyone back up. I'm placing you all under arrest and escorting you back to Edinburgh. You can explain everything there. Feck off, said Cameron, you gobshite. Aaron grimaced behind the bar. There was the sound of a scuffle, grunting and punching. Men yelled warnings, but mercifully no shots were fired. Teddy yowled, begging for everyone to stay calm, but someone smashed up against the bar. When Aaron looked up, he saw Sergeant Ridgway being forced back by Cameron's massive forearms. In his right hand, the man held a pistol, which he fought to aim at Cameron's head. Let go of me! Feck off, you ball bag! Why could you name mind your own? There was an ear-piercing bang. The sergeant's pistol discharged, burying a bullet in the ceiling. Plaster dust rained down on the bar. Shoot him! The sergeant roared at his men. Shoot him! Aaron gritted his teeth. No fucking way! He grabbed a pint glass from beneath the bar and leapt up. Immediately, he spotted a soldier aiming his rifle at Cameron, trying to get a headshot on the big Scot as he fought with the sergeant. The other four soldiers pointed their rifles elsewhere, keeping Helen and the others in place. Aaron took aim and tossed the pint glass at the soldier aiming for Cameron. He likely couldn't have pulled it off a second time, but the glass struck the man right in the centre of his face and shattered. It caused him to grasp at his eyes in panic, rifles swinging from a strap around his shoulder. The others wheeled round, confused by all the screaming. Cameron won his battle with Sergeant Ridgway, yanking the smoking handgun free and turning it against the man's temple. Tell your fuckwits to drop their weapons now! Do it or I'll put a bullet in your thick head. Do it and you'll be dead before my body hits the ground. Cameron yanked the sergeant away from the bar and placed the man in front of him as a human shield. Then he wrapped a thick arm around the sergeant's throat and aimed the handgun over his shoulder. How about I take a few port shots at your men, see if they're good enough to hit me without hitting you first? The sergeant tried to struggle, but Cameron was too strong. He grunted in defeat. Fine. Everyone, put down your weapons. Reluctantly, and with much harsh language, the soldiers placed their rifles down on the ground. I'll take that, said Teddy, grabbing up one of the rifles and shouldering it. Fiona and Helen followed suit, grabbing the others. Suddenly they were armed, and the soldiers were not. Things had turned out okay. Aaron leant on the bar with his right hand and let out a breath. That was a little hectic for first thing in the morning. At least no one had to die. You need to stand down, said Sergeant Ridgway, a trickle of blood coming from his eyebrow. This has got very serious, so stand down while you still have a choice. No, said Helen, and we're taking your guns as payment for the feckin' rudeness. We'll hunt you people down. Sergeant Ridway's cheeks turned red with fury. 
but when he turned and glanced at Aaron and saw his long, sinewy tentacle, he gasped and turned pale. What? What the hell? What? What are you people involved in? This man is infected. We still think of him as a wee boy, said Cameron, and he's only half infected. If you want to come after us, we'll be heading south, pal. Otherwise, shut your trap. The sergeant locked eyes on Aaron, licking his lips. You're a danger to everyone around you, boy. I'm not dangerous. The infection didn't take root. I'm still human. Look at yourself. You're far from human. You're one of them, one of the enemy. No. Aaron shook his head defiantly. I destroyed the corkscrew inquiry, Kel. You have no idea what I've done, what I've lost. Clearly too much. You're a monster. Cameron jabbed the sergeant in the ribs. Shut it. You're jabbering on things you know now to boot. The sergeant doubled over with the pain and grunted, but he quickly straightened up again and continued glaring at Aaron. Your friends are senseless keeping you around. You need putting down like a cancer riddle. Another jolt rushed up Aaron's spine, and suddenly his tentacle whipped up and over the bar, slicing downwards in a diagonal arc and making a loud crack. Sergeant Ridgway gasped. His lips moved, but no words came out. A thin red line appeared across the side of his neck and quickly widened into a crimson valley. Then a dam burst, blood cascading down his chest as it gushed from a torn open jugular vein. Cameron staggered back from the bar in complete shock as the sergeant crumpled to the floor at his feet. Without seeming to realise it, he pointed his handgun at Aaron. Aaron placed his right hand in the air. I, I didn't! He's a monster! One of the soldiers yelled. The corporal, who'd spoken in their defence outside. The young man rushed forward, but Cameron turned and pointed the handgun at him. Rather than pull the trigger, he brought the pistol grip down on the soldier's nose and dropped him in the middle of the floor. You stupid bastard! The corporal grabbed at his face and groaned. What the hell are you playing at? Aaron glanced at the other soldiers and was relieved to see them cowed. None of them made a move. They just stood there under guard by Helen, Teddy and Fiona. Cameron grabbed the wounded soldier up to his feet and shoved him back to join his colleagues. He kept the handgun at the ready, cupping it in both meaty hands. Your boss should have left when he had the chance. We never wanted this. So, what do you got to do now? asked the corporal. Exclude us. We work for the government. You'll be committed. No one's killing anyone, said Cameron. We're all good guys here. But you lot happen to be a bunch of pricks too. You'd be the enemy. The corporal glared at Aaron over his blood-soaked hand, cupping his face. You killed the target in cold blood. He has a few issues, said Fiona. It was a ridiculous thing to say, but she appeared to mean it. Don't we all? Anyway, what Cameron said is right. You bought this on yourselves. Sucks, but it's true, said Teddy. He knelt down beside Ranger and petted her. The dog was snarling, tail tucked between her legs. We were just here minding our home when you came along. Never asked for no trouble, did we? Cameron glared at the soldiers, shaking his head in disgust. You can have this place here. It's safe and well stocked. So take a day to yourselves before heading back to whatever hole you crawled out of. And if we come after you? The wounded corporal inquired. Cameron chuckled and aimed his handgun. I've taken a bullet before and lived. Want to find out if you're as lucky. The soldier was smart enough to keep quiet. We should tie him up or something, said Teddy. Give ourselves a head start before they run back across the border to grass us up. There are tays around the curtains, said Helen. See if they'll do. Teddy and Fiona headed over to the windows. Helper shuffled up beside the captured soldiers and lifted his fans. Humans, friends, ally. The wounded soldier grunted and spat blood. You give us too much credit. Cameron moved back to the bar and leant in to speak with Aaron on the other side. You're okay, cute little English. Aaron peered over the bar at the dead sergeant on the floor, blood still pumped from the man's torn open neck. I did that. 
I killed him in cold blood. No, I was protecting Cameron. I had everything in hand, said Cameron, seeming to sense Aaron's thoughts. He never had to go like that. Ah, I, I didn't mean for it to, I'm sorry. Another one of your fits? Aaron shrugged, not knowing. It's like I'd suddenly lost control of myself. There was this jolt running through my body. I didn't mean to kill him, Cam, I swear. Cameron looked down at the dead sergeant and sighed. He forced the situation, so don't blame yourself. All the same. All the same what? You dangerous little English. Next time you lose control, it could be one of our throats you slit. What? No, never. As if to sabotage himself, Aaron's talon whipped across the bar and left a bloody smear on its surface. Cameron hopped back and pointed his handgun again. You're making me nervous, lad. I, I would never hurt any of you, Cameron. You know that, right? Please. Cameron sighed and walked away from the bar leaving Aaron alone on the opposite side. Suddenly, he missed Ryan more than ever. I'm alone. Any connection I had to my old life has been destroyed. Now even Cameron doesn't trust me. I can't blame him. I am dangerous. Fiona and Teddy tied up the soldiers, while Helen kept them at gunpoint. Once secure, they gathered supplies and filled up the soldiers' extra-large rucksacks, which were now their rucksacks with whatever would keep on the road. Not only were they murderers, they were now robbers. Eh, I found something, said Helen, as she rooted around one of the rucksacks. She pulled out a small metal box and placed it on the ground. Should I open it? Cameron shrugged. I like to gamble. Carefully, Helen lifted a clasp and opened the box's lid. Inside were three identical objects each the size of a fist. Helen whistled at the sight of them. Grenades? Make come in handy. Or they might blow us to bits, said Teddy. H-E-2. That's what I explosives, yeah? Aaron pointed to the inside of the lid. The box is airtight and padded. I think it'll be safe to carry them. We can use them to destroy the next corkscrew we find. Cameron nodded. Hey, it's a good plan. Bring him along, Hell, but try not to blow us up. Helen nodded and carefully put the box back into the rucksack. Okay, said Cameron twenty minutes later as he shouldered one of the combat rifles and stuffed his combat trouser pockets with a pair of spare magazines. Let's hit the road. No rest for the wicked, said Fiona with a wistful sigh, but I enjoyed it while it lasted. Helen prodded one of the bound soldiers with her foot. Take care of this place, lads. We might want to come back some day. The soldier glared at her in silence. Oh, calm down. Your sergeant seemed like an ass, so we probably did you a favour. Count yourselves lucky we're not executing you all on the spot. If it were my vote, I'd put a bullet in your throats. Fiona put a hand on her back and eased her away. Come on, let's go, hell. Aaron was glad to be out of this place. The sergeant he'd killed was starting to stink. The man's bowels had emptied themselves. The dewdrop was no longer the sanctuary it had once been. He had spoiled it by killing a man. Ridgeway. His name was Ridgeway. Trying not to think about who the man was, or the life he might have had, Aaron shouldered his weighty rucksack and stepped out from behind the bar. His friends eyed him warily as he joined them, barely able to hide their mistrust. Maybe they're not my friends anymore. Aaron looked back at the dead sergeant one last time. Maybe I'm the enemy. Chapter 4 They walked for three hours without stopping, putting plenty of distance between them and the soldiers back at the dewdrop. When they finally did come to rest, it was in the grassy centre of a large traffic island. Once it might have been landscaped, but now the grass was covered in black ash and was only just starting to regrow. Aaron sat down on a small metal sign advertising part-worn tyres, while Cameron nodded to a large blue sign at the edge of the circular road. Handprints crisscrossed it, 
showing somebody had been by and cleaned it. The sign labelled one exit as leading to Edinburgh, apparently only thirty miles away. Anyone fancy a wee trip to the capital? Aaron leant forward and rubbed at his ankles with his right hand. I wouldn't blame anyone, he said, groaning. It's probably safe in the capital, while we're heading right into danger. It's sound if anyone wants to leave. I can do this on my own, like I did in Quarry Kell. Cameron gave him an odd look, then turned away, grumbling to himself. Helen, too, looked at him unkindly. Aaron shrugged. What? I'm just saying, we don't all have to risk our necks. Because you'll save the day, said Helen. You might have destroyed the corkscrew in Quarry Kell, Aaron, but we all helped you get there. We all did what needed to be done, and we'll keep doing it. This isn't your fight, it's our fight. But only I paid the price. He whipped his talons gently by his side. Helen snarled. We all paid. Of course, Aaron said, backtracking. She had understood him all wrong, and he wasn't trying to argue. I just... I don't want anyone else getting hurt, that's all. I'm already fucked, so it's not like I have anything else to lose. Helen huffed, but then she shook her head and grinned, which filled Aaron with relief. You're no more thick than most lads your age. She glanced back at Helper, who was examining a crop of dandelions sprouting around his three enormous feet. And family comes in all shapes and sizes. So, said Teddy, is that a nah to heading into the city? Got to admit, it's kind of tempting to just give up and let someone else watch the walls for a while. We've been there and done that, said Fiona. Being surrounded by armed soldiers isn't as safe as you think. Gul Drake taught us that. If you were there, you'd know. Aye, said Cameron. There's only one way left for us now, and that's south. And hail to follow, said Helen, if we're lucky. Teddy stared off in the capital's direction. He hadn't been in the fight as long as they had, and not so long ago he'd been robbing survivors out on the road. Did he truly want redemption, or was he just looking for an easy life? Aaron wasn't sure. This is far from the charmed life of a professional footballer. I don't think he's truly come to terms with what he's lost. Of any of us? They were currently in a built-up area, surrounded by ash-covered housing estates and looted shops. While the fungus had died off for miles around, its remains coated every surface. Surprisingly, however, the grass and weeds were already beginning to grow back, as if they had merely been lying dormant beneath the soil, waiting for a chance to burst forth and reclaim the land. Hopefully, Mother Nature can save us. Among the few things untouched by both the ash and the renewed foliage were the many cardboard signs that spotted the landscape every few hundred metres. Every one directed people to return to the capital by order of the new Scottish leadership party. Cameron put a hand on Teddy's shoulder. It seemed to shake him loose from his thoughts. So, Ronaldo, which way you heading? Teddy peered around at everyone. Then, when he saw Ranger wagging her tail beside Helper, he seemed to make up his mind. I'm with yous, ain't I? Spent my whole life dreaming of becoming someone special. What better way is there than by saving the world from an alien invasion? South I go! Cameron patted him on the back, hard enough to send him forward half a step. Good lad. We best not hang about then. Who knows how close the nearest patrol is? Yeah, said Fiona readjusting the rifle hanging from a strap around her neck. Some of her dark hair had fallen in front of her face and twirled under the force of her breath. We're better armed than before, but I'd still rather avoid a fight. Who the hell is this new Scottish leadership party anyway? asked Helen. I certainly never voted for them. Although, to be fair, I never voted for anyone. Cameron shrugged. Doubt we'll get back to democracy after all this is over. Power will go to whoever's quickest to grab it by the short and curlies. Eh? Maybe I'll have a go at becoming the next king of Scotland. Everybody groaned. Helper shimmered his fans. People, humans, friends. He seemed to look off in the distance.
They had travelled with the alien long enough to accept him as an early warning system, so it was time to go. Everyone shouldered their rucksacks and got moving. Ranger and helper hurried ahead, side by side as usual. Now and then, the alien would attempt to pet the dog with his fans, and sometimes Ranger would jump up at helper. Dog! Friend! Not bite! As they exited the traffic island, Aaron's legs suddenly deserted him. Fiona was closest, so she was able to grab him before he fell. Whoa, you okay? Aaron clutched his forehead and tried to stand up straight, but he just couldn't manage it, and he had to lean into her. Yeah, yeah, I, I just... Get away from him! Cameron grabbed Fiona and pulled her back. Cameron, she protested. What the hell are you doing? Aaron fought to regain his balance, and for a split second, his vision turned green. He, he's worried I'm going to hurt you. Fiona pulled a face at Cameron. What? That's crazy. Cameron seemed embarrassed, but it didn't stop him from pulling her back even further. I'm just saying we need to be careful, lass, after what happened this morning. That was different. Aaron would never hurt any of us. Are you sure? said Teddy. Got to admit, he ain't himself lately. It hurt to be condemned by those closest to him, yet he couldn't summon an argument because they were right. You should be afraid of me. I didn't kill the sergeant back at the dew drop. Something inside me did. Something I'm not awfully in control of. It's best if you keep your distance. Fiona tutted. Aaron, I trust you. And we can handle ourselves, kid, said Helen. Try to take a swipe at me and I'll shove that sparkly towel on up your jacksie. Aaron chuckled. I don't doubt it. All the same, I feel better if everyone stayed back. If I were to hurt one of you. Teddy nodded. All right, man. We'll keep our distance. But that don't mean we ain't got your back. We'll just pretend you got the flu or something. Best not to get too close and all that, yeah? Aaron chuckled joyously. Suddenly he felt tears coming. I'm a freak, eh? I was a black kid living in Scotland on 800 quid a week. I know a little something about standing out in a crowd. It ain't so bad if you embrace it. Aaron nodded. Yeah, I guess. Anyway, we should get out of here. You sure you don't need to rest up? Asked Fiona. She slid a beer out of her rucksack and twisted off the top. I'm fine. Cheers, though, all of you. I don't know what I'd do without you. I can't believe we started out as strangers. It's like destiny or something, you know. Give over, said Cameron. We're just a bunch of badasses with a common enemy. Aaron chuckled and tried to ignore his tentacle flapping all by itself. Well, I'm just glad you badasses are with me. Hey, said Cameron. I'm not with you. You're all with me. Teddy saluted. Boss badass. And dinner you forget it. Now much, you wee lettuce. Everyone got moving again, and the weariness slowly left Aaron's legs. He wondered if the infection was still changing him, or if he was now simply sharing his body with something malignant, something that took the reins now and then whenever it was bored or bloodthirsty. The inside of his head was overcrowded, like his thoughts were being pushed aside by whispers. Whispers from voices that didn't belong to him, with emotions that weren't his. Pain, hatred, fear. I don't feel right. They walked for another two hours, moving away from the urban sprawl and into the wilderness around its edges. There, they witnessed more of Mother Nature's grand reclamation. A thick tangle of blackberry bushes bordered the field they were walking through, and they took ten minutes to eat their fill, staining their mouths purple with fresh, energy-filled juices. It was a moment of simple contentment that reminded them all of why they were fighting. Not just for humanity's survival, but perhaps a chance of something better. There was no need to bring back credit cards and junk food. A field full of blackberries was enough. The sound of gunfire broke their high spirits. Rhythmic shots echoed off the landscape. Pop, pop, pop. They're executing people, said Cameron, one by one. 
infected people, said Aaron. That's what Sergeant Ridgway said before I sliced his neck. It's a cull, said Helen, but I can't say I disagree. The infected can't be helped, she eyed Aaron and shrugged, except for in extreme cases. They can be helped, said Aaron, anger in his voice. They can be helped by destroying the corkscrews, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to destroy them all. I'll drink to that, said Fiona, downing half her beer and handing the rest to Helen, who promptly finished it off. Then Fiona pulled out another pair of bottles from her rucksack. You want one, Cam? No, thanks. I no fancy hiking on a gut full of gas. Let's just keep moving. We're still too close to the capital for my liking, but we'll have to make camp soon. Yeah, said Teddy. It's getting dark. In fact, I hate to kill the mood, but everyone might want to look up. Everyone followed Teddy's gaze. Once again, the sky overhead was a strange tapestry of lights and colours. It wasn't yet night, so the colours were muted, but they were there. A technicolour sky. Take us, enemy, death. Everyone glanced at Helper and then each other. That doesn't sound good, said Teddy. Helen swigged from the beer Fiona had handed to her. Huh? How much worse can it be? Fact is fact, and we're already well and truly fact. It's when we do our best work, said Fiona, swigging from the other beer. Her words were a little slurred, and she let out a light belch. Bring it on, I say. Eh? Hey? said Helen. What's life without a good old scrap? Teddy appeared unsettled about something, so Aaron asked him what was wrong. My coach used to have a saying, he said. A three-goal lead ain't the same as a win. Let's not get too full of ourselves, yeah? Last thing we need is more trouble than we can handle. None of us know what the lights in the sky mean, but let's at least hope for the best. Take us! Take us! Something's coming! said Aaron. I can feel it. What we've been dealing with is only the beginning of something larger. Cameron sighed. We've had the tip. Now here comes the shaft, eh, little English? Something like that. Aaron took a deep breath, acidic breath, enjoying the fizzing spark it sent through his veins. How can you do that? asked Teddy, staring at him through narrowed eyes. Do what? Breathe in so deeply like that. It's like breathing in vinegar I can barely keep from coughing. Everyone nodded in mutual agreement. It's been getting worse the more we've headed south, said Fiona. We're obviously getting closer to the fungus. It's polluting the air. But you can breathe it in just fine, said Teddy, still staring at Aaron. Your infection is like a built-in gas mask or something. Aaron mulled it over and decided it might be true. He had no trouble breathing in the air, but his companions clearly did. What if it became too poisonous for them to live? Would he have to watch his friends suffocate while he breathed in the acidic atmosphere as if it were potpourri? The whispers in his head seemed gleeful at the thought. Something bad is coming, and whatever it is, is nearly here. We have to get as much done as we can before everything changes. Cameron slammed his meaty palms together, making everyone jump to attention. All right, let's get another couple of miles in the bag before we find somewhere to sleep. Everyone be on guard. Yeah, thought Aaron. Be on your guard around me. And whatever is about to fall out of the sky. Chapter 5 The English border was invisible. After so long walking, Aaron had been imagining it as a big white line painted along the ground, but it was just a patch of ash-covered scrubland stretching into another. The only indication a border even existed was an unremarkable sign with a bent-over corner. Welcome to England. Written across the sign, in a crude black marker pen, were the words, Jules Holland is a bender. Fiona rolled her eyes. What a lovely memento for future generations. Hey up, said Teddy. He knelt and shrugged off his rucksack. I saw a marker pen in here earlier when I was packing. Must be what soldiers are using to write out their little cardboard signs. What message should we leave instead? Fiona shrugged. Surprise me. 
Teddy took a minute and then crossed out the homophobic slur, writing something new beneath it. Bury us and we grow. Fiona smiled. That's nice. What does it mean? He shrugged. I forget where it's from, but it's like, we're all seeds, right? We grow from the moment we're born. And if you bury us in a load of shit, we'll only grow faster. A hard life grows a tough person. Our troubles are just fertilizer. I like that, said Aaron. He waved his tentacle. Especially now that I'm part plant. Helen cackled and raised her beer in salute. She'd downed several. Fiona prodded Teddy on the arm. You're deeper than the average footballer, aren't you? I'm probably the smartest professional footballer alive, love. Probably the only one alive, said Cameron. Although I can imagine David Beckham's holed up in his mansion somewhere with his wife and his agent. Ranger barked, getting their attention. The dog was hopping back and forth, muzzle pointed at the ground. Teddy hurried over to her and stooped. What is it, girl? Aaron felt a strange creeping sensation along the back of his neck. He moved to join Teddy and examined a patch of road in front of Ranger. What he saw was unwelcome but expected. It meant they were getting close. A bug? One of the bugs that spread the fungus? Teddy pulled a face as he studied the fat little slug with four legs. Then he lifted a trainer and stamped on it. It made a popping sound, which only disgusted everybody more. There are more of them over here, said Helen, pouring some of her beer onto the pavement that ran alongside the road. There, everyone discovered a cluster of swollen bugs writhing about in the ash, leaving behind slick green trails. Cameron took pleasure in stamping on them, but it was a pointless effort. Once they got closer to the fungus, the critters would be everywhere. Their best defence was, as always, helper. Whenever the alien waved its fans, the bugs writhed and died, just like the fungus. Carriers. Plague. Fat little critters, said Cameron. We're about to enter the lion's den. Anybody want to turn back? Nobody did. They all got going. They walked for several more hours, heading further south into England. Aaron had expected to feel more at home, but he didn't. Ryan, Luby, Chloe, and all of his other friends were lying somewhere back in Scotland. It was as much a part of him now as England. Perhaps he would feel differently if he ever returned to Manchester, but he held little hope of it being the way he had left it. The buses would no longer be running, the pubs would all be shut, and an acidic stench from an alien atmosphere would have replaced the heady scent of street food cooking on the high street. The city was probably inches thick with fungus. But I'm going to do something about that. My own might be gone, but I won't let the enemy have it. It was the middle of the day, but the morning's hike had been difficult. They had crossed a lot of uneven ground, and Cameron's boots were beginning to fall apart. They'd all agreed to stop for the day once they'd found somewhere suitable to rest. Somewhere suitable presented itself a short while later. The only problem was it was covered in fresh green fungus. The supermarket was modern, built from glass and steel girders, one of the posh ones with brand names Aaron and his family could never afford. It felt like a small victory to see it now, abandoned with its doors wide open. He could stroll right in and take whatever he wanted. The fungus might not even hurt him because he'd already been infected. He could be immune. Cameron and the others, however, were very much not. Helper lolloped off towards the supermarket, showing no concern about the fact it was bristling with alien matter. He raised both fans in the air and they vibrated loudly. Almost immediately, the fungus turned black and died, falling away in clumps and dripping from the windows. It rained down from the girders like charcoal-coloured snow. Fiona opened a fresh beer and clucked. I really do love it when he does that. You reckon any of the food inside is still edible? Helen shrugged. Maybe the stuff in tons or plastic packaging? 
we'll have to take a look. Either way, it'll be dry inside and hopefully warm with all these windows. Aaron looked up at the sun, wondering if it was strong enough to heat the supermarket. He didn't even know what time of year it was anymore, but he imagined the seasons were not what they were. Today, the sun was shining weakly in its technicolour sky. But if the sun can keep shining, then perhaps they're still up. It took a good hour for Helper to kill the fungus inside the supermarket, and by the time he'd finished, black ash covered everything. You could sweep it aside easily with a hand, but it was also in the air, making breathing difficult. Hopefully it would settle. Inside the supermarket, Aaron quickly located a pair of large brooms, which Helen and Teddy used to clear the floors of several aisles. Then everyone gathered tinned food and added it to what they already had in their rucksacks. Helen had been right. The contents were unaffected by the fungus, the growth unable to penetrate the airtight metal. The same was true of anything packaged in plastic. I guess plastic really will still be here in a million years from now. Together, Aaron and the others slid the supermarket's large glass doors closed and the building quickly grew warm. In fact, they were able to shed their jackets for the first time in days as they laid out their sleeping bags and grabbed dusty cushions from the homeware aisle to make a seating area. Finally, they lit a small fire inside a shopping trolley, which was easy to keep going thanks to all the gaps in the metal frame providing fresh oxygen. They fed the fire with magazines, newspapers and spoiled food. By the time the sun went down, the ash had settled, and they had themselves a cosy little campsite. Even the strange colours staining the night sky were beautiful, reflecting off the windows and making rainbows on the floor. Helper was on constant alert, but they tried to ignore him. Let the alien worry. They were going to relax while they had the chance. Cameron placed a large can of baked beans on the floor and opened it with a can opener he'd taken from the homeware aisle. He then drank down the tin of cold beans like it was a can of beer. It was disgusting, but it was the way of the apocalypse. You ate what you found when you found it, because there was no telling how long it would be before it spoiled. Fiona munched from a giant bag of crisps and swigged from a bottle of vodka she'd swiped from the alcohol aisle. The supermarket was pleasingly well stocked, neither looted nor vandalised. A few signs existed that someone had defended the place. A broken broom handle here, a large blood-stained knife there, and several shelving units that had been pushed up near the entrance to form a barrier. Perhaps the staff had made a last stand to keep out the unwanted before something had forced them to evacuate. Or worse. Aaron didn't know what town they were in, but the whole area looked like it had fallen to the fungus quickly, giving people no time to panic. It led him to wonder where everyone had gone. Were the infected sleeping somewhere? Hiding? Were they watching the supermarket right now? He didn't think so. If there was any danger in the area, Helper would have gone schizo by now. The big blue alien currently stood by the windows, tilting his body backwards and angling his large black eyes up at the sky. Beside him, Ranger sat stiff-tailed with ears erect. Every now and then, Teddy would glance off towards the dog with a sad expression on his face. The animal had chosen a new master and as petty as it might be, it clearly hurt Teddy. Aaron opened up some beef jerky and took a bite. He didn't feel hungry, but he knew the calories couldn't hurt. None of them ate as much as they used to, and each of them had lost several pounds in the last few weeks. Cameron in particular had shed much of his bulk. Yet, despite their slender frames, they were in better shape than ever. They were lean, strong, and honed for survival. Apocalyptic athletes, ready to hurdle fences and clamber up dense ruins at a moment's notice. The end of the world diet and exercise regime was without equal. So, Teddy, said Aaron, did 
deciding he would watch him mope about his dog no longer. Were you really that good a footballer? Do you think you could have played for Man U one day? Teddy smirked, and it seemed like he was about to say yes, but then that smirk vanished and he appeared glum. Nah, tell you the truth, I would have been lucky to even make the Premier League. Fiona wiped her mouth, having just taken a swig of vodka. She grunted, ha, I never would have guessed, the way you talk. Teddy shrugged, gotta keep it real, right? You're my people now, and you don't bullshit your people. I was good, sure, but I was never going to make the national team or earn the big bucks. Big bucks for a footballer, at least. I probably would have made out okay in the Scottish leagues, but there were far better players than me in the youth squad. You don't know that, said Aaron. Who knows how far you could have gone? Nah, some kids kick a ball at five years old and you just know they're destined for greatness. I was never one of those kids. To be honest, I'm kind of glad it's all over. I love the game. I love being on the pitch, with a ball at my feet, all the rest of it. The abuse from fans, the politics behind the scenes, the agents, the contracts, all of that sucked balls, man. It ruined things for me, and I'm a little glad it's over with. He shook his head and scratched at his short, scruffy beard. The world ended, and I had the chance to be something more than a semi-talented footballer, but instead I threw my lot in with a mad doctor and started robbing people. I'm a piece of shit. He paused to take a breath, but nobody filled the silence. Being real with you now. His eyes turned bleary. I'm having a hard time dealing with it. Sleeping at night is... He shook his head. I, I don't really know what to do. How do I make up for being a piece of shit? People died because of me. Helen sighed. I wish I had some advice to give you, kid. Cameron? Cameron grunted. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Helen smirked. I'm just saying that when it comes to apocalyptic retribution, you're the poster child. Before the world ended, you're the town drunk. Now you're a warrior of the wastelands, throwing yourself into battle to protect the innocent. Cameron nodded, the fringes of a smile upon his lips. Aye. So, what's the secret? she asked. How did you stop being a piece of shit, Cam? Teddy needs to know. Come on, hell. I never hurt nobody, did I? I might not have been very useful, but what harm did I do, really? It was the world that was wrong, Nemi. He looked at Teddy, who was staring down at the ground with his fingers laced together between his knees. Look, kid, you're human, which pretty much means being a shit show from the moment you're born. But you've got a decent heart, and that's what counts for a lot. The beauty of the apocalypse is that there's no one around to remind us of our mistakes. So just leave your baggage behind you and move on. Us here are all you got, lad. And we'll like you, so give yourself a break. Maybe you were a piece of shit yesterday, but it's up to you what you're going to be tomorrow. You want to be a good man? Then just be one. That easy, huh? Cameron shrugged. It's as easy as you make it. Don't be a prick. Everybody chuckled. Fiona shuffled her legs on the floor and rolled up onto her knees. I'm hungry. I'm going to grab another bag of crisps. Anyone want anything? Nobody did. So they sat and watched her as she clambered to her feet unsteadily. She then staggered towards the nearby shelving racks, full of mouldy blackened chunks of what would once have been bread. But before she got her feet properly beneath her, she lost her balance and toppled over. Unable to stop herself, she crashed against the shelving display and bounced off onto the ground. She cried out in shock as old ash-covered bread rained down on her. Messy bloody girl! Cameron leapt to his feet and rushed over to help her as she thrashed on the floor, trying to get up but slipping on the mouldy loaves and cobs. 
Cameron yanked her up onto her feet by her armpits. It looked like he was about to yell at her, but instead he hopped back and turned the air blue. Fiona saw the bugs crawling all over her arms and chest and screamed, batting at herself like she was trying to put out flames. She hopped up and down frantically. Get them off! Get them off me! Get them off me! Instinctively, Aaron looked towards helper, but the alien was already rushing away from the windows and coming to help. Plague! Pestilence! Carriers! Fiona staggered towards helper and begged him to get the bugs off her. In reply, he raised his fans and made them vibrate. Within seconds, the bugs tumbled from Fiona's body and shriveled up on the ground, where Cameron proceeded to stomp on them. Even after the bugs were all dead, Fiona continued to panic, brushing at her arms and flapping her clothing. They're still on me! Cameron grabbed her by the arms, red in the face, and jaw tensed as he glared at her. What the hell you playing at, lass? Knock the bottle on the head, because it's nae doing you any favours. Fiona shoved him away. Get the fuck off me, Cam. I'll do what the hell I want. The fucking world has ended, if you haven't noticed. Forgive me if it gets a little too much to deal with sometimes. I'm just relaxing and having a bit of fun. You're falling about the place like a blind pelican. Keep it up and your days are numbered. I'll near stand by and watch you kill yourself or get one of us killed. She sneered at him, almost spitting. You're one to talk, the town drunk. Aye, hey, I weren't the town drunk. But now I'm the one looking out for your bony ass, so get it together or piss off back to Scotland. Helen moved up beside Cameron and eased him away. Give her a break, Cam. If she wants to get too pissed, then that's her right. Who can blame her? It's not like life is worth staying present for. Sometimes I think we should all just go find a hole and live out our last days in peace. It'd be easier. Cameron looked at her like she was insane. Have you lost the plot, woman? This is not just about us. It's about the survival of the fucking human race. We have a duty. So that, she said, rolling her eyes. What are we even fighting for, Cam? Do you plan on going back to being a layabout after we win, eh? Am I supposed to get married and have a family? Is Teddy going to rejoin the football team? What's the point? What's the point? Maybe it's repaying the men and women who died to protect us at Drake while you laid around drinking and screwing. Or maybe you owe it to me for not giving up on you. I know you're a pain, hell, but don't talk to me about pain, Cameron Pollock. Helen, I'm trying to just thick off Cam. Beneath this brave, bearded warrior act is the same old layabout with vomit on his jumper and piss on his jeans. Stop pretending like you're anything else. Cameron didn't have a reply for that. So in silence, he gathered his rucksack and sleeping bag and headed off deeper into the supermarket alone. Aaron, still sitting on the floor, considered going after him, but decided to stay out of it. He couldn't help, however, but feel a twinge of anger when Fiona grabbed the bottle of vodka and resumed her drinking. She sat down with Helen, and the two of them passed it back and forth, giggling. Teddy looked at Aaron, probably thinking the same thing. What the hell just happened? Aaron had been so focused on his companions not trusting him anymore that he'd missed the fact that they didn't fully trust each other either. Not completely. No, it's not about trust. It's about strength. We don't have much of it left. Ellen and Fiona are losing hope. Cameron's losing patience. Teddy's losing himself. What am I losing? What do I have left? Helper went back to the window to keep watch while Ranger went over to Teddy and settled down on the floor beside him. Teddy scritched at her neck, which seemed to relax him. Perhaps the German shepherd had sensed his need for comfort. Aaron suddenly felt unwell, his head swimming with anxious thoughts and chiding whispers. He lay down on his sleeping bag and tried to ignore the voices, listening instead to the crackling of the fire. You mind if I get some sleep, Teddy? No worries, man. I'll keep the fire going. Thanks. Wake me up if, you know. If the shit hits the fan, yeah, will do. Sweet dreams. 
I wouldn't count on it. Aaron closed his eyes and saw green. The dead surrounded Aaron, an army of corpses led by his brother. Ryan was a monster, diseased and skeletal. His broken jaw fell open, a moan escaped his cracked lips. Aaron was standing in the middle of an endless road with barriers on either side. He wanted to turn and run, but for some reason he couldn't. He could only backpedal as his brother led a putrescent army towards him. Game over, our kid, said Ryan, although his jaws didn't move in time with his words. I'm done letting you hold me back. Gonna do what I should have done a long time ago. Please, said Aaron, tripping over his own feet, which seemed to be getting heavier. Ryan, I, I love you. You're a loser, kid. Held me back me whole life, you have. What did I ever do to deserve you hanging around me neck? I, I'm just a kid. Time to be a man. Please stop. Ryan, you'd never hurt me. Ryan shambled forward, leading the undead horde. Aaron saw the faces of people he knew. Luby, Sean, Brett, Father Miles, Chloe, Boone. All the people who had died to keep him safe, now hungry to drag him down into whatever hell had claimed them. Aaron deserved to join them. They were better than him. Brett had been a vet. Luby was loyal. Father Miles, a kind man. But I'm nothing. I'm worthless. I should be dead. Ryan continued pursuing Aaron. Aaron continued backpedaling. He had tried desperately to turn and run, but still he couldn't. The road was melting beneath his feet, sticky tar sucking him down. Ryan and his dead army picked up speed. There was no escape. Ryan, please don't! Ryan snarled, reaching out and seizing Aaron around the throat with a skeletal claw. I wish you'd never been born. This isn't Ryan. Ryan would never hurt me. He would never have admitted what a burden I was to him. Get off me! Mum's ashamed of you. Shut up, don't you talk about her. She regrets ever having popped you out of a snatch. Shut up! Ryan snarled, broken teeth rattling in his festering gums. I'm gonna rip you to sh- Feck off your bow bag! Aaron shoved Ryan away. Then doing something unthinkable, he threw a punch and clocked his brother right on the chin. Ryan's jaw detached and dangled to one side. Ryan, I'm so sorry. No, this isn't my brother. It's just a monster wearing his face. Ryan is dead. Consumed by fury, Aaron leapt on top of the demon and pummeled its rotten face, cracking and splintering it until there was nothing left but a chunky puddle. Dead hands clawed at him from both sides, trying to pull him back, but he shoved them away before launching himself upwards with a maddened screech, ready to destroy them all. His bones vibrated with rage. I'll tear you apart! Aaron, stop! Stop, damn it! Aaron threw a punch, but his fist was gone, replaced by a razor-sharp talon, and instead of an army of the dead, he faced his friends. What? What is happening? Aaron stopped himself just in time to avoid slashing Cameron across the face. He stumbled backwards, confused and horrified, and before he could make sense of things, Cameron's forehead connected with his nose. Everything went dark. Aaron's entire face folded in on itself. He was barely aware of his head cracking against the floor, and for a moment he was back on that lonely road again, facing down his brother. But then his eyes snapped open and he was staring at the shadowy ceiling of the supermarket. What the feck happened? Helen asked from nearby, sounding utterly bewildered. I don't know, said Teddy breathlessly. He just went psycho on me. I, I think I think he was sleepwalking or something. Shit, man. I'm hurt. I'm hurt bad. Aaron blinked over and over again, trying to clear the tears from his eyes. He lifted his head, groaning in agony, and in the glow coming from the trolley fire, 
he saw Teddy hunched over with dark stains all over his exposed forearms and a smear across his cheek. He's dangerous, said Cameron. We have to do something. Do what? asked Fiona. Do what? I don't know, woman. Something. Aaron sat up and rubbed at his eyes with his forearm. Blood trickled from his nose and it was difficult to breathe. What, what did I do? Cameron stormed over, glaring down at Aaron like a furious demigod. What did you do? What did you do, lad? You only tore poor Teddy Boy to pieces, that's what. Have you gone soft in the head, you daft pillock? White noise filled Aaron's head, obliterating his thoughts and leaving him only with confusion. No, no, I didn't. I, I was dreaming it was just a dream. Teddy moaned in pain. This is it for me, right? I'm infected now. I'm going to turn into a monster. We don't know that, said Fiona, both hands on top of her head, like she was about to have a panic attack. We, we don't know that. I'm screwed, man. We all know it. Shit, I'm bleeding all over. Aaron climbed to his feet, which caused Cameron to clench his fists and bend at the knees ready to fight him. Aaron put his palm out in a gesture of peace. I won't try anything. I just, I just want to stand up. All right. Little English. Easy does it, eh? Aaron agreed and straightened up slowly, then kept his distance from the others. He glanced out the window behind him and saw the night sky starting to lighten. How long had he been asleep? What had caused him to attack Teddy? The others watched him warily, as if he were a kind of animal. He wanted to cry, to scream embarrassed, ashamed, frightened. His tentacle flapped by his side, its talon stained with blood, Teddy's blood. Slashes covered the young lad's arms and a wide gash parted his left cheek. Blood was everywhere. Teddy, I, I'm so sorry. Teddy waved a hand, as if to say it was cool, but he said nothing. He didn't even look at Aaron. It was not cool. Danger! Helper moved up beside Aaron and fixed his two large black eyes on him. Human, enemy, human, friend. Eh, said Cameron. It's getting confusing. Aaron fought back tears. I have to leave, don't I? Sorry, little English. Cameron shook his head like he couldn't believe he was saying it. But I never think it's safe to have you near. The thought of leaving filled Aaron with terror, as did the thought of being alone, of being useless and a danger to others. Ah, I, I understand. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Hey, we know that, lad. It's near about that. Just find somewhere safe to ride this out, and we'll take the mission from here. You've done enough to an arrest. Aaron desperately wanted to argue, to give some reason why he shouldn't have to leave. But the truth was that he would never forgive himself if he hurt anyone else. North of the border, he had offered to come south by himself. It looked like that would now be the case. No way was he going to hide and wait things out. His mission still stood, destroy the corkscrews no matter what. He turned towards the supermarket's exit, but failed to put one foot in front of the other. It was like his dream all over again, his body not obeying him. He fought for several seconds until he was finally able to move towards the exit. He couldn't bring himself to look back. Will I ever see them again? Of course not. Wait! It was Fiona. There's another way. Aaron doesn't have to leave. Cameron grunted. Look what I did to Teddy. We can't risk it. Just hold on. Aaron, wait there, okay? Aaron turned back around, but Cameron moved and blocked him like a bouncer, thick forearms folded against his chest. Behind him, Helen was seeing to Teddy's wounds. Ranger and helper stood alert, glaring at Aaron. The threatening atmosphere made his spine tingle. His tentacle flapped at his side. In the firelight, Everyone remained silent, brooding, tense. 
Fiona returned a few moments later with her arms full. She stepped up to Aaron, but hesitated when his tentacle rose towards her. Easy, Aaron. I won't hurt you. His words were no longer slurred, but her eyes were baggy and she looked like hell. Let me help you. What are you doing? Making it safe for you to be around us. She produced a pair of dog leads and clipped them together by the clasps. Then she wrapped them around Aaron's waist. When his tentacle flapped, she froze. It's okay. Stay calm. Aaron had a lump in his throat as he realised what was happening. He was being tied up like a dangerous animal. The worst part of it was that he welcomed it. It meant he could stay. Fiona wrapped the leads tightly around him, then tied a knot before standing back. There, she said proudly. Now you can't lash out and hurt anyone. You can stay with us. Are you kidding me? said Teddy, his voice quivering. What if he undoes the knot? I won't, said Aaron. I won't do anything to willingly hurt any of you. All of you. 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 His tentacle thrashed at his side and the leashes slipped free, tumbling to the ground in a slack loop. He groaned. So did the others. It won't work, said Helen. The tentacle's too thin and twisty. It's like trying to handcuff a wee worm. Aaron closed his eyes and felt his heart beat against his chest. For a moment there'd been a tiny spark of hope. I'll go. I'll just go. No, said Cameron. He was pulling at his bushy beard as if a thought were occurring to him. We had the right idea, just the wrong execution. Do you really want to stay with us, little English? Course I do. You're all I have. Without you lot, he shook his head, acid rising into his throat. I'd be all alone. Cameron nodded. Hey, I get it. We're a family. And family have to stick together and take care of each other, no matter what. Consider this an intervention, lad. A what? Aaron frowned. And then he gasped when Cameron produced a large knife from his rucksack. Cam? Cam, what are you? Don't worry, lad. He marched towards Aaron with the knife held out in front of him. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Aaron's tentacle shot up in the air, the talon whipping back and forth. It wasn't under his control, but somehow it seemed linked to what he was feeling. It's protecting me because I'm afraid. Because I'm terrified. Oh, maybe the thing inside me is. Helper stepped forward and lifted its fans. They rotated in circles, vibrating, and produced a high-pitched whistle. Buzzing wasps flooded Aaron's skull, and his tentacle fell limply to his side. No one else seemed affected by the noise, so Cameron hurried forward and kicked Aaron's legs out from under him, sending him crashing down on his back. The wasps in his head grew angrier, paralysing him completely. He could do nothing as Cameron bore down on him with the knife. Chapter 6 Aaron woke from a fever dream. Where was he? Had he hurt anybody? Was he still human? He turned his side, head on a cushion, and searched for the alien limb that he hated so fiercely. It was gone. The tentacle no longer dangling by his side. He was human, but not whole. While the tentacle was gone, his arm hadn't returned. He flexed a hand that wasn't there, tried to bend an elbow that was missing. Turning to his other side, he was glad to see that his right arm was still part of him. He's awake, said a voice. He couldn't work out if it was Helen or Fiona or maybe even a stranger. Memories flashed through his mind like photographs shown and then immediately withdrawn. Images of Cameron bearing down on him with the knife, pressing the sharp edge against the sinewy tentacle where it met Aaron's shoulder and then soaring back and forth, slicing, slicing, slicing. Aaron recalled every searing kiss of the blade as it ate into his alien flesh, millimetre by agonising millimetre. He felt the fibres parting in slow motion, his hot blood gushing out, warm human blood spilling out of alien flesh. 
The final thing he remembered was Cameron yanking the tentacle free like a weed from the ground and tossing it aside in disgust. He dismembered me. He did what he had to do. An intervention. I hurt Teddy. Cameron appeared in Aaron's blurry vision. The big Scot looked exhausted, haunted. Are you okay, Aaron? Ah, I'm not sure. What happened? Something you're probably best off forgetting. Do you need food? Drink? No, I think I'm okay. Good. We'll leave as soon as you're okay. Cameron offered him a hand, and Aaron took it, hoisting himself to his feet. It took a great deal of grit, but once he had his feet firmly planted, his strength returned quickly. But so did the pain. Hot pokers seared the stump of his shoulder. He tried to see the damage, but it was too hard to angle his vision. We had to burn it, said Cameron. Grabbed you and held you over the fire until your shoulders stopped bleeding. Think you'll be all right, but we'll need to keep an eye on it. You've been asleep for the past few hours, but we need to make a move now. Help us having a paddy out there, it's nae safe. Aaron searched for helper and spotted him through the supermarket's windows. The big blue alien was pacing back and forth in the car park, fans shimmering above his head. Ranger hopped back and forth alongside him. Something had clearly disturbed them both. Aaron nodded. Okay, I'm ready. We can leave. You should. Wish we could give you longer to rest, but... It's okay, Cam. I'm ready. We need to go. Grand. Ready in ten, then, eh? He turned and walked away, but Aaron called out and halted him. How's Teddy? Who we'll see for yourself. Aaron didn't like Cameron's tone, and he prayed it didn't mean Teddy was dead or worse, but fortunately it wasn't the case. He found Teddy sitting near the entrance, next to a blackened trolley full of smouldering embers. Everybody's rucksack sat in a line packed and ready to go. Aaron approached Teddy slowly, sickened by the bandages crisscrossing his arms and the thick gash on his face. Teddy, are you okay? Teddy started like he'd been dozing off and had been disturbed. Does it look like it? I'm sorry. I can't tell you how much. Are you... are you infected? Tell the truth, I don't even know, man. Signs are good, though. Things spreads fast, right? Aaron thought about Sean and Brett and all the other people he'd seen infected. Within hours? Teddy rolled his wrist and revealed a shallow cut that hadn't been bandaged. It was red and slightly swollen, but perfectly normal. Nothing on Miss Turn Green yet, so that's nice. I reckon the infection you have ain't like the normal one. Destroying the corkscrews in Quarry Kell stopped it from taking all of you, right? It's like a dead strain or something, so I think I'm going to be okay. I feel like I'm going to be okay. Reckon you've left me with a few scars, though. You really went to town on me. I'm so sorry. Teddy waved a hand. Sorry, yeah, I know. I forgive you. You do? Aaron looked at all the bandages and shook his head. How? I want to atone for all the shit I've done, right? Well, forgiving you seems like a good start. I know you weren't at the wheel, man. He pointed to the stump of Aaron's shoulder. And you paid for your penance. We're good, bro. Really? Just like that? Cameron shot me and I forgave him, didn't I? Aaron chuckled. I guess you did. Come at me like that again, though, and I'll use your head for free kick practice. You feel me? You don't need to worry. I'm harmless. Teddy groaned. Now that I can't forgive. Get out of me sight, man. Aaron smirked for a moment and then walked away, feeling a little lighter. With his tentacle gone, he felt less like a freak, less of a danger. But I'm still not fully human. The whispers, they're still inside my head. It feels like they're mocking me. Cameron shouted from the aisles, Everyone outside ASAP. Soon as we're ready, we're off. Looks like helpers are about to have an aneurysm. Aaron went and looked back out of the supermarket's windows. Helper was absolutely frantic now, his fans flickering and forming strange images like hieroglyphics. As Aaron got closer to the entrance, 
the sky came into view. It was alive with deep, vibrant colours swirling in a vortex. Fiona moved up beside Aaron, causing him to jolt. Something's coming, she said. The thing we've all been dreading. But what? What is it? Don't know. Maybe Helen's grenades will come in handy sooner than we thought. She put a hand on his back and rubbed, then headed outside into the blustery wind. Soon, everyone else followed, and once they'd all assembled with their overstuffed rucksacks, they began their next leg of the journey, setting off across the car park and heading towards town with their overladen rucksacks across their backs. Helper led the group, hopefully taking them towards the nearest corkscrew. He was the one who had first informed them that destroying the alien artefacts was vital, so they all trusted that he understood their mission and knew where they needed to go. They shortly entered a built-up area that was more like a jungle than a town. Thick fungus covered every building and carpeted the ground for miles in every direction. Helper's fans cut a path for them to walk through, the vibrations somehow destroying the fungus, perhaps reducing it on a molecular level. Aaron would love to know the science behind it, but that was something for another day. This was a war to win first. Ranger yipped and growled as they passed by several bulky fungus-covered shapes that could have been cars. It was hard to distinguish the road from the pavement, and they had to tread carefully as they traversed the uneven ground. Sometimes, when Aaron stared hard enough, he saw clusters of bugs writhing around in the green fibres. Where are all the infected? asked Fiona. Thankfully, she wasn't drinking a beer right now and had a bottle of water in her hand. Perhaps her argument with Cameron last night had caused her to reassess her behaviour. Cameron, however, didn't quite seem like himself. His expression was glum and he spoke very little. He did, however, answer her question. I've been wondering where they are myself. In Scotland, the infected were everywhere, but we've never seen any since crossing the border. And they like it. One thing I've learned about the infected since all this started is that they name mindless zombies. They've ambushed me more than once to learn that lesson. Well, said Teddy, where could they be? I've never seen them hide before. I've seen them sleeping. Fiona looked at him. Sleeping? Yeah. It's like if there's no one around, they just sh shut off and go still. Maybe that's it. Maybe there's a big group of them somewhere, standing around like statues. Hey, said Cameron. Let's just hope we don't bump into them then. So far, things have been easy, and I nay want it to change. Easy? I wouldn't go that far, said Aaron, glancing at his missing arm. Then he looked up at the sky. The colours were brighter than ever, shifting constantly like a kaleidoscope. It was beautiful. But then the sky exploded. For a split second, the light took over everything, completely blinding, all-consuming. Then streaks of light fell from the sky like drizzles of neon paint. Then there was an almighty rumble and the ground beneath their feet shook. Teddy tripped and fell to the ground, calling out in pain as his multiple wounds flared. Ranger hopped up on her back legs and started barking at the sky. Helper rushed around in wild circles, leaping back and forth on his three legs and waving his fans frantically. Enemy, take us, death! That doesn't sound good, said Fiona, grabbing at her hair and pulling. Cameron grabbed Teddy and yanked him to his feet then turned to check on everybody else. They stood together in a huddle, gawping at one another, speechless and confused. Helper continued to panic. Whatever was coming had just arrived. That felt like someone hitting the earth, said Fiona. She let go of her hair and folded her arms. Half of her dark ponytail had fallen loose. Aaron nodded. Something fell from the sky, like meteors. I saw hundreds of lights falling. I saw them too, said Helen. Cameron spat at the nearby fungus. Reckon we're about to meet the bastards behind all this. He slammed his fist into his palm. About time, I say. Another impact shook the ground. 
Everybody stumbled, fighting to stay on their feet. Windows shattered in the fungus-covered buildings. Car alarms went off from the many vehicles that hid beneath the alien growth. That one felt closer, said Helen. She didn't seem particularly worried, stating it matter-of-factly. Yeah, said Teddy. Too close for comfort. Maybe we should double back to the... Hey, hey, Ranger, come back! The German shepherd took off, barking ferociously, tail pointed up in the air. Teddy took off after her, yelling frantically at her to come back. Cameron shook his head and cursed. God damn it! Come on! We can't afford to lose each other out in this jungle! Everybody chased after Teddy, who sprinted after Ranger. They risked tripping over in the fungus and raced far too quickly for Helper to clear it away. They also risked infection, but as long as they kept on moving and touched nothing with their bare hands, they might be okay. Helper hurried along behind them, trying to keep up and doing what he could to clear the fungus for them. His bulk made him slow. Everyone kept on running. Ranger kept on barking. By the time the dog stopped, everybody was gasping for air. Even Teddy, the fittest of them all, doubled over and wheezed. Ranger! Jesus! What the hell? Ranger was hopping up and down and barking at a strange metal sphere that had embedded itself into the centre of the alien landscape. It looked like a giant ball bearing, completely smooth with no edges. Cameron grimaced. Guess this is what caused the ground to shake, eh? Didn't it look so scary to me? The green landscape shifted. The fungus rose up in a dozen different places. It was alive, somehow, or something underneath it was. Aaron shook his head, trying to understand. What's happening? Then he realised. Cameron growled. Ambushed again! Infected people sprung up from the fungus tearing free of it as if it were a giant blanket beneath which they'd been sleeping. A mouldy odour filled the air. This is very bad, said Teddy. Like, we should probably run kind of bad. Guess we found where the wee conflicts were hiding, said Cameron. He lifted his rifle and wasted no time picking a shot, tearing up the nearest infected, a slender bald man, with a quick burst of three bullets. The creature's brittle body crumpled as if it were made of dry leaves. Then all hell broke loose. Everyone raised their rifles and fired, picking their shots carefully, for they only had a few spare magazines taken from the soldiers back at the Dew Drop Inn. More and more infected rose from the earth, shedding fungus and freeing their deadly talons from the tangled undergrowth. Their tentacles whipped at the air, cracking like pistols. Danger! Enemy! Take her! Helper rushed back and forth, taking out the infected with high-pitched frequencies from its fans. The infected turned their focus on the big blue alien, seeming to understand that he was the biggest threat to them. Unlike the humans, Helper would not run out of ammunition. They whipped at him from all angles, causing him to dodge back and forth but he wasn't as agile as they were, and he struggled to get out of danger. His three chubby legs were cumbersome in tight spaces. With only one arm, Aaron aimed the handgun he'd taken from the sergeant he'd killed. He closed one eye and pulled the trigger again and again and again. The impacts of his rounds was weak compared to the combat rifles of his companions, but a couple of shots took care of whatever he aimed at. Each successful hit caused the whispers in his head to cry out in pain. The infected kept on rising from the earth, the entire landscape carpeted with their bodies. All the while, Ranger barked ferociously at the strange metal sphere, almost like she couldn't focus on anything else. Aaron glanced at the sphere and noticed a strange shimmer coming from its surface. Then when he turned fully to look at it, he saw the sphere was vibrating, more and more violently until the very ground around it shook. It emitted a deep groaning sound. Exit! Retreat! Take us! Enemy! Helper turned to face the sphere, 
raising both fans towards it like radar dishes that might suddenly shoot invisible death rays. But as he did so, one of the infected clambered out of the fungus and whipped a talon at him. The sharp appendage sliced the air with a deadly whistle and cut straight through Helper's left arm, severing the fan cleanly. It dropped to the ground and curled in on itself like a dead spider. Helper staggered backwards, his three legs almost buckling. He twirled around awkwardly, confused in his movements, blue blood leaking from his arm. Cameron hurried forward and grabbed the alien by his uninjured arm and dragged him back to the safety of the group. Meanwhile, Helen and Fiona took shots at the nearest infected, trying to give them all some breathing room. Teddy begged that they all make a run for it. The enemy kept on coming, rising from the ground like a horde of zombies. Like in my dream, an army of the dead. Ryan said I had to be a man. The ground shook again, and suddenly the sphere let out an almighty boom that sent the air itself into retreat. Aaron's hair flopped in the sudden wind, and he stepped backwards, instinctively afraid. We need to get out of here. No shit, said Teddy. The sphere changed shape. Like a glob of mercury inside a lava lamp, it separated into three slender forms, and those forms took on shapes of their own before breaking free and forming arms, legs and bodies. Their shimmery silver surfaces began to change colour. Everybody continued firing, but their shots grew slower as their attention fell upon the strange, newly formed creatures. Like humans, they had two legs, but those legs were thick like an elephant's, while their torsos were slender like elongated pythons. Their arms and their legs were thick and short. The creatures' heads, if you could call them that, for they had no neck, were little more than fatty lumps on top of their serpentine upper bodies. A dozen beady black eyes glinted beneath the colourful sky. Helper waved his remaining fan and obliterated a pair of infected women. Cameron fired his rifle until it clicked empty. Reloaded, then fired until empty again. Infected fell in their dozens. The strange creatures from the sphere resembled, in some ways, the fat little slugs that spread the fungus. Only these creatures were upright and huge. Like the fungus, they were green, but it was a sickly shade that shimmered and turned translucent in the light. Take us, enemy death! Blue, viscous fluid leaked from Helper's missing appendage, and he moved about frantically, clearly in pain clearly panicking. Cameron seemed to sense this and pulled him closer, leaning against him while holding his rifle like a club. Helen and Fiona emptied their weapons and fell in as well. Aaron aimed his handgun at one of the new creatures and pulled the trigger. The bullet struck the alien in the shoulder, causing it to wheel backwards and squeal. Bright orange blood exploded from the wound and it bent over, placing its arms on the ground and retreating on all fours. We can hurt them, Aaron cried. We can kill them just like anything else. Helen, Fiona and Cameron quickly reloaded their rifles, while Helper kept the infected at bay. All at once, they focused on the new giant slug-like enemies. Their shots peppered alien flesh, sending up gobs of luminous blood and gore. The creatures screeched and scattered, but did not flee. Instead, they moved behind the infected, who now came in droves. They're not going down, said Fiona, trying to take a shot through the crowd. They're using the infected as a shield. We need to get the hell out of here, said Teddy. Come on, Ranger. Here, girl. But Ranger was busy. The German shepherd leapt up at an infected man and tore away his tentacles. Then she turned and bounded into another infected person and knocked them down. Swishing her tail back and forth, head held low, she pointed her body at one of the new aliens and snarled. Hackles raised, she crept back a few steps, 
It looked like she might retreat, but then she bounded forward, sprinting directly at the slug-like abomination that rose up onto its back legs like a posturing silverback. Teddy called out to Ranger, trying to recall her to safety, but her instincts had taken over. She leapt into the air, lips drawn back, teeth exposed. The height she gained was impressive. Her ferocious jaws were on a collision course right with the alien's eyes. But the alien was ready for her. In less time than it took a heart to beat, the slug-like creature threw up a stubby arm and sent out a shockwave. The air rippled and Ranger disappeared, replaced by a bloody cloud of red mist. Two infected people that had been standing close by also disintegrated into nothingness. Teddy screamed, Ranger! Ranger, no! Helper squealed and then swished his fans. Friend! Canine! Gone! Cameron fired the last of his magazine and tossed down his empty rifle. He grabbed Helper by the shoulder while at the same time grabbing Teddy by the wrist dragging both alien and man backwards and ordering a retreat. Helen and Fiona emptied their handguns, but the infected kept on coming. They had no option but to turn and run. Aaron stood for a moment, watching the infected pursue his friends. For some reason, none had come in his direction. Is it because I'm standing still? He aimed his handgun and fired his remaining shots, clipping a number of infected and killing just two. Then, with no more ammunition, he took off after the others. They had nowhere to go, but each knew they had to stay together. They followed Cameron, who led the retreat, while behind them an army of infected gave chase, along with three terrifying aliens that could vaporize a living creature in less than a single second. What the hell are we going to do? Aaron asked himself. How the hell do we fight something like that? Chapter 7 Three weeks had passed, but it felt longer. In that time, Edinburgh had become home, and Sophie had gone from being a patient in one of the city's infirmaries to becoming a volunteer nurse. The daily routine of going to work each morning had almost made life feel normal. Her stab wound had healed remarkably fast, and while it still hurt to move, it amazed her that she was able to walk at all. Bending down remained out of reach, but for the most part she was fully able. Currently, she was rooting around in the supply trolley searching for bandages. The ratio of supplies was peculiar. Simple things such as bandages, Gauze and antiseptic were in short supply, while antibiotics, painkillers and prescription medicines were abundant, the result of so many dead. The number of diabetics, epileptics and those suffering from other chronic conditions had plummeted, leaving behind the medicines meant for them, while traumatic injuries had skyrocketed for obvious reasons. Most of the infirmary's visitors came in with minor injuries, broken bones or lacerations, while the more serious casualties got admitted into the city's actual hospitals. Many of those involved soldiers crawling back from battle, but by then it was usually too late to help them. Protocols were in place to not waste morphine and other valuable supplies on men who were infected or unlikely to survive so many died in pain. It was heartless, but practical, and Sophie saw the sense in it. Nancy, however, was a different story. Sophie's mother-in-law complained constantly about not being allowed to help those who were suffering, and just this morning, a teenage soldier had died screaming after having been stabbed by some madman roaming outside the city. Being at war with an alien invader one might have thought a majority of wounds would come from fighting the infected, but it appeared the army spent most of its time fighting various groups of survivors assembling in the heart of Scotland and causing trouble. 
mankind was determined to make life as hard on itself as possible. Nancy was working at the opposite end of the infirmary, giving an old lady a bed bath. June had fallen and broken a hip, but beyond bed rest and painkillers, there was little they could do for the frail octogenarian. No surgeon alive in the city was going to spend their much-needed time on a hip replacement. Nancy took it badly, and she'd been paying special attention to June's needs. Perhaps she sees herself in June. Nancy's getting old, weak. Every day seems harder for her than the last. But I'll be there for her. She won't be alone, like June. Sophie had already made her morning rounds, so she trotted over to the small kitchen area at the back of the infirmary, which was basically an old factory unit of camp beds and patio heaters. She switched on the kettle and leaned back against the cupboards, keeping one eye on her patients. My patients? Whoever would have thought that I'd be a wartime nurse? The infirmary had nine beds, but only four of them currently held patients. Facilities like this were all over Edinburgh, since the main hospitals were full. The Royal Infirmary was also in use as a spillover hub for the government. There was a lot of space and empty offices inside a typical city hospital, apparently, so certain areas had been converted into living space for politicians and officers who found it prudent to stay together rather than retire to their separate homes in a city full of vulnerable and excited people. Fearful mobs had murdered several members of the previous government in the street, and it was only after the new Scottish leadership party had taken control that the city settled back into peace and order. Soldiers and police officers now patrolled the streets, and swift justice was dispensed via the city's single remaining functional court. Of course, most of what Sophie knew about the city had come second-hand from the various patients and strangers she spoke to. At night, she mingled in the market square that Nancy had told her about, where many of the off-duty soldiers relaxed. Sophie was determined to discover more information about this heroic group that had headed north to destroy the corkscrews there. So far, nobody claimed to know Ryan, but Sophie had heard rumours about a Manchester lad being amongst the group. That seemed like too much of a coincidence, and every time people flowed into the gates of Edinburgh, she expected to see Ryan's face. He was out there somewhere, probably keeping his brother Aaron safe. The world was in dire straits, but somehow people were surviving. But only those who were tough enough, those willing to do whatever it takes. Sophie made herself a cuppa and sipped from it tentatively. It was a simple pleasure, and she'd been trying to pay attention to those, tried to enjoy sleeping in a proper bed at night and waking to the sound of birds. While it was easy to miss things like television, fast food and the internet, the truth was that when you let go of them, life became much simpler. Happiness was easier to attain when it relied upon so few things. Food, warmth, shelter. Ryan. A patient raised a hand in the air, signalling that they needed attention. Nancy was still busy with June, so Sophie went over to check on the bedridden man. His name was Tom, a carpenter in his forties, injured yesterday by a falling timber that had broken his collarbone. He was only there for a weekend's bed rest, a little peace and quiet, and a pass from having to queue for food. But he seemed eager to leave. He was clearly in a lot of pain, but complained only rarely. It was mainly apparent from his occasional grimace, or by the way he gritted his teeth every time he moved. Tom, everything okay? He eased himself up on his pillow, grunting slightly. Yeah, I'm fine, Soph. I was just wondering if you'd heard anything about Steve yet. Sophie sighed and shook her head. Tom's friend, Steve, had been injured in the same accident as him. The two of them had been helping to build a guard tower along the fences, but the whole thing had collapsed. 
While Tom had earned a broken collarbone, Steve had taken a brutal blow to the head. She'd already discovered the poor man hadn't made it, a brain hemorrhage. But she didn't feel she should have to be the one to tell Tom. Surely it was a job for a doctor or an officer in the army. She was just a mere helper, not even a nurse. His grief shouldn't fall on me and the words I choose to use. Untrained volunteers ran most of the city's pop-up infirmaries, and days could go by without Sophie seeing anyone with actual qualifications. The most she and Nancy could do for patients was clean their wounds, change their bandages, and dispense mild medications like paracetamol and codeine. Informing the next of kin or a good buddy at least wasn't in her wheelhouse. But this was the third time Tom had asked her, and his polite manner made it difficult to lie to him. I already told you, she said with a forced pitying smile. They admitted him to the Royal Infirmary after the accident. The doctors there are looking after him. Tom nodded. I don't mean to nag you. It's just he and I are close, you know. Sophie read the man's expression and understood what he was saying. They weren't just friends. Steve meant more to Tom than that. Christ, I have to tell him, don't I? He deserves to know. Seriously, why is it my problem? She swallowed, sat down on the bed and sighed. Tom, look. The door at the end of the factory opened. An orderly rolled a patient in on a wheelchair, and for a moment, Sophie thought the wounded man was Ryan. Her heart missed several beats. But when she saw it was just someone of a similar age and appearance, scruffy brown hair, slender-toned body, he looked more like Ryan's brother than Aaron did. The young man's left leg was bent at an ungodly angle, yet it didn't seem to cause him too much pain. The glazed look in his eyes made it obvious why. He was pumped full of morphine by the looks of it. Got another one for you, love, said an orderly named Brian, a cockney who'd somehow found himself in the Scottish capital. Silly muppet broke his leg falling off a roof. Don't ask me how, because they didn't tell me. Okay, thanks, Brian. I'll take it from here. Are you on a cuppa before you go? I'd love to, sweetheart, but I've got to get back to it, ain't I? There's been a kerfuffle down in Blackford. Army executed a load of criminals. Sophie frowned. Criminals? Yeah, drug dealers, I reckon. There was plenty of powder on the streets before the world ended. It ain't got no better since. Anyway, don't work too hard, love, because I won't. I'll try my best. See you later, Brian. Catch you when I see you. He trotted back out the door, leaving it open. Sophie pulled it shut with a loud tut then rolled the wheelchair over to a free bed at the back of the infirmary. Nancy had finished with June, so she came over to assist. New arrival? Sophie nodded. He's a bit out of it. They brought him here with a sprained wrist. Nancy pulled a face and pointed. But his leg? I know it's his leg. I'm joking with you. Nancy rolled her eyes. I never know when you're joking and when you're not these days. The entire world is pretty much one big punchline. But I can't seem to smile. Anyway, this leg's going to need seeing to. I'll have to go send for a doctor. Nancy waved a hand. I'll do it. I need some fresh air. June piss herself again. Sophie, don't be so callous. She's 82 years old. And she's lost everyone. Four children gone. Outlived them all. It's tragic. Sophie sighed and tucked a few loose strands of blonde hair behind her ears. You're right. That sucks. How is she? as well as you'd expect. She put a hand on Nancy's shoulder and looked her in the eye. We're going to find Ryan and Aaron, you know that, right? One day, we're all going to be together again. Nancy put a hand to her mouth and coughed before speaking. I wish that too, Sophie, but it doesn't make it any easier to think about all the people who won't get to be reunited with their loved ones. Oh, Sophie, there's been so much loss, so much pain. The air is thick with it. I can barely breathe. Sophie thought the only thing the air was thick with was an acidic stench that no one seemed to be able to get rid of. Rather than say it, however, she gave Nancy a quick hug and told her to go take a break. June was sleeping now, and the other patients were all fine. 
so Nancy exited to go summon a doctor, while Sophie wheeled the patient in the wheelchair around so that he was facing the room. She knelt in front of the young man and snapped her fingers. Hey, you with me? The man looked up, suddenly less dozy than he'd first appeared. I'm just about coping, he said with a mild local accent. You ever snapped your tibia? I can't say that I have. What's it like? Not great. These drugs are helping, but the pain's coming back. Sophie reached around and checked a slip of paper attached to the back of his chair. You can't have any morphine for another hour or two, but I can give you something else. It should feel better when someone else comes and sets your leg. Wonderful. How long's that likely to be? Less than an hour if you're extremely lucky. Less than a day if you're not. Hopefully, not very long. My colleague has gone to fetch someone. My name's Sophie, by the way. What's yours? Nathan. Where are you from, Nathan? Here. I'm a lecturer at the university. History mainly. Sophie raised an eyebrow. Wow. So tell me, what is a history lecturer doing up on a roof? Brian said you fell. I like to get up high. Gives one a better view of the big picture. What does that mean? It means that it's every man's duty to see what's going on around him. I was on the roof because I was being nosy. Nosy? Nosy? About what? Can I trust you? She shrugged. I guess. Doctor, patient, confidentiality and all that. You're not a doctor. But I'll take my chances. He looked her up and down for a moment with his great big pupils. But it wasn't in a leering manner. More simple curiosity. I was trying to see into the loading bay of the big lorry depot near the docks. The so-called government has gradually been cutting rations because of so-called shortages, but I wanted to see for myself how supplies are looking. And? And politicians lie now as much as they did before. The lorry yard is piled high with rations, and I also know, via several contacts, that the fishing fleet is bringing in regular hauls. There's no reason the city can't remain fed indefinitely, especially now that the nearby farmland is being restored. Sophie straightened up and then sat on the bed, crossing her legs and placing her hands on her lap. Our entire infrastructure is destroyed, our livestock's gone, crops killed off. Yes, but we also lost 90% of our population. Left behind are food processing plants, fisheries, sugar refineries and warehouses full of undelivered food. We have enough supplies to keep everyone fed for an entire year, by which time we'll be self-sustaining again. The NSLP is lying to everyone. Control the food, control the populace. Oh, brother, I thought the days of conspiracy theorists were over. Nathan gave her a lopsided smile that reminded her of Ryan. You mean the type of weirdos on the internet who used to say the aliens were real? Yeah. What were they thinking? Okay, I'll give you that one. But why would the NSLP want to control the city? Because in wartime, autocracy is more effective than democracy. Say that to Winston Churchill. He chuckled, a little patronisingly. We didn't win World War II because of democracy, miss. We won it because of technology and numbers. The United States, Great Britain and Russia combined is what won us the war. In fact, if left to our own devices, we likely would have been utterly conquered and would now remember Winston Churchill for the ill-tempered drunk he was. I think that's debatable. Either way, we have an enemy to fight, so who cares about the politics going on behind the scenes? Ryan, Nathan, shook his head at her. Because taking power is simple when a nation is on its knees, but that power is built upon weak foundations and will eventually crumble. Every empire falls to ruin. Ancient Greece was a force to be reckoned with until constant infighting caused it to decay. The Roman Empire's constant politicking and need for conquest split it right in two. Britain was conquered a dozen times over before it came what it is today. Let me guess. You taught ancient history, right? Classical and contemporary. Sophie shrugged. Well, I don't get your point. The Roman Empire was pretty great, wasn't it? Give us sewers and roads and stuff. And wine, don't forget the wine. 
Uh, sure. Anyway, it didn't collapse overnight. And before it did, it kicked half the world's ass. A Roman Empire would be a good thing right now, I think. Perhaps. But what about after? Say we win this war. Do we go back 2,000 years to a time of conquering each other, enslaving each other and forming new nations? How many will die in the resulting pandemonium? We might avoid extermination only to suffer our own self-made extinction. Rome possessed no nuclear weapons. Sophie blew air out of her nose. You know, for a guy pumped full of morphine, you're quite the buzzkill. Whatever you believe, I think most people are just focusing on staying alive right now, one day at a time. And that's why this city and our very species is in danger. While the plebs are worrying about their rumbling tummies, those in power are solidifying their rule. If what I hear is true, that we've started to make headway against the enemy, then we could gain victory at the cost of everything. So what do you suggest? Anarchy. What? How's that going to help? I say anarchy in the sense of no government. We must all fight together, standing side by side as equals. If we exist only to follow orders, then we will either die or become slaves when all this is through. But if we fight for our own self-interest and for those standing to either side of us, then no de facto power grabber will be able to claim victory when the dust settles. And what then? Who rules after we reclaim our country? The people, of course. Is there any reason to go through all of this if we just go back to the same way of living? If we fight and succeed beneath the banner of whichever government claims authority, then that victory will be attributed to the politicians and bureaucrats instead of the people who actually bled for it. Anarchy is the only chance of survival, not just for tomorrow, but into the future. Nations make enemies of us all. Sophie didn't know what to say. There was a certain sense to what the man was saying, despite him being high as a kite. And she had witnessed the poor and the hungry in the streets for herself. Two-thirds of Edinburgh's population was disenfranchised. The people focused solely on their own suffering. Only the men and women with guns and government titles held status. But what if those cold and hungry thousands rose up and fought alongside the army? They would no longer be disenfranchised. They would be proud and driven and strong. Then, once the war was won, all would have an equal claim to whatever remained. Mankind would be united in bravery and strength. With the way things were, though, if the enemy was ever defeated, an elite few would claim victory. Everyone else would automatically fall into a lower class, subservient to their triumphant protectors, the government. Sophie grunted and rubbed at her temples. You make my head hurt. Good. It's my job to make you think. Think about whether a minority of men has an inherent right to own the majority. Then... When you come to your answer, do what you feel is right. Outside, a series of gunshots rang out. Nathan huffed, more fertilizer for the fields of democracy. It's the infection, said Sophie. People deserve a merciful end. Is that what you tell yourself? I haven't seen an infected person in days, have you? In fact, from what I hear, the whole of Scotland's clean. The fungus is gone, which begs the question, who exactly are they shooting out there? Sophie thought about what Brian had said about criminals being executed in Blackford. Had they really been drug dealers? Another pair of shots rang out. That's the sound of slavery, said Nathan. The sound of liberty being stolen. I see it every second of every day. It's time to act before it's too late. Anarchy, we need it. Look, Nathan, you need to calm down. You're high right now, which is making you a little loose-lipped. Be quiet, okay? It's in your best interests. Spoken like a true tyrant. I'm not a tyrant, you moron. I just don't want the next gunshot to be aimed at your head. We can talk again later, when you got your wits about you. But you're too trusting with your words right now. He gave her a stern look. I've got my wits about me, miss. Don't you worry. She glared at him. I'm trying to help you, Nathan. 
He leant back in the wheelchair and sighed, but then he gave her a nod, as if he understood that her advice was well intended. It was just in time, too, because Nancy marched in with a military doctor at her side. Once again, Sophie couldn't help think that mankind was making survival much harder than it needed to be. Everything okay? Nancy asked Sophie as they stepped aside to let the doctor work on Nathan's leg. You look rattled. It's our newest patient, she whispered. I can't work out if he's a terrorist or a freedom fighter. Either way, he frightens me. He frightens me about what's to come. She turned away and started walking. Where are you going? Nancy asked her. She nodded towards Tom, who was laying on his bed, staring up at the ceiling. I'm going to break some bad news, she said, because I have the feeling there's going to be a lot more to come. Cameron tripped, stumbled, and then twisted his ankle. Falling down in the fungus-covered rubble, he swore non-stop for almost a full minute. Aaron couldn't help the big Scot up one-handed, so it wasn't until Teddy came to help that they got him back on his feet. Aaron thanked Teddy for his assistance, but Teddy was just acting on autopilot. He didn't blink or make eye contact with any of them. And as soon as he was no longer needed, he stepped back and stared off into the distance. I've done me bloody ankle, said Cameron, growling. Feck, feck, feck. He tried to put his weight down on it, but the pain was too much even for him. He wrapped an arm around Aaron's shoulder while Helen helped him from the other side. Come on, let's just keep moving. I need to find someone to take a shite. They set off again, a ragtag group of survivors fleeing to nowhere. The aliens from the sphere hadn't given chase, but the infected were everywhere. Aaron could hear them screeching and chattering all around. The aliens' arrival seemed to have awoken them somehow, excited them. Takers? Helper called them takers? Where the hell do we go? asked Fiona, searching around in a panic. The fungus is everywhere. The infected are surrounding us. Helper was clearly suffering, still bleeding blue gloop from his missing fan. He gingerly lifted his remaining appendage and caused the nearby fungus to recede but he was slower at getting rid of it now. Any fat little bugs that made it onto their clothing shriveled up and died. Hopefully, any fungus trying to worm its way beneath their flesh would die too. Aaron couldn't help picture Ranger exploding in a bloody mist. While he hadn't known the dog long enough to love her, she had been a part of the group as much as any of them. Ranger had fought for the group, protected the group, and had died for the group. That gave the German Shepherd full membership as far as Aaron was concerned. Her loss weighed heavily on all of them. No one said anything, but it was clear. It was obvious. They trudged their way through the fungus-covered rubble for nearly an hour, Cameron struggling more and more as his ankle swelled. In their terror, they had taken off at a dangerous sprint, and it was a miracle their group had got away with only a swollen ankle. Still, it was a hindrance they couldn't afford. The enemy's going to find us. The infected, their eyes are on us. I feel them. Hundreds of eyes. We need to get out of here. They eventually broke free of the housing estate they'd fled into and entered a more commercial area with wider roads. The fungus-covered buildings were larger and spaced well apart. Fiona pointed to a building 50 metres away. What about in there? she asked. The entrance looks clear. We might be able to get inside with helper's help. What is it? asked Helen. It looks like a leisure centre. Is there nowhere better we can hide? What about a supermarket? Right now, said Fiona, anywhere with a roof and four walls will do. All the other buildings are too overgrown with fungus or collapsed. It was true. A lot of the buildings in the area seemed to have fallen in on themselves, perhaps due to the fires that had raged early on in the invasion. But the leisure centre's wide, single-storey building appeared mostly intact. Its front entrance, a set of glass double doors, were more or less clear. While the fungus clung to glass as readily as any other surface, it didn't seem to thrive as well as it did on brick 
cement and flesh. Let's just check it out, said Aaron, feeling a shiver down the back of his neck. We need to get inside before those creatures find us. We can't fight them. They've shrugged off our gunfire like it was nothing. And they're... they're... He didn't need to say it. They all saw the damage the strange new creatures could do. Hey, said Cameron, I need to get off this sword and ankle. Let's check the play suit before we lose the option. Then we'll put our heads together once we're out of sight. They trudged across the road, moving a little slower to allow Helper more time to clear the fungus ahead. Even though they'd lost only one of their number, their group suddenly felt small, dwindling. Several infected rose from the fungus of what must have been a car park. Helper redirected his focus and obliterated them with his remaining fan. Their green flesh peeled back from their bones as they crumpled to the ground. Aaron and the others made it over to the building safely. But when Aaron looked back into the distance, he saw movement. The whispers in his head grew louder, spoke over themselves. The takers were pursuing them. He felt it. They're getting closer. Perhaps the alien overlords had needed a moment to orientate themselves after crashing down on Earth, but they were wide awake now and hunting for prey. We need to get inside, said Aaron. Right now. Working on it, lad. Help her do your thing. Take us. Death. Hide. Aye, right, let's hide. Helper focused on the fungus covering the swimming pool's entrance and raised his fan. The fungus blackened, but it did so painfully slowly. Everyone stood in a huddle, adrenaline coursing through their veins and making them shake. Aaron wanted to double over and vomit. Along with the whispers, his head was full of angry buzzing flies. His face tingled like it was next to a stove. And once again, he felt an arm that wasn't there. His missing hand ached. Come on, helper, said Fiona, hugging herself tightly. Please be quicker. Aaron peered off into the distance. Back in the housing estate, something moved in the middle of the road. He saw nothing clearly, but the air seemed to shimmer and come alive. More infected rose from the car park and immediately turned towards the leisure centre. What good is hiding if the enemy sees where we go? Somehow, in their retreat, everyone had kept a hold of their rucksacks. Aaron slipped his off now and unfastened one of the Velcro pockets. From inside, he grabbed a combat knife taken from a soldier at the dewdrop, exactly the same as the one Cameron had used to slice off his tentacle. Helen saw the knife and asked what Aaron was doing. Stay here and get inside, he said. I need to make sure no one sees us. What? You can't deal with all of those infected by yourself. I can't. Somehow he knew he could. Just trust me. Stay here. Before anyone could stop him, Aaron marched into the car park. He imagined the nearby buildings being full of sofas and pet supplies and hundreds of cheerful people shopping and enjoying the fruits of their labour. It had all been taken away. Aaron told the whispers in his head to shut up. To shut the feckin' hell up! I'm going to quieten you all! The nearest infected person was barely human. Just a bulbous lump of fungus pottering around on two thick stumps. Like all infected, it had tentacles and talons, but those remained inert, swinging gently by its sides. Aaron stepped right up to the disgusting creature and smelled its damp, mossy odour. Do you see me? he whispered. Are you one of the voices in my head? The creature gave no reply. In fact, it didn't even seem to realise that Aaron was standing right in front of it. Even when he lifted his knife and planted it into what seemed to be the creature's skull, it did nothing. It just fell lifelessly to the ground, not even making a sound. Aaron marched up to the next infected and repeated the process. The creature didn't resist as he executed it. The infected didn't see him, for he was one of them, 
an inhuman whisper. But I still have a human conscience and the memories of what being human means. Aaron strolled around the car park, methodically executing the infected until there were none left. Within five minutes, he had dispatched a dozen of them, and he hurried back to join the others. Helper had made progress on cleaning the entrance, and one of the glass doors was now almost completely clear. Helen stared at Aaron as he approached. Did I? Did I just see that? The effect it ignored you, even when you killed them? I lost me tentacle, but not my alien membership card, it seems. They won't attack me, because they think I'm one of them. Or maybe they just don't sense me at all. Whatever the reason, it means I can protect us, I can keep us safe. Let's cross that bridge later, the little English. For now, we're getting our heads doing and making a plan. Of course, said Aaron. Can I lend a hand? Everyone groaned. They waited another minute for Helper to clear the last of the fungus from the entrance, and then Helen threw her shoulder against the door. It was stiff, but unlocked. So after a few more shoves, it opened enough for everybody to slip through, even Helper. Everyone went inside one by one, but Aaron went in last. Before he entered, he turned back towards the housing estate, where the air continued to shimmer. There was something there, perhaps watching them, perhaps waiting to give chase and devour them. Are we truly hiding, or are we just leaving ourselves with no place to run? Aaron and the others found themselves inside a gloomy reception area with a high desk, several plastic seats, and a row of vending machines, all of which were empty. Oddly, the interior was completely free of fungus as if the growth had stopped at the door. This place is clean, said Fiona. The vending machines have been smashed open and the magazine racks are empty. Cameron frowned, but he seemed to follow what she was thinking. Yeah, someone swiped the mags to build a fire. Fiona pointed at the walls, where tiny scraps of paper clung to drawing pins. The posters have been ripped from the walls and the leaflet holder on the desk is empty too. I think someone tried to survive here. Well, hopefully they made it someplace safe, said Helen, although I doubt it. I really wish them vending machines weren't empty, said Cameron. Could murder a Twix and an Ironbury. Oh, said Helen, a double-decker and a pack of salt and vinegar walkers for me. I'd kill every one of you for that. Thanks, said Fiona, trying to refasten her ponytail. She was shivering slightly. Teddy moved away from the group. Come on, he muttered. Let's check this place out. I need to sit down or puke. I haven't decided yet. He stormed off around a corner and disappeared. Fiona shook her head and folded her arms. Poor Ranger. I can't believe it. It was just a dog, said Helen. Let's not fall to pieces about it. Fiona nodded silently. Come on, said Cameron, still holding on to Helen for support. Let's make sure the kidney does himself in. You'll love that mutt. Hey, said Aaron, having a thought. Maybe the pool's still filled. We can go for a swim, just like I wanted. Fiona gave him a glum smirk. Back at the dew drop, right? Yeah, maybe you'll get your wish. The water'll be filthy, said Cameron. Count me out, lad. It can't be any filthier than you, said Aaron. Just help me walk, will you, little English, before I take you in there and drown you. They headed around the same corner Teddy had, which led to a set of interior doors with an electronic switch to one side. With the power off, the magnetic lock was inoperable, so Fiona shoved both doors open while Helen and Aaron helped Cameron through into the following corridor. It led, according to the signs, to male and female changing rooms, a basketball court and a sauna. Straight ahead, however, was a door labelled Pool and Gallery. That was where they were headed. They expected to find Teddy inside, and they did. But they hadn't expected to find him with his hands in the air and a spike to his throat. What the feck? Cameron raised his fists. A dozen people 
glared from the far side of an empty pool that was filled with bedrolls and blankets. Standing alone by the entrance and holding an improvised pike to Teddy's throat was a skinhead with tattoos on his face. He did not look happy. Who the fuck are you people and how did you get in here? Cameron kept his fists raised. With human pal, is that near enough for you to put down your weapons? Nowhere near close, mate, said the tattooed man. This is our place and you are trespassing. And a grand place it is too, fella. Got a real pleasant atmosphere of bio and piss. Teddy groaned. Seriously, Cam, can you try not to be an arsehole when there's a spike against me throat? Aye, sorry, lad, for a habit. You all need to leave, demanded the skinhead. The people behind him, on the other side of the pool, were clearly anxious at their arrival. They didn't seem like fighters. But we just got here, said Cameron. I haven't had a brew yet. How's about a wee crumpet? The skinhead shoved the pike harder against Teddy's throat and made him squeal. I'm not messing around. You people need to turn around and help her, humans, ally. Helper toddled forward, oblivious to the peril they were in, or at least that Teddy was in. Don't freak out, said Aaron, putting up his hand. It's okay, he's not dangerous, please. The skinhead lowered his pike and chuckled. Oh, I know he's not dangerous. We have one too. Slowly, Aaron and his companions followed the man's gaze to the far side of the empty pool. There, a big, blue, three-legged alien waved a pair of fans at them. Helper! Ally! Friends! Brother! Helper grew excited, hopping back and forth. He lifted his remaining fan and shot back a message. Brother! Warrior! Fighter! Then he made a bunch of high-pitched whistles that the other alien responded to in kind. Well, this is unexpected, said Cameron. What are you people all doing in here? The skinhead narrowed his eyes. Could I ask you the same thing, matey? Is it not still a jungle out there? Or is it safe now? Nowhere near safe, pal. Sorry. We're working on it, though, said Aaron. The skinhead flinched and raised his pike again. Christ almighty, get this kid the hell out of here, he's infected. I'm not, said Aaron, shaking his head adamantly. Your eye, it's fucking green, mate. Only the one. Look, I was infected, but then I was cured. I'm no danger to any of you, I swear. Teddy shifted awkwardly. Not no more, anyway. He used to have a monster arm he couldn't control, but we chopped it off, so it was all good now. He's telling the truth. He's harmless. The stranger groaned. You people aren't here to rescue us, are you? He scratched his chin where there was a tiny crucifix tattooed in the stubby cleft. He'd been managing to shave. I wish we were here to rescue you, said Cameron, but we're just looking to keep our bums out of the fire. There's something nasty outside. Something new. New? Cameron nodded. The alien bastards what sent the fungus had just arrived in a big metal testicle. It was more like a giant ball bearing, said Fiona. Alpa called them takers, said Aaron. They're behind everything, behind it all. They want our planet for themselves. The fungus was sent here to make it suitable for them. The skinhead glanced back at his companions, who continued to huddle anxiously on the far side of the empty pool. Then he turned back to Cameron, with an eyebrow raised. You talking about the earthquakes? We felt them, like something crashing to the ground. Hey, that's exactly what it was, pal. Big testicle crashed down and spilled out little green men. Except they were more like big slugs with legs. You seen the critters that spread the fungus, yeah? Like them, but much bigger. Then you all better come in and tell us all about it, mate. Afraid we have no crumpets to offer you, though. We're pretty much out of food. Cameron smiled. Then we come bearing gifts, pal. Or more to the point, rucksacks full of tinned food and snacks. Consider it payment for your hospitality. The skinhead's grin stretched wide, stretching out the tattoos under his jaw. Then welcome to our little pool party, friends. The name's Corbin. It took more than an hour 
for both sides to catch up on each other's stories. After the pool group shared their experiences, Cameron told them tales of Quiry Kell and Cull Drake. Each group had survived misery, misfortune and death. It would be a contest to decide who had it worst. The swimming pool's caretaker, Ben, was friends with Coburn, who was the manager of a nearby charity shop and also a local AA group leader. When reports had first come through about an alien invasion, they had got together to purchase and stockpile as many supplies at the pool as they could afford. Coburn and Ben had then gathered a dozen vulnerable people from the local area and brought them together for safety. They had intended to gather more, but then the fungus had hit and their mission came to a premature end. Those who had made it to the swimming pool had then locked themselves away, and when the fungus arrived on their doorstep, they had used chemicals to keep it at bay. Rationing their supplies and keeping out of sight had allowed them to survive, until they ran out of food and chemicals. When supplies had started to run low, Coburn and a few other volunteers went out searching for more, breaking into the nearby abandoned shops and factories. They quickly plundered another month's worth of food, but lost three of their number in the effort. The infected were everywhere and impossible to avoid. To make matters worse, the fungus started to creep inside the swimming pool's buildings, and without chemicals they could no longer keep it at bay. All had seemed lost. Until a chunk of metal had crashed through the roof of the basketball court, and spat out a terrifying blue alien with three legs and two strange appendages. Turned out, though, that the alien was friendly, with a knack for keeping the fungus at bay. The strange creature kept them safe. They named him Papa. That had been six weeks ago, and the group had been hiding inside the swimming pool ever since, unwilling to risk another deadly excursion to gather supplies although it would soon become necessary if they didn't want to starve. Why didn't you leave the pool filled? asked Fiona. Couldn't you have drunk the water? Ben, the pool's manager, shrugged his shoulders. He was a grey-haired man with sharp cheekbones. Fifty thousand litres of standing water with poor ventilation and no sunlight. That's a recipe for Legionnaire's disease, so no thank you. We gathered enough bottled water before we locked down, so we didn't need to take the risk. We also filled buckets from the mains before it dried up and sealed them with cling film. All the tin food we got cheap from a wholesaler. Problem is, we underestimated the amount that people eat when they have nothing else to do. We only planned to be here for a few weeks. It's a miracle you're all still alive, said Fiona, smiling. I suppose it is, said Coburn, rubbing his hands together in some kind of self-soothing gesture. How many other people are left? The world ended, said Cameron. What do you think? Coburn sighed. We got caught with our trousers down. If only we'd known. Like we said, Cameron muttered. We're fighting back. There ain't one yet. We had a plan until the takers arrived, said Aaron. Now we're hiding instead of getting things done. If we're going to... Cameron put a hand up to dismiss his complaint. Calm down, lad. We can afford to take a night. The whispers in Aaron's head told him that wasn't true. We're not safe here. Everyone sat for a while, basking in the heat of a paraffin heater, running off a green and red canister. It was the last bottle, according to Coburn. But tonight was a special occasion. The people at the pool had feared never seeing another human being again, and spirits had apparently got pretty low, culminating in a suicide a few nights ago. The dead woman had left behind a seven-year-old daughter, who was now being raised collectively. Her name was Edith, and she had a stuffed banana to her name, and nothing else. Aaron sat a little way from the group by himself. He didn't seem to feel the cold like the others, so he didn't want to hog the warmth from the heater. His appetite wasn't up to much either, so he watched the others enjoy the tinned food and snacks, while he chewed on the last of his jerky. As he did so, his attention turned to Helper and the other blue alien. 
Helper and Papa were almost identical, but Papa was almost a foot taller. Does that mean Helper is a girl? Papa also had a collection of narrow white streaks through his flesh that reminded Aaron of that stinky cheese he couldn't remember the name of. The two aliens clicked and whistled at each other, quietly, almost like they had similar manners to humans and didn't want to speak too loudly. Now and then they would raise their fans and make shapes to one another. How many of Helper's people are here? If we stumbled upon two all by ourselves, then there must be more, lots more. Can they help us? Or are they as beaten and afraid as we are? Aaron watched Helper for a while longer, until something caused him to gasp. Helper had made an image of Ranger with his fans. He was telling Papa about the dog, and the whistle Papa gave off sounded almost sympathetic. Helper slumped as though he was sad. Teddy shuffled up beside Aaron. Is it weird that I'm angry? he asked. Angry at an alien? Aaron frowned. Angry about what? Angry that Ranger loved Helper more than me. I don't think that's true. They were just buddies. Teddy chuckled and wiped at his eyes. It's stupid, I know. But that bloody dog was all I had. When I was with the dog, doing, doing bad things, Ranger never judged me. I got to be kind when it was just me and her. She kept me in touch with the good parts of myself. Without her, I think I would have lost myself for good. Aaron nodded. I get that. I feel the same way about all of you. If I had to do this alone, I don't know what I'd become. I feel like half a person as it is. We have your back, Aaron. Even if you wig out and attack us sometimes for no good reason. He rubbed at his arms, which were covered in grubby bandages. Does it hurt when I cut you? Only in about a dozen places, but that's nothing that won't heal. He nodded to the group huddled around the patio heater and munching on cans of beans and ravioli. Can you believe that all these people survived here right in the middle of the fungus? I've learned that people can survive anywhere if they stick together. Also, it helps to have a friendly alien with you. I figured Elper was the only one, said Teddy. Guess not, huh? I always assumed there were more. Let's hope an army of his people came here to help. Without Elper, we never would have made it this far. I hear that. The git stole my dog, though. They both chuckled, but then fell to silence, watching Helper and Papa at the far side of the pool. Both aliens had stopped conversing and were now standing quietly side by side. The little girl, Edith, who had lost her mother to suicide, had wandered near to them, and when Helper noticed her presence, he turned. The girl was clearly used to aliens, so she didn't flinch, but she did, however, take a step back, clutching her stuffed banana. This was a friendly alien, but it wasn't her friendly alien. Helper raised his fan and made it vibrate. For a moment, it almost looked like he was going to grab her, but then an image appeared in the bristling fibres of his appendage. It was a monkey wearing a tutu, of all things. Teddy looked at Aaron and frowned. The hell is that? Something from his data bank, maybe? His species must have collected all kinds of information about us. Like the words he uses, huh? They're more like recordings than speech. Like he's hitting a button and playing back sounds. Aaron nodded. He travelled light years across the universe equipped only with knowledge. Perhaps we should learn something from that. They watched Helper interact with Edith for another minute, both of them smiling when the child broke into laughter. Alongside the monkey in a tutu, Helper displayed a cartoon hippo balancing on a giant ball and a windswept dog with its tongue dangling out and its lips pulled back. It was as though he were playing clips from an alien YouTube. He understood humour, if only on a basic level. How do you think he gathered all the knowledge? asked Teddy. All the stuff he knows about us. Aaron shrugged. It was something he'd already given a lot of thought to. Through the airways, radio waves, satellite signals, 
How much of our information bounced off into space, do you think? Help us people must have intercepted it somehow. From so far away, we probably can't even imagine. We really don't know shit about shit, do we? Teddy shook his head wistfully. There's an entire universe out there, filled with life and technology, that we'll never even know about. It's scary, but awesome too if you think about it. Aaron studied Helper again, in awe of the alien's natural empathy towards a sad little human child. We're all just the same, Teddy. No matter what place we come from, we all just want a life that doesn't hurt. Teddy nodded. Yeah, I feel that. Maybe when this is all over, we... Helper and Papa reacted at the same time. Both aliens threw up their fans and let out high-pitched screeches. Everyone at the pool leapt to their feet. What the hell's happening? Coburn demanded, moving around the edge of the group like a sheepdog, keeping its lambs together. His hands went to his ears and he grimaced. What are they doing? I don't know, said Aaron, leaping up beside Teddy. Help has never made that sound before. Neither does Papa, said Ben, his hair suddenly seeming even greyer. Take us, enemy, death. They're here, said Aaron. They found us. Coburn shook his head. Who? Teddy backed up against the wall. The takers, but how? How did they know we were here? He eyed Aaron, suddenly suspicious. You think you're I'm to blame, said Aaron. Maybe you're right. Maybe they can sense I'm here. Or maybe it has nothing to do with me and they can simply smell us through the walls. Either way, it changes nothing. Teddy nodded. You're right, man, I'm sorry. The infected can't sense you, so why would anything else? Helen grabbed her rucksack and started pulling out the contents. She produced the small metal container full of grenades. Who cares why they're here, she said. Let's just kill them. Helper and Papa continued freaking out. Everyone panicked. The people in the swimming pool had survived by hiding, not fighting. They were terrified. But no danger presented itself. The pool had several entrances, via two changing rooms, a viewing gallery, and various fire escapes. But the group's primary focus of concern was the fungus-covered window at the far end of the cavernous space. It was floor to ceiling and twenty feet high and let in moonlight only through a few tiny gaps between the green fibres clinging to the outside. Everyone looked at it at the same time, seeming to sense the threat in unison. The window exploded. Fortunately, no one was standing in the shower of glass and fungus that rained down, but it didn't stop everyone from screaming out from sudden shock. The air shimmered in the space where the window had been, and multiple colours faded into view. Limbs formed from thin air as a taker took shape. Coburn stood with his eyes bulging. What the hell is that? Up close, the heavy-set creature was eight or nine feet tall, two-thirds of which was taken up by its slender torso. It clomped through the broken window on its two thick legs, crunching broken glass against the tiled floor. Briefly, it surveyed the scene in front of it, twenty screaming humans, and then lumbered forward like a grizzly bear, letting out a roar like a dozen thunders. Everyone made a break for it, but they were immediately cut off as a second creature appeared in the corridor that Aaron and the others had used to enter the pool area. The taker threw up a stubby arm and released another of those deadly pulses, obliterating three screaming pool survivors in a cloud of blood and guts, including Ben, the pool's manager. What the fuck did you bring here? Coburn yelled at Cameron. Sorry, pal. Buy your beer. Go fuck yourself. Coburn grabbed his pike from where he had left it, leaning against the wall and hurled it over the empty pool towards the taker standing in the corridor. It pierced the creature right through the centre of its slender torso, and it let out a thunderous roar matching that of its companion. Steaming orange blood burst from the wound. A rancid stench filled the air. Good shot, said Cameron, and he grabbed Coburn by the arm, dragging him towards one of the changing room exits.
Coburn shrugged himself free. I can't leave them. That fact, pal. I'm sorry. No, I need to stop this. I need to do something. Aaron moved towards the wounded taker in the corridor, hoping it wouldn't sense him. But it immediately raised its arm and sent out a shockwave. Aaron threw himself to the ground just in time. His hair blew back as the air turned hot and whooshed above his head. Behind him, two people turned to a bloody vapour. Aaron breathed them in and tried not to gag. The alien's pulse had seemed weaker than the first. Was it because the alien was injured? Or because its attack needed recharging? From on his belly, Aaron saw Helper and Papa race over to tackle the other taker by the broken window. Papa raised both fans and made them vibrate. The taker roared and stumbled back, a thin line of flesh parting across its pale green chest and leaking orange fluid. Aaron narrowed his eyes and clenched his fist. That's it, Papa. Kill the fucking thing. The taker screeched as the thin line lengthened, leaking more and more foul-smelling alien blood. But then the creature seemed to steal itself. It regained its balance, paused, and forced itself forward like it was walking into a strong wind. Its chest continued to split open, guts leaking out of its torso, but defiantly it threw up an arm. And that was the end of Papa. The tall blue alien erupted like a balloon full of blue paint. His blood splattered the walls and floors. Helper made a gargling sound that caused the taker to stagger backwards. He then raised his vibrating fan and the taker's slender torso split open horizontally. It tried to raise an arm, but the movement and weight caused its heavy upper half to slide forward and detach from the lower, dragging orange entrails with it. Both halves slumped to the tiles and slid over the edge of the pool, splattering at the bottom. Papa! Edith dropped to her knees beside the bloody puddle that had been Papa. She dropped her stuffed banana and put both hands in the blue mess. Papa, come back! Helper reached out with his fan and tried to gather the girl up, but his limbs weren't meant for such things. He succeeded only in smothering the girl, and she leapt back up and ran away. Aaron's head filled with buzzing crickets. He was momentarily lost, unable to focus or move. He placed a finger against his temple and pressed hard, trying to open up a hole to let the noise out. It didn't work but he was able to break free from his stupor when Teddy grabbed him by the arm and yanked him to his feet. We have to go, said Teddy. Aaron nodded. Cameron stood in the male changing room's entryway, ushering everyone through. Helen was on her knees, struggling with the clasp on the metal grenade container. Fiona gathered her and pulled her up. It's not worth it, she said. We need to fate, said Helen, clutching the metal crate against her chest as she backpedalled into the changing room's entrance. I want to kill them. I want to see them bleed. Not now. These people need to get out of here. We have a child to protect. That seemed to get through to Helen. She turned and ran. The taker in the corridor rushed forward, entering the pool area proper. Coburn's pike had remained embedded in its torso, but it slid free now as the massive creature loped forward. Frightened humans bunched up against one another, shoving and fighting to make it into one of the exits. It was every man, woman and child for themselves. The taker raised its stubby arm. Get down, Aaron shouted, and he leapt on top of Teddy. The two of them crashed against the tiles and were soundly trampled by fleeing feet. But those fleeing feet suddenly vanished. Aaron looked up and had to shield his eyes as a bloody pall drenched him. Teddy moaned beside him, also covered in blood. The people who had been fleeing were gone. Get up, said Fiona, appearing behind them. Quick! They leapt up and scrambled towards Cameron, still waiting for them in the entryway to the changing room. He bellowed at them to get a move on. His expression was one of terror. The taker rushed around the empty pool, barging a woman over the edge and into the empty deep end, 
Her head cracked open against the tiles and spat out a jagged star of blood. Coburn roared and threw himself at the alien, thumping at the fleshy lump of its head. It had no effect, and the taker lifted its arm and batted him aside like a fly. Coburn stayed on his feet, but staggered in a daze towards the edge of the pool. Aaron leapt out and grabbed him, keeping him from falling into the deep end. Coburn didn't thank him, he just clutched his ribs and wheezed as Aaron dragged him to safety. Everyone piled through into the male changing room, but Aaron paused in the entryway. Helper was yet to make it through. The alien was hurrying towards the taker, raising its fan and making rapid vibrations. The taker's wound from Coburn's pike split open and spat steaming orange blood. The taker roared and threw up a stubby arm to obliterate Helper. No, no, please! Helper collided with the taker, knocking it back a step on its lumbering legs. It sent out a pulse from its arm that sailed harmlessly over the top of the empty pool. Aaron called out from the doorway as Cameron fought to pull him away. Helper, we have to get out of here! Aaron, friend, ally, Helper, please! Helper shoved the taker again, knocking the larger creature back another step. He raised his fan and worked on the taker's wound, splitting it open wider, but the taker threw out a thick arm and clobbered Helper in the side of his head. Helper staggered and tripped, falling onto his side, helpless, doomed. The taker took a step forward, lifted its arm towards Helper and roared. Cameron grabbed Aaron around the waist and pulled him, screaming, into the changing room. There, everyone was already piling through a narrow doorway at the back. Helper, we have to go back and get him! We can't, lad. We can't. Aaron continued to struggle, but Cameron was too strong to resist. He had no choice but to join everyone in the corridor outside the changing room. Coburn opened a fire escape and ushered everyone out. The tattooed skinhead was visibly shell-shocked, the muscles in his face frozen in place. Once everyone got out, they had to drag Coburn away, letting the fire escape slam shut behind him. He staggered and clutched his ribs, hacking and coughing. Fiona ushered a small group of survivors ahead of them, only six remaining of the pool group now, including Coburn and the child Edith. Where do we go? asked Fiona. The fungus is everywhere. We lost Helper, said Aaron, trying not to throw up from the shock. He stayed behind to fight. We need to head back north, said Teddy. We can't survive out here without Helper. You brought this, said Coburn, clutching his ribs and gritting his teeth. You, you got everyone killed. We were safe, we were fine. Can we scrap about it later, said Cameron. Let's just stay alive for now, eh? Everyone hurried through an overgrown back area that might once have been a small car park. The remaining pool survivors led the way, taking them around the building and towards the front. By the time they saw the taker, it was already too late. It was the same enemy Coburn had speared with his pike, identifiable by the wide gash across its slender torso. While the pool survivors sprinted for safety, the taker must have slipped out of the front entrance. It lifted its arm and sent out a pulse. Four human lives disappeared in an instant. One of them had been holding Edith's hand, and the child fell back screaming with a dismembered arm in her grasp. It doubled back through the building, said Aaron, shaking his head. It's smart. No shit, said Helen, clutching her crate of grenades. Edith! Coburn raced for the girl, tattooed arms outstretched. The child had fallen on her rump and was sobbing loudly, covering her eyes just sitting there. The taker raised its arm again. Coburn roared and threw himself into the air. A pulse reduced Edith to bloody molecules. Coburn collided with the taker and beat at it with both his fists. The force of the blows knocked the alien backwards. And, as it overbalanced, its wounded torso tore open wider, spitting out vile orange blood. I'll drink your fucking insides! Coburn roared. Then he shoved both hands inside the wound and yanked. 
He tore the taker's slender abdomen apart as if he were ripping a hole in a cheap bedsheet. The alien screeched, a pitiful sound of something ancient dying. It tried to fight Coburn off, but a volcanic rage had possessed the man and he would not be removed. His mouth opened wide in a bellow, even as steaming orange blood spurted all over his face. With one last final roar, he tore the taker wide open, exposing guts and bone and emptying it of blood. Aliens were just as squishy as humans on the inside. The taker fell down in an eviscerated heap. Coburn soaked in orange gore immediately started searching the ground frantically. Edith! Edith! Helen reached out to him. She's gone. I'm sorry. He battered at her arm. Get away from me! You brought these fucking monsters here, you all did! No, said Aaron. They landed less than a mile from here. They would have found you as soon as you left to find more food. We're not the bad guys, said Teddy. The monster you just killed is to blame for this, along with all its brothers and sisters. This is war, and you can't hide from it, man. This isn't our fault, said Aaron. Coburn glared at him. We were fine until you came. We were fine, and now they're all gone. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill all of you. He lunged at Aaron, but Cameron stepped in his way and grabbed him. Easy, lad. Coburn swung his fists and clocked Cameron on the side of his jaw, knocking him out cold. Helen gasped and immediately rushed to help him. Coburn reset his sights on Aaron. You're dead. Aaron held his hand up. Please. We need to get out of here, the fungus. You don't need to worry about the fungus. I'm going to end you. Teddy stood in Coburn's way. The, then you'll have to go through me, mate. And me, said Fiona, stepping up beside Teddy. Both turned pale, but they stood their ground in front of the enraged skinhead. With his scowling, tattooed, covered face, Coburn looked like one of the demonic Oni tattoos living on Fiona's arms. Coburn sneered at them. That's fine. I'll deal with you all. Aaron glanced at Cameron, who was slowly coming too. It was possibly the first time anyone had ever put the big Scots lights out, and it had only taken one punch. Now Aaron had to fight Coburn one-handed. Somehow the enraged man was more terrifying than the aliens. Don't do this, said Aaron. Please. Coburn shook his head. You need to pay. I've lost everyone. So have I. Aaron pushed through the middle of Teddy and Fiona, facing down his attacker. Everyone I loved is dead. Every friend, every neighbour. The entire world is hanging on by a thread because an alien species attacked us without warning. Every second we continue to live is a constant battle between sadness and anger. I choose anger, said Coburn, fists clenched at his side. There were little stars inked on each knuckle. Aaron nodded. I choose anger too. Sadness hurts only ourselves, but anger, anger we can use. The problem is, you're aiming your anger in the wrong direction. If you want to hurt me, kill me, then do it. In fact, I welcome it. This time last year, I was an overweight kid locked in my room playing video games. That was my life. Now look at me. I've lost everyone I care about, as well as my left arm and I'm one of the lucky ones. Killing me won't help you. And the more we fight each other, the easier we make it for our true enemy to take what's left. We can only survive this by sticking together and aiming our anger in the right place. Come with us, Coburn. Come with us, and I promise you a chance to get revenge. Please don't hurt him, said Fiona, moving back in front of Aaron. I can't lose anyone else. Coburn shook his head and let his fists drop. All the anger seemed to drain out of him with a long sigh. We're all screwed, so what does it even matter? The fungus is everywhere. The infection is going to get us before we make it hundred metres from here. Actually, guys, said Helen, that isn't true. Look. Aaron glanced at where she was pointing and saw the fungus peeling back inch by inch, turning to black ash. A semicircle around the swimming pool's entrance had cleared, and it was growing larger. Why is the fungus dying? Aaron shook his head in confusion. I don't understand. Ally, humans, 
Help her! Everyone glanced at the grimy glass entrance and saw a large, blocky creature sliding through the gap between the door and the frame. The taker had pushed it wide open when it had doubled back through the building and ambushed them. Aaron gasped. Helper, you're alive! Helper ignored Aaron and moved over to a patch of blood pooled on the ground, that of Edith and the other survivors. Human! Child! He stood still, trembling. His black eyes remained fixed on the bloody puddle. Slowly, he began to make a strange choking sound. Eventually, that choking sound became a word. Edith! Edith! Coburn looked at the alien, tears in his eyes. Yes, Edith. That was her name. Helper turned away from the puddle and struggled to form another word with his actual voice. It took several attempts before it came out. Angry! Hey, said Cameron, rubbing his jaw as he came to on the floor. Join the club. Helper moved away from the blood and over to where the dead taker lay in a pool of its own orange remains. The alien went back to speaking via its recorded vocabulary. Death! Taker! Finally, he turned to face them all. Humans! Fight! Fight! Aaron nodded. We will help her. We're all going to fight. Coburn went and helped Cameron to his feet with a grunt of an apology. For a moment, it looked like Cameron was going to get his own back, but then he nodded appreciatively and shook the other man's hand. We brought death to your doorstep, pal. Bet it was coming one way or another. All the same, I'm sorry. He took a step and prodded the dead taker with his boot. These bastards aren't going to stop until there's none of us left. They want our planet all to themselves. The question is, what are we going to do about it? He looked at Coburn specifically. Coburn glanced at Aaron and then Helper. I suppose I don't have much choice. I'm going to fight. Helen glanced down at the bloody spot where Edith had died with a disturbed look in her eyes. She held up her metal box and sneered. Let's go find something to kill. Chapter 8 they were all a little shell-shocked, but there was no time to rest. Within minutes of them exiting the leisure centre, a horde of infected had arrived. Helpers saw off a dozen of them before becoming overwhelmed, which forced Aaron to leap into the fray. Their rucksacks lay abandoned inside the swimming pool now, so he had to fight bare-handed, but with the confidence of knowing that they wouldn't attack him. He kicked at several of them, knocking them down, and whenever he was able, he wrenched at their tendrils and tore them loose from their bodies. The vine-like appendages were surprisingly delicate and came away with a firm yank. Aaron fought till exhaustion took him, his head full of screaming that wasn't his own. Was what he was hearing the sounds of souls trapped inside desiccated vessels? Did infected people die, or were they merely pushed aside and forced to become passengers inside their own bodies. He still remembered Luby, who had somehow remained himself. What would I be if I hadn't destroyed the corkscrews in Quiet Kel? Would I be a passenger in my own body? A screaming voice, like those inside my head, driving me mad? Unable to fight or even lift his tired arm any more, Aaron did the only thing he could. He manoeuvred himself in the way of the infected, as they sought to attack his companions, unable to do anything except block them. They attempted to edge around him as though he were a boulder in their path, but not once did they attack him. Several times they whipped at the air, but it was more a gesture of frustration. Whenever he could, he nudged them off balance and caused them to stumble. All the while, he grew more and more out of breath. The battle seemed to go on for hours, but in reality it must have been mere minutes. Meanwhile, Helper continued taking care of the infected as quickly as he could. He seemed tired too, almost beaten. 
Cameron led everyone away from danger, but they had yet to make any kind of plan. Did they head south, searching for the nearest corkscrew? Or did they head back north to lick their wounds? Both options depended upon them not dying in the next ten minutes. Aaron was forced to stagger away from the fight and join the others. Without weaponry, they were all vulnerable, and soon they would need to find somewhere to take cover again. After what had happened at the pool, though, it would be difficult to feel safe anywhere. Cameron yanked Aaron close to him, and they retreated. His jaw had turned purple from Coburn's punch. We can't keep this up, lad. I'm blowing hot air out me ass. Aaron nodded out of breath himself. I know. We... We have to get out of the open. And go where? asked Fiona. She stopped and gripped her thighs, doubling over and panting. The acidic air caused her to cough and breathe through her shirt. All the buildings are covered in fungus. We'll never make it inside anywhere in time. We can't keep going like this, said Teddy. He was the least out of breath, but still winded. The infected are popping up like daisies. As if to prove him correct, the fungus trembled nearby and a pair of infected adults leapt forth. They immediately staggered towards Fiona, who was taken unawares. She threw up an arm to defend herself, but couldn't get her feet moving fast enough to get out of the way. Aaron yelled out, No! Buzzing wasps filled his head, stinging at his brain. His vision turned green. The world reduced to a pinprick, and he was suddenly back on that lonely road, surrounded by the dead. His brother, Ryan, looked on at him, a smile on his face. He was no longer a demon. That's quite a temper, our kid. Is it all snot and dribble, or are you ready to be a man? Aaron flashed his teeth. You're gone, Ryan. I'm all on my own. Are you? Yes, but I'm not giving up. Ryan smiled. The world rushed back in a whirlwind of colour and sound. Aaron was still reaching towards Fiona, his hand outstretched. She was cowering, waiting to be attacked. But the pair of infected people had pulled back their talons and turned away. They took a few steps and stopped in front of Aaron like soldiers on parade. Aaron sensed something inside himself. A fishhook embedded in his throat attached by a steel cord to the two creatures standing in front of him. Go! Get out of here! The infected turned around and lumbered off. Storm in hell, said Coburn. You can control them! Aaron shook his head in awe. Looks like it. Cameron smirked. You just levelled up, little English. Think you can give Smurflad a hand? Yeah, said Aaron, but only the one. He hurried back to join Helper, who was hunched over and wilting on his three trembling legs. The infected had surrounded him now, and his raised fan vibrated louder and louder, like a motor about to give out. Aaron threw up his hand and bellowed at the threatening horde. Thick off, you ball bags! The infected stumbled to a halt, tentacles dangling by their sides. I said go! The infected turned, and as one began to depart, thick fungus covered their bodies, but chunks of it blackened and fell away as they retreated. Aaron shook his head in disbelief. Ally, said Helper. Then, with his choking voice, he said, Aaron! Chapter 9 They were exhausted but at least with Aaron's newfound abilities, they could now travel in safety. Each time an infected person burst forth from the landscape, Aaron yelled at them to go away, and, miraculously, they did. The ability seemed to get easier and easier the more he used it, like his brain was rewiring itself to be more efficient. Cameron fondled his jaw as they walked and Teddy rubbed at his forearm where his bandage was coming loose. Their newest member, Coburn, seemed to go back and forth between wanting to kill everyone and wanting to run away. For the time being, at least, he chose to stick around. 
clutching his ribs and wincing as he kept up. Helen glanced at him now and then sympathetically. Do we try to clear the entrance to a building? asked Fiona. She was shivering since they'd all left their jackets back at the pool. The only thing they'd brought with them was Helen's box of grenades. She had taken to hugging the crate close to her chest, as if it was some kind of good luck charm. I don't think help us up to clearing an entrance for us right now, said Teddy. The alien walked gingerly beside him, hunched over and silent. The wound from his dismembered fan had opened up and was seeping dark blue blood. Could Helper get an infection? If he had anything resembling an immune system, it would have had no exposure to Earth's countless bacteria. Aaron doubted any human medicine would help in the event he got sick. We can't lose him, he's too important. It was impossible to tell where they were currently, because every road sign was buried beneath two inches of fungus. Aaron wasn't particularly good with geography either, so he couldn't make a guess. Besides Liverpool, Sheffield and Leeds, he didn't know much of where anything else was. He might have been able to locate London or Birmingham on a map, but he had only a vague understanding of where those cities were. It made him realise, once again, how much of his life he had wasted. England wasn't a large country, yet he had barely explored beyond the housing estate he'd grown up in. Manchester was the sum of his life experience. Brilliant people have died all over the world. Soldiers, doctors, scientists, leaders. But I get to survive. It isn't right. I don't deserve it. But I can't throw it away either. My life is worth even more now because of how many people have lost theirs. They continued trudging through the alien landscape. Helper kept the fungus at bay, but he could create only a very narrow corridor of safety. The bugs were everywhere and constantly clung to their trousers as they brushed past the growing stalks. If they lost Helper, they would be infected for sure. I think we're getting a wee bit off the beaten path here, said Cameron. Does anybody have the foggiest idea where we are? Teddy shrugged. Absolutely no idea, other than up to north somewhere. He said it in a Yorkshire accent, despite them being well south of that county. Even Aaron knew that. Looks like an industrial area. Those buildings over there look like factories. Too big to be houses. Aaron looked around, and they agreed that they were most likely in a former industrial area. The buildings were mostly single storey, but vast like warehouses or hangars. The area itself was developed across two levels, and a large slope to their left led downwards. Taking the low road felt safer somehow than remaining up high. Perhaps it would help them stay out of sight. There was no telling how many more takers had landed in the area. Aaron pointed towards the slope. Shall we head down? Maybe it'll take us under a bridge or something. We might be able to stay hidden. Hey, said Cameron. Maybe we can catch a wee nap beneath an overpass like a pack of hobos. Helen chuckled. Wouldn't be the first time you have passed out under a bridge, you wee ogre. Cameron snickered and gave her a playful shove. She retaliated by reaching out and grabbing the back of his arm in a pinch. But then she held on for a moment. The two of them shared a glance, and all seemed well for a moment. Aaron might even have felt hopeful, if not for the harsh lesson life had taught him. Things could always get worse. Fiona shrugged and said, I like the idea of being hidden, so let's check out the slope. Besides... One path is as good as another when you're lost in the middle of nowhere. And so they travelled down the long slope to their left, entering a lower section of whatever city or town they were in. As Aaron had surmised, they found themselves walking alongside a bridge, the road held up by a series of cement archways. A large, fungus-covered patch of ground made up the way ahead and they followed it for a good ten or fifteen minutes, before something caused them to stop and gasp. Water, thought Aaron. 
ordinary water. Why is that such a sight to see? Everybody stopped to admire the murky brown water, as though it were a crystal river running through the centre of Camelot. They had stumbled upon a canal, and several boats bobbed back and forth in the gentle breeze. Barges, Aaron thought. They were called narrow boats. There was no fungus on any of them. The fungus can't grow on the water, said Fiona. We knew that, right? Cameron nodded. Back in Kuljik, I remembered hearing that the fungus hadn't crossed the sea or the oceans. A few of the soldiers used to chat about the British government assembling in Bristol on ships and boats. Maybe this is our future. Maybe mankind will have to take to the seas in order to survive, eh? Teddy pulled a face. I really hope not. I went on a cruise once and puked up every day for a week. Usually, when black people go someplace on a boat, it ends badly. Everyone chuckled, but the joke somehow fell flat. The atrocities of the past, the racism and genocide and everything else, seemed inconsequential now. The world had been reset, and every last human being alive was the same. No more nations, no more races, just human and non-human. Perhaps there really was a chance of something better after all this. If humanity survived, perhaps the sins of the past could finally be forgotten and the future forged in love and unity. In fact, the notion of one man going to war with another seemed more absurd than ever. The notion of one man believing himself to be superior simply because of the colour of his skin was utterly ridiculous. If anything, the only colour that mattered now was the colour of blood. Helper bled blue, humans red and takers a stinking orange. Tangerine was the colour of evil, orange and green. These canals go all over the country, said Coburn. I lived in one once with a couple of mates. Not bad living once you get used to the close confines. Every morning you can wake up someplace new, moor up next to a picturesque pub, enjoy the view for a while, then you get right back on the boat and put your feet up. Your troubles just melt away on the water. Sounds lovely, said Fiona, pushing a strand of dark hair behind her ear. Coburn nodded. Man isn't supposed to stay in one place. We're nomads by nature. A caravan or a riverboat is far more natural than a house made of bricks and mortar. You're some kind of gypsy, asked Cameron. No, said Coburn. But would it be a problem if I were? Cameron shrugged. Not really. I knocked her aim with a travel, alas, once. Only person I ever met that could drink me under the table. You know the tape. I don't drink anymore, said Coburn, so I can't say that I do. Teddy frowned. What's your deal, man? No offence, but you don't look like the kind of guy to spend the early days of the apocalypse helping homeless people survive. Coburn folded his arms, which caused his sleeve to pull back and reveal even more tattoos. Don't judge a book by its cover, I suppose. All those people are gone now anyway, no matter what I tried to do. Teddy nodded. I know, it sucks. Go on though, man. Spill. Who are you? Who am I? Really? Do I have to do this? Okay, fine. I was born on an army base in Germany. My old man was a captain in the Royal Artillery. I probably should have enlisted myself to make him proud, but honestly, I hated the man. He was a bully. He used to knock me and me mad about every time we looked at him wrong. Behind closed doors, he had just about every prejudice you could name. He probably only became a soldier to kill people different from him. Cameron grunted. Can I pick our parents, more's the pity. No, we certainly can't, said Coburn. The only part of my old man I wish I'd inherited was his self-control. The guy had his shit together like you wouldn't believe. He never took a piss without planning it beforehand. He may have had a celebrated career, but his family was only ever window dressing, a way to appear respectable. When I was 15, and after one too many beatings, I ran away from home. We were based in Portsmouth then, so I did north until I reached Bolton. I suppose I was trying to get as far away from my old man as possible, but hitchhiking only got me so far. Turns out life is a lot harder than I expected it to be. 
and I eventually fell in with a bad crowd, sleeping rough and doing drugs. Didn't get my first job until my mid-twenties. After a few stints in prison for petty shit like burglary and dealing weed, I eventually found God. God was the father I'd always needed, the role model to show me the way. I got my shit together, just like my dad, but instead of judging everyone like he did, I chose love and acceptance as my guiding principles. Cameron raised an eyebrow. So, what did you hit me with? Love or acceptance? Coburn looked down at the ground. I apologise for that. My temper is a burden I still struggle with. He held out his tattooed arms, emblazoned with angels and crucifixes. I know what I look like, but these tattoos are a history of my struggle. They remind me every day of how hard life is and what we must do to help each other. He cleared his throat and lowered his arms. So, that's my story. Good enough for you? Teddy nodded. Cool with me? Helen grunted. An age and town of birth would have done me. The rest was a bit melodramatic. Coburn chuckled, but it was full of sadness. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm an oversharer. You can thank AA for that. Wear the truth like a shield and no man may pierce you with his lies. Ray, said Cameron, well, my truth is more like a moth-eaten vest than a shield and it's getting cold out here. We need to find somewhere to spend the night. Some place we're not going to freeze our bums off. We've already found somewhere, said Fiona. She pointed to one of the barges floating on the water, a green painted box decorated with red and yellow flowers. The side of the boat read, Easy Drifter. There's no place safer than one on the water. And Coben said these canals lead all over the country. Maybe we can use them to travel where we need to go. Everyone looked at each other. And while they were all clearly unsure, no arguments came forth. Not until Aaron cleared his throat and decided to play devil's advocate. Don't you need to know what you're doing to operate one of these things? Not really, said Coben. It's just an outboard motor and a tiller. Thing probably only goes about ten miles an hour. The locks are a little complicated at first, but once you know how to raise them, they're pretty simple. You can handle it, Fiona asked him. Yeah, I can take care of things. If you really think we can help by destroying these corkscrews you mentioned, then I want to help. What happened back at the pool? I have to make it mean something. Like Aaron said, I need to spend my anger on something or I'm going to explode. We all need a win, said Teddy. But for now, said Fiona, we need a rest. I say we get this boat open and make ourselves at home. At eight, said Cameron, ladies first. How chivalrous. With a raised eyebrow, Fiona turned and moved over to the easy drifter. It was hitched to a mooring post on the bank, but only half the rope was covered in fungus because its middle section was sunk beneath the water. The barge itself was floating about a foot away from the canal's edge, requiring Fiona to hop a short gap. She did so and landed on a flat semicircular deck at the back of the barge, almost tumbling right over the other side. She grabbed hold of a railing and steadied herself with a sheepish grin. Easy peasy. Come on. I need a man to kick the door in. Coburn hopped up onto the boat with ease and then examined the small wooden door that closed off the cabin from the outside. It was locked, but he was able to bust it open with a weighty kick. He then shielded his face like he'd just opened the door to a hot oven. Yikes, it's a bit fresh in here. Of course it is, said Fiona. It's probably been stewing out here for months. We just need to open the windows and air it out a bit. Let some of that fresh acidic air in, you mean, said Teddy. That'll help. Just come on, said Fiona. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Oh, hey, said Cameron. It's a horse, is it? Here's me thinking it were a boat. Probably be more room on a horse. Fiona yelled at them to stop complaining, then disappeared inside the cabin with Corbin. Aaron watched while Cameron and Teddy hopped the gap and followed after her. That only left him and Helper. After you, said Aaron, but Helper stayed where he was. The alien stumbled to the edge of the canal and eased down on his three legs. It was a position he usually took when he was resting. 
The boat was too small for him. He was seven foot tall. Helper, are you going to be okay out here? Helper leapt, causing Aaron to yell out in fright, and he landed on the roof of the barge with a heavy thud. There, he settled down, seeming to shrink to half his size. Heal, rest. Yeah, said Aaron. You rest our kid, you earned it. What the bloody hell was that? Cameron yelled from inside the cabin. Bloody racket! Aaron chuckled. Then he hopped the gap, quickly ducking inside the cabin to join the others. It was even more cramped than he'd expected, but at the same time it felt safe. They were all together, enclosed in a cocoon floating on the water. The boat, while narrow, was deceptively long, and Aaron could see a pair of single beds at the very end. In the middle was a wide sofa with a slim table suspended over it. Opposite the sofa was a flat-screen TV with wall-mounted speakers. At the entrance to the cabin, where Aaron was standing, was a small kitchenette with a kettle, microwave, and even an oven. It was a little dark inside, but each of the dozen windows was covered by a curtain that could be pulled back. Oh my God, said Fiona. She flicked a lamp on and off in the bedroom. We have electricity. Coburn nodded. The boat will have a separate battery for lights and appliances. It charges up whenever the engine is running. If this thing is still functional, we should be able to keep the lights on at night. Fiona closed her eyes and smiled. That's it. I'm a river woman now. You'll find me on the water. There's a heater here, said Teddy, lifting up a small two-bar heater from where it was sitting on a table beside the sofa. It was plugged into a socket on the wall. All modern cons, yo! Aaron glanced up at the television, wishing they had back all of the things they missed. He imagined switching on the news and seeing what the world was like. Maybe there were planes commencing bombing runs and tanks rolling over the infected. Or they could be the last people on Earth. It was impossible to tell from their small bubble of isolated existence. The small television had a slot in the side for DVDs, which betrayed its age. In fact, everything on the boat was a little outdated, yet somehow made it feel more homely. Modern appliances now seemed cold and lifeless. This boat had soul. People had lived their lives here, and it was part of them. He was grateful to be borrowing it. Suddenly curious, Aaron started rooting around in the cupboards. He found toolkits and manuals and board games and kitchenware. Everything was kind of shoved together with little organisation. Then he found a drawer full of DVDs, loose without cases. Many were blank, with the titles only written on in marker pen. Copies. Aaron realised his hand was trembling as something occurred to him. He grabbed the first disc from the pile, The Nutty Professor, and then looked around for the television's remote. He couldn't find it, so he prodded at the side of the flat screen instead until his fingers found buttons. The television switched on. The disc tray opened. What are you doing? asked Fiona from the other end of the cabin. Just hold on. Aaron inserted the DVD and closed the tray. The intro loop for the nutty professor started to play. Oh my God, said Teddy. We have movies. We, we can watch a movie. So long as the power holds, said Coburn. He seemed a little peeved and Aaron wondered if it was because of Teddy's mild blasphemy. Shit, said Cameron. Ten minutes of the feckin' weather to do me. Anything to feel normal again, eh? We need to make a night of this, said Fiona. She started opening cupboards, frantically pulling out any food she could find. Then she froze. Are you actually kidding me? She pulled her hand out of the cupboard, clutching a large red packet. Popcorn! We have freaking popcorn, people! Aaron dumped himself down on the sofa. Just tell me when to press play. Everyone watched the movie except for Coburn who decided to take a nap on one of the beds at the cabin's rear. Now that they were safe, 
Grief had clearly struck the man with its full force. He'd lost a dozen friends back at the pool, and even Aaron struggled to contemplate that amount of loss in such a short space of time. It was a miracle Coburn had been able to put one foot in front of the other. He was tough. Everybody chuckled quietly to themselves as they watched the movie, munching on popcorn and enjoying Eddie Murphy acting a loon a decade before Aaron had even been born. The stupidity of the story only made it more enjoyable. Nothing like real life at all. And that was a gift. You reckon Eddie's still alive? asked Teddy quietly. Helen shrugged. I'm sure one of his kids is. He had like a hundred. With one of the spy skills, right? Scary spice. I always like the cartwheeling one, said Cameron. Bendy lass. The electricity remained on for the entire movie. Although during the last half hour, the cabin's lamps started to flicker. Once the credits rolled, everyone wiped tears from their eyes and let out a satisfied sigh. It had been a long while since any of them had enjoyed movie night. The cabin had grown stuffy thanks to the space heater on the table, so Helen went and switched it off, letting the red glowing bars cool down. Fiona got up and stretched, then put her hands against the small of her back. She arched backwards, exposing her midriff, and let out a throaty groan. Aaron realised he was staring at her, so he looked away before anyone noticed. It felt wrong to be so relaxed after how much they'd lost. It felt reckless when there was a new, even deadlier threat to deal with. The takers weren't going away. What had happened today was merely a first encounter. The next would probably kill Aaron and his friends. By this time tomorrow, they might all be reduced to a bloody mist. But not tonight. We have tonight. Fiona reached into a cupboard above the sofa. Wonder if there are any spare blankets? We'll have to bed down wherever there's a space. Ah, jackpot. She reached in and yanked out a woolen blanket one of the fuzzy kinds that Aaron had always hated. As it came free, it dragged something along with it that bounced off Cameron's head as he sat on the sofa. Watch it, you daft mare. Almost had my bleeding eye out. Helen, sitting next to Cameron, leant down and retrieved the fallen item beneath the table, which turned out to be a see-through plastic bag full of something brown, like tea leaves or coffee grounds. God, I love this boat said Fiona, her eyes lighting up as she stared at whatever it was in Helen's hand. It's skunk. Aaron covered his nose with his forearm. I think it's gone off. Smells like a farm. Fiona and Teddy shared a look with one another, and then both of them laughed. You never smoked weed before, Fiona asked Aaron. He shook his head. Bad for your lungs. We're all breathing in acid, said Teddy and we'll probably be murdered painfully before the end of the week. Lung health ain't worth worrying about no more, mate. Too right, said Fiona. We need to find some roll-ups and a lighter. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Cameron cleared his throat and fidgeted on the sofa. You sure that's a good idea, Fee? Not trying to be your da, but you know. Fiona's face creased into a scowl, but she took a breath and sent it away. Cam, I know you worry about me and I love you for it, but I need this. I need to zone out in the safety of this boat and not have to worry about anything for a while, just for one night. It's not like I can go anywhere or do anything. We can barely move our elbows in here. Let the girl relax, Cam, said Helen, handing over the bag of weed to Fiona. I'll look after her, providing she shares. Me too, said Teddy. We'll just take it easy and catch a little mellow. Worst that weed ever does is make you sleepy anyway. Cameron blew air out of his cheeks. Just don't cause me any headaches. Fiona hopped up and down, making the floor vibrate. We won't, I promise. Teddy helped Fiona search the rest of the cabin until they found some roll-ups and tobacco. They found a pink disposable lighter in a drawer and used it to light the spliff, expertly rolled by Fiona. Teddy took the first puff and immediately started choking. 
He covered his mouth and chuckled. Been a while. Give it here, said Fiona, and she snatched the smouldering spliff out of his fingers. She put it to her lips and inhaled deeply, eyes rolling back in her head. There it is. That's what I've been missing. Aaron glanced at Cameron and saw the anxious expression on his face. The big Scot turned and saw Aaron staring at him. The two of them shared a worried look. Fiona offered the spliff to Aaron. Here you go. No thanks. I don't think now's a good time to start a drug habit. Oh, give over. Now's the perfect time. Don't you want to shut off for a while? He shook his head. Not really. Usually when I shut off, I wake up attacking somebody. Fiona prodded the spliff at him. Go on. No, really, thanks. Aaron, don't be a killjoy. The lad said no. Cameron put a clenched fist down gently on the table, like some kind of warning. Have your fun, Fee. But the lad said no. Fiona gawked at Cameron for a moment. But then she shrugged her shoulders. Fine, no problem. Just trying to be the mischievous aunt. We're all family, right? She turned to Aaron and winked. Everyone needs a naughty auntie. Aaron's tummy fluttered. Oh, I might try later. I'm just not feeling like it right now. No worries, man, said Teddy. We all do what we do. The tension that had been rising slowly drifted away and everyone relaxed again. Teddy, Fiona and Helen smoked the weed while Cameron and Aaron declined. Cameron and Aaron did, however, get a pot of tea on the go, in itself a divine drug, another simple pleasure once taken for granted. Jesus, that's good, said Cameron, sipping carefully. Aaron sipped his and sighed. You're telling me? Me man would always have a brew on the go. Made everything a little easier, she'd say. Acrid smoke gradually filled the cabin. But unlike the naturally acidic air bred by the fungus, this atmosphere Aaron did not like. It caused a pressure in his chest that made him want to cough, and he had an unshakable sensation that his body was being polluted. Clearing his throat, he had to excuse himself to get some fresh air away from the carcinogenic fog. Outside on the back deck, the fresh air hit Aaron like an open palm across the cheek. He hadn't realised how drowsy he'd been, but he quickly became alert, which was why he sensed Cameron stepping out behind him. You okay, Cam? Eh, just been a day, eh? Yeah, after cool Drake, I thought I was used to death. I'm not. Means you're still human, lad. Don't lose it. Never stop being horrified by what's happening. If anything, said Aaron, I'm only becoming more horrified. This'll never be over, will it, even if we win? Cameron moved up beside him and stared out at the water shimmering gently in the dying sunlight, reflecting the neon colours of the sky. Life is what we make of it, lad. We have to concentrate on the good. What good? He shrugged. I've always been a loner, but now I'm surrounded by people I care about. It's filled a hole in me, and I didn't even know it was there. That's what I hold on to. That's my good in all of this fecking bad. You cut me arm off? Because I love you, lad. Aaron huffed. Yeah, right. Cameron gave him a shove that almost knocked him overboard. I mean it. When Ryan died, it's like I took over as your big brother. Not that I would ever try to replace him. You don't have to replace him. You mean as much to me as Ryan did. Maybe more despite you cutting me limbs off from time to time. Cameron beamed, his cheeks glowed red, eyes flickering back and forth. I'll try to avoid it in the future, lad. Anyway, I best get inside and keep an eye on the retrobates. Aaron nodded. I'm worried about Fiona, Cam. Me too, lad. But sometimes you have to let people make their own mistakes. I'm proud of you, by the way. For some of us, it's way too easy to give in to booze and drugs. It takes strength to say no, especially these days. That's why I came out here. Just to let you know that you shouldn't let anyone pressure you into doing what you know is wrong. Fiona was out of order. Honestly, I only said no because I'm scared. I've changed so much already. 
I'm worried I might lose myself completely if I'm not careful. We won't let that happen. Be careful out here on your own, eh? You know clumsy English are. Cameron went back inside and left Aaron alone with his thoughts. When he heard a noise behind him, he turned and saw Helper still perched on the roof like a nesting duck. The alien had no eyelids, but sometimes he seemed to go to sleep, remaining still for hours. He seemed to be sleeping now. His fan was closed and pressed tightly against his torso. All three of his legs were bent at the joint. His body was only a few inches from the ground. You dreaming, buddy? Do you have a family someplace? Or have you lost everyone? What's your planet like? I can't even imagine. Aaron felt at peace now that he was out of the weed smoke. He didn't know how Fiona and the others could stand it. It was like breathing in death. Is that what it's like for them all the time now? Breathing in an alien atmosphere? How can they bear it? Even thinking about the poisonous atmosphere inside the cabin made Aaron cough. And when he did, it brought a voice muttering inside his head. Shit, what was that? Aaron held on to the railing and turned sideways, looking towards the flat ground that had brought them to the canal. Shadows seemed to dance, shambling towards the water, towards the barge. They found us. They know we're here. Just like at the swimming pool, we can't hide. Aaron panicked, then remembered he was safe on the water, and also that he had the ability to control the infected. Go away, he yelled. Not tonight. Just not tonight. The dancing shadows grew larger. Getting closer, Aaron yelled at them again. But all it did was summon Cameron back out from inside the cabin. We got trouble, lad. Aaron nodded towards the bank. Infected, a bunch of them over there. Well, it should be okay on the water, eh? We can pull up the ropes and push ourselves into the middle of the canal if need be. But you can send them on their way, eh? I'm trying to, but it's not working. He shook his head frustrated that the infected were continuing to approach. Stay here. What? No, wait. Aaron hopped across the gap and landed on the bank. He trotted up the hill and hurried to head off the infected. There were a dozen of them at least, forming a pack that couldn't have assembled by random. This was an attack squad looking to finish what had begun at the pool. Go away! I command you to leave! The infected stumbled towards him, his head filled with whispers, words that meant nothing, perhaps spoken by an alien tongue. I said go! But the infected continued. Their whispers grew louder, so loud that Aaron clutched his head and growled, Ah, it hurts! Aaron! Cameron shouted from the barge. What are you doing? Get back on the boat! No! No, I have to! The infected were on him, whipping at him with their talons and parting the flesh of his upraised forearm. He tripped and fell down, falling into the blackened fungus left behind by Helper's earlier passage. The ash clung to his bleeding flesh. Why have they stopped listening to me? How can they see me now? Another talon struck Aaron, slicing into the muscle above his knee. He cried out in agony and shuffled away on his back. Cameron yelled from the boat, Aaron, hold on! The infected continued their assault, whipping at Aaron over and over again. He avoided most of the attacks, only by rolling frantically sideways. But he was totally defenceless. Trying to get to his feet with only one hand, while also having to dodge, was too difficult. He made it only as far as his knees. Cameron appeared on the bank, and threw himself at one of the infected. As he did so, his sprained ankle twisted beneath him and he went down in a heap, bellowing out in pain. The infected turned their attention to him, attracted by the noise. Aaron got to his feet and rushed to help Cameron, but a shock ran up his spine and froze him in place. Help me, lad! Aaron stared at Cameron. What are you doing? Aaron, help me! We saw an ankle! The infected bore down on Cameron, raising their talons and preparing to slice him to ribbons. Death! Plague! 
helper rushed up the bank and barged the infected away before they could attack Cameron. A whole heap of infected had arrived now, coming from the direction of the slope. Helper lifted his fan and attempted to destroy them, but they were too many, too close. They sliced at Helper with their talons, drawing bloody furrows across his glossy blue flesh. He grunted in pain, a sound all too human. Aaron couldn't move, but hands grabbed him from behind. They belonged to Teddy. His eyes were wide and puffy, but his actions were firm and focused. He dragged Aaron back towards the barge while Coburn and Helen helped Cameron. The infected surrounded Helper, whipping at him from all angles. Aaron shoved Teddy away, back in control of his body. We need to get him out of there! Shit, man, the infected are everywhere! We can't leave him! Aaron raced towards Helper, grabbing an infected woman and throwing her to the ground. Then he pushed himself in front of Helper and took a talon intended for him. Aaron felt the skin of his chest part and the warmth of his own spilled blood. He bit down on the pain and shoved Helper backwards, which was no mean feat considering the difference in their size and weight. The breathing room allowed Helper to lift his fan and fight back. The nearest infected trembled and rotted away. Teddy arrived and soccer kicked an infected man's legs out from under him. Then he leapt up and booted another in the chest. Helen and Coburn got Cameron back to the boat, helper backpedaled towards safety. Come on, man, said Teddy. We've got to get back on the water. Aaron was bleeding all over, but the pain wasn't so bad. He went with Teddy willingly, both of them racing back to the boat. Helper was in a bad way right behind them, bleeding from a dozen wounds. He stumbled back and forth, barely staying on his feet. More infected people arrived in the direction of the slope. Cameron hopped the gap between the plank and the boat and immediately collapsed onto the deck, grabbing his ankle and hissing. The others leapt across after him, joined finally by Aaron and Teddy. Aaron immediately turned around and called out to Helper, who was teetering by the edge of the canal. Death, the alien said and then he leapt back onto the roof. For a moment, it looked like he wasn't going to make it. His leap was underpowered and the angle slightly off, but then his legs struck the roof of the boat, and he went tumbling onto his front, almost skidding right over the opposite side and into the water. Fortunately, he came to a halt just in time. Aaron stumbled against the railing and tried to catch his breath. His blood dripped onto the deck and pattered against his shoes. Cameron snarled in pain, still gripping his ankle. Why did you run off, you idiot? Could have got yourself killed. I'm sorry, said Aaron. I thought, I thought I could send them all away. The infected gathered at the edge of the canal. Over a dozen of them now, with more on the way. They whipped their talons at the boat, but couldn't quite reach it. Help was in a bad way, said Teddy, standing on his tiptoes and peering at the prone alien lying on the roof. Helper was breathing but barely moving and sprawled on his side. Now the sun had nearly gone down, his skin looked more grey than blue. You should have stayed on the boat, said Coburn, shaking his head. We were safer on the water. There's no need for you to leave. I just wanted to help. Send them away like before. You've got a goddamn messiah complex, lad, said Cameron. Always needing to put yourself in harm's way. Are you trying to lose your other arm? No, I... Teddy sighed. It was a bad move, man. You took off on your own, and others had to pay for it. Survival's a team game, right? This ain't all about you. Aaron nodded. I thought it would be easy, but, but hey, they didn't listen to me. I told them to leave, but they ignored me. I don't understand. There's a hell of a lot we need understand, said Cameron, which is why you shouldn't run off half-cocked. Feck's sake, lad. I'm barely going to be able to walk on this ankle. Let's, let's just get back inside for Christ's sake. Maybe if those things lose sight of us, they'll pass off. Teddy put his hands on his hips and huffed. I doubt it, man. They're coming from everywhere. Aaron lowered his head as everyone went back inside the cabin. Cameron stayed behind, and the big Scot leant in towards Aaron, his voice low. 
You stood there and did nought when I fell. They were going to rip me apart and you just stood there and watched. So something came over me. I just froze. Aye. Cameron shook his head in disgust. Then without a word, he ducked back inside the cabin and rejoined the others. Aaron glanced up at Helper, knowing that if the alien didn't make it, it would be his fault. People always get hurt around me. They get hurt and they die. Somehow I always survive. His lungs itched, causing him to cough. It was the smell of the weed floating out of the cabin. Poison. There was no way he could stand it. So he remained outside, alone on the deck, watching the infected gather on the bank. An army of the dead. Chapter 10 Aaron awoke to moonlight, choking and wheezing, and certain that he was dying. His throat was full of garbage, and he couldn't catch a breath. Up on his knees, he coughed and hacked as hard as he could until the blockage mercifully came loose and spattered all over the deck. He stared at the resulting puddle, waiting for his eyes to adjust to the darkness, but when they didn't, he reached out and prodded at the mess. It was spongy and moist, chunks of fungus. He'd coughed up fungus. Helen came out of the cabin. A protracted yawn suggested she'd been woken up. Everything I'd ate, she asked, then glanced towards the bank, where there were now several dozen infected. I thought I heard retching. Aaron wiped his mouth. I was being sick. I, I don't feel right. I had to breathe. It's the weed. We stopped smoking hours ago. I know, but I think it poisoned me. From second-hand smoke, give over. Aaron rose up on his knees. No, it poisoned the fungus inside me. Helen recoiled, but then cautiously reached out to him. He flinched as she poked at his face and felt something peel away from his eyeball. Helen showed him the ragged scrap of fungus she'd plucked free, dangling it between her finger and thumb. Your eyes back to normal. Your lip too. Aaron prodded at his face. The thick vein in his bottom lip had reduced, and the green tint from his vision was gone. The last of the fungus inside me. I think it died. Helen nodded appreciatively. Your hopes of one day getting laid are stud. It's the weed, he said. Something in the weed killed it off. So you're saying weed cured you? Well, if we don't legalise it now, when will we? Aaron put his hand to his temple and closed his eyes, listening for the whispers. You're not out of the woods yet, our kid. I'm still here. We all are. Aaron groaned. What is it? Helen asked him. Nothing. I just... I thought I was all better, but I'm not. He stood up and faced the infected on the bank. He told them to go away, and several of them turned to leave. Many more did not. Probably takes practice, said Helen, stifling another yawn. Aaron nodded thoughtfully. The weed had weakened him, which was perhaps why he could no longer control the infected. He could still feel the fish hooks in his brain reaching out to attach themselves to the people on the banks but somehow he couldn't reel them in. If the whispers are still in my head, I'm still not fully in control of myself. I'm still a danger to everyone around me. There are so many voices now, more and more all the time. We need to move from here, said Aaron. I feel something bad is coming. Helen sighed and nodded. I'll go let Cameron know. He wanted to wait until morning, but perhaps we can take shifts. You're going to take my word just like that? She shrugged. Are you lying? No. Well, then I'll go and tell the others. Aaron leant back against the railing and tried to decipher the voices in his head. Once again, the words were alien, but one voice was louder than all the rest. Powerful and demanding. It wanted something from Aaron. He knew it belonged to a taker. That's why the infected stopped listening to me. My voice is too quiet. The takers have more power over their minds than I do. Once again, he shouted at the infected to leave 
but this time none of them obeyed. They were in orbit of something greater now, something that demanded them to assemble into an army and a mass along the canal. Coburn came out a few minutes later, rubbing sleep from his eyes. He looked far better than Helen did, due to opting for a nap over smoking weed. Helen said we need to be on the move, he said. You think danger's coming? I thought we were safe on the water. Aaron rubbed at his forehead. I don't know anything for sure. I just have a feeling we need to move now. Coburn watched the infected amassed on the bank. Can't say I have a problem with that. Might even benefit us to move by night. These things might find it as hard to see in the dark as we do. Let's hope so. Coburn started rooting around at the back of the boat, loosening a drawstring threaded around a vinyl bag. Underneath the bag was a large outdoor motor with a handle fixed to the top. Cross your fingers, said Coburn, and he grabbed the engine's pull cord. He gave it a harsh yank and the motor grumbled to life, but then faltered. He yanked the cord two more times and the engine spluttered to life, emitting a thin grey smoke cloud out the back. Aaron waved his hand in front of his nose. Do we need petrol? Most of these things run on diesel. We can probably scavenge some along the way. Most narrow boats have a jerry can full of fuel for emergencies. Failing that, we can push ourselves along with poles if we can find some. Many ways to skin a cat. There might even be a can of diesel hidden on the boat somewhere if we looked for it. Aaron realised then that Coburn was a practical man, someone who focused on solutions rather than what-ifs. They were lucky to have him especially after we contributed to killing everyone he cared about. Coburn took the tiller and turned them around in the water. This section of the canal was relatively wide, but it still required Coburn to reverse halfway through the manoeuvre in order to make the turn. In order to see ahead, you had to look right across the long roof of the boat. It was like driving a car from inside the boot. Coburn looked strangely majestic, as he stood there, one hand buried in the pocket of his jeans. In the dark, his tattoos merged and gave him a dark, mottled complexion, like some kind of fairy tale creature instead of a man. Most of Aaron's companions had gained a majority of their scars due to the last several months, but Coburn seemed to have spent a lifetime collecting his. They set off, puttering along on the water. Thanks for coming with us, said Aaron. Thanks for forgiving us what happened. Who said I've forgiven you? Look, mate, I'm pretty easy going when it comes to people and their mistakes, but let's not run before we can walk. I lost a dozen of my friends because of your arrival. People I cared about. It's only the fact we're at war and that your enemy is my enemy that I'm able to put that to one side for now. I don't know your people, but from what I've seen so far, I'm not entirely sure we're a good fit. We're decent people, Coburn. I promise you'll see. Coburn nodded but said nothing else. From the way he stared directly ahead, it seemed like he wanted to be left alone. Aaron didn't dare go inside, however, as there was still a faint stench of weed. The odour sickened him and made his lungs itch again. He didn't know what effect it had on him exactly, but it certainly wasn't positive. The alien fungus was a delicate life form, despite being sent to Earth to destroy all life, and it needed the right atmospheric conditions to thrive. Perhaps the Colombians were surviving just fine, burning their crop fields and polluting the air, having a whale of a time as they breathed in the intoxicating fumes. The infected followed along on the bank, but their clumsy movements were too slow and they gradually faded into the distance. New infected people popped up now and then in various places, but they were not organised like the group back near the slope. The further the boat travelled along the canal, the quieter the voices in Aaron's head became. Only the loud voice remained, still demanding and forceful, but its words meant nothing, more like chanting than talking. It drove Aaron to distraction, though, and he gritted his teeth to try and force the noise out of his head. Twenty minutes later, 
when the voice finally began to fade. It was a blessed relief, but not total silence. Left behind was a ringing. Aaron rubbed at his temples and stepped away from the railing. The ringing faded. No, it's not fading. It moved. It moved inside my head. Aaron turned slowly back towards the railing, and the ringing seemed to change position, moving from the back of his skull to the front. It stayed in the same place while his head rotated. It's like I'm hearing something with me ears and knowing which direction it's coming from. So what is it? What causes the ringing? What are you doing? Coburn asked him, still standing at the tiller. You have having a panic attack. Just breathe, mate. No, not a panic attack. I, I hear something. Well, not really here. It's more like a sense something. These canals, do they only go in one direction or are there different routes? Coburn nodded. Canals are no different to roads. There'll be various routes ahead, all leading to different places. Why? Because I can hear a corkscrew. We're getting near to one. Okay, said Coburn. Just tell me which way to go. Aaron coughed as he caught another subtle whiff of weed. That stink's gonna kill me, he said. Coburn narrowed his eyes. The weed? Not the most pleasant smell, is it? Glad I gave all that nonsense up. As mind-altering substances go, weed's a mild offender. But I must have put on three stones as a teenager because of it. That took some going, considering I was homeless at the time. Aaron tittered. I can't even imagine the life you must have led. Makes me feel a little pathetic now for how mollycoddled I used to be. I always thought me and my brother were poor growing up, but I guess we were pretty lucky. One thing I've learned, Aaron, is that misery doesn't discriminate. In my AA group, I had millionaires sitting next to single mums living on welfare. Their happiness had little to do with money and material possessions. I'll tell you the secret to being happy. It's purpose. Spend your life doing something you're passionate about, and misery will rarely find you. That's why the happiest people you'll ever meet are those spending their lives helping others or working for a cause. Can't say I don't miss playing Call of Duty for nine hours straight sometimes, but I get your point. Cameron is a completely different person since the world ended. It's like he's been waiting his whole life for this. He found his purpose, said Coburn, his reason for being. From the look on your face, Aaron, I'm not sure you found yours yet. Destroying the corkscrews, that's my purpose. Is it? For now, yeah. I don't see what else I could be doing. Sometimes our passion has to find us rather than the other way around. My passion was keeping people safe. I hope I can rediscover it again soon. Aaron chewed his lip for a moment. It felt strange now that the bulging vein was gone. I really am sorry for what we brought to you. Me too, he nodded. Here, yeah, there's a turn coming up. Doncaster or Huddersfield? Aaron stared ahead across the boat's long roof. Helper was still sleeping, and he blocked most of the view. But by leaning, Aaron could see the split in the canal ahead. One way going straight, the other veering to the right. He closed his eyes and slowly rotated his head, concentrating on the barely audible ringing. Right, he said, go right. Huddersfield it is then. Coburn shifted the tiller and the boat turned diagonally. The nose almost banged against the canal wall and missed only by a few inches. Aaron couldn't work out if it was deftness or luck. Either way, Coburn remained calm and seemed to know what he was doing. Huddersfield, thought Aaron. I don't think that's far from Manchester. I'm nearly home. He looked back through the small window set in the top of the cabin's door. His companions were all inside, probably sleeping. Or is this home? We're all nomads now. Sophie glanced over her shoulder, wary of the senior nurse tending to patients right behind her. It wasn't often she was allowed into the dispensary at the Royal Infirmary, but Nathan's leg was healing poorly and causing him pain. So the doctor had authorised a small dose of morphine and a week's allocation of vancomycin 
to clear up an infection around the wounds where his tibia had broken through his skin. It gave Sophie the perfect opportunity to gain access to several restricted substances. Potassium, magnesium, peroxide, alcohol, polystyrene containers. Grab whatever you can. Here's a list. Sophie could barely believe she was doing this. Collecting volatile chemicals for a man she barely knew. If she got caught, she would become one of the sudden unannounced gunshots that now seemed to happen on an hourly basis in the city. But it was those gunshots that had caused her to do this. After listening to Nathan's lectures on man's inhumanity to man, and specifically the tyrannical aspirations of the new Scottish leadership party, she had decided that innocent people were in danger. It had been days since she'd seen an infected person. So who exactly was being executed? Edinburgh's population was growing increasingly sullen. Afraid. Voiceless. The food rationing had tightened, as Nathan had predicted, and dead bodies now littered the streets, along with the homeless and mad. Soldiers quickly carted corpses away to the pyres, but it was impossible to keep it a secret. The subtext was clear. The city's lower classes existed only to serve those deemed important, those chosen for whatever future was to come. A byproduct of the mass poverty and starvation was a huge increase in people volunteering to join the army, which further increased the government's might and grip on the population. There are soldiers on every street now. Soon people won't be able to whisper without being heard. Sophie had already gathered cleaning supplies for one of Nathan's contacts, a small man she met each night in an alleyway near the infirmary where she and Nancy worked. Based on the chemicals he was asking for, he was clearly making a bomb. And I'm helping him. I'm getting a stranger the materials he needs to make an IED or a dozen IEDs. What am I doing? Sophie pocketed a few vials of medicine and a few packets of pills. Then she took what she had actually been sent there for, antibiotics and pain relief. She waved to the nurse and said goodbye. See you later, Maggie. Hold on a minute, you. Sophie froze. She had deposited the stolen supplies in a pouch behind her apron, just a small amount. But she felt herself trembling as the nurse marched over to her. She had met this other woman only once before and had found her a little abrupt and a little nosy. Maggie smiled at Sophie knowingly. Remember what we spoke about last time? Ah, um... The woman reached into her nurse's uniform and pulled something out of her pocket. It was small enough that she could hide it in a closed fist. You told me about your mother-in-law, Nancy, wasn't it? Sophie went blank. What is this woman talking about? Last time I was here, I was stealing iodine. If we spoke about anything, it was just nervous chit-chat to keep her from being suspicious. Maggie raised an eyebrow at Sophie. You must have forgotten. She opened her hand revealing a couple of tiny orange objects. You said she was having trouble sleeping at night because of all the snoring and coughing. I found some earplugs on one of the wards and immediately thought of you. Sophie put her hands against her cheeks. You're right. I totally forgot. I can't believe you thought of me. That's so kind. She took the earplugs. Thank you, Maggie. Sure, no problem. Hey, do you fancy getting a drink tonight at the spatula? The spatula? Maggie chuckled. Yeah, it's the greasy spoon on Tanner's Lane. A lot of us nurses go there at night. Almost makes life seem normal. You should come. It would be nice to see a new face. Especially one as pretty as yours. Sophie smiled to buy herself a second to process. She's hitting on me. I suppose that's okay, but... Yeah, this is uncomfortable. I just need to get out of here with the stolen supplies. Sure, I might be able to make it, she said breezily. Tanner's Lane, right? I'll have to see how Nancy's feeling. She's not doing great at the moment. Maggie reached out and touched Sophie on the elbow. She probably just needs a good night's sleep. The earplugs will help with that. You deserve a break. It'll be fun. Sophie nodded. Okay. I'll do my best. Thanks, Maggie. 
And hey, I'll even forget about the bits and bobs you've got stuffed under your apron. Sophie felt an icy dagger pierce her stomach. What? Ah! Maggie waved a hand. Don't worry. Inventory is a complete mess at the moment, so nobody knows what's where. A few extra shots of morphine won't be missed, so you're good. It's for your patience, right? What? Oh, yeah, of course. We don't have any at the clinic. Maggie nodded, then leant in, conspiratorially, close enough that Sophie could smell her perfume. The way we're forced to withhold pain medication from people in pain is a disgrace. We have far more medicine than you'd think. Enough that people shouldn't be dying in agony. You're a good person to risk yourself for the people under your care, Sophie. Makes you a good nurse. Sophie blushed. But it was from a fading panic, not embarrassment. I'm not actually a nurse, not like you. Hey, you take care of sick and injured people for twelve hours a day. That makes you a nurse. Tanner's Lane, okay? I'll see you there. She tapped her on the shoulder playfully. Don't make me report you, you dirty thief. Sophie giggled, but she had a sinking feeling. Maggie had made the threat as a joke, but it was still a threat. If anything, it showed that Sophie wasn't as skilled a thief as she'd thought. She'd been stealing supplies for the last two days now. Had anyone else seen her? Suddenly, she felt like there was a red dot on her forehead. A bullet might arrive at any moment. She bid Maggie farewell and raced out of the door, carrying her stolen goods beneath her apron. Tonight, she would tell Nathan's contact that she was out. The city was a corrupt cesspit, but she would rather be alive in it than die in it. What was I thinking? Chapter 11 It was the middle of the night, and the barge had been parked up for the last twenty minutes. Coburn had been at the tiller when Aaron had told the man to stop. They were just north of Stoke-on-Trent. A corkscrew lay nearby. I can hear it ringing like a wet finger round the edge of a wine glass. Coburn and Aaron had agreed to leave the others sleeping. Fiona, Helen and Teddy needed to get the weed out of their system before they could be of much use. And it was probably unwise, setting off across a treacherous landscape in the dark anyway. Better to see out the corkscrew at first light. So, Coburn had gone to catch a few more hours rest, while Aaron had remained outside alone. Aaron stood at the railing at the back of the barge. He wasn't feeling sleepy at all. In fact, he felt wide awake. It had been many hours since he'd eaten as well. What's happening to me? I don't feel human. The only thing I could taste is the acid in the air. The area around the barge was identical to the miles and miles of landscape they'd put behind them. Fungus covered everything. Buildings rose like grassy mountains, cars like mossy boulders. All traces of humanity's architecture, design and influence were gone. This was an alien world. For now, we're taking it back. There was just one problem. Helper wasn't doing well. The alien was still asleep on the roof and had barely moved in hours. It was unclear if he was dying, healing, or simply resting, but it seemed unlikely he would get up soon. How long could they afford to wait? Without helper, they couldn't brave the fungus, or at least nobody but Aaron could. Likewise, they risked being found by the takers. Did the alien invaders have the same vulnerability to water as the fungus? Or would they simply leap aboard the boat and dismember everybody? They wouldn't even need to do that. They could just stand at the water's edge and obliterate us with a pulse. Our only hope is destroying the corkscrew as soon as possible. We can't delay. I can't delay. There were three or four infected people on the bank, but they weren't interested in the barge. Once again, Aaron seemed to be invisible to them, and he assumed... It was because there were no takers nearby to take control of them like puppets. Perhaps it also meant that he would once again be able to influence them. He narrowed his eyes and concentrated, 
focusing on a shambling woman with so much fungus around her head that it hung in front of her like a watermelon. Lie down, get on the ground. To Aaron's delight, the woman leant forward, her heavy head causing her to overbalance, and crumpled to the ground. There she remained. Aaron focused on another of the infected, this one a child. Go away! The child turned slowly and walked off into the distance. I'm back in control. The infected are no threat to me. Nor is the fungus. Aaron glanced back at Helper. The alien had given so much of himself to help them. He had lost an appendage and was now crisscrossed in glistening wounds. It was time for him to rest, but Aaron's friends could do nothing without his protection. The fungus would infect them, the infected would attack them, but not me. I'm the only one who can leave the barge safely. Aaron eyed the bank, a flat section leading up to a series of long rectangular hills. Terraced housing, perhaps? Cameron will kill me if I run off on my own again. But isn't it worth the risk if it keeps the others safe? Aaron blinked, still feeling wide awake. He was suddenly certain that he would never sleep again. It was a human need, and he was no longer human. As much as it pained him, he was an outsider and would forever be one. There would be no happy ending for him, no post-apocalyptic family or well-earned relaxation. He was a casualty of war. It meant he had nothing left to lose. Except my friends. I've already lost so many people. I won't lose more. Aaron moved along the railings so that he was facing the bank. He placed one foot over onto the edge and then the other. He stood for a moment, waiting for Cameron to leap out and grab him. What the feck you doing, lad? But no one awoke inside the cabin. It was just him and the darkness. Just him and the other monsters. He hopped the gap and landed on the bank. An infected man nearby turned in his direction, but then shuffled off in another direction. It had heard the noise of Aaron's landing, but saw nothing. I'm invisible, which is why I'm going to walk right up to the corkscrew and destroy it. Cameron will go mad. Only if I fail. Glancing back at the barge one last time, Aaron headed into the fungus-covered wasteland, ready to take whatever risks he had to if it kept his friends safe. The acidic air flowed through him, making him feel light and alert. The whispers returned, muttering at the back of his mind, sometimes screaming, but he was too used to them now to let them bother him. His head ached, but the less he focused on it, the more distant the pain became. Aaron passed by the first fungus-covered buildings, alive with millions or billions of pestilent-spreading bugs. The landscape shimmered with their endless movements. Overhead, the moon fought against the vibrant colours of the night sky. Was it the changes to the atmosphere that had dyed the horizon? Or were more alien spacecrafts coming? There had been no more earthquakes, which was a good sign but how far away could they be felt? Would he feel it if new takers were landing 50 miles away? 30? 10? The tremors had been substantial up close, but Aaron had no idea how far the shock waves could travel. The further he moved into the city of Stoke, the more infected people he came across. The tingle at the back of his spine warned him of danger, but the enemy paid him no mind for the time being. Their talons dangled by their sides, most standing completely still. Even the whispers in his head had grown muted and inert. The infected were sleeping, or whatever their version of it was. Like Aaron, they seemed to have no need for closing their eyes. Aaron followed the ringing in his head. As before, he could sense its direction. It was louder now, as if the water had been dulling the sound. The fungus was higher, too, perhaps for the same reason. It rose all around him, 
and he had to part the stalks with great difficulty, with only one arm in order to get through it. Eventually, he was so buried in it that all he saw of the infected were the tops of their heads moving about in the gaps between the stalks. The alien landscape sent him right back to Quirikel, the last time he had fully been himself. The infection had only just taken hold, and he had still possessed two arms. He remembered forcing himself onwards with Ranger's help, and the thought of doing it again without her caused him to swallow a lump in his throat. This time he was truly alone, with not even an animal to accompany him. Yet he knew he could do this. He could sense that a corkscrew was near, and he would destroy it. The landscape would blacken and turn to ash, ready to be renewed by Mother Nature. The infected would shrivel away. Bugs would pop like blisters. Perhaps the takers, too, would be dealt a mortal blow. He hoped so. Aaron stopped to take a breath. While he no longer seemed to grow tired, he could still become exhausted. In fact, he fell to weakness worryingly fast. He leant against the thick body of a fungal stalk and caught his breath for a few moments. Bugs dropped onto his neck and wriggled under his collar. But his disgust wasn't strong enough to panic him. He merely gritted his teeth and waited as they slid down his sweating back and fell out of his shirt. Did the bugs, like the infected, know that he was immune to the spread? It wasn't as if they bit or stung. They spread the organism by secreting that sticky green oil that had first revealed itself on Sean's palms. Aaron put his own hand to his lower back and rubbed. When he brought it around in front of him, his fingertips were tacky and green. Good try, but your bug phlegm is wasting on me. He stomped a few bugs underfoot for his own satisfaction. Soon he hoped to destroy them all in a very wide radius. Once he had caught his breath, he moved on, pushing aside thickening stalks. He could no longer see the infected, but he could hear their whispers. They were excited about something. Perhaps he was near the corkscrew, and they knew what was coming. It could lie only ten feet away, and he wouldn't yet see it, but he was getting close, really close. Movement up ahead, the stalks swaying. It wasn't enough to concern Aaron, for it was likely just an infected person. But then he heard the barking. What the? A dog, out here. The coincidence both excited and concerned him. Any animal in this dense alien forest would surely be infected by now. But if it had only recently entered the area, it might still be more dog than monster. Aaron shoved his way through the stalks, trying not to overexert himself and grow tired again. The dog barked, sounding closer. The whispers in his head became mocking jeers, almost drowning out the barking. But he told them to be quiet and pushed ahead, sliding into gaps and forcing himself onward. There was an infected man standing in his way, but he paid it no mind. Until it barked at him. Aaron froze. The infected man looked directly at him through one green eye and one dead human eye. It opened its mouth wide and let out another perfect imitation of a canine barking. Ranger. It's imitating Ranger. Because I was thinking about her. Does it know my thoughts? Be quiet, go away. The infected person laughed then lashed out with its talon and struck Aaron across the face, slicing right through his left eyeball. His vision suddenly halved, and a lightning bolt struck his brain. Suddenly Aaron felt all too human again, as mortal terror took hold of him. He staggered away from the infected man who had just half-blinded him and fell onto the stalks. On his hands and knees, he scurried through the undergrowth as fat slugs squashed between his fingers. He wailed in horror, desperate for help, but knowing that none would arrive in this forsaken place. All thoughts of fighting back against the enemy fled his mind, and he only wanted to be away from here, to be safe. Mam, mam, please! 
He sobbed, clutching his face. Please help me. His strength deserted him. He curled up in a heap on the ground. All around him dogs barked. An unfamiliar voice in his head spoke wicked words he didn't understand. The takers were near. They saw him. They toyed with him. He was a perversion to them. A defiance of their will. He had rejected their toxic gifts and retained his will, but they had finally broken him. It had been inevitable. I have nothing left, he shouted. I thought I could do this one last thing and be done. But you went, okay. Do you hear me? I hate you. I fucking hate you. Aaron lay on his back, staring up at the day-glow night sky through his narrowed window of vision. Blood ran down his cheek. His throbbing eyelid turned fatty. The whispers in his head told him to give up, to just lie there until it was all over. Humanity was finished. There was no point in fighting it. Time slowed right down, the colourful night sky swirling endlessly above him. The overwhelmed moon started its retreat towards the horizon. Would he live long enough to see the sun replace it one last time? The emerald forest swayed all around him. The infected crept in from every direction. He had no idea how long he lay there for. Aaron, go away, he shouted. But of course the dead did not listen. Their true masters were near. Just go away, please. Aaron, Aaron, where the feck are you? Go away, he yelled back at the stalks. Stop playing with me, just end it. The infected chattered like monkeys. Aaron, call out so we know where you are. I said, go away, feck off. Hey, I heard you, lad. Keep on talking. Aaron let his head roll to the side and groaned. Another cruel joke. As if hearing rangers barking wasn't enough, now the takers sought to fill him with false hope that Cameron was here to rescue him as usual. Cam? Cameron? Hey, lad, I'm coming. The stalks parted. A cackling, infected man appeared and lashed out at Aaron, striking his forearm and drawing more blood. Stop it, Aaron cried. Leave me alone. Feck's sake, little English, where are you? The infected man lifted its talon to strike again, but something leapt out of the stalks and sent it flying. Like a mirage, Cameron was suddenly standing over Aaron, offering out a meaty hand. Bloody idiot! C Cameron? Is that really you? Look at the state of your lad. Did we not have a conversation about you near running off on your own? How, how did you find me? I followed the gaps you left in the stalks. Then I take a genius to see which route you took. Then I heard you bawling. Looks like we found you in the nick of time. We, Fiona, Teddy, Helen and Coburn stepped out of the fungus. Helen was already clearly infected. Lines of tiny green veins crisscrossing her cheek. You're a pain in the ass, said Helen. I voted to leave you out here. Helen, you're, you're infected. Why did you follow me? All of you, you're all infected. Cameron grunted. Hey, that's the bloody length you've driven us to. We'll be all right, do we? Long as we destroy the corkscrew in the next five minutes, the infection will die off. Aaron shook his head horrified by the sacrifices his friends had made. Any longer and you might end up like me. Cameron yanked Aaron up to his feet, a little unkindly. Then get off your ass and feckin' sort this out, you blood idiot. You need to get this done, said Coburn, itching at his forearms. I don't know you well enough to throw my life away. I'm here purely because you promised me a rapid cure. So, Aaron, do you know where this corkscrew is? He turned up and picked up a jerry can from the ground behind him. I found this strapped to the side of the barge's roof. Right there all along it was, full to the brim. Fire kills everything, right? Alien and human. And I bought this, said Helen, clutching her crate of grenades against her chest. I will blow up something by the end of the day, even if it's ourselves. Aaron smiled. In all his haste, he hadn't even thought about how he would destroy the corkscrew. He had made the same mistake in Quirikel. 
Why had he thought even for a second that he could do this alone? Because I'm not thinking clearly. I'm losing myself. Teddy motioned towards Aaron's eye. You're looking a bad way, man. It's probably even worse than it looks. I can't let this thing take any more of me. I, I have nothing left. Fiona moved over to him and put an arm underneath him for support. We can do this together. Maybe even tip things enough in our favour that others can take over for a while. Aaron raised his arm and weakly pointed. Over there, the corkscrew's in that direction. Cameron scratched at his thick red beard and dislodged a greasy slug. I haven't felt this dirty since I got the clap off Becky Brown. Come on, let's get this over with. By the time the sun comes up, I either want to be dead or heading someplace with a shower. Chapter 12 Morning broke, yet Sophie had already been awake for over an hour. Despite her intention to stop helping Nathan's contact, she had recommitted after encountering a starving child in the streets. The young boy, named Daniel, hadn't seen his parents in days. Apparently, they had gone to the gates to ask for permission to leave the city, wanting to fend for themselves instead of starving in the streets. They hadn't returned. Sophie had made a few inquiries after that, and it appeared nobody was allowed out of Edinburgh. Once you were in, you stayed in. You stayed where you were told and ate what you were given. If you argued too much, you disappeared like Daniel's parents. Sophie stood now watching the gates to the city. Ten dozen people slept in the streets, while soldiers watched over them from elevated positions. The area around the gates was flat and open, a playing field or park in former life, but now littered with fortifications and sliced in two by a ten-foot fence. A main road ran through the park's centre, passing through the gate and into the city, the people amassed in the streets that led off from it. Did all of them wish to leave? Was that why they had camped out around the city's main exit? The mesh fences, the razor wire, the steel barricades. It all became clear what it represented. Edinburgh was a prison. She had arranged to meet Nathan's contact at dawn, and, sure enough, the short man was exiting a nearby side street and heading towards her. In his hands was a plastic tub full of soft toys. She imagined that hidden among the contents was something less adorable. Sophie, how are you this morning? I'm good. What do you have there for me? As discussed, a delivery for the Royal Infirmary. Just some toys and things donated by the fortunate. Sophie's eyes narrowed. She had known to expect something, Nathan had informed her so yesterday. But she took the box apprehensively, while a voice inside her head screamed at her not to touch it. The thing was, she'd made up her mind to do this, and there was no going back. If she refused to act now, she would be just another victim, owned and controlled, told how to live her life. Nathan was right. If people didn't fight for their own individual right to survive, then humanity deserved nothing better than what had come before. Sophie realised she didn't even know the name of the man she was talking to, yet he smiled at her like an old friend. He wasn't evil or good, and he always came across as entirely neutral, pleasant without being friendly, and focused on the task at hand without being pushy. Now, however, he leant forward, lips moist behind the bristles of his dark brown beard. He kept his voice low. There's a linen storage cupboard next to Conference Room 4. A third of the new Scottish leadership party assembles there every day after lunch for a daily briefing. Leave this box in the storage cupboard and press the switch inside the stuffed unicorn. She shook her head and offered the box back. I'm no suicide bomber. You press the button. He shook his head and chuckled. It's on a 15-minute timer, so don't panic. I would do it myself, but I don't have access to the Royal Infirmary. You have a nurse's pass. That doesn't mean they let me walk around without reason. 
A little effort is required on your part, granted, but that's the nature of the business. We're risking ourselves for the good of all. Sophie took a moment to examine the man before she agreed to his request. So far, her crimes had been minor and easy to dismiss as trifling theft. But deep down, she had known she was contributing to something bigger. This was it. This was the moment she faced the consequences of her decision. Can I trust Nathan and his friends? Are they just crazy? The man before her was rugged, but had clearly lost a lot of weight. His cheeks were sallow and his button-up shirt too big. He smelled unclean and chewed at his cracked lips constantly. But despite that, he had watery blue eyes that cried empathy. This man, like her, had become something he never thought he would be. What's your name? she asked. I want to know before I do this. He frowned. Sure, you never asked before. My name's Paul. Paul Conway. What did you do before the world ended, Paul? Suddenly he appeared sheepish. I, I was a local NP, South Ribble. Sophie almost laughed. You were a politician? And now you're Guy Fawkes trying to take down Parliament. What happened? The world ended and afforded me a chance to actually make a difference. I know what you're thinking. That all politicians are lying, self-serving swine. I'd almost agree with you, but the proper truth is that only 99% of politicians are unworthy of the job. Me? I used to genuinely care about my constituents. I entered politics to try and make the world a better place. The problem was, I didn't know what a nest of vipers I was entering. The elite at Westminster chewed me up and spat me out. I was browbeaten at every turn, unceremoniously subdued if I even hinted at stepping out of line. Quickly I realised becoming an MP was much like joining a gang. If you disagree with the bigger boys, you get your legs broken. The entire system was as corrupt as it was inefficient and as unjust as it was unequal. He shook his head and seemed embarrassed, probably because of the dumbfounded expression Sophie had on her face. What's happening here in this city is worse. As much as I hated our government before the fall, it was infinitely better than the days of kings and tyrants. I can't fail the people who are relying on me again. This is my chance to put things right to be the man I desperately wanted to be. All these people, Sophie motioned to the people sleeping in the streets around the gate. They want to leave. Of course they do. In here, they're frightened and starving. But if they could leave, if they could look for food or fish for themselves, they wouldn't feel so powerless. That wouldn't benefit those in power, though. If people are allowed to leave and start surviving on their own, why would they ever accept a government? Or even worse, what if they were competing governments? No, the NSLP needs everyone to stay inside the city while its troops secure everything of value for miles around. They need to ensure that nobody has a chance of surviving on their own. Once the government is well and truly established, it can then face any external competition from a place of strength. Sophie nodded. I understand. Paul looked around making sure no one was listening or watching them. He then nodded to the tub of soft toys in her hands. Okay, so just press the switch inside and get your butt out of there. We're not talking about a nuclear bomb here, but you don't want to be anywhere nearby when it goes off, okay? Are innocent people going to get hurt? Honestly, I don't know, he shrugged. But probably. There are many people on that floor but the important thing is that most of them serve the NSLP. After the attack, the message will be clear. We won't stand for tyranny. The soldiers are going to clamp down hard on people afterwards. They'll want heads on spikes. Paul nodded, looking unhappy about it, but undeterred. A tyrannical response can't be avoided, but it's also the reason this has to be done. A dying animal bites hardest but it will still eventually die. Can I trust you with this, Sophie? I have others willing to do what must be done if you're not. 
She readjusted her grip on the tub. It was heavy, and she thought she could feel liquid sloshing about inside. I'll do what needs to be done. I'm the one with the nurse's pass, right? Paul reached out and touched the back of her hand. With a smile, he gave her a curt nod. Then I'll see you in the smoke clears, comrade. Yeah? Viva la revolution and all that? Christ, I can't believe I'm doing this. She turned and headed across the street, intending to visit the Royal Infirmary at once and get this over with. But she saw, coincidentally, someone who worked there. It felt like a bad omen. Maggie came running over to Sophie, eyes baggy and blonde hair pulled back in a severe ponytail. Your mother-in-law told me I'd find you here, she said. I'm just about to start my shift, but thought we could get breakfast together. I have a spare ration ticket. She leaned in and whispered, Surprising how many go begging in the trauma ward. They lose half of everyone that gets admitted. Oh, said Sophie. She suddenly regretted telling Maggie where she slept at night. During the last few days, the woman had seemed to track her down wherever she was. I, um, I can't right now, Maggie. I'll be heading into the Royal later, though, so I'll pop by and see you, OK? Maybe you can get a break. Maggie frowned. Come on, you must have ten minutes to spare to get a coffee and some cereal. It's going to be a long day. I already ate. So eat some more. I can't. Really, I have an errand to run. What errand? It's six in the morning. Maggie's eyes narrowed. Her nostrils flared. Are you on about those toys? Where are they going? What, are these? Uh, no, uh, these are for um, children's board. That's why I'll be along later. Well, that's silly. I may as well take them for you. Sophie pulled back, hoping Maggie didn't hear the sloshing coming from inside the tub. No, I'm still collecting toys. That's what my errand is. Some people I know are doing a collection for the kids' ward. I'm going to see them now. That's why I have to go. Maggie raised an eyebrow. The story was reasonable enough, but the way Sophie had told it had been unexplainably frantic. OK, I get it, said Maggie, an edge to her voice. There's no room in your life right now for new friends. I guess I just thought it'd be nice for us ladies to stick together in this mess we find ourselves in. She sniffed and folded her arms. You sure you don't want me to just take the box from you, save you the trip? Sophie gripped the tub tighter. You can't take the box, Maggie, because then I wouldn't have an excuse to pop by the hospital later and see you, would I? Really? Yes, really. She rose her eyes pissily. I have stuff going on right now, so just let me get on to it and I'll see you later. OK, we're all good. Maggie let out a breath and lowered her shoulders. You're eight. Right. I'm sorry. I'm pushy and mistrustful and pretty much a hot mess most of the time. It's the hours. I'm barely getting any sleep. All I see is people suffering and... Sophie forced herself to smile. I want to be friends, Maggie, OK? There's just a lot going on for me this morning. I'll see you later when I'm free. No, I won't. I'll probably have been arrested or executed by then. I hope you'll forgive me for standing you up. Okie dokie. Maggie blushed and said goodbye, wandering off in a direction that might lead either to the hospital or to one of the many places set up for breakfast. It presented Sophie with a problem. She needed to go to the Royal Infirmary to plant the bomb, but she'd just told Maggie she had errands to run first. I can't go straight there in case she catches me and wonders why I lied. She'll question me to death. No, I'll have to wait an hour before I go. By then, Maggie will be at work, and I can head straight up to the conference rooms and blow a load of people up. Sophie felt sick. The weight of the tub in her arms almost became too much. Her stitches were still in place, but they'd been tugging more and more as the wound healed. Now they seemed to rip at her muscles in protest. She hurried along the street, knowing only one place to go. Nancy and Sophie both slept in a small public library near the old town. There, Sophie found Nancy awake, sitting in their spot and guarding their things. Theft was rife in the camps, so they rarely left at the same time, unless it was for work, and then they took their possessions with them in their rucksacks. A friend was here looking for you, said Nancy. 
She wiped at her mouth, having just been coughing. I told her you were probably near the gates getting breakfast, but we both know that's not true. Whatever you're involved in, Sophie, why don't you just tell me? How did she know where I've been? Sophie placed the tub of toys down on the ground carefully, very aware that it was designed to explode. I don't want to tell you because I don't want to worry you. It's a miracle we ever got here. You deserve to rest. Oh, don't give me that bollocks. Who are you meeting at the gates this morning? I heard you arranging a meeting last night with Nathan. Sophie sighed and looked around. The library was emptying now that people were heading off to whatever jobs they had, a prerequisite of getting to sleep beneath a roof with soldiers keeping order. Okay, don't freak out, but there's a group of people in the city trying to take out the government. I've been helping them. Nancy's eyes bulged. What? Why? Because people are starving in the streets, Nancy. No one's allowed to leave or fend for themselves. It's not right. No one has the right to control anyone, to control me. Nancy shook her head and groaned. Mankind is barely hanging on by a thread. You really think now is the time to start a civil war? This city is the only place left that actually feels safe. Why threaten it? Because people deserve a chance to be free. Even if it ends us all, the NSLP represents everything that's been wrong with mankind since it first began. Greedy men taking whatever they want at the expense of others. Well, not today. Today they lose and the people win. Oh, Sophie, honey, I've got a lot of years on you, so trust me when I say the people never win. The freedom fighters of today become the governments of tomorrow. And then a whole new group pops up to fight them. The cycle goes around and around and around. Then I'm going to help break the cycle. How? How on earth are you going to do that? Do you really think your new friends are as pure-hearted as they claim? Sophie thought about it. Nathan and Paul seemed genuine. But Paul had been a politician before, so somewhere deep down there must be a part of him that craved power. Didn't most politicians begin with grand ideals? Didn't they all want to help before being corrupted by the first taste of influence? But Nathan wants anarchy. He wants no government, no rules. If Sophie planted the bomb as requested, then only a third of the NSLP would die. That wouldn't get rid of the government. It would only piss it off and probably make life worse for everyone. Even if Paul's hopes came to fruition and the NSLP fell from power, it would be a destination reached via a road paved in blood. What's in the box? asked Nancy, eyeing the tub full of toys. Sophie, what's in the box? Sophie swallowed a lump in her throat, suddenly feeling like a child caught stealing money from her mam's purse. I won't tell you. It will put you in danger. Nancy covered her face and groaned, Bloody hell, Sophie. Just get it out of here, okay? Whatever it is, give it back and tell your friends to go do their own dirty work. Then don't change, Sophie. Maybe if a woman were in charge, I'd have a little hope. But you're getting involved in other people's messes. Let's just keep our heads down and hope for the best. Ryan and Aaron could walk through those gates any day now. Or get executed out on the road, like the other refugees deemed to be a risk. And even if Ryan made it into the city... We could never leave. We would be prisoners here. Sophie got to her feet and picked up the box. I'll meet you with the clinic in a bit. I'll deal with the box, okay? Nancy coughed into the crook of her elbow before speaking. Please, don't put yourself in danger, Sophie, please. I won't. Everything will be fine. Sophie headed out of the library with her box, heading towards the Royal Infirmary. I'm wondering how much damage the bomb would do. Would it take out a room? A floor? The building? She didn't even know what kind of device she was carrying, or how qualified its maker was. It was unlikely to have been Paul who'd put it together. The infirmary was some distance away, but the city gates were closer. So that was where she went. Back to where she'd been standing only twenty minutes before. She'd been confused then, but she knew what to do now. It was clear to her. Nancy was right. 
If Sophie took out the government, she would just be repeating the cycle of men replacing men. Civil wars did nothing for ordinary people. They merely reshuffled those in power. The only way to truly help Edinburgh's cold and starving population was via anarchy. Sophie was going to remove the people's need for government. When she made it back to the main gates, the streets seemed even more littered with the homeless and starving. There were more guards, too, including the man on the double-decker bus who delighted in executing refugees. Maybe it was her nerves, but it felt like there were eyes on her from every angle. She looked around, searching for somewhere secluded, but of course there was nowhere. She followed the fence for a short while, until the crowds thinned out, and after a few minutes, stopped at a place where the mesh butted up against the wall of an old white brick pub. A nearby road sign said that the borough of Blackford lay beyond this section of the fence. A housing district, patrolled by soldiers who sought to bring everyone inside the city centre and the old town. The drug dealers executed last week had probably just been people who had refused to abandon their homes. There were no guards watching this section of the fence, because the pub was three stories high and the mesh was topped with razor wire. It would take a crazed soul to try to escape here. You could cut through the mesh links, Sophie supposed, but the chance of somebody walking by and seeing you was high. Hopefully, no one would spot her and take an interest in what she was doing. But if they did, she would try to look like everyone else around here, homeless and invisible. She slid down against the pub's side wall, placing the plastic tub to her side against the mesh fence as she sat on the ground. She rooted amongst the stuffed toys, pushing aside a grubby green elephant and a cheerfully smiling dog. The unicorn seemed to jump out at her. Brand new, shiny and white, with a rainbow-coloured horn. Its back was fastened with Velcro strips, having previously housed some kind of voice box, most likely. But there was something else inside it now. Sophie pulled the toy open and slid out a small plastic unit with a switch. The switch was connected via wires to the stuffed elephant, which Sophie now realised was full of liquid. Other wires led to the other toys in the box. It was a complicated yet rather inspired device a perfect disguise for bringing a bomb into a hospital. But she wasn't taking the bomb into a hospital. She was leaving it here. Sophie plucked the switch unit out of the unicorn and pulled the stuffed animal free of the wiring. Then she pressed the exposed switch and flinched. A small part of her had expected to blow up on the spot, but there was no explosion, only an electronic beep nothing that indicated a bomb had been set. She sat there for a while, wondering if Paul had lied to her and that the bomb would go off in two minutes instead of fifteen. Part of her would be okay with that. There was a certain peace in what she'd just done. She had made an empowering decision, not siding with one set of men or another. She had made her own decision. After a short while, she got to her feet brushing at her jeans and strolling down the street. There was a scrap of wet cardboard lying nearby, so she went back and draped it over the tops of the toys to keep them hidden. There were people in the area, but hopefully no one would disturb the box, especially not children. She couldn't control that, of course, but she could at least hope. In her hands, she still held the unicorn, so she kept it with her as she walked. Soon she arrived back at the gates, and for a minute or two she just stood near the guard tower and listened to people begging to leave, begging to go look for their loved ones in the city and landscape beyond. Several times soldiers raised their weapons threateningly. Then, knowing she had only minutes left, Sophie sought out the young boy Daniel. Daniel was sitting in a doorway where he seemed to live. He had a blank expression on his face and a hungry mouth. Hey, Daniel, 
said Sophie, reaching into her pocket. She realized she hadn't eaten since yesterday or this morning, so there was something in her possession. I have a spare ration ticket if you want it. Daniel snatched the ticket from her and held it against his chest. Children couldn't get ration tickets without an adult, so he probably hadn't eaten in a while, other than whatever scraps he'd managed to pilfer. Th thanks. What do you want for it? Nothing. I've something else you might like too. His eyes went to the unicorn in her arms. What do I have to do? Nothing. Here is yours. It's a bit girly, but... Daniel snatched the toy from her and hugged it. It looked even whiter against his dirty skin. I love it. Good. Look, Daniel, people are going to start leaving soon. When they do, I want you to follow the biggest group you see, okay? Find someone friendly and stick close. People will look after you if you ask them to. Your parents, they're probably gone for good. Daniel's eyes fell downwards. He made a muffled sound that might have been a sob. I want my mum and dad. She went to reach out and touch his cheek, but stopped herself. She couldn't be that person for him. Her purpose prevented her from nurturing a child. She needed to be something else, something colder. You'll be okay, she said, but you need to look after yourself now. I'm only six. I know, Daniel, it sucks, it isn't fair. Find some people, okay? Force them to take care of you. The right people will. Don't let anyone use or control you and do whatever you need to survive. But, and this is very important, he stared at her intently. What? Always help someone if you can. When you have a choice between being a good person and a bad person, be good, okay? He held up the unicorn. Like you? You're giving me this because you're good. She sighed. It might be too late for me, kid, but not for you. Take care of yourself, Daniel, and remember what I said, okay? Sophie turned back to the gates and waited. She had no idea how much time had passed, how many minutes, but her teeth were on edge, her mouth was dry. Finish with your errand. Sophie turned to see Maggie coming towards her. The nurse had a steaming cup of coffee and a curious look on her face. She nodded towards Sophie's empty hands. Where's your box? Sophie took a moment to play back time. How many minutes had passed? How long before the bomb went off? Was it long enough that it couldn't be stopped, even if she told someone about it? Ah, uh, um, filled it full of explosives and left it by the fence. You what? Sophie licked her lips. She didn't know why, but she decided in the moment that she liked this needy, slightly awkward woman, enough to speak the truth. This city is messed up, Maggie. You said it yourself. People are suffering and being left to die, all because resources are being hoarded by a select few. People are starving in the streets. Children are being orphaned. To add to all that, my fiancé's out there somewhere, and I can't go and find him because no one's allowed to leave the city. Maggie looked away. Your fiancé. Sophie put a hand on Maggie's shoulder. It felt good to touch another person. But again, her purpose didn't allow her to fully feel the moment. Yeah, I'm engaged to marry a wonderful man named Ryan. He's completely directionless, a little lazy and not the most intelligent, but he's also loyal, brave and as selfless as they come. I love him with all my heart and I won't stop until I make it back to him. Maggie nodded. Understand. Look, I'm sorry for... But I have room in me life for one new friend. Job's yours if you want it. Maggie raised an eyebrow. I don't need pity. And I have none to spare. Like you, Maggie. You're abrupt and a little too in your face, but you wear your heart on your sleeve, and that's a good thing. Heart on the sleeve, people, are what this world needs more of. What I need more of, actually. Listen to me. Things are about to change. I'm leaving the city with Nancy. You should come. What are you talking about? Are you talking about a bomb? It isn't funny. Sophie looked at all the guards, then looked at all the raggedy men and women who outnumbered those guards six to one. No, I was telling the truth. There's a bomb. 
We have a minute or two, but then there's going to be a great big hole in the fence that people can go through. I'm going to be one of them. You want to be a nurse? Then be a nurse for them. Be a nurse for the people who want to try to make it on their own out there. Don't just treat the people you're allowed to treat in here. You're crazy. I shut out crazy long before I crossed the border. What I am now is a full-on anarchist. Feels pretty freeing, to be honest. Maggie looked only confused. Listen, she said, let's go sit down somewhere and... The world went boom. The explosion was much more than Sophie had expected, and the air whipped around her even though she was 300 metres away from the blast. Bits of dirt rained down from the sky, and when she turned, a yellowish-brown smoke was rising from behind the nearby buildings. All hell broke loose. The soldiers began barking at one another and aiming their weapons, but they could find nothing to shoot. The homeless and bedraggled screamed and scattered. Then the first shouts began, The fence is down! The fence is down! People ran in the direction of the smoke. Soldiers yelled at them to stop, but went ignored. So they fired at the crowd, shooting people in the back. Then people fought back, throwing themselves at the gunman while shouting at others to make a run for it. Sophie saw husbands buying time for their wives and children to escape. She saw screaming mothers clawing at soldiers' eyes. But the people were unarmed, and it was destined to be a slaughter. A high-powered rifle was deadlier than a father's love. Then something completely unexpected happened. Another bomb exploded this one near the city centre. A few seconds passed and a third bomb exploded in the old town. I wasn't the only one. Mine wasn't the only bomb. Sophie grinned. Anarchy had arrived. And with it, people would flee the city and survive by themselves, if able, and die as free people if not. Maybe they would focus on their true enemy and finally go to war. No one else would do it for them. You're insane, said Maggie, her eyes bulging. You weren't, you weren't fucking kidding. This is... Sophie ignored Maggie, her attention taken up by something else that was happening. Some kind of militia had arrived on the scene, and it promptly began to overwhelm the guards. They wore makeshift armour, cricket pads, baseball helmets and American football armour. They wielded knives, hockey sticks and golf clubs. It seemed the government hadn't clamped down on sporting goods. Amongst the militia was Paul, who saw Sophie and shook his head. He seemed confused rather than angry, but he quickly disappeared into the fray. Sophie turned to Maggie, who was still going on at her. I'm going to get Nancy, she said, and any supplies I can carry. If you want to set off with us, then I'll meet you here in 30 minutes. If not, then good luck. Before Maggie replied, Sophie took off, passing by a bewildered Daniel, who still stood in his doorway, clutching his stuffed unicorn. Next, she passed by the results of her bomb, and delighted at the devastation. Half of the pub had collapsed, leaving a twenty-foot-wide chasm across the rubble. A further fifteen feet had opened up in the mesh fence, which had fallen flat in two sections. Dozens of people were pouring through the openings into Blackford, probably not even having any belongings to gather first. They were free, and they would take their chance while it existed. Sophie would take hers. She found Nancy inside the infirmary where they worked. Nancy had clearly just made it inside, because she was standing with the two women from the night shift. They had all heard the explosions, and they were deathly pale clutching themselves anxiously. Nancy's eyes went wide. Sophie, are you all right? What happened? The look she gave Sophie asked, Did you do this? There's a gap in the fence and everyone's leaving. One of the night nurses seemed appalled by the news, but the other took off like it was the best thing she'd ever heard. Sophie imagined her going to grab her stuff and fleeing, and it assured her that she'd done the right thing. People didn't want to see the government topple, 
because they didn't even want to be here in the first place. They hadn't voted to be ruled by the NSLP or anyone else. The other nurse left to see if anyone needed medical attention, leaving Sophie alone with Nancy and the patients. No one under their care was in need of special attention. They were all just minor injuries, so she had no conscience about leaving them. Time to pack up our things and go, she told Nancy, and she hurried over to one of the room's desks. From behind a box of patient files, she pulled out a rucksack that she had packed yesterday, filling it with bits of food and boxes of medicine she might be able to use as trade. Sophie, what's going on? What were all those explosions? I had a bomb in that box, and I used it to break the cycle, Nancy. I blew a hole in the fence so people can leave. There were other bombs, too. This city is about to erupt, so we need to leave before the government reacts. I'm not leaving, Sophie. I, I can't. What do you mean? If it's about Ryan, then... Nancy shook her head. I know he's never coming through those gates. The groups of people arriving have dried up. I've heard what happens to half the refugees who make it here. So why don't you want to leave with me? Because it'll slow you down. If Ryan's alive out there somewhere, he needs you more than he needs me. You're his future, Sophie, if there is such a thing left. Go find him and be with him. Love him enough for the both of us, okay? Because I can't go. I can't make it out there again. Sophie put her hands on her forehead and realised she was sweating buckets. What? No, 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 Nancy, I can't do this without you. We're a team. Nancy reached out and hugged her. Sophie wanted to push her away, wanted to shout at her until she submitted. But she collapsed into her mother-in-law's arms and whimpered. Nancy rubbed at her shoulders. You're the strongest person I've ever known, Soph, and the best daughter I could have asked for. Nancy, I love you. Please come with me. Nancy eased her away and reached into the pocket of her apron. From inside, she pulled out a red and white rag. No, it's a red and white handkerchief. That's blood. I don't think I've got long left, said Nancy. I spoke to one of the doctors, and they think it's something brought on by the changes in the atmosphere. Nothing I've taken for it has done any good. Every day my breathing is worse, whether it be cancer or something else killing me. This city is where I'm going to die, so please don't hate it too much. You're going to find my boys, but this is my home for whatever time I have left. Sophie shook her head. Nancy couldn't die, not after all she'd been through. Yet, she had got so old recently. It was like she had aged ten years in the last six months. I'm staying too, said Sophie. I'll be with you every step of the way. Nancy shook her head. I won't have your final memories of me being spoiled by illness. When you find Ryan, you tell him how strong I was to get here, and that's it. That's how you remember me. He'll never forgive me for leaving you alone. She won't be alone, said Nathan, sitting in his wheelchair nearby. He had been listening the entire time. After what you did today, Sophie, we all owe you. I'll make sure Nancy gets everything she needs. She'll be looked after every moment, I swear. Sophie looked at him sheepishly. I didn't put the bomb where Paul told me to. Nathan nodded, as if he'd known that already. You blew up the fence, I'm guessing, from what you said. I gave people the option to leave. It's genius. I know Paul will think so too. We're all just good people trying to do what's right. But that doesn't mean we have all the answers. Sometimes it takes someone doing what their conscience tells them to in a moment. As long as we're all working towards the same goals, it's okay if the methods vary. He wheeled himself forward. His infection was almost gone and his leg was finally setting well. Soon he would be up and about on crutches. Luke, if you need to go find your lost love, then go. I'll take care of Nancy. Maybe you'll even make it back to see her again. With any luck, the city will be a better place by then thanks to you as much as anyone else. Sophie looked at Nancy, who was urging her to say yes. There were tears in her eyes, but she was smiling. She almost seemed proud as she spoke, 
Never thought you'd end up as a terrorist, honey. But somehow you make it work. I'm going to stick around, clean up some of the mess you've made. You go find my boys. Give them a kiss from me. Sophie nodded, knowing she had to leave. She couldn't stay here in one place being told what to do. After surviving out on the road, her spirit had broken free and would never again accept the cage. Humanity was at war, and she was a warrior. She needed to fight. As much as she hated to leave Nancy, it wasn't a choice. Sophie gathered her things in silence, trying to hold herself together. If she started sobbing, she would collapse on the floor and lose her chance of fleeing. Outside, the morning was alive with gunshots and shouting. A full-scale civil war was in effect, and she had helped ignite it. If she could do that, she could find Ryan. Please be alive. After all that I've done, you need to be alive. You need to bring me back. Remind me who I was. When she was ready to go, Sophie shouldered her rucksack and turned to Nancy one last time. I can't believe we made it this far, she said. Nancy smiled, and Sophie finally saw how ill she was. Her skin was grey, and the circles beneath her eyes were almost jet black. She had less fat on her than a broom handle. I would never have made it without you, Soph. I'll miss you while you're gone. But I will hope each day for you to come back through those gates with my boys. Sophie hugged her. If they're alive, I'll bring them home. I'll find your boys and I'll get them back here before... before... Nancy rubbed her back. You best get a move on. The day's already ticking away. Sophie nodded and held back tears. See you soon, ma'am. See you soon, honey. Be safe. Sophie left the infirmary, fighting off the urge to rush back inside. She couldn't prolong the goodbye. It had to be over with. She cleared her throat, straightened up, and got moving. It was still morning, yet she was severely tired, like she'd been awake for days. Yet at the same time, she was totally wired. A hound let off the leash. She headed back to the main gates, wanting to see what was happening there. The fighting had finished, Paul's militia having taken the main gates and stolen the guards' rifles, and the area was now secure. Paul stood atop the double-decker bus, and when he saw Sophie, he saluted her. Feeling silly, she returned the gesture. The main gates were open, so she was free to walk right out of the city. But before she could, she was halted by a pair of familiar faces. Maggie stood before her, holding hands with Daniel. The little boy held his stuffed unicorn by its horn in his left hand. Sophie greeted them both with a frown. What are you two doing together? You said to find someone nice, said Daniel. I saw you talking to this lady, so she must be nice. Maggie gave a lopsided grin. She had changed into a thick ski jacket. I told Daniel I was leaving the city with you. He wants to come if you still want company. Sophie's mouth fell open. She couldn't take a child out on the road with her. But if not me, then who else? What am I fighting for if not for Daniel? Sophie shook her head in resignation and smiled. Just don't eat all my food. Maggie had on a small backpack, and she blushed when Sophie looked at it. I didn't have much to bring. All we have is each other, said Sophie. That's more than enough. Where's Nancy? Maggie looked around. Your mother-in-law? Sophie gave a sad smile. She's going to rest up here for a while, so it's just you and me and our little stray here. What's this stray? Daniel asked. Trouble, said Sophie. Maggie put a hand to her face and shook her head. You're going to get me killed, aren't you? Sophie shrugged. Probably, but I promise it'll be fun. Well then, lead on. Let's get the fuck out of this city. Daniel chuckled. You can't say that word. He's right, said Sophie. You need to watch your language, miss. Maggie pretended to zip her mouth shut. Come on, said Sophie, moving towards the gate. Let's go create some anarchy.
Chapter 13 Aaron followed the noise in his head. The ringing got louder and louder, but never became overwhelming. It pushed aside the whispers and the angry voices of the takers, actually giving him a semblance of peace. Even the agony of his sliced open eyeball became a low-level ache. Over here, said Aaron, shoving aside the stalks. We're getting close. We're getting really... He came to a stop. Close. The corkscrew was fifty metres ahead. The stalks stopped in a circle around it, forming a clearing. Thick, pulsing vines trailed from the bottom of the corkscrew, pumping its alien toxins into the ground. Up close, Aaron could sense its vibrations, a constant thrum. Whether mechanical or organic, the corkscrew was alive, a womb filled with life. Good going, lad, said Cameron, patting Aaron on the back. His ankle was still a mess, so he hobbled along like an old man. So what do we do now? asked Coburn. He lifted his jerry can and sloshed it. Best we make it quick, right? I'm feeling a tad itchy. Standing beside him, Teddy noticed his face was a picture of misery. No offence, Aaron, but I really don't want to lose an arm. How long do we have? Not long, said Aaron, remembering his own infection. Then let's douse the thing and set it alight, said Fiona. She seemed the worst infected, her left arm encircled with throbbing black veins. If it goes anything like Quirey Cal, said Aaron, then we'll be safe as soon as the corkscrew goes up in flames. Grand, said Cameron. They all got moving, looking around warily for threats. Since finding Aaron lying on his back, the group had moved steadily through the fungus without being attacked. It had been a little too easy. There was a reason for that. All at once, the infected spilled out of the stalks, encircling the clearing around the corkscrew with Olympic precision, surrounding Aaron and the others. Brilliant, said Cameron, holding on to Helen for support. We walked right into a trap. Kind of stating the obvious there said Teddy, turning back and forth, probably looking to find an escape route. Kind of thinking I should have gone to Edinburgh now when I had the chance. Too late, said Helen. You'll have to take it like a man. Cameron sighed. You ready, Hell? Oh, yes, she grinned. Extremely ready. Helen dropped to her knees and opened her small metal crate. She really had been dying to use a grenade, and it looked like she was finally going to get the chance. There were three inside the box, and she grabbed the one in the middle. Then, like Rambo, only Scottish and female, she yanked out the pin with her teeth and tossed the grenade towards the corkscrew. Fade in a hole! But the grenade evaporated in midair. Fiona gasped. What the? It disappeared, said Teddy. Feck, 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 feck! Helen knelt down to grab another grenade. Aaron kept his eyes on the stalks behind the corkscrew. There was movement there, and it revealed itself to be a taker. The massive creature was holding up its arm from where it had sent out a pulse to destroy the incoming grenade. Helen went to pull a pin on a fresh grenade, but Aaron stopped her. Don't waste it, he said, nodding towards the stalks. We have company. The taker gave a bestial roar that pierced Aaron's skull. The infected attacked all at once, closing in around the group quickly and cutting off any chance of escape. Cameron hit back first, clobbering a fungus-covered man with both fists. Teddy followed up with a flying boot to the chest of a diminutive woman. Helen and Fiona stuck close together, kicking out defensively and trying to keep out of reach of the deadly talons. Aaron yelled at the infected to leave, and some of them actually listened, but most didn't. This was a fight they couldn't win. They were outnumbered, surrounded. Coburn started pouring out diesel from his jerry can, quickly soaking the ground in a semicircle around them. He then ducked, just in time, as a talon whizzed by his head. Teddy appeared beside him and booted the infected woman responsible backwards, 
causing her to collide with a pair of men behind her. All three of them fell into the fungus. Thanks, said Coburn, and he then looked at Fiona. Hey, sister, you still got a light? Fiona reached into her jeans pocket and pulled out the bag of weed from the boat. From inside, she grabbed the pink lighter and tossed it to Coburn. Coburn caught it, flicked it, and set flame to the ground. Aaron flinched, expecting the diesel to ignite in an instant blaze, but nothing happened. Coburn grumbled. It, it won't light. Cameron punched a woman in the face and caught a slash across his arm as a reward. He hissed and asked, Does diesel burn? Of course it does. I, I mean... Coburn shook his head. It must do. Light the fungus, said Aaron, shoving himself into an infected person before it lashed out and struck him. The fungus will burn. Coburn moved the tiny flame away from the puddle of diesel and into a nearby patch of fungus. It caught fire immediately, but didn't spread. The flame flickered, vulnerable and new. It needed time to breathe life into itself. The infected continued to close in. Coburn stood in front of the growing flame, trying to guard it. He was whipped twice in quick succession, once across the thigh and once against the shoulder. Grunting in pain, he shoved the enemies away. I I'm hurt! He staggered back to the group, clutching his leg. It's spreading, said Aaron, relieved to see the flames growing. The fire was currently winding its way along a spongy green vine running along the ground. It just needs another second. Feck it, said Cameron, and he threw himself forward back into the fray. He almost fell on his twisted ankle, but he barreled into a pair of infected people and forced them back into the others behind them. Several more infected saw that Cameron was now isolated and turned towards him. It drew their attention from the area around the growing flame. Cameron cursed his enemy as they whipped at him over and over, drawing bloody furrows across his shirt. The cuts were shallow, intending to infect, but their relentless onslaught sent him to his knees, where he hunched over and covered up with his arms. The fire suddenly burst into life. An oily stench filled the air. Aaron stumbled back as the air turned hot, the river of diesel soaking the ground finally beginning to burn. The fuel must have needed time to heat, and once the nearby ground had caught fire, the diesel combusted. Several infected people were caught in the suddenly rising flames, their bodies catching a light, which caused them to spread the flames further. Soon, a third of the clearing was ablaze, cutting off a majority of the infected from attacking. Teddy and Coburn rushed over to help Cameron. They each picked a side and shoved the infected into the flames. Their squeals were soulless. Cameron was in a bad way, bleeding from both arms and several lashes on his back. He growled in pain as he clambered to his feet, but he remained focused. We brought ourselves some bleeding space. What do we do now? There was a taker, said Aaron. It brought the infected with it. It's controlling them. If we can kill it, we might be able to get the infected to back off. How do we kill it? Said Teddy, looking around. I don't even see where it's gone. Aaron put a finger to his temple and closed his eye. It's near. I hear its voice. I think it might be afraid. Or at least cautious. It doesn't like the fire. Coburn went and retrieved the jerry can sloshing it to show it still had some diesel left. Let's light the son of a bitch up then. The fire spread fast, fiercest where the diesel had ignited. The problem was, it had created a wall between Aaron and the corkscrew. He needed to get to it to destroy it. It had to be him. All he had gone through, all he had suffered, it was his duty to do this. The infected are heading back into the stalks, said Fiona pointing through a gap in the flames. Beyond, several infected people stumbled out of sight, entering the tall fungus. They're going to come around behind us, said Cameron. Fiona put a hand in front of her face and closed her eyes. It's getting too hot to stand here. The fire's getting out of control. Good, 
said Cameron. Let it burn. Helen grabbed the two remaining grenades from the crate, one in each hand. We need to distract the taker long enough that I can shove one of these up whatever counts as his ass. Aaron nodded. It was a good idea. They had to kill the taker. It was the only way they had any chance of dealing with the corkscrew. Hold on, I'll see if I can find it. He listened to the noise inside his own head, the ringing from the corkscrew, the whispers of the trapped souls, and the angry alien voice spoke from directly behind Aaron. And he turned, just in time to absorb a blow from an arm materialising out of thin air. The taker had cloaked itself, visible only as a shimmer, but it quickly revealed itself at the edge of the clearing, right behind them all. Aaron fell to the ground, clutching his ribs. He smelled burning and quickly realised his hair was smoking. The fire raged only a few feet away from where he'd landed. Cameron launched himself at the taker, pushing aside the alien's thick arm just as it rose towards him threateningly. One hit from its deadly pulse would see the end of him. Coburn rushed forward too, upending his jerry can. Diesel flowed out of the spout, soaking the taker's rear, but most of it splashed onto the ground. The clearing was getting hot, unbearable. The taker swept Cameron aside, lifting him off his feet and sending him sprawling into the stalks, where an infected man immediately set upon him, whipping at him as he fought to get back to his feet. More infected people filling the clearing from the rear. Aaron found himself trapped between a wall of flames and a wall of monsters. Right in the middle of it was an eight-foot monster. The taker roared, stomping forward. It clobbered Fiona in the side, knocking her down in a moaning heap as she struggled to take a breath. Hey, said Teddy, on earth we don't hit ladies. He leapt in the air and delivered a flying kick, strong enough that the taker actually wheeled backwards with a surprised grunt. It brought up its arm and Teddy ducked out of the way, forcing the beast to turn and try to track him. With its attention diverted, Corbin leapt on the taker's back and started clawing at its multiple bead-like eyes. The taker roared, but Aaron heard a different sound inside his head. It was pain. It was fury. To a taker, humans were as lowly as cattle. How dare they fight back? Aaron turned to Helen and reached out his hand. Give me a grenade! Helen still held one in each hand, but she shook her head at his request. No way! I need this! I need to kill this fucking thing for my own sake! Aaron sidestepped to avoid an incoming infected man. Why? Why does it have to be you? Because it does. They took my boy, and I need to make them pay. I need to see them suffer. I need to make it stop hurting. The infected were closing in. They almost seemed to be taking their time but Aaron supposed it might be the confusion caused by their minds being invaded and their actions dictated by the taker. They seemed to pause every couple of seconds as if receiving new directives. Just give me a grenade, Aaron demanded. No, feck off. This isn't the war of the Cartwright brothers. I want my pound of flesh. Just... He stepped towards Helen, but gasped when he saw her fists flying towards him. He tried to duck, but the blow had come from his blind side and he saw it too late. But she didn't punch him, instead she shoved him aside. The taker swung its arm into the space where Aaron had been standing and instead struck Helen right on the shoulder. The crack was audible and her body immediately malformed. She collapsed to the floor, dropping both grenades and clutching her clearly broken collarbone. The noise she made was a siren, a high-pitched agony. Aaron immediately threw himself at the taker, not wanting to give it time to finish its assault on Helen. With only one arm, though, he was little more than a pest, and striking the taker's flesh was like punching bark. His fist sliced open and bled against the gnarled flesh, but the taker barely even reacted. In fact, 
it ignored Aaron in favor of Coburn, who was emptying the remaining diesel over its flank. It threw up an arm and sent out a pulse and missed Coburn by mere inches as he dodged away, his head down low. Cameron re-entered the fight, limping badly. He punched the taker in its head, but was immediately clubbed aside. All they were doing was distracting it and annoying it. None of them had done any damage. Aaron hissed as something sliced his back. He turned and faced an infected woman with dirty blonde hair down to her waist. His pain turning to anger, he grabbed her thick mane and spun her round by it. As he yanked, her body twisted and she went flying, but her hair remained in Aaron's hand as her mouldy scalp tore free. He tossed the hair into the flames with disgust. It was getting way too hot in the clearing. The crisp, dry flesh of the infected was smouldering and sending up smoky tendrils. The ground too was giving off smoke. Aaron caught Cameron's attention and pointed. The diesel! It's getting hot! It's about to ignite! Cameron looked ready to pass out, but he seemed to understand. He clenched both fists and raced towards the taker. His ankle was clearly close to breaking point, but he ignored the pain and put his weight on it as he picked up speed. He collided with the taker at full force and sent it back a step, but not enough. The puddle of smoking diesel was two feet behind it. Coburn and Teddy moved together, racing side by side. Both men leapt into the air and shoved at the taker before it regained its footing. The combined force sent it back a full stride. The taker was now standing right in the middle of the smouldering puddle. Helen growled from on the ground, fighting against her agony. She was dragging herself along on her side, trying to gather up the two fallen grenades. Fiona saw what she was doing and rushed to help. The taker lifted an arm towards Fiona as she ran, locking in on her, preparing to aim a deadly pulse. Aaron called out a warning for her to get down. The air shimmered, and then everything caught fire. The diesel that had been soaking the ground combusted, catching the taker directly in the centre of its fiery maw. The beast screeched in shock and pain. Its wailing filled Aaron's head. When the diesel soaking its back and sides caught fire, its agony grew louder. Everyone backed away, shielding their faces as the blaze gave off ferocious heat. Each of them sported sweat-drenched foreheads. The taker's flesh burned, but only where the diesel had soaked it. The flames didn't spread or engulf its body further. In fact, the flames were already dying out. Would it be enough? Was the damage enough to end the taker? Aaron didn't think so. Fiona was kneeling on the ground, but she leapt up in the direction of the flailing taker. She plucked at something in her hand and threw back her arm. She was holding a grenade, and the pin had just fallen to the ground at her feet. Hey, fucker! You want to get high? Fiona tossed the grenade, and while the taker was flailing in circles ten feet away, trying to put out the flames, eating away at its body, it didn't see the projectile sailing through the air towards it. Helen screamed out, No! It was mine! The grenade struck the taker in its arm and thudded to the ground. Everyone turned and ran or scrambled along the ground. Aaron, for one, had no idea how big the blast from a grenade would be. The infected were everywhere, whipping their talons and making the air crack. Cameron barreled into the nearest one and knocked it back. Teddy and Coburn did the same. Aaron glanced back, staring at the taker now fifteen feet behind him. The flames had all but died out. The grenade lay at its feet, doing nothing. Then the world became noise. Rather than bringing a flash or fire, the grenade was more like a giant fist thumping the ground. A massive column of earth and fungus 
burst up right beneath the taker and launched it into the air. Its body went in two directions, splitting apart. At first, Aaron thought the shattering wail had come from the grenade's explosion. But then, he realized, it was the screaming inside his head. He blinked as dust filled his eye, and he found himself standing alone. Everyone else was lying on the ground, having dived for cover. The infected screeched in unison and began to convulse. The takers' agonized screaming inside Aaron's head must be in theirs too. Behind him, his friends moaned in pain, but also in relief as the onslaught momentarily ceased. Aaron strode forward. He needed to look the taker in its eyes. He needed to be seen by it. The creature was lying on the ground in two bloody pieces, yet it lived. The smaller of the two pieces was mostly just an arm and a piece of its slender torso. Aaron went to the larger part, the part that had a dozen rodent-like eyes. Aaron saw himself reflected in their dark surfaces. You're not going to win, he said. You're scary and powerful, and we know nothing about you. But you attack innocent planets without warning, and the only reason you would do that is because you're weak. I don't think you're used to fighting. You're used to sneaking in and winning before anyone has a chance to fight back. But let me tell you something. If there's one thing mankind is good at, it's fighting. We're going to kill you all. He kicked the dying creature and made it squeal. It's already started. Fiona moved up beside him. She was wheezing and gasping for air, but there was half a smile on her face. You have to admit, that was pretty cool. He frowned at her. Want to get high? Seriously? You couldn't think of something better to say? It was the only thing that came into my head. They make it seem so easy in the movies. He patted her on the back. Maybe you'll think of something better next time. She groaned. Sod next time. I killed this one, so I'm sitting the next one out. Aaron chuckled. Yeah, maybe we could all use a break. The taker gurgled and went still. While Aaron was no expert on alien physiology, he was pretty sure the thing had just expired. The screaming in his head had stopped. The fire still burned in the clearing, but it was dying out in several places. The fungus burned, but there were several patches of stony ground where the fire had gone out once the tendrils covering it had burned away. If the flames made it to the stalks, however, there could be a full-on inferno. They needed to act quickly. Aaron turned back and saw his friends still lying in various heaps. Every one of them was bleeding from a dozen wounds, mostly shallow slashes across their arms and shoulders. They would need to take care of themselves soon or risk infection. Not to mention the fact they were all currently covered with fungus. They risked their lives to come and save me. Aaron closed his eyes, breathing in the acidic air. I put them all at risk. But look where it got us. We killed another taker. And the corkscrew is right in front of us. As long as I destroy it, everything will be worth the effort, worth the suffering, worth the loss. We need to finish this, said Aaron. The infected were still disorientated, despite the screaming in their heads having most likely stopped. Aaron yelled at them several times to leave, but they didn't. Perhaps they couldn't yet hear him. Aaron moved away from the dead taker to check on his friends. Everyone had made it to their feet now, but they moved gingerly. Helen's shoulder was a mess, a good three inches lower than on the other side. She could barely move her arm. But despite her obvious pain, she stooped down and picked up the remaining grenade. Shaking her head, she stared at their dead taker. I wanted it. I wanted to hurt one of those things like they hurt Andy. She turned and scowled at Fiona. You took that from me. Fiona looked mortified. I, I'm sorry. Come on, Hill, said Cameron. We got the job done. That's what matters. Not yet, said Aaron. He looked through the flames at the corkscrew. He could still hear the ringing. We have to destroy it. Cameron nodded. Hey, 
Should we burn it? Coburn kicked the jerry can. It sounded empty. Sorry, guys. I got a bit carried away in all the panic. We need a plan B. Helen held up the grenade. We plant this next to it. Sure it'll work a treat. Everyone agreed. Aaron went to say something, but he flinched in pain, grasping at his forehead. The angry alien voice was back louder than before. He squinted at the dead taker, checking it was actually dead. It was, no doubt about it. The light had faded from its eyes. What is it? asked Fiona, putting a hand on his back. What is it? S Something's wrong. I hear them. Coburn swore and got their attention. He was looking towards the corkscrew. Aaron fought the pain in his head and straightened up. What he saw caused him to slump back down in defeat. It was all over. A pair of takers had appeared before the corkscrew. A legion of infected gathered either side of them. We need to get out of here, said Teddy. I can barely stand. We're fucked, said Coburn. He turned to face the infected behind them. They were still disorientated by the death of the taker that had just been inside their heads. We still have a chance to get the hell out of here. I vote we take it. He's right, said Fiona. Come on, we have to make it back to the canal. Helper can heal us. Aaron shook his head. If we leave now, it's over. We'll lose our shot. Cameron clapped him on the back. It's over, little English. We gave it what we had. Let's not die today. Helen gave Aaron a little shove, knocking him off balance. I promised you once that I'd see you back to your mum, didn't I? He sighed. Yeah, you did. Will you forgive me if I break that promise? He frowned, not understanding. Without warning, Helen took off towards the flames burning in the centre of the clearing. Everyone shouted after her, but she had too much of a head start for anyone to stop her. She moved awkwardly with her broken shoulder, but managed to break into a sprint. Like a manic, she leapt into the air and straight towards the middle of the fire. Cameron yelled out in horror, Hail, you mad cow! Hail! Helen passed through the flames and landed on the other side. Aaron hurried forward, moving himself so he could see through a gap in the fire. He saw Helen racing towards the takers and the infected, who'd spotted her and immediately readied themselves to attack. The infected raised their tentacles. The takers raised their arms and sent out a pair of deadly pulses. Helen threw herself down, hitting the ground on all fours and scrambling forward ducking under the deadly shimmer of air. She had the grenade clutched tightly in her hand. She yanked out the pin and screeched, I got a wee gift for you, you scabby thuds! Aaron felt a cold dread wash over him. His friends were all yelling at Helen to come back, but he knew she wasn't going to do that. She raced ahead, aiming straight at the enemy. He could hear their whispers inside his head. They were bewildered. The takers didn't raise their arm at Helen again, perhaps because they needed a minute to recharge. They did, however, move to block her. But instead of trying to avoid them, she barged right into the slight gap between them and crashed into a horde of the infected at their backs. She swam her way through their malformed bodies, forcing her way further and further forward even as they whipped at her and tore at her flesh. One talon struck her across the neck, blood jetted into the air. Cameron and Fiona sobbed, both shaking their heads. Teddy and Coburn stood in stunned silence, no longer shouting for Helen to come back. It was too late. Helen continued to swim and push her way through the infected, not stopping until she had placed one hand on top of the corkscrew. In that hand, she held the unpinned grenade. Covered in her own blood, her neck torn wide open, she turned back to face Aaron and the others. There was a smile on her face. Helen exploded, the arm holding the grenade and most of her face gone in an instant. The rest of her went airborne, along with half a dozen infected men and women. The takers were shielded from the blast, 
but they let out an ear-piecing screech as their minions were torn apart. Blood and flesh filled the air, mud and dirt. When the miasma finally cleared, the corkscrew was dented. Its top half had cracked wide open and was spilling out foul fumes into the atmosphere. Then it exploded like a leaking battery too close to a flame. A mighty wind swept across the clearing, putting out the flames. The takers collapsed to the ground, convulsing, as did every infected person in the vicinity. Immediately, the stalks around the clearing wilted and started to turn black. The spongy ground turned to ash. Aaron slumped to the ground, exhausted. Somewhere nearby lay Helen's remains but he didn't know if he had the strength to go and find them. So he said his goodbyes now, hoping to catch her spirit before it departed to wherever it was bound. Tell Andy I said hello, he chuckled. Scabby fuds. Now that's a badass line to remember you by. The screams of the dying wailed inside Aaron's head. The only way he could stop the noise was by passing out. So that's what he did. Chapter 14 After convulsing for several minutes, the takers did the strangest of things. They curled up inside metallic shells that appeared from the air around them. Whatever Cameron and Coben tried, they couldn't penetrate the strange covering. So instead they backed away. It was unclear exactly what the aliens were doing, but it seemed unwise to stick around and find out. Everyone decided to leave. However, before they did, Aaron stood and concentrated for a moment, clutching his head and closing his eyes. When he opened them again, he gave his companions a grim smile. They're afraid, he said. They've never lost before. And they're afraid. Hey, said Cameron. So they should be. They've never had to fight a Scot before, especially one like hell. Teddy chuckled, even though he could barely stand. She was a badass. Cameron nodded. Aye, she was something all right. Time to go, said Fiona, holding back tears. The fungus on her arm had turned black. We should go. She moved to the edge of the clearing and everyone followed. Then they set off into the ruins, while they still had strength. It was easier to move with the stalks turning to ash, but Cameron in particular was in a bad way. They had to take turns helping him walk backwards towards the canal where they hoped to rest up and heal. While the fungus had fallen from their skin and no longer crept through their veins, their many open wounds still needed tending to. They walked slowly now, in no rush now that the fungus was dying. The infected lay in heaps here and there, their bodies disintegrating like autumn leaves. Teddy kicked them now and then, making them explode. He was hurt badly, clutching a bloody hand against his chest, but he was still the most able of them when it came to walking. At one point in their journey, he stopped in front of a road sign, wiping it clean with his sleeve. He then pulled his bloody hand away from his chest and rubbed it on the sign. With his own blood, he wrote out a message. Fight back. Cameron gave him a nod, showing he appreciated the message. May all those still living see it. Before they made it back to the canal, they stopped at a small two-story building. The dying fungus fell from its facade like a black snow, revealing it to be a newsagent. It was too good a thing to turn down, so they forced open the door and went inside. Everyone immediately grabbed bottled water and sated their desperate thirsts. The ash in the air had made their throats dry and their eyes sore. Cameron found a box of plasters, which weren't as ideal as pads and bandages, but would cover the worst of their wounds. Fiona grabbed a bottle of vodka from the shelf behind the counter and unscrewed the lid. Cameron immediately groaned. Please, lass, now is near the time to drink. She upturned the bottle, 
and poured the vodka all over her bloody arms, hissing as it stung her wounds. I know that, but it's a good way to disinfect your wounds. She kept half the bottle and offered it to Cameron. Want to join me? He hobbled over to her and took the bottle. Bottoms up! Everyone grabbed high-proof spirits from the ash-covered shelves and used the alcohol to disinfect their wounds. Then they used the plasters to cover the area still bleeding. By the end, they looked a little ridiculous, but their spirits had lifted. We need to get back to the boat, said Teddy. Helper might need us. Everyone agreed. It didn't need saying that they were all worried about their alien companion. They'd left him unconscious on the roof of the barge. What would he do if he awoke to find them gone? The canal wasn't far now, so even in their poor state, they were able to reach it in less than an hour. When they finally got there, the sun was high in the sky and shining brightly. Strange colours still stained the atmosphere, but they didn't seem quite so lively. Would the acidic air soon retreat? Would Aaron's friends soon breathe easily again? Will I suffocate? Am I more alien than man? They walked along the canal in the direction they'd left the barge. It came into view on the horizon ten minutes later, but it took them a few minutes until they spotted Helper. The alien was still on the roof, exactly how he had been when Aaron had left him shortly before dawn. Everyone was completely silent as they approached the barge. No one wanted to state the fear inside each of their hearts, but eventually Aaron would stand it no more. Helper, he called out. Helper, we're back. We did it. The corkscrew's dead. Helper didn't move. He made no sound. His large blue shoulders were like stone slabs. Aaron shared a glance with Fiona. She was already broken from losing Helen, but this seemed like it might be too much. One loss too many. Perhaps for all of them. Cameron and Fiona were the only ones who'd gone to see Helen's body after the corkscrew exploded, and both of them had returned with all the colour drained from their faces. Aaron hadn't asked them what they'd seen. He didn't want to know. Come on, helper, said Aaron. There's still work to do. We need you up and at him, please. He put his hand to his head, his arm trembling. Please, buddy. Still no reply. Still no movement. Then, Aaron, ally, friend. Everyone looked at each other. Eyes wide, mouths turning up into smiles. Helper used his own voice, croaking out a series of words that were barely recognisable. Little English. A brief pause, then. Fecker. Everyone slumped against one another, holding each other up. They smiled and laughed, despite every part of them hurting. It could have been worse. It could have been so much worse. Helper got to his feet. Chapter 15 Sophie had been on the road for two weeks, and she was astonished by how much her circumstances had changed. The exodus from Edinburgh had been modest but substantial. Not everyone had wanted to try surviving on their own, but the number of those now migrating south through the countryside numbered in the thousands. Not one of them regretted it. Their singing filled the air for miles. The fungus was all gone in the north, that much they'd already known. But what had surprised them all was that it had all died off south of the border too. Instead of green fungus, harmless black ash now coated the landscape. Someone, somewhere, had struck another blow against the enemy. Someone was fighting back. It's you, Ryan. I know it is. You're the one destroying the corkscrews, aren't you? You and your brother and your friends. All of you would have stuck together when the fungus came. You're the heroes of Quarry Kell, I know you are. Via rumours and half-truths shared on the road between soldiers, survivors and Edinburgh exiles, the heroes of Quarry Kell had taken life. 
facts varied, but it was agreed upon that a group of survivors in the highlands had fought back against the enemy. With the area south of the border now being clear, there was a good chance these heroes had travelled south to continue the war. Sophie had now made it down almost as far as Birmingham, having entered the Midlands early yesterday afternoon. She had trekked hundreds of miles with hundreds of people, a migration of humans. She had lost count of how many people currently travelled in the group, but it was a lot. They all scouted for supplies and shared everything fairly. They hunted together and fished together, sang songs and played games. They spoke of the old days and those who had been lost. Refugees, survivors, whatever you wanted to call them, they were one people, human, each prepared to fight for tomorrow. That was why they were all heading south. At first, they'd sought the enemy south of the border, but it had already been dealt with. So they travelled further, and would continue doing so, until they eventually found a fight. My feet are killing me, said Maggie. She had stopped hitting on Sophie since leaving the city, and the two of them now shared a burgeoning friendship. They were yet to fully know or trust each other, but they liked one another, and for now that was a gift. As a qualified nurse, Maggie was often busy, but they finished each night in the same tent and often chatted for hours, remembering what it was to smile and laugh. Together they looked after Daniel, who was remarkably resilient. He played with the other children and rarely became sad. There was a powder keg of grief inside the child, but for now he was keeping a lid on it. Sophie reached out and clutched Maggie's hand. We'll get you some new shoes. I told you to get hiking boots in the last town. She shrugged. I prefer trainers. Boots are too manly. Don't think fashion matters anymore. Fashion always matters. Without it, we're no better than the enemy. Sophie nodded. True. Hey, do you think you can get one of the tripes to wear some stylish sandals? You'd have to get two pairs and throw one shoe away. Maggie turned back and laughed. Walking behind them in a tight-knit group were seven three-legged aliens. Everyone called them tripes, which was short for tripods. The children in particular loved the strange blue creatures. The migrating group of people had encountered the first tripe about 50 miles south of Edinburgh. It had come rushing out of an alleyway, producing words with one of its strange vibrating fans. At first, people had panicked, but when it kept shouting the word friend at them, they had eventually sent a couple of people to talk to it. One envoy they sent had sported a broken wrist in a sling, which the alien promptly fixed by flopping on top of the screaming man. Afterwards, the alien had given them a picture show about how it was an exile from a planet devastated by the very same enemy as the one Earth faced. People voted, and the alien was allowed to join them. They had gathered six more since then. It was like having a squad of miracle healers with them, and the aliens were revered and protected by the people who owed them their good health, or even their lives in many cases. The only thing that sapped people's spirits was the colours in the sky. There were reports of something falling from the atmosphere, but no one really understood what that meant. They would surely find out soon. Daniel came running over, having been playing up ahead with some other kids. It was bizarre how they lived their lives on the move. They ate while walking, played games while walking, even washed while walking. The group was always moving and growing, like a stone rolling down a hill and gathering moss. Not every survivor was from the north of the border and they discovered new people every day. Each one was a miracle of persistence and strength. They were a growing nation of warrior nomads. Daniel was out of breath. He doubled over, panting. Easy, kid, said Maggie. What's wrong? We, there, there are people ahead over the hill 
Lots of people, hundreds. Maggie and Sophie looked at one another. Maggie obviously knew what Sophie was thinking because she nodded and said, Go. Sophie took off, her heart hammering in her chest. They encountered new groups of survivors every day, but only in trickles. Sophie always prayed that one of them would bring Ryan back to her, but it was never to be. But to find hundreds of people at once? He must be among them. If he travelled south, he must be. She and Maggie had been walking near the middle of the migration, so it took a good twenty minutes for her to race to the front of the group. As Daniel had said, the front walkers had crested a hill, and at the bottom of the other side was a collection of tents and ancient vehicles, all arranged in rows. While there was military equipment on show, it didn't seem to be the army. Most of the men and women walking around the camp looked like civilians. Most didn't have guns. The leaders of Sophie's group, various men and women who had asked for the job, were already chatting with the strangers. People were shaking hands and joking. But Sophie didn't want to make friends. She wanted information. So she grabbed the nearest stranger she could find. It was a youngish man with freckles and brown hair. Hey, did any of you come here from the north of the border? She asked. The boy frowned at her. You mean Scotland? Not many. Most of us came here from the south or the west. Wales wasn't as badly yet. She grabbed the man by the arm, which she realised she shouldn't have done. Sorry, she said, releasing him. I'm looking for someone, that's all. Did anyone join you after crossing the Scottish border? Yeah, um, a small group did, a week ago, I think. They all camp out in a big blue tent near the centre. That way, he pointed. Sophie took off without even thanking the man, racing between the rows of tents in the direction he had indicated. It was astonishing to see so many people in one place instead of marching along in a loose flock. These people were camped in one place, with supplies and equipment. It was as much a town as a camp.
and be a good guy for them. Take care of them in the right way. The fuck you think I'm trying to do? They're only alive because of me. We owe Jake everything, Nay protested. The two boys standing behind her nodded. You don't owe him everything, said Sophie, looking at Nay. There are certain things you never have to give away if you don't want to. Jake waved the knife again. Shut up. It's not as if you're offering something better. The whole world's fucked. Sophie nodded. It is. And I guess that should mean no one needs to care anymore, except that I do. I still care about how we treat one another, and you should too. So hand me the knife, Jake. Let's change how this goes. Jake squinted one eye at a time. He was a twitchy character, and it was possible he might have gone a little mad, which would hardly be surprising. The knife in his hand trembled. Do what I tell you, he ordered, or I'll kill you. Sophie shook her head and took a step back, not wanting to prod the kid into lashing out. I won't do what you say. Try something else. He gritted his teeth, knife trembling even more. I'll fucking gut you. No, you won't. You're a good kid, I can tell. Before all this, I bet you were just a normal young lad, kicking a football around and vibing with the girls at school, right? The knife trembled even more. You don't know anything. Nancy put her hand out. Come on, don't do anything silly. Just listen to Sophie, she wants to help. Shut up, you old slag. He kept the knife pointed at Sophie and took a step forward. You are pissing me off, he warned. Get doing on the ground, nay, come tie her up. Sophie took another step back. Don't do what he says, nay. This isn't happening, okay. The girl appeared unsure about what to do. She just kept attempting to take a step and changing her mind until Jake raised his voice and she finally got moving. Sophie took one more step backwards and her hands found the golf club. Nay tried to grab her, but she shoved the little girl away and swung at Jake's head. Even in these dark times, she had never killed anyone, and it reassured her that she found it so horrifying. The club struck Jake in the temple and sent his left eyeball popping out of its socket. His body struck the tiles and flopped about. It looked like he was trying to walk, but his legs were in the air. It took almost a full minute for him to go still. Nay stared at Sophie in horror. Sophie reached out her hand to her. It's okay. He can't hurt you now. We're going to take... The girl screamed, then knelt beside Jake's body and cradled it. What did you do? What did you do? Sophie shook her head and closed her eyes, trying to ignore the headache she had coming. She wondered if caving in a few more skulls would relieve the tension, but that was a dangerous notion. I can't let violence overtake me. These children are just scared. Sophie opened her eyes again and studied the three young boys at the back of the kitchen. They looked ready to piss themselves. Nay continued to scream and admonish Sophie, but Sophie didn't care. She stepped away from the corpse and stood with Nancy, who was shaking her head and staring at Jake's bloody skull. What did you do? She said. I thought you were going to talk things out. The kid was a rapist. That girl is no older than 12, and it looked like he was ready to have his way with me too. Fuck him. Sophie, he was just a boy. A boy who wanted to be a man. That means consequences. Come on. She picked up her backpack, shoving the blanket back inside. Where are we going? To search this place for anything we can find, and then we're going to take as many apples from the tree outside as we can carry. Nancy gasped. But it belongs to these children. It belongs to whoever's willing to take it. Sophie, move, Nancy. I'm not going to ask you again. Sophie left the kitchen and headed upstairs, bloody golf club by her side. Chapter 7 Aaron had left Coldrake's ruins five days ago. Alongside him were Boone, Cameron, Fiona, Helen, and three soldiers who wanted to tag along. Helper skipped along behind everyone. They were all heading for the Scottish Highlands, specifically to the village of Quirikel, where Aaron knew the location of several corkscrews. 
The fungus appeared more and more frequently as they headed deeper into Scotland. Fortunately, Helper had a method of keeping it at bay. Whenever they set down their bedrolls in whatever natural shelter or abandoned building they found, the alien would vibrate his fans. Somehow it kept the fungus from creeping near. They hadn't originally set off with the alien in tow. Aaron had assumed the remains of the army would take the alien south with them. But upon the first night after leaving Coldrake, Helper had awoken them with his usual litany of Ally! Helper! Friend! The temperature was milder than Aaron would have expected it to be, but a constant drizzle kept everyone damp. It was only Boone's training and lessons John had imparted to Aaron that made life bearable. Every night, they set a fire to sleep beside, and whenever the weather grew particularly blustery, they bivouacked in whatever crevices they could find in the rocky landscape. They were poorly armed and poorly equipped after leaving Caldrake in such a rush, but they were doing okay, averaging 15 miles a day by Boone's prediction. It had put them nearly halfway to their destination. Boone pulled up the sleeve of her camo shirt and glanced at her watch. It's time to make camp. Anyone disagree? Nobody did. So they shrugged off their packs and set them on the ground. Coldrake had been an infectious mess after the attack, so they'd only grabbed a few supplies before leaving, which Aaron supplemented by hitting uninfected rabbits with his point two two. Cameron had also shot a starving fox with his SA-80, but the 5.56mm round had obliterated the animal too much to eat. Aaron propped his rifle against a large boulder at the side of the road. They had kept mostly to the main roads because it was easier going and allowed them to follow the traffic signs. The last one had indicated they were approaching the village of Comrie, which they would seek to avoid. They always endeavoured to skirt around the various pockets of civilization, because it was much safer out in the open, where they could see any threats coming. I'll go fetch some sticks to Budden, said Cameron, walking off on his own. The last few days had been unkind to the big Scot, and his face was grey and baggy. Losing Col Drake had struck him hard. I'll come with you, said Aaron, and he caught up with Cameron as he headed off-road. Deep in the wilderness, it was easy to find bushes and trees to use as firewood. Everyone had knives. Aaron, the machete that had belonged to John, so cutting the wood wasn't difficult. Finding patches of ground free of fungus was the only challenge, but fortunately, Boone had stopped them in a clean area. Helper was nearby if they needed to push the spread back a few metres. Cameron moved up to a spindly tree with a whitish bark. Aaron knew little about trees, but he thought this one was pretty. It was almost a shame when they started hacking at its limbs. You doing okay? asked Aaron, noticing Cameron wouldn't look him in the eye. Grand, you. I've been better. I'm sorry. Cameron eyed him as he prepared to slash at a new branch. For what? For thinking this was all about me. What we're doing now is for all the places like Coldrake that are still holding on. Cameron lowered his blade and grunted. We were supposed to defend Kuldrick, and we failed. We failed all those people. They didn't all die, Cameron. We fought back. A lot of us made it. Aye, but Kuldrick near did. They were the first place I ever felt I belonged. Now it's gone. Aaron hacked at the branches for a while, wishing he knew what to say. He had never seen Cameron depressed. His sense of humour had gone and he no longer displayed the brash self-confidence that had caused him to butt heads with Ryan so often in the beginning. Aaron decided to give him some space, so he took an armful of branches and went and deposited them in the middle of the road. Boone's soldiers were in the process of fastening a large ground sheet to four large sticks they carried with them everywhere. The canopy would capture the heat from the fire and keep everyone dry, Boone was gathering rocks to radiate warmth. The entire drill was second nature by now after their five-day camping trip. 
It surprised Aaron to find he actually enjoyed pitching camp. He enjoyed the company of his friends. Enjoy was possibly the wrong word, though. He wasn't happy, but he was content. No longer was he drifting from empty minute to empty minute. His life had found new purpose. There was a reason to wake up every morning. Fiona unwrapped some of the rabbit meat they had left and poked it with her finger. Somehow she had become the group's unofficial cook, and she too seemed to enjoy having a purpose. Aaron sat beside her. Cameron is really suffering. She raised an eyebrow and huffed. We're trekking 15 miles a day during an apocalypse. Who isn't suffering? Good point. I just thought he would agree with how important this is. We need to hit back at the enemy. We need to fight. Usually that's what Cam's all about. He understands, Aaron. Give him some time. If he didn't want to be here, he wouldn't be. All of us understands what needs to be done. Hey, said Helen, coming to join them. I'm looking forward to going home and seeing what the fungus and flames have done with the place. She looked down and sighed. I can find my boy and put him to this properly. We'll all look for him, said Fiona, placing a hand on Helen's arm. Once we do what we have to do, we'll find him. Helen smiled grimly. Thank you. Aaron had expected Helen's mood to worsen the closer they got to the village where she'd lost her son. But the opposite happened. No longer drunk, she seemed confident and strong. Maybe, like Aaron, she just needed a mission to set her mind to. We can look for your brother too, said Fiona. We can find Ryan. Aaron looked down at the road and picked up a chunk of grit, rolling it between his finger and thumb. How would I even recognise him in the rubble? The whole village burned. Helen shrugged. Perhaps just being back at the place at all of one's day will be good enough to see Edgar Bays. We never had a chance before. But if our plan works, we might get a little time to make our peace. Aaron chucked the piece of grit and blew air out of his nostrils. You're right. It might help. Certainly can't make it any worse, said Helen. Fiona chuckled to herself and when they both turned to her, she started to explain what had tickled her. When I was a kid, she said, back before I screwed my life up royally, I used to visit this little stream near my house. It was more of a ditch, really, and it filled up every time there was heavy rain. At certain times of the year, you could catch newts and frogs and stuff, so a lot of kids would go there to hang out. I was no different. But because my mum worked as a barmaid in the evenings, I never had to go home when my friends did. She would get back well after midnight, so I could pretty much stay out as late as I wanted. Anyway, sometimes I would stay at the stream until dark, and this one year a fox appeared. Obviously I shit my pants. The thing was big, like the size of a cocker spaniel or something, and I worried it was going to bite me. It didn't, though. It kept its distance and trotted right into the stream. Then it started splashing about like it was playing and having fun. It was trying to catch the newts and frogs, but back then, I didn't know any better. It was just beautiful. A moment where the world was just right. Aaron chuckled. Don't foxes carry babies? I don't know, she admitted. This one didn't. Anyway, the next night I hung around the stream again and the fox came back at the exact same time. It was cautious of me, but not afraid, and once again it splashed in the water, having even more fun than last time. Let me guess, said Helen. Came back the next night too? For over a week. I started tossing it bits of sandwich meat, and it stayed longer and longer every night. Aaron smiled. Cute. But then it stopped coming said Fiona abruptly. I came back three nights in a row, but the fox was never there. I spotted it on the main road a few days later, when I was walking along the verge to buy sweets at the petrol station. That sucks, said Helen. Fiona nodded. He was plastered all over the road. I could only tell it was him because of the lumps of orange fur. I knew it was my friend lying there. He'd probably got run over on his way to the stream on his way to see me.
I cried my eyes out for a week. Is there a point to this story? asked Helen, a little mean-spiritedly. Then she grimaced. Sorry, just wondering. Yes, there's a point. After the fox died, I avoided the stream because it was too painful. Until one night, weeks later, I went back. I sat down at the side of the water and pictured the fox, splashing about in the water and having fun. I remember how much joy it filled me with, watching it. Then I realised I was feeling joy all over again, just by being there and remembering. I said goodbye to the fox, hoping its spirit would hear me. And suddenly this weight lifted. After that, whenever I felt sad, I would go and spend time by the stream and things would get better. Adam raised an eyebrow. So, your point is that I can say goodbye to Ryan just by making it back to Quiety Kel? Or maybe my point is that we all end up as roadkill eventually, so let's enjoy what we have while we have it. Aaron looked down at the scraps of rabbit flesh in her hands and wrinkled his nose. For we are truly blessed. Oi, said Boone, standing in the road. You three get your asses into gear. If this rain picks up, we're going to end up sodden. I was thinking we might be able to build a decent lean-to and have a late start in the morning. We could all use a rest. You're telling me, said Fiona, leaning over and pressing at the toe of her dirty white trainer. I had blisters on my feet the size of walnuts. Aaron wasn't sure he liked the idea of resting when their mission was so important, but he had to admit his entire body could do with a break. Yeah, some extra sleep would be good. It's decided then, said Boone. But no one rests until we make camp, so on your feet and get to work. Aaron hopped up to get more firewood, while Fiona and Helen organised supplies. Cameron was far off, hacking at a large lopsided bush. Boone gathered her three men to build a lean-to. Helper was staring off into the distance. At first the alien appeared to be resting, which he did whenever they stopped. But then Aaron saw a dark shape in the distance, moving down the centre of the road. What is that? asked Aaron, forgetting that the alien wasn't much of a conversationalist. It startled him when Helper gave a reply. Dog! Aaron frowned but then realised it was indeed a dog racing towards them. It was large and dark-coloured. Dusk was on its way, which made it hard to see clearly, but there was no doubt that a large hound was heading their way fast. Shite! Aaron turned and searched for his rifle. He grabbed it from the large boulder he'd propped it against and hurried back to help her side. Aiming down the iron sights, he brought the rifle to bear on his target. It was rare for an infected animal to be so quick, as their bodies were usually in too poor a state to sprint or pounce. This dog was moving at breakneck speed. Canine, dog, pet. Aaron tried to keep his crosshairs on the bounding animal, and the closer it got, the larger a target it became. But he needed to hold off long enough to hit the target with certainty. Miss, and he might not get a second chance. Behind him, Boone barked orders. Everyone grabbed their weapons. Aaron prepared to pull the trigger. Mixed in with the dog's brown fur was a flash of colour. Not green. Red. Blood. Aaron held his breath, readying to take the shot. He was just about to squeeze the trigger when he focused once again on the flash of red coming from the dog's mouth. Is that... a ball? The dog had a red rubber ball in its mouth and was whipping its tail like a propeller as it bounced towards them. Aaron pulled his eye back from the rifle and scanned ahead. A second shape was coming down the road and while he couldn't be sure, he thought he heard a distant voice. Boone stepped up beside Aaron and levelled her rifle. Stand back! No, said Aaron. It's not infected, it's just a dog. Boone glanced at him. Starving and dangerous, no doubt. Aaron grabbed her arm, seeing that she still intended on shooting. She glared at him, about to spit venom, but he interrupted her. It has a ball in its mouth, look! Boone frowned, then squinted through her scope. Well, I'll be damned. Okay, 
Nobody shoot, but be ready. They stood and waited while the dog continued bounding towards them. Its tongue lolled out the side of its mouth, the ball taking up most of the space between its jaws. Its tail was a blur behind it. Looks like a German shepherd, said Fiona. My granddad used to have one. Said his squad adopted a stray during the war and he fell in love with the breed. It's big, said Aaron, trying not to focus on the fact that most things that ran at you nowadays wanted to kill you. Gentle giants, said Helen, and she strode into the road ahead of them. Get back, Boone warned. You're blocking my short. Fiona knelt and put an arm out in front of her, her fingers outstretched. She held the position for three seconds until the excited dog reached her. Rather than sniff her fingers, it leapt up and knocked her backwards. Aaron raised his rifle, but when he realised Fiona was laughing, he held off from firing. 